this is the first lesson called python programming fundamentals so if you scroll down below you will find a notebook tab here and in the notebook tab you will find all the notebooks that we are going to use in today's lesson so if you just select a notebook you can see its content right below but what i'm going to do is just click the run button on the first notebook so this is how we are going to run the code so on the lesson page you can click the run button and then click run on binder what this does is this gives us a jupyter notebook an interactive computing interface where you can write code execute the code and see the results of the code right there and you can also write explanations within the jupyter notebook itself so in a way it's a good way to document your code as well so today this notebook that we're looking at this is called the first steps with python and jupyter so we're just going to get to know basic python things like arithmetic operators conditional operators and logical operators in this jupyter notebook you can see some explanations and then you can see some code below so you can see that these cells which have a gray background are code cells and the rest are text cells or also called markdown cells to create a new cell within jupyter you can click insert and click on insert cell above or insert cell below so that's an easy way to insert a cell or another way is to click just on the left of a cell near its left boundary and press aa to add a cell above and bb to add a cell below now we have some code here and you can see that this code also has some outputs these outputs are from the previous execution of the code so what we want to do is we want to execute some of the code ourselves so we can then click kernel restart and clear output so what that does is that clears all of the stale outputs from your jupyter notebook so there you go all the stale outputs have been cleared and now we can start executing some of this code so the simplest way to use python is to just use it as a calculator now within a jupyter notebook any code that you type inside a code cell is valid python code uh, and of course if it is invalid then python will give you an error what we've written here 2 plus 3 plus 9 that is valid code and then to run it we simply need to click the run button so if i just click the run button that's going to run the code that's one way to do it and you can see 2 plus 3 plus 9 is 14 another way to use it is to click cell and just click run cells and that's going to run this cell so let's just try that too so there you go that cell got executed as well and this was 99 minus 73 so we've seen addition we've seen subtraction another way is to click shift plus enter and i like this way because this is the easiest and i can turn off the toolbar as well in this case so shift plus enter runs the cell and in this case you can see that we've performed a multiplication between 23.54 a floating point or a decimal number a number with a decimal point and minus 1432 an integer next we have division so we have 100 by 7 that's that's about 14.2 then we have integer division so if you simply want the quotient you do not want the entire division to happen then you can also just divide using a double division operator and then finally you have this operator called remainder this is 100 percentage 7 so the percentage symbol is the remainder in python now one last operator is this power operator so if you see 5 star 3 what that gives you is 5 to the power of 3 so that's a power operator so that's how simple arithmetic operators work in python and what you can do is you can combine operators as well so you can create an expression let's say 2 plus 5 multiplied by 17 minus 3 divided by 4 to the power of 3 and these operators have a certain precedence i believe the precedence would be 4 to the power of 3 would be the first thing then 3 divided by 4 would be the second and then 5 into 17 would be the third so you would have 2 plus 5 into 17 so these would first get calculated minus 3 by 4 and 4 to the power of 3 so that's what the result should be but there is a certain precedence and you can read about it you can find out about it but what's easier is to simply put brackets or parentheses so these are also called round brackets or parentheses 
So just add parenthesis to specify the order in which these operations are executed. So that's arithmetic operations. You have plus minus multiplication, division, floor division, modulus, uh, or remainder. So this is called modulus or rem remainder, and this is called integer division or floor division. And finally, this is called the exponent. So what you can do is you can try out some problems. I've linked to a page here. So this is, this would be a good thing to do during the study hours. So just check out this page. This contains a bunch of math problems. So these are all consisting of integer division, decimals, multiplication, etc. So do try out some of these. If you are new to Python, just to get familiarity with Python and the Jupyter interface. Okay. So what we'll do is we'll try and now solve a multi-step problem using variables in Python. Here's a problem and I'll let you read it. So it says a grocery store sells a bag of ice for $1.25 and makes a 20% profit. Now, if it sells 500 bags of ice, how much total profit does it make? So it's a simple question, something that you might encounter in primary school. And the way you would solve it is to list out all the information and provide it and gradually convert the word, pro word problem into a mathematical expression that can be evaluated using Python. So you would say that the cost of the ice bag is 1.25 and then the profit margin on the ice bag is 20% or 0.2 Then the profit per bag, which would be the profit margin multiplied by the cost of the ice bag becomes 0.2 times 1.25. So that would be the profit per bag. And then finally, the number of bags is 500. So here we have that the total profit would be the number of bags times the profit per bag. So that means 500 times 0 0.2 times 125. So this is everything that you would write out on a piece of paper or just type something out. And then finally, you can take this final calculation and instead of running it through a computer, you can run it through the, put it into a Jupyter notebook, into a code cell, and that is Python will calculate it for you. So the grocery store, now we see, makes a total profit of $125. Now, while that's a reasonable way to solve the problem, it's not entirely clear just by looking at the code cell, what's happening here, what information these numbers represent. So what we can do is we can give names to each of these numbers by creating variables in Python. So in a programming language like Python, any information is stored in variables. And you can think of variables as containers for storing data. Now, of course, it's a little more complicated than that, but for the time being, let's think of variables as containers as storing data. And then the data stored within a variable is called its value. So if we say the cost of ice bag, so you can see here that I've typed cost underscore of underscore ice underscore bag. So there are underscores here. And that's very important because variables need to be a continuous word. You cannot create a variable with the name cost of ice bag with spaces. Python will going to, will give you an error. So it's going to tell you that this is invalid syntax. So you write the name of a variable that you want to declare. You don't have to set a type or anything like that. And then you simply put in an equal to, and then type the value of the variable. So that's 1.25 is the cost of the ice bag. Perfect. Similarly, we've defined the profit margin, which is 20% or there's no way to directly write a percentage in Python. So you can simply say 0.2 here. And finally, you can mention that the number of bags is 500. Okay. Now that we have all of these, you can see that each of these now contain the information that we had in the problem. So for example, if you typed cost of ice bag, and executed the cell, you would see the value 1.25. So that's an important thing because we use programming languages when we use variables to remember information. Now you no longer need to remember the value 1.25 and it's a lot easier to remember the cost of ice pack. And in fact, to further help you remember, Python also gives you something called auto completion. Actually, that's a fact, that's a feature in Jupyter. So you just type PRO. And if I just type and just press the tab key. So the key right next to Q. It gives me a couple of values and you can see that I can select one and complete it to profit margin. 
and profit margin has a value 0.2 so now we can take variables and we can use variables inside arithmetic operations so now we've gone from just multiplying numbers to creating variables so already python has become a lot more powerful than a calculator we take the value of two variables and the result can be stored in a third variable you don't have to but in general it's a good idea so if we simply multiply the cost of ice bag by profit margin we get back 0.25 that's great but we can simply put that 0.25 value inside the variable profit per bag so that also has the value 0.25 and then the total profit is going to be the number of time number of bags multiplied by the profit per bag and let's check the total profit 125 great so we get back the same answer 125 dollars is the amount of money that this grocery store makes the amount of profit now here what we've done is every variable that we've tried to access or use has been defined before and definition happens like this where you put a variable name and you put an equal to sign but what happens if you try to access a variable that has not been defined let's say you try to access a variable net profit you will find that python throws something called a name error and we look at errors today as well and you find and python just tells you that the name net profit is not defined and that's it so if you ever make a mistake python will tell you and you will have an opportunity to fix it so for example if you meant to say total profit you can just go here and change it to total profit and then run it again so unlike certain other languages or programming environments if something goes wrong within a jupyter notebook it's so perfectly okay you don't have to shut down everything and restart everything sometimes you do but most of the times you don't all you need to do is you can just go in change the code and fix it and it will start working okay now one other thing that i want to mention is about naming variables now here we have named our variables some slightly long names like cost of ice bag or profit per bag and profit margin this may seem like a lot you may wonder why don't we just call it c or p and pp or something like that and that's perfectly fine as a variable name in python but that's not great programming practice so one thing that we want to focus on in this bootcamp is to learn the best practices in the industry and you should always keep your variable names informative and there are a couple of reasons for that one is for somebody reading your code to be able to understand what you're doing and you may think that your code is meant for execution but the fact is that your code will get changed again and again and it will be read by other people and more importantly by you like you are reading my code right now you will be working on your own project and your project will go over several weeks sometimes several months and you may get confused if you're not using descriptive variable names so just make it a point take a mental note at this point that you will always use descriptive variable names and autocomplete makes sure that you don't have to type it out each time so we have the total profit but it would be nice to just print a message showing the total profit and also mentioning that this is a dollar values just to give some information now to display a message on the screen as an output we can use the print function so the print up so what's the function before we get into the print function so a function is a reusable set of instructions and it takes one or more inputs and it performs certain operations and it returns an output so we will talk about functions today as well and how to define them and python provides many inbuilt functions like print so print here you can see is an inbuilt function and the way it's an inbuilt function is when you type print it's going to turn green which indicates that it is a reserved keyword or an inbuilt function in python and python also allows us to define our own functions which we'll see so this is the function name print and then we are giving it a couple of arguments the grocery store makes a total profit of dollar so this is the first argument so we've given some text as an argument to a function and whenever you're writing text which is english text which is not meant for python to interpret or do something with uh, you put it in quotes so when you put in quotes you are simply telling python that this is to be treated as some text probably for the purpose of display 
and not as instructions. So anything inside a code will appear orange and that will let you know that this is a string. Python will not process it in any way. Anything outside Python is going to try to interpret it as a variable or an operation or a function or something else. So the first argument or the first input to the function is this piece of text. The grocery store makes a total profit of dollar. Then we have a comma and then we have a second argument to the function. So the second input to the function. So let's run it. And this will now print out that the grocery store makes a total profit of $125. Great. So we've just learned about a, the print function. And we've also just talked about arithmetic operations, variables and functions in Python. So we'll talk a lot more about these soon. Now, so far we've been creating a code cell for each variable or each mathematical operation. We don't have to do that. Jupyter allows you to write multiple lines of code within a single code cell. So here, for example, what you can do is you can write the cost of ice bag equals 125 and then press enter and then write profit margin equals 0.2. Number of bags equals 500. Then you have profit per bag, which is calculated here, total profit. And finally you have print. So this is how you write multiple instructions in a cell. You can also leave some lines blank just for spacing. So this is just for your codes readability. And we have this special sentence here. So whenever you put a hash somewhere, this is called the hash or the pound character. So whenever you put the hash character, anything written after the hash character on that line is completely ignored by Python. Okay. So strings are still processed by Python that Python is going to take the string and put it as an argument into print. It's not going to interpret what's inside the string, but it's going to use that value. But the comments, this is called a comment. Comments are completely ripped out. The Python does not even look at them. The moment it sees a hash, it says, okay, I'm not going to look at all this. I'm just going to go to the next line. Comments are for you to inform yourself or the people reading your code about what you're doing. Okay. So do add comments from time to time. Like here, we are saying that we're going to store input data and variables. So that gives you some information here. We're saying perform the required calculations. And then here we're saying display the result. And there are comments of three types. So you have what's called an inline comment. So here we have some Python code, my favorite number equals one, any Python code. And after some Python code, if you put a hash character and type an inline comment or whatever you want to type here, all of this is ignored. So that's called an inline comment. You can also put a comment onto an entire line of its own. So you just put in the hash character and say this comment gets its own line or whatever you want to put here. And then write some code below or above it and we'll ignore that line completely. So that's a single line comment that takes its own line. Then you can also create multi line comments. So you can create, if you use three quotes, you can create multi line comments. So you just start with three quotes and then start typing and come all the way to the end and then close the three quotes. And that's a multi line here. So there's a multi line comment here right above your code, a national number equal, a neutral number equals five. Okay. So that's comments. So now we've looked at arithmetic operations and we've also seen how to write multiple lines of code within a single code cell. And we've also looked at how to use comments within your code. Apart from calculating sums and subtractions and divisions and multiplications, Python also provides several operations for comparing numbers and variables. So for instance, if you have a few variables here, so I have a variable, my favorite number, which has the value one, and I have the variable, my least favorite number, which has the value five. And I have the variable, a neutral number, which has the value three. So we have these three variables and suppose I want to check what the value in my favorite number is. I want to check if it's equal to two. So if we just, if it's equal to one, so if you just type my favorite number equals double equals one. So here's a small difference here. If you put in a single equal to that would be assigning. So that would be putting the value one into my favorite number. But if you put in two equals, you are comparing the values. So here you're saying my favorite number equals one, and that's going to return true because the value of my favorite number in fact is one. 
on the other hand if you had put in 2 here it would return false so this is called a comparison operation and a comparison operation between a number or a number or a variable or you can even have a variable and an expression so you can also say something like is my favorite number equal to 2 minus 1 yes it is so you can put anything on both sides of the comparison operation and the result that you get back is either true or false true if the condition is satisfied false if the condition is not met here's another you can compare two equal two two variables so my favorite number is that equal to my least favorite number false here's another so this one is called not equal to so when you want to check if a number is not equal to another number you can use this so you can see that my favorite number is not equal to a neutral number they have different values that's why we get back true on the other hand a neutral number is equal to 3 so here we get back false and similarly you have some other operators as well so you have the greater than operator you can compare two numbers like 5 greater than 2 is going to return true and 5 greater than 10 is going to return false similarly you have the less than operator so you can try this out as well and then you have the greater than equal to operator so here you can here what it does is it checks whether my favorite number is either greater or equal to so in either of those cases this will return true right so if my favorite number has a value 5 then 5 is greater than 1 so it's going to return true and if my favorite number had the value 1 1 is equal to 1 so it will return true but if my favorite number had the value 0 then this would return false and similarly you have a less than equal to as well so that's it that's comparison operators and you can experiment with this notebook now just like comparison operators just like arithmetic operations the result of a comparison can also be stored in a variable so for example you have cost of ice bag set to 1.25 and then we have this comparison is the cost of ice bag greater than or equal to 10 now it's not the result should be false uh, but we can take that result and put it into is ice bag expensive a variable and then we can put that variable into a print statement just like any other variable so variables are really useful because you can store information and then share it around here and there wherever you need it and access it anywhere so is the ice bag expensive false this is the result that you get back let's quickly look at logical operators as well now logical operators are and or and not and they are used to combine conditions so if you have two expressions so for example we have my favorite number greater than 0 and my favorite number less than 3 and is going to return true if both of these conditions hold true so if my favorite number is greater than 0 and it's less than 3 it's going to return true otherwise it's going to return false so you can look at this table so if you have two conditions a and b on the left and right then only if both of them are true and returns true if a is true and b is false returns false if a is false and b is true returns false otherwise returns false true so just as you would expect in daily life what and means you want two things both to be true that's why you say and so true and false you can also just type true and false directly and you can say true and false is false and then true and true is true so you can experiment with and similarly we have or so we have the or operator which is true if at least one of the conditions evaluates true so the difference between and and or is this that true true is going to be true but if i only a is true and b is false it still returns true and similarly if only b is true and a is false it still returns true the only case in which it is false is when neither of the two conditions hold true so that's or again you can check these out there are there are some examples here you can try coming up with your own examples as well and then you have the not operator which is really simple it simply takes a condition and the it reverses the result of the condition so if a neutral number let's check the value of a neutral number so i'm just going to create a new cell here and say a neutral number so the neutral number has a value 3 so a neutral number equal to equal to 3 is going to return true so not of that is going to return false on the other hand if you see my favorite number that has the value 1 so my favorite number less than 0 has a value false so not false is going to return true 
so that's your logical operator and as you try this out you will realize that you can combine these in all kinds of different ways for example you can say 2 greater than 3 and 4 less than equal to 5 and then put parentheses around it and say then or not my favorite number less than 0 and true i let you figure out here what the precedence of the operators is what you can try and do during the study hours is just go through this yourself and try to determine the result yourself and then see if executing the code matches the result okay and if parentheses are not used if you don't have any brackets then logical operators are just applied from left to right. so that's another thing to just keep in mind so so far we've been looking at code cells if you see insert and you click insert cell below that's going to insert a code cell but if you want to insert some text if you want to type some text here then you can go to cell change cell type and just click on markdown and that's going to convert it into a text cell or or a markdown cell and you will see that some, when something's converted to a text cell then this in out prompt goes away so let's say we type some text and now if you want it to show up like this all you do is you run this cell so you can go cell run cell or you can simply press shift and enter and you can see that now it is now we have typed hello there now that's one way to and if you want to edit it again just double click on it and you will be able to edit it as so in the beginning you just want to start writing text just have text cells above and below your code and keep adding some explanations from time to time but over time you may also want to style your text so you would want to just double click on a cell and then you see here you see these double hash characters so these are used to create headings so wherever you type a hash character that's going to create big text and you have different sizes of text that can be created using different number of hashes so you have hash one hash two hash three hash four hash so headers one through six i believe so that's one way to create headings and give some hierarchy to your jupyter notebook now you can also create a bulleted or a numbered list so if you want to create a bulleted list simply type like this so have a star so leave a space leave one line of space above your bullet list then start with the star character and then give a space you can also use the minus character but star is something that is something that works reliably across different rendering engines to create a numbered list you simply put in 1 dot 2 dot 3 dot and then give a space and you see when we run this so when we run this you will see that now these have all become headers 1 through 4 and these have all become this has become a bulleted list nicely formatted this has become a numbered list and so on then there's a little more you can do so if you want to make some text bold then just use these two characters these two star characters around your text and that's going to make your text bold if you want to make your text italic you can use a single star character another way to do this is to you can also use underscores so if you use two underscores that's going to make your text bold and if you use a single underscore that's going to make your text italic so jupyter shows you a preview in the editing mode but when you render it so when you run shift plus enter these underscores are going to go away and just the style text is going to remain and we'll see that in just a second you can also create links so creating a link is also really easy just open a square bracket here so open this bracket and then type the text of the link the text that you want showing up and close it and then inside parenthesis add the link okay so let's take a quick look at this so you see here you have the bold text you have bold italic italic and then it says a link and if you right click on it and open it in a new tab you will find that it goes to the link that we have set up there now we can also embed images so you can see this is an image the jovian logo and here you can also see that we have written some code inside markdown now let's see why we would want to do that so to embed images it's very similar to a link all you need is this exclamation mark before the image before the link that you put in 
So if you want, you can include a description about the image here. So let's say I can just mention Jovian logo, but you don't have to. So inside the square brackets, you mention a description and then inside these round brackets or parenthesis, you mention the, the link to the image. Now you make sure that this is a link to the actual image. So a dot PNG file or a dot JPG file and not to the link, not the link to a web page containing that image. This is a common issue. So for example, if you see an image on a website, don't grab the website link, grab the image link. Now, another nice feature of Markdown is the ability to include blocks of code. So when you use these three back codes, so this code is available right under the escape key on your computer. So you just press the key under the escape key, and that's going to create this for you. And you start a code block with a back code and you end a code block with a back code and then write some code inside it. And then just execute the markdown cell. And that's going to now show up as code. And the difference really only is that it's going to use a monospace font, the kind of font that you see in code and not a nice font like Helvetica or Arial, which is normally seen in text. It's also going to indent the space a little bit and the color is going to be slightly different. This is only a display of the code. This code is not going to get executed. There is no way to execute the code within markdown. So there are certain cases where you want to show some code, but you don't want to execute it. That is when you should use a code block inside markdown. And that's pretty much it in markdown. So if you just spend some time thinking of what you want to create and then start applying some of these styles, you will get quite familiar with markdown and it almost becomes second nature when you are typing. You can check out the full syntax of markdown here. There's a few more things. You can also use HTML tags inside markdown. For example, you can create a span, a table, a div, etc. So with that, we are done with the topics in this notebook. So what we're doing here is we are using a cloud-based Jupyter notebook. So you can see that this Jupyter notebook is running on hub.binder.jovian.ml. And this is something that we've set up for you. And normally whatever company you work at, will have some cloud-based Jupyter notebook set up internally. You normally would not have to do the work on your own computer, but we'll show you how to do it on your own computer as well towards the end of this particular course, the programming course. So right now we're using this cloud-based Jupyter notebook. So the code we are typing here is not getting executed in my computer. It's getting executed on the cloud on Jovian servers. Okay. Now, because this is free compute that we are offering, this has a limit. So if you leave this page idle for about 10 minutes, this is going to shut down. So what we do when we run jovian.commit is we capture a snapshot of this notebook. And then we take this notebook and then we put it onto your Jovian profile. So you can see that this link was printed here. So we simply take this link and then we put this link, uh, open this link and you will see that this will show up on your Jovian profile. So you will be able to see the entire notebook here. And if you want to run it, you can click the run button and then select run on binder. There was one question about deleting cells. Deleting cells is really straightforward as well. So if you have a cell here and you don't want it, so let's say I put in some word X here, we can go to edit, delete cells. So that's going to do it. Another way to do it is just click next to this in or in prompt next to this boundary and press D twice. So you have to press twice just to confirm that you want to delete so that it's not accidental. And that's going to delete the cell for you. we will move on to the next notebook. So on the lesson page, now I'm going to click on the second notebook, Python variables and data types. And we're going to run this on binder. Okay, let's just give that a second. These notebooks are a bit large, so they will take a while to load up. While this notebook starts up, we are going to just start going through what's in this notebook. So we've already looked at variables, but we'll talk about variables in a bit more detail here. Now computers are useful for two purposes for storing information and information is also known as data and then performing operations on the stored data. So while working with a programming language like Python, 
data is stored in variables and as if, as we've seen date you can think of variables as containers for storing data and the data stored within a variable is called its value and we've seen how to create variables creating variables is pretty easy all you need to do is type the name of a variable so for instance here we've typed my favorite color and then put in a value blue and and that's it you can execute the cell and a variable will get created and it will have the value blue now this is called the assignment statement the variable's name followed by the assignment operator equal to followed by the value to be stored within the variable so just a few basic things about variables now when you want to create multiple variables you can do that in a single statement simply by giving the bunch of variable names with commas and then putting an equal to and then giving a bunch of values with commas so just make sure that these two match up and i guess my notebook is ready here so now we have this variable my favorite color equals blue and then my favorite color has the value blue and here we are looking at how to create multiple variables so here you have color 1 color 2 color 3 and then color 1 has a value red color 2 has a value green and color 3 has a value color 3 has a value blue now you can also assign the same value to multiple variables by chaining assignment statement so you can say color 4 equals color 5 equals color 6 equals magenta and that's going to chain the assignment statements and give a single value magenta to all the three variables so color 4 5 and 6 all have the same value magenta so here you we've seen how to create multiple variables with the same value and before this before we came to this point we've created a variable called my favorite color and let's say we created it with the value green so let's say we create a variable my favorite color with the value green now if you reassign the value of a variable if you say my favorite color equals red then the old value is overwritten and you can no longer access the old value so you can see that if we run my favorite color is red then my favorite color becomes red so these are just very basic things that you need to know about variables and if you wish and this is something interesting you can use the previous value of a variable to compute a new value so for example you can say counter equals counter plus 1 and what this will do normally in mathematics is cancel out counter and counter and you will get 0 equals 1 and that doesn't make any sense but here this is an assignment so we are taking the current value of counter which is 10 adding 1 to it and then putting that result back into counter so this specific action of adding 1 is also called incrementing the variable but in general you can use let's say you could also say counter equals counter times 10 and then counter would have the value so first counter had the value 11 when we made it counter equals counter plus 1 so counter had the value 11 here and then now if we type counter equals counter star star 10 so now counter should have the value 110 there you go so now the pattern var equals var op something where you take the variable and then use a previous value of the variable and apply an operator and then have something else on this side is very common you'll see that it comes up a lot and that's why programming languages like python have a shorthand syntax for it so a simpler or easier way to write it so for instance if counter has a value 10 you can say counter plus equals 4 and that will have the same value or that will mean the same thing as counter equals counter plus 4 and this is called an increment so here you are doing a plus equal to that would be an increment a minus equal would be a decrement and similarly you have multiplication and division too so that was working with variables how you create variables how you change their values and there are a few names or the few rules about naming variables so your variables the variable names can be as descriptive as you like you can also keep them short like axy but better not call them my favorite color profit margin the three musketeers etc but there are a few rules that you need to follow the first rule is that the name must start with an underscore must start with a letter or an underscore so a variable is fine or even underscore variable is fine this is also perfectly fine the variable can only contain lower case letters so for example is a lower case letters or upper case letters so you have today that's lower case s in saturday is upper case it can contain digits that's fine too and it can contain underscores so it can contain these underscores but that's it nothing else you not have special characters like this that's going to lead to an error 
So you see when you have proper variable names, everything works properly and there's no error. And then you will be able to access the values of each variable. So the three musketeers has the value Athos, Pothos and Aramis. And we'll see what this bracket means. Now, if you create a variable that's with a name that's invalid, for example, here we're saying a space variable that's invalid. Python is going to throw what's called a syntax error. So what's syntax? The so syntax of a programming language refers to the rules that govern the structure of a valid instruction or a statement. So here we are following the rules. We are following the rules of naming a variable. We are following the rules of assignment. You know, we've not let, left this blank. So that's not, that's, that would be breaking the rules. We have something on the left and the right. And here we are following the rules. Again, we are putting any special text inside quotes so that Python doesn't have to interpret it in any way. And here also we're following the rule here. In fact, we are creating a list, right? So all the rules or the grammar of the language is called the syntax. Now, if you do not use proper grammar and try to speak English, the other person wouldn't understand you the same way. If you do not use proper syntax and try to write Python code, Python will not understand you. So here the syntax error is at V because Python expects here there to be an operator after a variable A. Here you will find a syntax error again. So here you see is today on Saturday instead of S we are using dollar and that's an invalid character. So Python throws an error here too. Here we're saying my, my, my favorite car, but we are using the hyphen. Now the problem with the hyphen is that it is treated as it is treated as a minus character. So what you're actually saying is the variable my minus the variable favorite minus the variable car. And that's an expression and you cannot have an expression on the left side of an assignment. So that's where it says cannot assign to operator. Okay. Then finally here we have a variable where the first character is a number that's not allowed. So this is going to throw a syntax error as well. Okay. So those are the rules for naming variables. Very useful. Always create variables, never hold information in your head. That's the general rule of programming. Now I'm just going to run this jovian.commit once again. Now this part may not make sense. This pip install and import jovian, etc. You can ignore this for now because we will talk about modules in just a bit. But the important part here is when we say jovian.commit, we capture a snapshot of this notebook and put it on your profile. So next we're coming to built in data types in Python. Now, Programming languages are used to work with data and there are a few types of data that you normally work with. We've already seen numbers. We've also seen things like true and false. That's also some data. Anything that you can put into a variable is data. And every date, every information, any piece of data stored in Python in a Python variable has a type. So what you can do is you can check the type of a variable that the type of the value it stores using the type function. So if you have this variable or variable, and then you try to check its type, you can see that this is an int, which represents an integer. An integer is simply a number which does not have a decimal point. In fact, you can even directly type and just check the type of 23. So 23 is an integer. Similarly, you have is today Saturday. This was, this has the value false. We have created this above while talking about variable naming. And you'll see that true or false have the type bool. So if you check the type of true as well, you will get the value bool. And then similarly, my favorite car, which is DeLorean has the value has a type STR. And then the three musketeers has the type list. So it seems like there are a lot of different types of data in Python. So we should know what they are because you will need to pick the right type for the right use case when you're writing Python programs. So here are some commonly used data types. The first one is integer. We've already seen that float is simply a number which has a decimal point. Then we have Boolean, which is true and false. And then we have a few more. So none, string, list, tuple, and dictionary. And we look at each one of them briefly. Let's talk about the integer data type. Now the integer data type is used to represent positive or negative whole numbers from negative infinity to infinity, right? So it, you can have a very broad range. There's no limits. There are certain languages which impose limits on integers, but Python does not. They can have 
very large value. So here, for example, the current year is now it's 2021. So the current year is 2021. And if you check the type of current year, it is int, right? The variable current year stores an integer. And here is a very large negative number. You can see that this has several characters, probably more than 20. Perfectly fine with Python. You can take those character, take those numbers and multiply them and then raise one to the power of the other. And that's perfectly okay. Here we have floating point numbers. Now floating point numbers are numbers with a decimal point. So for example, the constant pi here, we are creating a variable called pi, and then we are putting in the value 3.1415, so on. So these are the first 20 digits of pi. And that has the type pi, and that has the type float. Now, one important thing to remember is that a whole number or an integer is also treated as a float if it is written with a decimal point. So for instance, here we are saying 3.0. And when you check the type of a number, that's going to say float. So just keep that in mind when you have 3.0, or even if you just write four dot or four point, that is also going to create the number four with a decimal. Okay. So just keep that in mind. Whenever you put in a dot, then you're going to get a float and not an integer. So it's more to do with the presence or absence of a dot. Then floating point numbers can also be written using the scientific notation. So here is one way to write it, especially if you have big exponents. So for example, 100 is one by hundred. And you can see that the result of a division is a floating point number. And this is a special operator division, which even converts integers into floating point. But yeah, the value 0 0.01 is what we want to represent. Oops. Yeah, so the value 0 0.01 is what we want to represent. So we can also type 0 0.01 here. Or another way to write it is 10 multiple uh, is 10 to the power of minus two. So when you say e minus two, what that means is that converts it to 10 to the power of minus two. So when you say one e minus two, that gives you 10 to the power of minus two. When you change one to some other number, then that number gets multiplied. So for example, if you say 6.022 and then a few more things, E23, that's going to multiply 6.022 so on with 10 to the power of 23. And this is called the Avogadro number. Now, of course, it's also showing up like this because Python doesn't have an easy way of um, spelling out all the characters would be too much. But if we just put in, let's say this number E4, you can see that this is actually equal to 6022.4076. Okay. So that's the Avogadro number and that has the type float as well. So we have seen integers, we've seen floats, uh, we've seen the scientific notation. Now, one thing that's very useful is to convert integers into floats and vice versa. So if you simply use the float type as a function, so just say float and pass in an integer, that's going to convert it into an integer. Here we're taking a large negative number and then converting that into a float as well. Now, one thing to keep in mind though, is that in floats, you will lose some precision. So you will lose maybe the last few decimal characters, although integers do not lose precision. So integers can have any number of uh, digits. Okay. Here, another thing, what you can do is you can take a float and convert it to an int. Now, what that does is that simply removes the portion that is after the decimal. Now, of course, what that means is if you have, let's say one E minus two, that is 10 to the power of minus two or 0 0.01, converting that into an integer is going to return zero because it lies between zero and one. The integer part of it is zero. On the other hand, the Avogadro number is 6.022 into 10 to the power of 23. So that's going to get converted into this huge integer. So that's integers and floats. And when you're performing arithmetic operations, if any of the numbers involved in the operations are floats, then integers will automatically get converted into floats. So you can see that 45 multiplied by 3.0 returns a float and 45 multiplied by three returns an integer. Similarly, 10 divided by three 
ah in this case the division operator is special it will always return a float right so even if you say 10 divided by 2 that's going to be 5 but that's still going to be a float okay so just keep this in mind also always something that trips people up that the division operator returns a float now if you want to avoid that the way to do that is simply to use a the double division operator right so you should just say 10 and divided by 2 using the integer division operator and that's simply going to return the quotient as an integer but if you have one of the operations being a float one of the operators it's going to return a float okay so play around with this this is the best part about jupyter notebooks is that you can create new cells and then you can play around with it quite easily so do play around with this now we've talked about integers we've talked about floats the next thing is a boolean so boolean represents one of two values true and false so booleans have the type bool so here we're saying is today sunday that's true this is how you create a boolean just putting in a true or false and what's important is the upper case so do not use the lower case t or the lower case f that's going to cause a problem and then here let's just check the type of is today sunday so those are booleans and booleans are generally the result of a comparison operation so you generally get booleans when you compare two things for example here we have cost of ice bag and cost of ice bag is 1.25 and then we compare cost of ice bag if it is greater than equal to 10 yeah so we compare ice bag if the cost of a greater if the cost of the ice bag is greater than or equal to 10 then we say that the ice bag is expensive so you can see that is ice bag expensive has the value false because 1.25 is not greater than 10 right and it has the type boolean now one important thing about booleans is that booleans automatically convert to ints integers when they are used in arithmetic operations for example if we say 5 plus false that's going to return 5 because false gets converted to 0 on the other hand if we say 3 point or 3 dot plus true then true is going to get converted to 1 and we get back 4.0 okay so pretty useful because you have a bunch of booleans and then you simply want to count up how many trues and falses there are so just add them up and that will give you the number of true now another thing now booleans do get converted to integers but any value in python can be converted into a boolean using the bool function and what happens when you try to convert a value into a boolean now there are only a few values that evaluate to false and these are the values which is basically the empty value in every data type so the value false itself evaluates to false when you call bool on false the value 0 an integer evaluates to false when you call 0 a bool on false the value 0.0 the float also converts to false then you have the empty value empty text empty list empty tuple etc etc a lot of these things convert to false but anything apart from these values and these are called falsy values because they all convert to false but anything apart from these values converts to true so for example if you try to convert bool of true or bool of 1 or bool of 2.0 or bool of hello or any of these things that's going to convert to true okay and we'll see what some of these other things are which is this is a list this is a string and this is a tuple and so on so that's booleans and we have a few more which which is going to look at two or three more and then we can take questions so then you have this data type called none and none is a very special value because it is used to indicate the absence of a value and it has the type none type so there's just one value in this type called none and its type is none type so if you just check the type of none or the type of a variable which points to none it says none type and it simply indicates that there is no value present here right so sometimes some languages use zero or false to represent the absence of a value but that doesn't make sense because false could mean something in the context of your problem so that's where the none type 
indicates that you have nothing and this is often used to just declare variables because you can't just declare variables right you cannot declare a variable like my var and leave it because python is going to throw a name error saying that my var is not defined so that's where you just say my var equals none and then later on when you want to use it just set another value to it and use it so that's none then we have strings and strings are a very special data type because they are very commonly used to store information that will be displayed or even to process information let's say you have a text file with with a bunch of text inside it and you want to process that information a certain way and this is a very common use case in data analysis then you will have to load them up and represent them as strings so a string is used to represent a string of character uh, represent some text in python and you have to surround strings with quotations so you can either use the double quotes or you can use the single quote either one is fine so for example here you can see saturday i have written with a single quote with a double quote that works with a single quote it works too and you just take the type of today and that's going to return str so str is the data type for strings now the reason you might want to use one quote or the other is simply when you have the other quote in the string for example here we have one floor the cuckoo's nest so you have the single quote within the string so if you used a single quote to create the string that would lead to a problem because the string would end here and then python would start interpreting all of this which is what we want to avoid so that's why we set we use double quotes here now similarly here we have another one this one says my favorite pun thanks for the explaining the word many to me it means a lot and here we are using double quotes around many so to avoid an issue when we we use single quotes around the string so that's why you have two types of quotes here we have the first time i got a universal remote control i thought to myself this changes everything right so what you can do is here you can one you can either use a single quote that's perfectly fine because you don't have a single quote inside or you can escape the double quote using the backslash character so if you use the backslash character that is going to escape this double quote that means this python will see the backslash character and say that okay this is not the end of the string but this is the actual character double quote that is present inside the string okay and when you print it here you can see that it shows up without that backslash even though you have two characters there backslash and then the escaped character it actually only represents one character then you have something called multi line strings so what you can do is you can use these triple quotes so if you use triple quotes either single triple quotes or double triple quotes and put them after variable so use them like a string they are going to become multi line strings so you can see sun dad can you tell me what a solar eclipse is that's the first line and then we are not closing the string here in fact this is a part of the string this quote and then we have the next line and here we have we say dad no sun and then we close the string right so here you're starting the multi line string here and then ending it here and that's a single string and you can check the type here as well yet another pun it has the type str now when you try to view a multi line string by simply typing it into an input cell you will see that instead of the new lines instead of the line breaks you will see this character backslash n so this represents a new line character okay so what you can also do is if you are using just double quotes you can insert this backslash n character and that will create a new line within the string now if you want to display it as it is intended to be what we can do is we can use a print statement so when you have new line characters inside a string and you want to display it over multiple lines according to the new lines so you simply use the print character and then put in the variable here and that's going to now print it across multiple lines okay so just work with this example here so you have a multi line string and when you try to view it you see a single a, a new line character and the whole string on a single line but then when you try to print it that is when the new line gets converted into an actual line break okay so don't let that confuse you and that's why we have both these 
ways shown here. Now, similarly, here we have another multi-line string, a music pun, which has which goes over about four lines. And you can see that inside we can freely use double quotes, single quotes, whatever we want. You can see I have, I'm a big metal fan. And then you have quotes here. And when we print it, it prints properly as you would expect. So that's how you create strings, single line strings, multi line strings. And you can check the length of a string using the len function. So if you simply say len and check my favorite movie, that's going to give you the length of the string. So my favorite movie was my favorite movie was one flew over the cuckoo's nest. So that has the length 31 and you can count it. So len is another inbuilt function in Python. So far we've seen print and then we've seen len and we're going to see a few more. Now here's a multi-line string. So here you have the string a. So there's one character here. Now remember all of this is simply used to start the string, right? The three quotes. So you have a that's one character and then you have B that's two character, but there's another character in between, which is the new line. So this is an interesting thing to note that the new line is also a character shown as slash N. So when you display the multi-line string, you can see that you see a and then slash N B. But even though this is two characters, while it is being displayed, it actually represents just one character, the new line character. So when you check the length, the length is going to be a and the new line and then B. Okay. Then we have another function called list and we we'll learn about lists very shortly in just some time. So you can take a string and you can convert a string into a list. So if we call the list function and pass it in a string, you can see that each character, so a or a becomes one character and then slash n, which is a new line character. You know, it's, that's one character. And then B is one character. So it, the string gets converted into a list of characters. And there may be reasons why you want to convert it into a list. And we'll, we'll touch upon a, some of them at some later point, but this is how you convert them, a list to a string. In fact, then you can go back as well. So you can just say str and that's going to convert this list. Okay. That's not going to convert the list back. The way to do that, if you have a list of numbers and you want to convert them into a string, then you use the join method. Okay. And we'll, we'll see that in just a while. So this is how you take a string and then convert it into a list, a Python list. Now, some of the more complex data types. So things like strings, lists, dictionaries, they are also called containers or they're also called data structures because they hold multiple pieces of information. So for example, a string holds a bunch of characters in place, right? And some of the most complex data, uh, more complex data types have ways in which you can get information out of these, out of these data types. For example, if you have today, which has the value Saturday, you may want to check what the first character of today is. And the way to do that is to use these square brackets. So this is also called the indexing notation. So you type the variable name today, and then you open these brackets, the square brackets, and then you simply put in a number. So you can put in number from zero to N minus one, where N is the length of the string. So here, for example, Saturday has a length one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So at position zero, you have S at position one, you have a and so on. So at position seven is where you'll have Y. Now you will not be able to access position eight. So position zero has S position three has zero, one, two, three, U, and then position seven has Y. And we'll see what happens if you try to access a position that does not occur. So if you say today and you put in eight, it's going to say this is an index error, which means that this index is out of range. So the range of indices that is valid is zero to seven or zero to N minus one, where N is the length of the string. Okay. So this is how you get characters and you can also access a part of a string. So instead of accessing just one character at a time. So here we have today. So if we say today five to eight, or let's say we say today, 
let's try another one let's try let's say today 3 to 6 okay so this is the index 0 this is the index 1 this is the index 2 so we started index 2 and then we have index 3 index 4 and index 5 so 2 3 4 5 you see all these indices that's what shows up here so t u r d right so if you have for example 2 to 5 then what would show up is t u r right t u r so 2 3 4 so this is an important thing to keep in mind that whenever you're working with ranges like this whenever you put in 2 to 5 2 colon 5 you are telling python that you want the indices 2 3 4 but you do not want the index 5 okay so that's how you get data out of a string now you can also check whether a string contains some text using the in operator so today has the value saturday once again now you can check that day is in today yes day is a part of today in fact it shows up at the very end you can check if sun is in today no sun does not show up in today so maybe if you tried satur satur that would show up in today so satur does show up in today great and that's how you just check membership then we have certain operators so what you can do is you can join two strings using the plus operator so you can use a plus operator just as like you have your full name and you have a greeting hello so let's say we want to say hello derek o'brien we can say greeting and then we can use the plus operator and then we can simply type the full name and that will combine these two strings so you can see here that it took the first string hello and it took the second string derek o'brien and it combined them but there's a problem here we probably want a space between hello and derek o'brien so what we can do is we can take greeting and we can then add a, a single character space then we have a plus and then we have a full name then we have plus and then we have an exclamation point so there we have hello derek o'brien so those are some of the operators on strings and then strings in python also have many built in methods that are used to manipulate them So let's check out a few methods. We'll see a few, and then you can try the rest in the study hours. So here we have today dot lower. So what that's going to do is convert all the characters in the string to lower case. Then we have Saturday dot upper. That's going to convert all the characters in Saturday to upper case. Then we have Monday dot capitalize. that's simply going to take the first character and then change that to the upper case let's see what happens if you do monday and tuesday so that's still only going to take the first character okay so these are some string methods to manipulate strings another example is replace so once again today has the value saturday and if you say today dot replace and put in instead of satur we want to put wednesday that's going to return a new string called another day and you can see another day has the value wednesday instead of saturday now what's important to keep in mind is that replace returns a new string and the original string is not modified so if you check the value of today that is still going to be saturday okay so now the objective here is not that you need to remember all of these methods that's not what it is it's primarily to show you that every data type in python has certain methods and what are methods are just these functions which are associated with a data type and you can access them using the dot operation so here today was a string so when we say today dot replace so that's going to take the method replace and method is simply a function which is already attached with the data type so that's going to take the value of today and it's going to pass the value of today into the function and it's also going to pass all of these other things into the function so what we are really saying is that inside strings there is a method called replace so for this particular string replace for this particular string today you want to replace satur with wednesday okay now methods are a good way of name spacing your functions because if we just had a function called replace and 
we were, we used it to change something within a string. Then we would have to create a different function, a differently named function for a different data type, which would also require replace. So maybe lists also have something called replace. Maybe dictionaries also need some kind of a replacement method, right? So instead of having top level functions or global functions, which can be used anywhere, we put methods into, or the developers of Python have put methods into each data type. Okay. So that's the replace method. Similarly, you have this method called split. So I'll let you figure out what it does. I'm just going to show it to you here. So split is going to, for example, take the string and then split it at the comma. Here you have another method called strip. What strip does is, let's see if you can guess. So you have some blank space here. You have some blank space in between and then you have blank space at the end as well. So once you do that, and once you call strip inside it, that's going to remove the blank spaces from the beginning and the end. One very important method is the format method. And what the format method does is that it combines the values of other data types like integers and floats and booleans and lists with strings. So you can use the format method to construct output messages for display. For example, here we have some input variables, the cost of the ice bag, which is 1.25. And then we have profit margin, which is 0.2. Then we have a number of bags which is 500. So these are three variables and they are all integers. Then we have this output template. So this is a template that we want to use to print some information or maybe to send an email or something. So we're saying if a grocery store sells ice bags at dollar and then blank. So this is used to indicate a blank in a template, something that needs to be filled with a value. And then here you have another blank and here you have another blank, right? So this is just a string which has these special characters, these special blanks inside it. You know, we have a multi-line string, but we could just as well have had a single line string as well. That would be totally fine. And by itself, it just prints like a string with all these blanks inside it. But what you can do is you can say output template. So which is the name of the string dot format. And then inside it, you can pass in a bunch of values. So for example, you're passing in cost of ice bag, which is a variable. So this is the first input to format. So this first input and cost of ice bag has a certain value, which is 1.25. So we take the value of the first input and then we insert it at the first blank. So now it becomes if a grocery store sells ice bags at dollar 1.25 per bag with a profit margin of here, we are saying profit margin times hundred. So profit margin is 0.2. So two times hundred is 20. So 20 is going to show up here with a profit margin of 20% and then so on. And similarly, the number of bags is going to show up here and then the number of uh, total profit is going to show up here, right? So now when we call format on a string, which has some gaps, then those values are going to get filled in. And here you have 125 per bag with a profit margin of 20% and we're selling 500 ice bags and the profit that we make is $125. A very useful, uh, a very useful method. It's also possible to do this using string concatenation, which is using the plus operator, but that requires one that requires more code to be written because now you have to put in a plus here and you have to remember to put in a plus after this. It's, it's a bit confusing. And second, it's not going to work just like this because when you are doing string concatenation using the plus operator, each of the variables needs to be a string. So each of the components of that expression needs to be a string. So you need to first convert something into a string using the str function, right? And then you can add them all together. And that's why it's always just nicer to use the format method. We will be using string formatting quite extensively. And it's one thing that you want to learn properly. Now, as we just saw the str function can be used to convert a value of any data type into a string. So your numbers become strings, floats become strings, booleans become strings. So the difference here is that this is the string true. So this is the string which contains the word T R U E true. Whereas this is simply the value in Python, the Boolean value, which is true. So you can check, for example, the type of 
true and you see that's a string and in fact this true is not equal to the actual true in python which is the boolean the keyword and here similarly you can also take things like lists and display them as strings using the str function so once again this is a string inside which it contains all of this information so this will not get parsed by python as a list whereas this is something that python parses as a list okay so that's strings and one important thing to keep in mind is that all the methods related to strings return new strings so whether you call replace or you call format or you call what else do you have split or you call lower upper strip all of these return a new string they don't modify the original string this is an important thing uh, because the behavior between strings and lists is a bit different in list you have a lot of methods that can directly modify the existing list and we'll see that in some time now strings also support some comparison operators so things like equal to and equal to equal to and then not equal to so strings also have some comparison operators they have the exact same behavior that you might expect strings also support very interestingly strings also support the less than and greater than comparison operators for example if you said akash less than viraj that would be true because less than here establishes the lexicographic order because a comes before b so that's why a is less than b so first we compare the first characters if the first character doesn't match then we compare the second characters if the second character doesn't match then we compare the third character and so on so in this case for example you will get back true but on the other hand in this case you will get back false okay so do play around with this you have less than greater than less than equals greater than equals and of course true and false so that is a look at all the what are also called the primitive data types in python which is integer float boolean none and string although string is also somewhere in between because it's also primitive because you cannot really break strings in python you can only create new strings but at the same time it's also more of a container data type or a data structure because it contains multiple characters so there's a question are these comments or are these strings so this in fact is not a comment it's a string so when i said that this is a multi line comment i actually lied to you a little bit because this is actually a string but what happens is if you just keep a stray if you just put a stray string somewhere python is simply going to ignore it python is going to go through it and it's going to see okay there's a string here fine but we are not putting the value of a string into a variable we are not doing anything with the string so python acknowledges that you have a string but then it moves on and then executes the next line so on the other hand if this is the only thing here then obviously python is going to process it right so actually when we said multi line comments they are simply multi line strings do you have a data type for hours and minutes so to represent time so you have a date time module in python so you don't have something in built like part of the language itself but you do have a date time module and the date time module contains a bunch of different functions for working with dates and times and a bunch of different data types as well so python has something called classes which we will learn about next week and in classes you can define your own way of organizing data for example you can define a time data type which has hours and minutes and seconds and so on i can see another question how to know what operations can be done on a variable other than by knowing the variable's type so the simplest way to know what operations you can perform for a variable are actually to check the type and then look up the things that you can do with a variable for example you have today if you have today is a string and then you can just go and google python string methods and get a full list of methods you see here there are a bunch of uh, references including the official documentation 
But another way you can do it in Jupyter is by typing today dot and then pressing tab. And that's going to give you a full list of both methods and properties. So this is interesting because objects contain both methods and properties, something that we will discuss next week when we talk about classes. So this is one way to do it. Now, let's say you talk about join today dot join. Now, if you want to know what to do inside join, what arguments does it accept? Once again, you can search, okay, string join, what are the arguments, or you can just put a question mark before it and then run the cell. And that is going to, you can see at the very bottom, that's going to print some information and says that today dot join takes an iterable. And then it's going to, for example, it gives an example as well. So it shows the documentation, the official documentation that if you give a list inside to something dot join, that's going to join it using the given string as a joiner and so on. So that's one, one other way to do it. You say today dot and tab. The next data structure that we look at is called a list and a list in Python is an ordered collection of values. So a list can hold different data types. And then it also supports operations to add, remove and change values. So you often come into this requirement where you have to hold a bunch of values together. So for example, if you have a list of fruits and your program needs to do something with fruits, then here we are creating a list called apple, banana and cherry. So we have three elements or three values in this list. You can see yeah, that we can print it out and see the same set of values. Each value inside this list is a string, but together they form a list. And if you check the type of fruits, all it says is that fruits is a list. Now this is where all the values were strings. And this is where a lot of programming languages stop. They don't allow you to create lists of different values or different types of values. But in Python, you can put a whole bunch of different values into the same list. For example, here we have 23, a number, hello, a string, none, 3.14, fruits, and then three less than equals five, even a Boolean expression. And fruits itself is a list. So you can have a list, which is a part of a list. So very interesting and very useful as well. You can see here now a list has a value 23. It has hello. It has none. It has 3.14. It has this fruits list and it has true as well. And you can have an empty list. So a list does not have need to have any values. All you need to do is close, open these square brackets and close these square brackets. And that's going to create an empty list. Just like this. And the empty list is just empty. Then to determine the number of values in a list, we can use the len function. Now we've already seen the len function with strings and the len function can also work with lists and it also works with tuples and dictionaries, which we'll look at in just a moment. And in general, it works with anything that has a bunch of values inside it. So when we check len of fruits, we get back three. Great. We had three fruits, apple, cherry, and apple, banana, and cherry. And we can then, we can even put this len fruits inside a print statement because the value three uh, is by itself is not very informative. So we can say something like the number of fruits is three. Similarly, we have another list which had six elements inside it. So this was this list, one, two, three, four. And then this entire list was just an element and then one, two, three, four, five, and six. Then the empty list, as you can guess, has the length zero. Now you can access an element from a list in the same way that you access elements from a string, which is by using an index and then using the indexing notation. So just using these square brackets. So fruits is a list and it has three elements. So to access the zeroth element, we say fruit zero. And this is something that you may want to get used to. Whenever you start counting in any data structure in Python or in general, and while programming, you always want to start counting from zero. So you want to call this the zeroth element and call this the first element and call this the second element. So this way you will not get confused where you say, okay, to access the first element, we say fruit zero. No, let's just say zero. So to access zeroth element, you say fruit zero to access the first or the one element, you say banana or one. That's a banana. 
and then two gives a cherry. Now, if you try to access an index that is higher than the length of the list, you will get an index error. The same happens with three or four, but very interestingly, you can use negative numbers to access elements from a list. So if you say, if I say, if we look at fruits and we type fruits minus one. Okay. So it starts accessing elements from the end. So fruits minus one is cherry fruits minus two, as you might expect is banana fruits minus three is apple. And then fruits minus four is once again going to return an error because minus one, minus two, minus three, there's no minus four here index error. You can also access a range of values from a list. So for example, here we have a list which has the value 23, hello, none, 3.14, and then another list and then a Boolean. And it has six elements. And if we say two to five, so this is read as two to five, or if it, this was one, that would be one to five. So if we pass in a range instead of a single index, then what this is going to give us is the values, the num, the list of values starting from the second element. So zero, one, two. So it's going to start here. So position two, position three, position four, but not position five. Okay. Remember the range is exclusive of the last element. So when you say two to five, you mean positions two, three, and four, something that often causes a lot of confusion, a lot of off by one errors. And that's why I'm repeating it over and over that it includes the element of the start index, but does not include the element at the end index. Okay. So that's how you work with ranges. Now, here are some experiments for you to try out during the study hours, try setting one or both indices of the range to, to be larger than the size of the list. For example, two to 10, even though you have only six elements in the list, you can also skip, you can leave out the start index or you can leave out the end index of a range. So here we left out the end index here. We've left out the start index that works to try out, see what it does. You can also use negative indices for a range. How exactly does that work? So can you just try it out and see what you get and explain the results? So these are some exercises that you may want to try out. You can also change the value at a specific index within a list using the assignment operation. And this is where there is a big difference between strings and list because in a string, you cannot do this. So for example, if we have, let's say I create a string fruit, which has the value apple. And you try to set fruit of zero to B. So you want to change the first character to B that does not happen. String does not support item assignment. What you can do is you can say fruit dot replace and then you want to replace a with a B, but that's going to give you a new variable, right? B P P L E. And then fruit is still going to have the same value apple. But here we have fruits, which is a list and we can say fruits of one and equals blueberry. So now we've changed fruits one. So the uh, element at index one or position one has been changed from banana to blueberry. Okay. So you can change the elements inside a list. And that's why these are called container data types or also called data structures because you have multiple pieces of information. You can switch things around. You can get things in and out. You can also add an element at the end of a list using the append method. So once again, if you say fruits dot append dates, that does not return anything, but that is going to add dates at the end. So apple, blueberry, cherry dates. Then you have a way to insert at a particular position. So here you have apple, blueberry, cherry dates. If you want to insert at position one, you say fruits dot insert one banana, and that's going to insert banana here. Now, similarly, you have remove. So remove, you can remove blueberry. So I'll let you figure out what that does. And what happens? You might wonder if you have multiple blueberries in the list, right? What, what does remove do? Once again, there are some empty cells here. Just type it out and test it out. So what do you want to do this? week is just try out all of these small exercises in each of these notebooks. 
and become familiar with all these data types. Or you can also look at documentation or you can look at some blogs online and see what they are. But the best way is to just try out these few exercises and then just type a dot and then just press tab and see each of these different methods that you have available. There's something called a pop method. Can you see what it does? We had apple, banana, cherry dates, and then we called pop one. So index one got popped out and got returned and it's no longer there. If you don't provide something to pop, it's going to just pop the final value out of the list. Membership testing membership within a list is also pretty straightforward. Just say fruits. So we have pineapple and cherry. Pineapple does not occur in fruits. Cherry does. Of course, if you put in RRY or this or just CHE, that's not going to work. That's still going to return false. Then to combine two or more lists, you use the plus operator. And this is also called concatenation. So you have fruits and you can take fruits and then put in a plus and give it another list and then put another plus, give it another list. And that's all of that is going to return a new list. So fruits does not get affected. Now, if you see fruits here, fruits is still apple and cherry, but more fruits now contains fruits and then this whole list and then this whole list as well. Then there are a few more methods. So you have this method called copy. Now what copy does is it creates a copy of the original list. So you have, let's see more fruits. So more fruits is this apple, cherry, pineapple, tomato, guava, dates, banana. Then we have more fruits copy, which we created a copy of using copy. And then if we remove pineapple, so that's going to remove pineapple and then we pop. So banana goes because pop by default removes the last element. You can see that the, in the copy, we have lost those values, but the original list remains unchanged. So whenever you want to make some changes without making changes to the original list, you want to use something like copy. Okay. Now here's an important point that you should note when we created a copy and then tried to cha make changes to the copy, the original did not get uh, did not get affected. But if you simply created a new variable, for example, we have more fruits and then we simply assign more fruits to a new variable, more fruits, not a copy, then more fruits, not a copy is still pointing to the same list. And this is an important thing to know about variables in Python that if you assign the value of one variable to another variable, then Python does not automatically copy over information. Both the variables are going to be pointing to the same information, especially for data structures, like things like lists, etc. Okay. So if you say more fruits, not a copy equals more fruits, and then you do more fruits, not a copy dot remove pineapple. So what we are saying is go to the list, which more fruits, not a copy points to, which is the exact same list or the same object in memory, which more fruits points to. And from that list, remove pineapple. So that's going to remove pineapple out of this original list. And similarly, that's going to pop something out of this original list. And you can see that we have just removed pineapple from both more fruits, not a copy and more fruits, which is basically the same list. Okay. So keep that in mind when you reassign, when you assign an object or a variable to another variable, and then you call a method on that variable, then that method is going to get called on the original object. And that is why we have that copy method over there. Okay. This can be a little bit tricky when you're just getting started. And the best way to understand it is just to test it out. Whenever you're in doubt, create a new cell and then type some code and test it out. Right. Jupiter is your friend. So that's strings and then just that's lists. And just like strings, there are several built-in methods available to manipulate a list, but unlike strings, most list methods modify the original list uh, rather than returning a new one. So do check it out. Here's a link where you can find out more about list methods. And here are some exercises for you. So during the study hours, you want to run this notebook 
or you want to start a new notebook and then try and complete these exercises reverse the order of the elements in a list so if you have a list of let's say a numbers 3 2 1 can you reverse that and get 1 to 3 i think this should do it oops let's say this is l okay something like this is what you would have to do so first we create a list and then on that list we call l dot reverse and then we check l and it looks like it gets reversed similarly you have add the elements of one list at the end of another list so you have a list and then you have another list and you want to combine their elements sort a list in of strings in alpha alphabetical order or sort a list of numbers in decreasing order so this is also something to try out so that's the list data type next we have a tuple and a tuple is an ordered collection of values that is very similar to a list except it is not possible to add remove or modify values in a tuple so a tuple is what's called immutable any data structures that cannot be modified after its creation is called immutable so you can think of tuples as immutable lists so you have fruits here so you have fruits is apple cherry dates that's just like a list except you use these parentheses instead of the square brackets then you check the length of fruits that's 3 <coughs> you can get the number of elements in fruits so you can get the number of elements in fruits by checking the length you can get an element out of fruits by getting using an index so the indexing notation just works you can also use a negative index you can check if dates contains is present in fruits yes dates is present in fruits but when you try to change an element you get an error because tuple does not support assignment so there's a type error here and when you try to append an element you get an error tuple does not have any attribute or any method append so you cannot add something into a tuple you cannot remove something from a tuple okay so that's the difference here now one small thing here is that you can actually even skip the parenthesis in fact whenever you put a bunch of values separated by commas python is automatically going to interpret them as a tuple so if you say the three musketeers are athos pothos and aramis and with commas you can see that python has automatically wrapped them inside this tuple and we can check the type here as well so if we just put in type the three musketeers that's going to be tuple next you can also create a tuple with just one element by typing a comma after it so this is very important when you type four comma that creates a tuple and the tuple contains just one element and you can check the type and the type is going to be tuple another way to just be more explicit and just avoid that is uh, avoid that issue is simply put parenthesis but even when you do put parenthesis you want to put a comma because if you don't put a comma then this is simply an expression with four inside it so that is not going to be a tuple so this is again something small but something that often trips people up this is like one of those eccentricities in python so if you want to create a tuple with one element and there may be reasons why you want to do that but if you want to create a tuple with one element you want to give it a comma after the first element okay whether you're putting parenthesis or not if you don't have a comma it's not going to be a tuple it's just going to be an integer there you go now we did see early on that you can create multiple variables in a single statement in python by let's say by saying x comma y equals 2 comma 3 actually what we were doing there is we were saying that we want 2 comma 3 the tuple to be assigned to this tuple of variables x comma y okay so that was just like a, a a trick that we were using so we can even do that in two steps if you have point equals 3 comma 4 and then you said point x comma point y equals point so point is 3 comma 4 so point x is going to become 3 and point y is going to become 4 now you may have a question what happens if you try to put in point z there you just type it in and see what happens and it's going to tell you that you don't have enough values it expected three values but it got two values 
on the other hand if point was 3 4 5 5 and you try to get two values out of it that would also not work right so when you are this is called unpacking a tuple so when you're unpacking a tuple into variables you need to match the exact number of elements with the number of variables let's just fix this there you go and our point x has the value 3 and point y has the value 4 as you would expect now you can convert a tuple into a list so which means you can take a list and put it into the tuple function and that will give you a tuple and similarly you can take a tuple and put it into the list function and that will give you a list if you want to convert and tuples have just a couple of methods count and index let's see if you can figure out what they do so here is a tuple and you can check count you can by the way if you want to know what a function does there are a couple of ways to do it so now a tuple when you press dot that it has just two methods count and index so i've pressed dot and then i've pressed tab so tab shows the auto completion there are two completions count and index so you just type count and if you just execute that it will tell you that this is a function if you want to learn about the function you can use a question mark just put a question mark before the function and press enter uh, shift enter and that's going to print this out so that's going to print out this information that it returns the number of occurrences of a value in a tuple another way to get the same information printed within your jupyter notebook rather than in a pop up is to use the help function so help on a tuple dot count gives you the exact same information similarly here you have a tuple dot index so you can just check out what index does as well this is what index does so try out using count and index with a tuple there's a question in what case is it better to use tuples let's say you're passing some information into a function now if you pass a list into a function the function can possibly change what's in your list that function can potentially erase the information from your list on the other hand if you pass a tuple the function will not be able to erase the information in a list that's one thing similarly if you're sure that you're only ever going to deal with three values if you know that number of values is going to be fixed and it's not going to be changed it's better to use a tuple right one last data type that we are going to cover today this is called a dictionary and a dictionary is an unordered collection of items so each item stored in a dictionary has a key and a value so this is what a dictionary looks like so what we do is we open these curly brackets or braces and then we give key value pairs right so dictionaries are used to store many pieces of information about a single let's say about a single person or about a single city or about a single thing in a single variable so a person has a name a person has a sex age and we have some information like whether a person is married now you could store this information in a list as well you could go something like this that the person's name is john doe and the person is male and the person has age 32 and then the person is married so we put in true here okay now that would be fine but now if you wanted to know whether this person is male or female we would have to go person 1 of 1 and now that is just some additional information to remember that the index 1 stores whether the person is male or female we don't want to remember any additional information more than we have to so what would be nicer if we could just say person 1 and what is their name so if, if we could just say person one name and that's what a dictionary allows so when we define it like this instead of having indices 0 1 2 3 we have keys so here we have the key name and the key name points to john doe and similarly here we have sex and sex the key sex points to male here we have age the key age points to 32 and then we have married and married points to true So now if you just check out person 1 itself the diction the object itself it's going to show up in the same way that we created it but what you can do is you can access information inside this dictionary so you can say person 1 and you open the indexing notation just as you do with lists but instead of passing an index you pass a key so you say person 1 name and 
the person one name is John Doe. So that's rather nice. And Python is all about expressiveness and all about making things easier to understand, easier to read, easier to remember. So definitely use dictionaries when it makes sense. Now, one other way to create dictionaries is using the dict function. So you will also see that use sometimes, not always. Most of the time, this is what, and this is how you should be creating dictionaries, but you can say dict. And then here, what you do is you put the keys as arguments. So here we are using a dict function and then we are using name equals as an argument and we're giving it a bunch of values here. So Jane, Judy, sex, female, age 28, married, false. Okay. Now one important difference here, something that again might get confusing is that a keys in dictionaries while declaring a dictionary using this notation should be strings. But here, since we are passing them as arguments to a function and keys are the argument names. So here you will not use a quotation. You, you will not use a quote around keys because this will lead to an error. Okay. Just something a little weird when we'll understand this better when we look at functions. But that's dictionaries for you. You can see both person one and person two are of type dictionary. And as I said, you can use the indexing notation to access information inside a dictionary. So person one, person two have both the information name, married and name. Now, if a key isn't present in a dictionary, a key error is thrown. So keep in mind that you only try to access keys that are present in a dictionary. But suppose you're writing a function and then the function is going to be used by somebody else and they may not always pass the right kind of information. So then to avoid getting an error, what you can do is you can type person two dot get name. So if you type person two dot get name, that's going to then return Jane Judy. And that works just like the normal indexing notation. But if you try to access a value that uh, a key that does not exist in the dictionary, like address, then you're going to get back none. If I just put in X, this value X and then try to print X, you can see that we get the value none. So by the way, quick aside there, if you have the value none as the result of an expression and you try to display it in Jupyter, Jupyter does not display it because none is nothing and Jupyter just doesn't display it. So if you want to display something which has the value none, you would have to invoke print. Okay. But yeah, if you try to get some, get using the dot get method. So this is again, a method inside a dictionary. You can also supply an unknown, or you can also supply a value, which is used as the default value. If this person does not have an address, maybe you want to return unknown, or maybe you want to return 221 B Baker street, whatever you want, right? There's no limitations here. Next up, we have a way to check whether a key is present in a dictionary. So once again, you can see that this in is keyword is showing up in different places in different ways. So for a string, it was a way to check if a string is a substring or lies inside another string for a list. It is a way to check if a particular element is present in a list in a dictionary. It is a way to check if a particular key is present in a dictionary. Very important. Keep this in mind that in works with keys and dictionaries and not with values. So if you try John Doe in person one, that's going to return false because John Doe is not a key. It's a value. And similarly here we have address in person one. So person one does not contain address. Let's see here. Person one contains name, sex, age, and married as keys. So name does show up address doesn't. And if you did try, for example, mail in person one, that would not work. Okay. And then you can also change the value associated with the key using the assignment operator. So if you see person two married, currently it is false and you can see the value of person two itself. And then person two married, if you change that to true using the assignment operator here, that's going to change the value from false to true. And that's going to also reflect in person two. And the assignment operator, in fact, can also be used to add new values to a new key value pairs into a dictionary. For example, person one here does not have 
an address, but if we say person one address, and if we just said this, that would lead to a key error. But since we are now combining them with an assignment operator, so this time it's going to add that address inside person one. You can see address has gotten added. And the way to remove a key from a dictionary is to use the pop method. Again, you see the pop method of a list does something else. A pop method of a dictionary does something else. And that's why it's better to put them inside the object itself. So that's why it's a person one dot pop rather than pop person one comma address because a single global pop function would have to know all the different data types. And that's a little bit inconvenient. And we'll see how to define our own classes and our own methods next week. So then we have person one here, person one now does not have address any longer. It, they used to have an address no more. Now dictionaries also provide ways of accessing a list of keys, a list of values, a list of key value pairs. And you can see here that dictionary one person one dot keys is name, sex, age, married person one dot values is John Doe male 32 and true. You can also use items and items is going to give you a list of key value pairs, but these are not exactly lists because these, you can see that there's a certain additional word that's written here, dict keys, dict values, and dict items. So what Python does is this thing you'll often notice that this is a list like object, but this is not exactly a list. And the implementers of Python have their own reasons for doing it. Primarily it is about efficiency because they wanted to probably use some structure inside the internal implementation of the dictionary itself without having to create a new list. So there's something to do with that. So what you can do is you can simply, whenever you have something like this, which looks like a list, but is not a list, you can simply say list person one dot items, and then that's going to convert it into a proper Python list. So because of some implementation reasons, they created an object of type dict items, which looks like a list, but is not actually a list. So just say list person one dot items, and that's going to convert it to a list for you, right? Similarly, you can actually even take an entire dictionary and convert that into a list. And that is going to simply give you the list of keys. So take a dictionary, convert, uh, convert it into a list and see what happens. And similarly, just like lists, dictionaries also provide many methods. And you can learn about the methods in uh, this. There's a reference here. So you can just open this up and learn about the different methods. And here are some experiments. What happens if you use the same key multiple times while creating a dictionary? Do you get an error? Does it use the first value or the second value? How can you create a copy of a dictionary? Now modifying the copy should not create the original. Can the value associated with the key itself be a dictionary? So can you put a dictionary inside a dictionary? And then can you add key value pairs from one dictionary into another dictionary. So check out the update method here. Then similarly, can the dictionary's keys can be something other than a string. So far we've only used string keys like name, sex, age, married, but can string, can keys be numbers? Can they be booleans? Can they be a list? These are all things to try out. So that's our discussion on variables and data types in Python. And then the next topic that we'll cover is branching using conditions and loops. And we'll probably cover that next time. We have enough time in the next few lessons to go over. Now, the hope is that today you've gotten just a little bit of a sense of what are the key building blocks of Python, which is numbers and the different data types, and then the different operators they support, the different methods they support, now, one good way to just get into the habit of programming is to create a new notebook. So you just create a new blank notebook. Let's just call this my practice notebook. So you can do this using the new button. It's over here. If you just open jovian.ai, you can click new blank notebook, my practice notebook, and then create it. So that creates a new blank notebook for you. Run it and then just click run on binder. And that's going to run the notebook for you. So you take this notebook. This is the actual lesson notebook that you have. You can take it running on binder, or you can simply just look at the notebook that you have on the lesson page. Anything is fine. And then you take this other notebook, the notebook that you've just created and put it here. And as you read some code here, 
you want to start typing that same code on the side. If you've not written a lot of code in the past, if you feel that you're still a beginner in Python, a way to do it is simply copy code. What you can, what you can also do is, okay, my favorite color is blue. And then my favorite color is what we want to print out. Fine. Just try declaring a variable without looking at it. So my favorite color is blue. And then my favorite color, let's print it out. Okay. That turns out to be blue. Looks fine. Then we keep going and keep typing out every line of code pretty much. Yeah. So here we have strings. So we're looking at creating a string. So just type today equals Saturday and then type today and see that, okay, it comes out as Saturday. It seems like there's a way to add strings together. So just hide that from you and go in here and say name Derek greeting. Hello and name plus greeting. Is this how we join strings? Yeah, this seems like how we join strings. Okay. But there's a problem here. So what do we do? We fix it and we fix it. If you can just do this, take the code, which is already there in the notebook and then just type it out yourself. You will automatically start feeling more comfortable with Python. And then of course there are a lot of exercises as well. So for some of these exercises, you will have to look up documentation. For example, if you want to know how to reverse a string, it's perfectly all right to say reverse a string in Python. No problem there. This is how I find out how to reverse a string too. So yeah, there seems to be a question answer here. And it tells you that you can reverse a string like this. So you never know what you might find. Sometimes you'll find something really interesting about the language, even when you ask the most basic questions. Okay. So Google is your friend. The documentation is your friend. These are the official Python docs. It tells you a little bit about string. There's a lot of explanation. There is a whole bunch of methods and there is a whole bunch of uh, examples. Now, do you need to remember all of these methods? No, not at all. You don't need to remember a single one of them. What you need to be able to do is when you need to do something with a string, you should be able to find the right method. Let's say if you want to convert a string into a list, you can see that you can just Google it and find it. And when you find it, you should be able to understand and apply it. So programming is all about being able to achieve the result that you want. It's not about remembering syntax. It's not about uh, remembering all these methods. Now we've gone over all these methods simply to show you the power of what you can do with programs. You will start to see a lot of things come together next week. When we talk about conditions and loops and functions, we will start solving problems with Python. And by the way, at the end of each notebook, you will find these questions for revision. So this is a good way for you to just test your understanding. So there are about a hundred questions here. So you just go through these hundred questions and each question will take maybe a second or two. What is the variable in Python? Can you come up with a sentence to answer the question? Yes. Fine. Move on to the next question. And similarly, you have these questions for the other notebook as well. So do use these questions for revision. Some of these questions will also be very useful from an interview perspective, because in interviews, sometimes you may get asked things like this, that are strings in Python mutable or immutable? That's a real interview question you may get asked. And then you may get asked questions about floats and tuples and such things. So the first topic we will look at today is branching using conditional statements and loops in Python. So we will have a couple of topics here. We will talk about conditional statements, which is the if, elif, and else statements. And then we will talk about iteration or loops where we'll cover file loops and for loops. You've already seen how to run the code. You simply click the run button and select run on binder, but you also have the option to run it on your computer locally and you can follow these instructions. Again, we will cover it at a later point. So one of the most powerful features of programming languages is called branching. It is the ability to make decisions and execute a different set of statements based on whether one or more conditions are true. And branching in Python is implemented using the if statement. And this is what the syntax of the if statement looks like. So you say if, and then you write a condition and a condition can be a value. Uh, it can be a variable. It can be an expression. And we look at some examples. And then you put a colon. This is very important. 
you tend to forget this sometimes but it's very important to put in a colon and putting in a colon in python indicates that you're starting a new block of code then under it you have several statements and these statements are executed only if the condition holds true now one important bit here is the four spaces that you see here now if i count this one two three and four you need to give four spaces before any statement that you write here this is called indentation and python relies heavily on indentation which is white space before a statement to define code structure and this is what makes python code easy to read and understand because other languages typically use brackets or braces or parentheses but python uses indentation and that makes it very easy for you to quickly observe the structure of the code and see the hierarchy within the code and if you don't use indentation probably you will run into problems so what you want to do is you want to press the tab key so you type if condition and then Jupyter will automatically bring you to an indented state but if you're not in an indented state and you want to come to an indented state you press the tab key and then you can get to an indented state if you want to reduce the indentation of a statement you press shift tab so we look at an example here so let's see here an example of using the if statement so we have a variable a number and remember variables need to be a single word that's why we're using underscore in the variable name so we've set the value of a number to 34 great and now we're using it in a if statement so we're saying if a number and then we have this uh, this percentage symbol remember that this percentage symbol is also called the modulus so if you do 10 percentage 2 that is going to compute the remainder when 10 is divided by 2 and obviously because 10 is even that remainder will be 0 but if since 11 is odd that remainder is 1 so this is going to be a value either 0 or 1 now since a number in this case is 34 so 34 divided by 2 leaves no remainder so this this will have the value 0 and then we're taking that and comparing it with the value 0 so equal to equal to is a comparison operator and we're comparing it with 0 so 0 equals equals 0 returns true so the condition in the if statement is true and when the condition is true then this code gets executed you can see there are four spaces of indentation here now if this was not indented we would just press the tab character to indent it and once we run this you can see that the two statements got executed and we are able to here detect that the given number is even now we can see another example here now here we have another number this is has the value 33 in this case once again we have the exact same condition but 33 divided by 2 does leave a remainder the remainder is 1 which is not equal to 0 so when we try to print the given number is even that this statement does not print anything because this condition doesn't hold true so the block of code inside the if statement is never executed and that's pretty much it about if statements now we may want to print a different statement if the number is not even in this example for instance if the number is not even we may want to print that the number is odd and this can be done by extending the if statement using an else statement and this is how you write it so you have the if condition and then you have this indented block of code so a few lines of code that are all that all have the same indentation that that are all under this if condition is also referred to as a block so this is a block of code after the if block we can once again write else and under else we can write another block of code so if the condition evaluates to true then this code is executed and if the condition evaluates to false then this code is executed so that's simple enough so here we're setting a number equals 34 and we're checking if a number is even then we print that the given number is even else we print that the given number is odd and obviously in this case the number is even so this gets executed and this does not similarly here we have an odd number so this condition is no longer true 33 modulo 2 leaves the remainder 1 which is not equal to 0 so this does not get executed and that is when the else kicks in and the given number of odd gets executed now this condition doesn't just have to be an expression like this a mathematical or arithmetic expression 
it can even be something like this where we are checking if a candidate so for example a candidate has the value this d octagon and we're checking if a candidate in the three musketeers so in three musketeers is a tuple and you might know that in a tuple you can check membership like this so if you can check athos in the three musketeers and that prints true on the other hand if you change the name a little bit then it's going to print false so this is another expression that returns true or false so in this case a candidate is not part of the three musketeers so this is going to return false and this is the code that's going to get executed simple enough now there is another extension to if else which is not very common you may use it you may not use it sometimes but still good to know this is the elif statement so python provides an elif statement and elif is short for else if to chain a series of conditional blocks so let's look at an example to see how it works we have this value today set to wednesday and then we have this block of code so first we have an if statement and here we're comparing today to sunday okay seems reasonable this is going to evaluate to false and so this code is not going to get executed now if you have an elif statement here then when the statement evaluates to false only then the next statement will be tested the elif statement remember if this statement evaluates to true then this will be skipped and all of it will be skipped but since this is evaluated to false it's going to test this condition so here once again it's going to test today equals monday and that's not going to be true because the today is wednesday so this print statement will not be executed today doesn't match tuesday so this print statement this will not be executed today does match wednesday so that is when this statement will be executed and then the rest of the statements the rest of the elif and even an else statement if you had an else statement at the end that would get skipped as well so you can see that just one of these exactly one of these conditions in an if elif elif chain can get executed in this case that is this statement today is the day of odin the supreme deity so that's a if elif statement here's one more example and just for you to verify that exactly one condition can be executed so here's a number it has a value 15 now if we check 15 modulo 2 it's going to leave a reminder of 1 so this is going to return false and so this is not going to be executed so then this statement will get executed so here we are going to check if 15 modulo 3 0 which it is because 15 is divisible by 3 so this statement will get executed then we're checking if 15 modulo 5 is equal to 0 but this statement will never get executed because this condition has held true so in an if elif elif chain exactly one statement is executed and that's why you get back 15 is divisible by 3 and even though 15 is divisible by 5 even though this condition will hold true this condition is never executed now contrast that to using just a chain of if statements so here for example we have if a number divisible by 2 so once again a number has the value 15 so this condition holds false so then this is not executed now this at this point because it doesn't say elif is basically an independent statement so here there is no relationship between the if conditions there is no chain of conditions here so here what happens is irrespective of whether this condition is true or false this condition is tested irrespective of whether, whether this condition is true or false this condition is tested and irrespective of whether this is true or false this one is tested as well so that's why here you see that this condition and this condition both return true and here you see 15 is divisible by 3 and 15 is divisible by 5 as well it's a subtle thing and it's an obvious thing when you look at it in context but this is something that often trips people up when you're writing a chain of if elif statements just be sure about what you want do you want to check just one condition or do you want to check many conditions independently okay and then finally you can also chain if elif and else statements together so here for instance you have a number equals 49 so first we'll check if it is divisible by 2 
If it is, then we print something. Then we check if it is divisible by three using elif. Then we check if it is divisible by five using elif once again. And if none of the checks succeed, then we have an else statement at the end where we're printing all the checks failed and this number is divisible by two, three, five, none of these statements. So now we've seen how to use the if, else, and elif statements. And one interesting thing that Python gives you, and that's something very nice about Python, it makes it easier and easier for you to write code with so many great features. So one thing that Python gives you is that not all conditions have to necessarily be Booleans. In fact, a condition can be any value. And if you recall from the previous lesson, any value can be converted into a Boolean. So when you put something like this here, so if you say if empty string, and then you have something here and then something else here, what Python does is it automatically takes whatever has been passed into if and puts calls the bool function. So the bool function when called on the empty string, and you might recall this from the previous lesson, returns false. Or even let's say if the bool function is called on zero, it returns false. Or if it is called on an empty list, it returns false. On the other hand, if it's called on any non-empty value in any data type, it returns true. Okay. So that's a quick and easy way instead of having to say is a string empty or is or is the length of a list zero, etc. Et you can simply put it in here and that becomes an emptiness check. And you can see in this case, this statement was false. This condition was false. So we print the statement, this condition evaluated to false. Okay, so next we have another check here. This time we're checking the string hello. Hello, when we call the bool function on it and Python does it automatically for us the condition evaluates to true. And that's where we say this condition evaluated to true. Next up here, we have a dictionary. So don't be confused or don't get intimidated if you see code like this. Anything that comes after if, in your head you want to just wrap it around a bool. If it is empty, then it's going to be false. Otherwise, it's going to be true. So this is going to evaluate to true. And here's another example. If you just say if none, then none automatically gets converted to false. So the condition evaluates to false. So do use this trick whenever you need to. Instead of having to check for emptiness, you can simply put that value directly into an if statement. So next we're looking at nested conditional statements. Now this is where it starts to get interesting where you can take an if statement and then put another if statement inside it. And don't do too much of this. So nesting can make your code a little bit tricky to understand, but there are many cases where you cannot avoid it. So one or two levels of nesting is fine, but you don't want to do too much nesting. Okay. So here we have a number. It has the value 15. And first we're checking if the number is even. So we have an if statement here and it's going to check if the number is even. Now, if the number is in fact even, then all of this code is going to get executed. And by all of this code, I mean this print statement that the number is even, and then another statement here, which checks if the number is divisible by three. Okay, so now suppose the number was even, then we would check inside this condition if the number is also divisible by three, and then we are printing the number is also divisible by three. On the other hand, if the number is divisible by two, but it is not divisible by three, then we are going to enter the else loop here. And that's going to say print, uh, the number is not divisible by three. Okay. Now, if the number is not even, then none of this gets executed. Even this condition never gets evaluated because we're completely skipping this entire block of code altogether. You can see here that when we have an if statement inside a block, the if itself is indented and then the code inside the if is indented by one more block. Okay, so now this is not just four spaces, this is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight spaces. So if the condition doesn't hold through, a number divisible is not divisible by two, then we're going to enter the else and we're going to print that the number is odd. And then we are doing a check on the number being divisible by five. So here we check if a number is divisible by five. If it is, then we print that it is. Otherwise we print that it is not. Okay. So a number has the value 15. So we print that 15 is odd. And then we also print that 15 is divisible by five. Now 15 is also divisible by three, 
but it's just that we never get to evaluate this condition and that is why we never actually get to print 15 is also divisible by 3. Okay. And always remember when you're creating nested conditions, you want to indent by an extra four spaces, whatever is the content inside it. So as I've said, nested if else statements are often confusing to read and they are, they are prone to human error. So it's good to just avoid nesting wherever possible or limit the nesting to just one or two levels because it does get confusing after a while and you want your code to be clear and readable. Okay. Now there's one frequent use case of the if statement and that involves testing a condition and then setting a variable's value based on a condition. So for instance, here we have a number, it has the value 13. If the number is even, then we set the variable parity to the value even. Otherwise we set the variable parity to the value odd. And this is something that comes up again and again. Based on a condition, you set the value of a number. And here in this case, of course, because a number is odd, you set the value of parity to odd. Now, Because this is so common, Python provides a shorthand syntax which allows writing such conditions in a single line of code. And this is known as the conditional expression or it's sometimes also referred to as the ternary operator. And this is the syntax it has. So you say x and then you provide a value and then you say if and then you provide a condition and then you say else and then you provide another value. And this is all on a single line and there is no indentation, there is no colons here, this is all on a single line. So x true value if condition else false value. And it has the exact same behavior as this if else block. So if you were, if you were to say if condition and then you said x equals true value else x equals false value, that would have the exact same behavior as the single line of code. So let's try it out with parity. So we say parity equals even if a number divided by 2 equals 0 else odd okay and that's a single line check for even odd parity and that works exactly as it worked earlier so it's useful in certain cases whenever you're setting a value based on a condition this is what you want to use and if you don't remember it that's perfectly fine just use this no problem now the conditional expression that we just looked at, which is variable equals true value if condition else false value. This highlights an important distinction between statements and expressions in Python. A statement is any instruction that can be executed and every line of code that we have written so far, every line of code that we have executed is a statement. For example, assigning a variable is a statement, calling a function is a statement, Conditional statements using if and else and elif are also statements. For loops and while loops, they're also statements. So pretty much everything that we've written so far is a statement. Now an expression on the other hand is some code that evaluates to a value. So this is a very important distinction here. And examples include values of different data types. So let's look at some examples here. So for example, if you type one, now that's an expression. And of course, that's also a statement. Any expression in most cases is also a statement. But if you were to say x equals 1, now this is a statement, but this entire thing is not an expression. An expression is simply this portion of it, right? So an expression is some code that evaluates to a value. And they can be either values of data types, they can be results of arithmetic operations like 1 plus 2, they can involve conditions. So 1 plus 2 equals equals 3. They can involve variables. So 1 plus 2 equals equals y. They can involve function calls. So let's say if you had the sum of a list, that would also be an expression. So anything that you can store in a variable is an expression. And that's kind of the rule of thumb here. Anything that can appear on the right side of the assignment operator is an expression. Now, that's where you can check that the if statement that we have learned right now is not an expression. If you try to write something like this, if you say result equals if a number divided by 2 equals 0, even, else, odd, that is not going to execute. This is going to throw an invalid syntax error because the if statement is not an expression. On the other hand, when you use the conditional expression, 
so where you provide a value and then say if a condition and else value in this case it is an expression so just experiment with this what you want to do is just look at these rules so we have defined statements and expressions here and try to write some code okay so something you can do in jupyter all you need to do is click on the left side of a cell and press the a button or the b button to add new cells and then type in some code and run it okay all right now one other thing that we'll cover talking about conditions now when you write an if statement an if statement cannot be empty for instance here we have an if statement where we are checking if a number is divisible by 2 and suppose we don't want to do anything if it is divisible by 2 we 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 just want to skip ahead but if it is not divisible by 2 then we want to divide it by 3 and then we want to print something like the number is divisible by 3 but not divisible by 2 right so since this is an elif a number div being divisible by 3 is executed only if a number is not already divisible by 2 this is something reasonable you might want to do but this is going to throw an error because whenever you create an if statement python expects to see an indented block and you can see that's why it's saying there's an indentation error it expected to see an indented block so if you don't want to do something inside an if statement just use the pass statement so this is a pass is a statement it's not a value it's a statement which basically tells python do nothing okay now here's one use case of pass where you want to check ensure that the first condition is false and only then ensure that the second condition is true but another use case is when you've not yet decided what you want to write let's say you're writing a bun bunch of if else elif else conditions and you've not decided what you want to write for the if you want to think about that code later just put in a pass there and then continue writing and then maybe also execute it and test it out with one of the elif conditions and then you decide what to do here so that's one other use case for it and finally if you just want to leave your if condition empty you can absolutely do that using pass so here we are able to test now that 9 is not divisible by 2 but is divisible by 3 and that's the if statement one other thing I can I just want to quickly mention is that you can also chain conditional expressions so if you, you can check that a number is divisible by, by, by 2 and a number is also divisible by 5 so you can use the and the logical operators to combine conditions within an if statement just as we've done in the previous lesson okay so with that we've talked about branching in python if elif else we have the conditional if expression and then we have the pass statement as well so I'm just going to save my work here. So I'm going to import the Jovian library. So we say import Jovian. This is going to import the Jovian library and we'll talk about libraries and modules. And then we say jovian.commit. So the commit statement, when you execute it, it's going to capture a snapshot of this notebook, which is running on binder. And it's going to put it on your Jovian profile. One other powerful feature of programming languages, which is closely related to branching, is the ability to run one or more statements multiple times. And this feature is often called iteration or looping. And there are two ways to do it in Python. So you have the while loop and then you have the for loop. Now this is what a while loop looks like. So you, if you have you say while, just like you say if, you say while, and then you say condition, and then you have a colon, just like the if statement, and then you have a block of statements. So you can have a single statement or you can have multiple statements. And in the while loop, the code under, a co under the while loop is executed repeatedly as long as the condition evaluates to true, this condition, okay? Now, if a condition is true, you may wonder then, won't the con code get, keep getting executed forever? And that's where what we generally do is one of the statements inside the while loop will keep making changes to some variable which will cause that condition to eventually evaluate to false after a certain number of iterations. Okay, and let's see an example of that. So let's try to calculate the factorial of 100 
using a while loop. Now the factorial of a number n is simply the product of all the numbers from 1 to n. So the factorial of 5 for example is 1 multiplied by 2 multiplied by 3 multiplied by 4 multiplied by 5 and so on. Similarly for um, factorial for 100, the factorial of 100 is all the numbers from 1 to 100 multiplied with each other. Now how would you do this? How would you calculate the factorial of 100 in Python? So first we have, we are going to track the result in this variable called result. So we're just going to say result equals one. Then we are going to create a value i and i is a very commonly used variable name in Python. It is used to indicate an index or a number that is going to be incremented or changed one by one. So, uh, but as such, you can call it anything you want. This could be x, this could be n, but i is a very common choice here. So we have a variable i set to one. Then we say while i is less than or equal to 100. Now obviously i has the value 1, so 1 is less than or equal to 100, so this returns true. So then we say that the result is result multiplied by i. So since i has the value 1 and result has the value 1, we say we get 1 multiplied by 1 is 1. So result still has the value 1. And then we do something very interesting, we say i equals i plus 1. So i which had the value 1 now gets the value 1 plus 1, 2. So at the end of the first loop or the first time this code is executed, i now has the value 2 and result has the value 1. Then we check is i less than or equal to 100. So 2 is less than or equal to 100. So this is still true. But you can see that slowly as i increases at one point this will become false, right? But yeah, but it is still true with the value 2. So then we say result equals result multiplied by i. Now result has the value 1 so far, we multiply that with 2, so now result becomes 2. Okay, so, so result has now changed. And then i becomes i plus 1 which is 3. Then we go back, we test this condition, it turns out to be true. We say result equals result multiplied by i which is 2 times 3. And then i becomes 4. And then we result becomes 2 times 3 times 4 and i becomes 5 and so on. And you keep doing this over and over, at one point i becomes 101 at that point this condition no longer holds true so when this condition no longer holds true we break out of the loop or we exit the loop or we uh, the loop completes these are all different ways of saying it and then the function and then the program execution proceeds normally right so at this place while the condition is true the program keeps going back up and up and down up and down and finally the condition becomes false and then we can print it out. So by this point, if you've followed things properly, then result will have the value one multiplied by two multiplied by three all the way multiplied by hundred. And this is the factorial of hundred. Okay. So this is a pretty huge number. I am not sure if you can even count the number of digits here. But I hope you, you can see here now if you had to calculate the factorial of hundred by hand or even just type out 1 multiplied by 2 all the way multiplied up to 100 it would take you a significant amount of time but using iteration using a while loop in just three lines of code we were able to compute this massive number right and this is what gives computers a massive advantage over human beings because they can perform thousands or even millions of repetitive operations very fast and with just four or five lines of code, we were able to multiply 100 numbers instantly. And you can actually do a lot more. You can do probably a million computations a second. In fact, there is one way to see how long some code takes to execute. So in Jupyter, at the top of any cell, you can include the statement percentage, percentage, time. And then write some code. And what that's going to do is that's going to tell you how long this code took to execute. So let's say we are calculating the factorial of not 100 but 1000. And you can see that this is the factorial of 1000. It's a page full of numbers. And that took just 981 microseconds. Now a microsecond is 1000th of a millisecond or 10 to the minus 6 seconds. So you could do almost a million of these calculations which is so huge. Now here's another example and this uses uh, yeah, so you can try changing this. You can try changing this to 10,000, try changing this to million and see at what point it's going to become too slow for the computer to compute. Okay. 
Now here's another example of a while loop and I let you study this on your own during the study hours. So here what we're doing is we've written a couple of while loops and together they create this pattern. Now your task is to look through this code and understand what's happening here. Feel free to create new cells and experiment with it. And then try to modify the code to create some other pattern. So here you have this arrow pointing towards the right. Try to create an arrow pointing towards the left or try to create this kind of a diamond shape. It's a good exercise to try out, a good exercise on loops. Now this statement that you see here, this percentage percentage time statement, there's a question about it. This is called a magic command in Jupyter. So this is not valid Python code. So if you write it in a Python script, this is not going to work. But Jupyter understands it as a directive that it should be keeping track of the time spent for this computation. Okay, now we've seen an example where the condition became false in a while loop after a certain time, but suppose a condition in a while loop always holds true. So in that case, Python is going to repeatedly execute the code within the loop forever and the execution of the code never completes. So here's an example. And sometimes it may happen because you have, you've forgotten to write some code inside your block that will eventually make the condition fall. Sometimes it could be just oversight. Sometimes it may not be, you may not be able to tell what, what maybe some Im improper input came into your function and or into your function or into your program and that led to this situation. But this is what ultimately it will look like. So here we have result so equal to one and i equal to one. And we're checking while i less than equal to 100, then we set result equal to result times i and then we forget to increment i. And that's just going to keep running this code over and over and over and over again. And this will need to be interrupted. Now there are a couple of ways to interrupt the code. One is to use this interrupt or stop button that you see. And if you don't do this, the code will keep executing. Sometimes your computer will run out of memory and then the kernel will shut down and a bunch of things will happen. But when you, whenever you see something that is stuck in an infinite loop, just click the interrupt button and that will interrupt the execution for you. And then here's another example. So here, once again, we have result and i equal to one initially. And here we have the wrong condition. So instead of checking i less than equals 100, we have i greater than zero. Once again, this will take forever because this condition is never going to become false. This condition is always going to be true as we keep incrementing i. So another way to interrupt this is to go to kernel and then click on interrupt. And that's going to interrupt the kernel for you. So that's called an infinite loop. And normally you don't want an infinite loop in your in your code, you want to have conditions that terminate. Now there are a couple more things that you want to know about loops, the, which are the break and continue statements. Now you can use a break statement inside the loops body to immediately stop the execution and break out of the loop, even if the condition that is provided to while still holds true. So for example, here we have i equals one, result equals one. Now while i is less than equal to 100, we multiply i with the result and this result star equals i is the same as saying result equals result star i. It's the exact same thing. And then we also check if i is 42. And if i is 42 and 42 is the magic number and we're saying we're, we've reached the magic number and we want to stop the execution of this loop. So we write the statement break. So the moment we write break, for whatever reason inside a loop and that break statement gets executed, Python is going to skip out of that loop and then start continuing with the next steps. In fact, it is even going to ignore this statement, right? It's going to immediately end the execution of the loop and ignore this. So if I has the value 42, this will not get executed. So I will still have the value 42. We will not come back to the while loop. So result will have the value of 42 factorial probably and then we'll print the i and the result. So you can see here that i has the value 42, not even 43. And the result is this, which is, you can verify this, this is 42 factorial.
okay so that's the break statement now sometimes you may not want to end the loop entirely but simply skip any remaining statements in the loop and then continue on to the next loop so you can do that using the continue statement so here once again we have i in result set to 1 and while i is less than 20 we are saying well we are first incrementing i so we make i i plus 1 so i will immediately get the value 2 because we start out with 1 and then we check if i is even so if i is even then we are skipping we are going to skip or we are just printing skipping here and we are calling continue now the moment continue gets executed this statement is skipped and anything below it is also skipped so anything below the continue is skipped within the loop and then we go back to the top so we skip multiplying with we skip result equals result star i and then we go back at the top then we check once again now this time i is odd so this condition does not hold true so this code does not get executed so then this code does get executed so continue means skip the rest of the statements in the current iteration and then go back to the top of the iteration and continue. So let's check it out here. So once we run this, you can see that we skip two because two is even, we multiply with three, we skip four because four is even, we multiply with five and so on. So this code, the result here is we multiply all the odd numbers below 20 together and that gives us this value. And one thing that you will notice here is we've added a bunch of print statements inside our branches. Now, when you are, when you write some code and there's a good chance that you, the code that you write could have some issues. Even today, when I write any code, I always make a lot of mistakes. And you want to figure out if there are any issues in the code. One good way to do that is simply to put in print statements, right? So we've put in a print statement skipping I even though we didn't have to for our result it doesn't matter for getting the final result and we've put in the print statement multiplying with i again we didn't have to this multiplication is going to happen but this gives us this information we can now look inside what's happening we can look at what's happening inside the execution of the code okay and especially with loops and branches it can get difficult to reason about it keep all that information in your head so whenever you want to understand what's happening in some code, just add a bunch of print statements. And this technique is called logging. And logging, you know, as, as our programs get large, they naturally become prone to human errors. And login can help in verifying if the program is working as expected. And in many cases, when we write functions or when we write some code, we graciously put in a whole bunch of print statements just so that when the code is executed for the first time, we can make sure that all of it works properly. And then we remove them later or we comment them out or something. And sometimes we even just leave them in. Now there are libraries, specific libraries that help you do logging, but I personally just find print statements the most helpful just because they're so easy to put in anywhere. You don't have to think about it. There's no setup required. Just, just add a print statement and rerun your code and that will help you figure out any issues. Next up, we're looking at iteration with for loops. Now, a for loop is used for iterating or looping over sequences. And sequences are things like lists, tuples, dictionaries, strings, and ranges. Anything that has multiple values inside it in a certain set, in any order, can is considered a sequence. And for loops have the following syntax. You say for value in sequence, and then you have a whole bunch of statements. So now this is no longer a condition. Now this is a part of the for syntax. This in is not a check whether you're not checking if a certain value is present in a sequence. So this is how you use a for statement. So for instance, we have days, which is a list and Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, the weekdays. And we're saying for day in days. Now notice that this variable day has not been declared yet. And that's very important because day is a variable that will get declared inside the for loop automatically for you when you say for day in days and each time in each iteration of the loop day will get one of the values so first day will have the value monday and then day will have the value tuesday and then day will have the value wednesday then day will have the value thursday and friday and that's where you can see 
all of this information gets printed okay so we are creating a variable here using each value in the container so that's your for loop now let's try for loops with another data type here we have a string so we say for care in monday and we can call this anything we want we can call this cx whatever so this is going to go over each character in the string and that's going to print the character m o n d a y and then here we have a tuple so let's make this a tuple this is a list here right now there you go that's a tuple so for fruit and apple banana guava we say here's a fruit and then we add the value of fruit there so here's a fruit apple here's a fruit banana here's a fruit guava here's another example where we loop over a dictionary so we say for key in person now this is very interesting about a dictionary when you try to loop over a dictionary using the for loop then you get back the keys so you get back each key so first key is going to have the value name and then key is going to have the value sex and then key is going to have the value age and then key is going to have the value married okay and what you can do is if you want to access the value then you can access it like this so initially key is going to have the value name so person and then you have the indexing notation and then you pass the key as the index so the key has the value name so person name is john doe and hence that is going to be the value here right so you can see when we run this we get the key name first and it has the value john doe we get the key sex it has the value male the key age has the value 32 and so on now in python dictionary starting in 3.8 i believe you get back keys in the order that they were inserted so this is not alphabetical as you can clearly see you get them back in the order that they were inserted but before python 3.8 there was no guarantee so you could get keys in any order because internally python dictionaries use something called a hash table where there is no sense of order for the data Now if you want to directly access the values one way to do it is to call dot values on the person on the key and on, on the dictionary and that's going to just give you a list like object of values and then you can check each value inside person dot values and you can see that here we have just printed the values and if you want to directly work with key value pairs then you can also just get key value pairs out of the data so if you say person dot items then each key value pair is going to become a tuple so you when you print it you see that each key value pair is a tuple and when you do get tuples in for so when you're saying for something and something and then this thing contains a whole bunch of tuples you can destructure the tuples what that means is you can take the different parts of the tuple and put it into different variables so you can say for key comma value in person dot items so what this is saying is that person dot items contains a whole bunch of tuples when you get a tuple from person dot items you grab the key from it as the first element of the tuple you grab the value from it as the second element of the tuple and then you can print out key with the value key and value with the value value and there you go you have the, all the data of the dictionary accessed as key value pairs Now there are a couple more data structures that you can there are a couple more data structures that you can uh, use for iterating over uh, for iterating over using for so one is the range function and then the range function the range function is used to create a sequence of numbers that can be iterated over using a for loop so let's see let's first try to create just a range so we say if you say range and let's say one way to do it is just to say range 10 and that internally contains the numbers from 0 to 10 now it does not create a list of numbers in fact what it does is it, it simply keeps a pointer it keeps a pointer at 0 and it knows that it needs to stop at 10 and it is meant to be used inside a for loop so what it does is if you say for i in range 7 it's going to start a pointer at 0 and it's going to keep increasing that pointer to 1 and 2 and 3 and 4 and 5 and 6 but not 7 right so when you create range n 
you get a sequence of numbers from 0 to n minus 1. Very important. Always causes a lot of confusion. So we say for i in range 7, so that's going to print 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. Okay. Now why do we use ranges? Because ranges are memory efficient. If you were to create a list of the numbers from 0 to 7, that would take up 7 memory spaces. But a range internally just uses one variable and then as you use it in a for loop, it keeps incrementing that variable from the minimum value to the maximum value. Now ranges can also apply, uh, use, can ranges can also accept a starting position. So you can start with 3 for instance and you can go from 3 all the way up to 9 which is 10 minus 1, right? Again, the last position is not included but the first is. So here you get 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. Here you have a starting, you have an ending and then you also have a step. Now here when we say print, it's going to start with 3, then it's going to add 4, then it's going to keep adding 4 one by one and keep returning the number till the number becomes equal to or greater than 14. Okay, So we have 3 and then we have 3 plus 4 7 and then we have 3 plus 4 uh, 7 plus, uh, we have 7 plus 4 11 and then we exit because 11 plus 3 is 14 and 14 is the upper end of the range so we exit. Even if it was 13 you would get the same result but if this was 15 you would also see oh sorry 15 also works if, if this was 16 you would see the value 15 here 11 plus 4 is 15 not 14. Now ranges are used for iterating over lists when you need to track the index of elements. So here we have a list, it has values Monday to Friday. And first what we do is we create len a list. So if a list has the value Monday to Friday, you will know that the len of a list is going to be 5 as you might expect. So what we are really putting in here is we are putting in the value range 5. So for i in range 5, so i is going to take the value 0, 1, 2, 3, 4 and then we are saying the value at position i is a list of i. So a list of 0 initially will be Monday and then Tuesday and Thursday and Friday. So I'm just going to revert this and it's going to print the value at position 0 is Monday, the value at position 1 is 1, 2 is two, uh, two, 1 is Tuesday, 2 is Wednesday and so on. So whenever you want to iterate over a list, but apart from getting the elements, you also want to keep track of an index, a number, that's when you can use a range. Now another way to achieve the same result is by using the enumerate function. So here you have this function called enumerate and you can pass in a list into enumerate and that's going to give you two things. So it's going to give you i and a val. And you can see what those two things are. So I will take the values 0, 1, 2, 3, 4 and Mon uh, Val will take the values Monday through Friday. Okay, so I'll let you figure out, I'll let you learn more about what enumerate does. You can use the help function, you can, so you can say help enumerate or you can also use this question mark to ask Jupyter to tell you what enumerate does or you can also look it up online. But do try it out or sometime during the study hours. Now within a for loop, just like a while loop, you can have break, continue and pass statements. So here for example, we have this same for loop which goes over day in weekday. So we are checking all the weekdays here and uh, we just print today is such and such. But the moment we encounter Wednesday, we just print I don't work beyond Wednesday and then we say break. Now if you say break here then that's going to break out of the for loop and it's not going to execute Thursday and Friday. Okay, So I hope you're starting to see the utility of break especially with for because there's no way you can exclude Thursday and Friday while iterating over weekdays but you can check inside the for loop and then you can break out of the loop so then the loop does never gets executed for Thursday and Friday. Here we have another example. Now here what we're doing is we are saying for day in weekdays, if the day equals Wednesday, 
then we just print i don't work on wednesday and then we continue so when we continue then the rest of the statements which is this print statement does not get executed so we just get we don't get an output for wednesday so you can see here we have today is wednesday uh, today is monday uh, today is tuesday and on monday we print i don't work on wednesday on tuesday on wednesday we print i don't work on wednesday and then we print thursday and friday as expected and finally if you don't want to put anything inside a for loop if you don't if you want to just skip you can say for day in weekdays and then just mention pass and we it's simply going to run over all the days but it's not going to do anything with them so ultimately this does nothing again you may not ever need this or sometimes if you just want to write some code and later on so you can just put in a pass right now and fit, fit the code later because this code is going to give an error okay then just like so just like if conditions you can also nest loops so you can have loops within loops so here for example we have a list of persons so we have a list of dictionaries so first we say for person and person so this for loop is going to grab each dictionary so the first person is going to be this and then person will have the value this and then person will have another value if there are more values so for person and person and then each person is a dictionary so we're saying for key in person so then for name in person and then for sex in person so first key is going to have the value name and then key is going to have the value sex and by the way this doesn't have to be called key this can be called x and you can call this x as well you can call this x right so key is not a special variable or anything you can call this whatever you want or you can call it k so that's another common term that is used but yeah so for k in persons and k will take the values name and sex we are printing k and then we are printing person of k so person is this dictionary so person of k is going to either be john or mail for the first person on for the second person it's going to be jane or female so there you see we have name john sex male and then once this inner for loop ends we are printing an empty line and then we once again print name jane for the second person and then we print sex female and then we print another empty line so that's how in you nest for and while loops once again you do not want to nest them too much here's an another example so for day in days and for fruit in fruits that prints all possible combination of days and fruits right so because day is first going to take the value monday and fruits is going to take the values apple banana guava so when day is monday you will once go over apple so you that prints monday apple then you will once go over banana and that prints monday banana and you will once go over guava and that prints monday guava and then you have tuesday apple tuesday banana tuesday guava and so on the next topic we're looking at is writing reusable code using functions in python and this is what roughly a function looks like in python there's a whole bunch of things going on here and you have all of this all these are all the different parts of the function the function name arguments optional arguments local variables return values error handling documentation so we'll go over all of this and we will look at it by solving a problem in fact a very practical problem something that you may end up doing in one form or another as a data analyst potentially so we've seen how to run the code we are running it already but you can run it on your own computer as well okay now we've seen a few functions already python contains many inbuilt functions like print and len that we've seen but now we're going to start creating functions now before we create functions we need to understand what a function is and a function is simply a reusable set of instructions that takes one or more inputs performs some operations and often returns an output okay now here's the print function that we've already come across when we say 
print today is comma Saturday. So we are passing in two arguments into print. The first argument is today is and then the second argument is today which is has the value Saturday and print is going to display those arguments on the screen. A very simple but useful function. And the way to define your own function is using the def keyword. So we say def and that indicates to Python that now we are defining a function. So remember this is, you're just setting up or defining a function and your function is called say hello. So you say say hello, that's the name of the function. Then you have these brackets, so you open and close. So you have these parentheses, very important, don't miss them, otherwise your function will not be defined. And then you have a colon. Now colon just like the branching or conditional statements indicates that you're going to start a block of code now then inside you have an indented block of code and that indented block of code is called the body of the function. So let's run this and when you run this you will notice that these print statements did not get executed and the reason for that is because we've just defined them, we've told Python that these are statements that will get executed when I try to invoke this function. So how do you invoke this function? Well to invoke the function you simply call the type the function name and then you have these parentheses. So this is important. Without this, the function will not get invoked. Python will simply tell you that say hello is a function. But when you put in these parentheses, there you go. Now it says, hello there, how are you? The two print statements are executed. Now every time you want to say hello there, how are you? You can just call the say hello function and not have to type all this code over again. Or you can put it in a while loop and say hello a hundred times. Right. So you see how these are all orthogonal concepts um, of iteration, branching and functions which you can all combine together as we will do. Now a function can accept zero or more values as inputs. Our say hello function did not have any inputs but we can have a function with inputs and inputs are often also known as arguments or parameters. So you will see all of these names being used interchangeably. There are certain technical differences in this terminology but we will just use them interchangeably so don't worry about it too much. And arguments help us write flexible functions that can perform the same operation on different types of values. So that's one part of it and then another thing that functions can do is return a result. So functions can return a result that can be stored in a variable or used inside other expressions. So here's a function and this function is called filter even. So that's the name of the function. That's how we're defining it. Then this time what we've done is inside the parenthesis, we've mentioned that it's going to accept an argument. It, and the argument it's going to accept is called number list. Now notice that there is no variable that we've created which has the name number list already, right? So this is in some sense, it, we are defining a variable here. We are saying that the first input that is passed into the function inside the body of the function, we will refer to it as number list, right? So we're kind of defining a variable here. Then inside the body of the function, we create an empty list. So we create an empty list result list. So you can do a variable declaration inside a body of a function. Any code that you can write outside the body of a function, you can write uh, inside the body as well. And then here we have a for loop. So we are now saying for number in number list. So remember number list, is something that will be passed in into our function and you can see an example usage here. We are saying filter even and then we are passing in a list of numbers, right? And that list of numbers will become number list. So for number in number list, so if number list is a list of numbers, we are going to get back an each a number each time. Then we are checking using an if condition if the number is divisible by two. So if the number modulo two or modulus two equals zero, if it does, then inside the result list, we are going to append the number. And finally, using this special keyword called return, we are going to return the result list as the result or the return value of this function. Okay, so there's a lot going on here. And what you can do is just uh, take it apart a little bit, maybe you know, remove the for loop entirely and just try to return result list and see what happens. Then introduce the for loop and keep it empty, then introduce the if loop, etc. So please feel free to use Jupyter. But what we're doing is taking a list of numbers, which will be passed in as input, creating a new list, getting each number out of the list of numbers, 
checking if it is even and if it is even we append it to this result list and finally we return the result list as the return value of the function okay and with that we have defined the filter even function next we take the filter even function and we invoke it on this list one two three four five six seven and the result that we get back we are going to store that in even list and then if you check even list well that even list has the values two four and six okay so just to quickly go over how the execution will happen number list will be this list of numbers we are going to grab the first number one and so number will have the value one and one is not divisible by two so this statement will will not get executed then number will have the value two two is divisible by two so we are saying result two dot append number so this will now get the value two inside it three will not match this condition so three will not be appended four will match the condition so four will be appended five will not not match the condition and so on so ultimately we will end up with just the even numbers and then since we are returning result list even list will now have the value two four six okay so that's a function for you now as a programmer you will spend most of your time writing and using functions probably 98 99 percent of your time you should always be writing or thinking about writing functions python offers many features to make your functions powerful and flexible and we're going to explore some of these by solving a sample problem so here's the problem we solve radha is planning to buy a house and the house costs 1.26 million dollars okay and she is considering two options to finance her purchase now that's a lot of money she may not have all of it up front so the first option she is considering is to make an immediate down payment of $300,000 yeah so you pay some amount you pay $300,000 right now and then take a loan so a take out an 8 year loan so you have a loan which is going has to be returned after eight years and the loan will be for whatever is the remaining amount and with an interest rate of 10 percent so every loan that you take it has an annual interest rate 10 percent per annum for example let's just say per annum here just to be super clear and then there's also compound interest involved so the loan gets compounded monthly so she so she can take the loan for the remaining amount and return it over eight years and it has the interest rate of 10 percent per annum compounded monthly the other option she has is to take a 10-year loan with an interest rate of eight percent for the entire amount okay so eight year loan 10 percent per annum 10 year loan eight percent and then one also has a down payment now both of these loans have to be paid back in equal monthly installments or also known as emis so which loan has a lower emi among the two now this is a kind of decision that you will probably face at some point in your life where you will have to decide if you want to take a loan how much the loan should be what interest rate are you okay with so let's see if we can use python to help radha decide whether option two or option one would have a lower emi so all she's interested in right now is how much she pays every month and she wants to minimize the amount she's paying every month okay so that's our problem we'll talk about this term compounded monthly this can seem confusing we'll talk about what that means okay so now since we need to compare emis for two loan options this would be a good opportunity for us to define a function to calculate the emi for a loan and the input to the function would be the cost of the house so in this case it's 1.26 million the down payment the down payment if there is one the duration of the loan and the rate of interest etc etc okay and we'll build this function step by step and this is what you want to do always whenever you are faced with a with a problem like this and i'm sure you're looking at this problem and thinking okay how am i going to write code for this you just want to build it out step by step very very slowly pick the simplest thing and go forward with it okay so first of all let's write a very simple function that calculates the equal monthly installment on the entire cost of the house so the, we take the entire cost of the house no down payment and we also assume that the loan must be paid back in one year and there is no interest as well so no interest no down payment one year loan very simple 
So let's say we're, we're defining a function called loan EMI and the loan EMI takes the amount and the amount would be the just the cost of the house and the EMI, well, the, the loan has to be returned in 12 months and there is no interest on the loan. So the EMI would simply be the total amount divided by 12. So if you've borrowed 1.26 million, so you just pay back 1 12th of 1.26 million every month. And that tells you that your EMI is going to be $105,000. Okay, simple. So we've just set up a function here. This is not our final solution, but now we've defined a function. Great. Next up, let us involve, let's still assume that there is no interest, but let us involve a duration for the loan. So instead of having just a one year loan that has to be paid back in 12 months in monthly installments, let's assume that we also pass in the duration of the loan into the loan EMI function. So now, and the duration is in months. So if it is a two year loan, the duration would be two into 12, 24 months. If it is a three year loan, the duration would be 36 months and so on. So now what we can do is inside the loan EMI function, we have EMI equals amount divided by duration. So we are creating a variable inside the loan EMI function. Okay, now you have the amount, there's no interest yet. So we simply divide the amount by the duration, which is the number of months. And that's going to tell you the amount you need to pay back every month. Okay, so that's the loan EMI function. And we'll test it out in just a second. But notice that this EMI that we have defined here, this EMI variable, it is not accessible outside. So if you just say EMI, you see Python says there's a name error. The name EMI is not defined. Similarly, even the parameters amount and duration, neither have they been defined before, nor will they be available outside the body of the function. You can say that the name Python, the name amount or the name duration is not defined. So what's happening here? These are local variables which lie within the scope of the function and scope refers to the region within the code where a particular variable is visible. Now this EMI is only visible inside this function. So we say that the EMI is a local variable in the scope of the function. So variables that are available, available everywhere, for example, the print, it is available inside loan EMI, it is available outside loan EMI or even loan EMI itself. Loan EMI is also going to be available outside because we are going to use loan EMI later. And then we can also use loan EMI inside the inside a function itself. So variables that are available everywhere that you can access anywhere are called global variables and variables that are only available inside a restricted context or a restricted scope are called local variables. And scope rules allow you to use the same variable names in different function without sharing values from one or the other. Right, so what happens now is if you have a loan EMI function and you have an EMI defined here, and then you have another different loan EMI function, it, it also defines a variable EMI. The value of EMI that you set here will not go in inside that function, right? Both of these are separate variables. It's like each function has its own bag of variables that it's dealing with, and it never shows them to anybody outside, it never shares any values as well, right? So the only way to communicate with a function is to pass in some information and then get a return value out of it. Okay, so now we have the loan EMI function and now we can call it with the loan amount, which is a $1.26 million loan. And remember the two options, there is an option of a six year loan. Let's see once again, there is an option of a eight year loan and a 10 year loan, right? Okay. So let's say if we want to compare a eight year loan and a 10 year loan, this should say eight. Let me just change that to eight. Yeah. So if you want to compare a eight year loan versus a 10 year loan, still assuming no down payment or no interest, we can call loan EMI with the amount, which is 1.26 million. And then once we get eight times 12, so that's 100 and uh, that's $13,000 per month. So if you have an eight year loan for the entire amount, you pay $13,000 per month. And if you have a 10 year loan for the entire amount, you pay $10,000, $10,500 per month, right? As you might expect, you pay a lower EMI on the 10 year loan because you have more time to repay the loan, right? And still no interest or down payment. 
Great, so we are starting to get somewhere. We've used the loan EMI function twice to calculate the EMI. Now if we just keep improving the loan EMI function step by step, I think that we'll, we'll get to a good place. But still recall that inside our loan EMI function, we are still printing out the EMI, that the EMI is such and such. Now instead of printing out the EMI, and the loan for the, the, the eight year loan e, loans EMI is higher than the 10 year loan EMI. Now we may want a way to compare them, right? Now, right now we're just printing out the results. So there's no way we can compare the two values. So it would be better to return it and then store the results in variables for easier comparison. So instead of printing out the EMI, we are going to return the EMI here. We just say return EMI. And now when we call loan EMI, once again, for the eight year loan, the value that was calculated in EMI gets returned and that can then be stored in the EMI one function. And similarly for the 10 year loan, we compute the EMI and then that is stored in the EMI two function. And you can see EMI one has the value one, three, one, two, five, and EMI two has the value one, zero, five, double, zero. And now we can even compare them. If you want to check which one is greater, we can just check if EMI one is greater than EMI two and it's going to tell you true, which means the eight year loan has a greater EMI with the current assumptions. Next, let's add another argument. And this time we will account for the immediate down payment. Now remember one of the loans has a down payment. I, th I guess uh, one of the loans has a down payment of uh, $300,000, which is the eight year loan. So we will make, but the other, other loan does not. So we will make down payment an optional argument because not both of the loans do not have uh, require this argument, right? So Python allows you to create an optional argument. So the way to create an optional argument is to simply provide a default value. So you say amount duration, the two required arguments, the, because these are always have to be provided. And then you say down payment. And the only thing that we're doing to make it optional is putting in an equal to and giving it a default value. Now I'm giving it the default value zero. Assuming that if you do not pass a value for down payment, then that means the down payment is zero, but this can be anything that you want it to be. And the default value is something that you have to think about when you are creating the function. So now first, what we do is we calculate the loan amount, which is the amount, the price of the house minus the down payment that gives you the loan amount. So that's a local variable. Then you divide the loan amount by the duration and that gives you the EMI, the equal monthly installment. And there you go. So now we have a loan EMI for EMI one. So EMI one now becomes 10,000. So this time we have 1.26 million as the amount. The duration is eight into 12. That's 96 months. And then three E five is basically three followed by five zeros. So three into 10 to the power of five, which is one, two, three, four, five. Okay. So 10,000 is the loan amount here. And for the 10 year loan, there was no down payment. So for the 10 year loan, it is simply uh, 1.26 million and the 10 month and the 10 times 12, 120 months. So now we have 10,000 for the eight year loan and 10,500 for the 10 year loan. Okay, great. Now we're almost done. The next, the only thing that we now need to add is the interest calculation into the function. And this is where I'm going to cheat a little bit because this is not a, a tutorial on compound interest. So, what we're going to do is we're going to use the formula which is used to compute the EMI for a loan. Okay. So if you're given a rate of interest and both of these loans have a rate of interest, I believe one has a rate of interest of 10%, uh, the eight year loan with the down payment, the eight year loan with the down payment of 300,000 has a rate of interest of 10% and the 10 year loan with the down payment with no down payment has a rate of interest of 8% I believe. Is that it? Yeah, 8%. Okay. So when you have the uh, loan amount, so or also called the principal, and you have the total number of months, the total number of periods for during which the loan has to be repaid. And finally, when you have a rate of interest per month, then this is how you compute the EMI. So it's the principal multiplied by the rate R multiplied by one plus R to the power of N divided by, so N is again the number of months, the number of periods. Then you have one plus R 
to the power f uh, divided by 1 plus r to the power of n minus 1. That's the formula for EMI. So let's see if we can incorporate that formula into our function. And by the way, this formula assumes monthly compounding. Now what's monthly compounding? Not to get too technical about it, but basically the idea is, let's say your rate of interest is 10% per annum. So if you took your loan out in January, at the end of January, the interest for that month will be computed. Now if your rate of interest is 10% per annum, what you need in this formula is the rate of interest per month. So 10% divided by 12 is the rate of interest for that month. So the 10% by 12, that is the rate of interest for the month, that will be used to calculate the interest for the month. And then the interest for the month will get added. And in February, you will be charged interest not just on the principal amount, the loan that you took out, but also on the interest of January. And that's the meaning of monthly compounding. Again, if that doesn't make sense, don't worry about it. But all that we need to know is we need the principal, the loan amount, we need the number of months, and then we need the rate of interest per month. Now, if you want to understand the derivation of this formula, you can watch this tutorial. It's not that difficult. It's just a way of laying out all the terms and doing a little bit of mathematics. But yeah, we won't cover it. So here's an implementation. So let's keep that around here. So we have loan EMI and loan EMI now has an amount. Loan EMI has a duration. Loan EMI also has a down payment and then it also has a rate, okay? Now, one important thing to note here is that any required arguments have to appear before any optional arguments because otherwise, Python may get confused. If you just give three arguments, Python may get confused. Did you mean to pass down payment or did you mean to pass a rate? So that's why all the required arguments come first in the definition. And then you have all the optional arguments with the default values. Okay, so we have the amount, duration, the rate and the down payment. First thing we're doing is computing the loan amount, which is the amount minus the down payment. Then to apply the formula, we first take the loan amount. The P in this formula is the loan amount multiplied by the rate and remember this has to be the monthly rate of interest so rate of interest per annum divided by 12 then we have 1 plus r to the power of n which is 1 plus rate to the power and power is expressed in python using double star to the power of duration the number of months which is n here divided by so we take the whole thing and divide that by 1 plus rate to the power of duration minus 1 okay so wasn't that hard the entire formula fit in one line, not too bad. So here we now have, we can now return the EMI from the loan EMI function. Great. And let's test it out then. So now we call loan EMI on the first EMI option, which is 1.26 million. And we have eight times 12. This is the duration, the number of months. 0.1 which is 10% divided by 12 is the monthly rate of interest and 3e minus uh, 3e5 which is 300,000 is the down payment the optional argument which we are providing here and that gives us the EMI 14567 oh, so 14,000 dollars 567 14,567 dollars that's the EMI for option 1 and then we have option 2 and in option 2 once again we have the same loan amount we have uh, 10 years this time, so 10 times 12 months. And then the monthly rate of interest is 0.08 divided by 12. And that's about $15,287. So we have the answer now, pretty much. The EMIs are pretty close, but the first option has the lower EMI, okay? Now, when you're looking at a function call like this, it's hard for you to understand what's happening here. And it's also easy when you're typing this out to forget what order the arguments are in and make a mistake. Like you could have just as well put in eight by 12 here and 0.1 by 12 here and you would still get a result. It would not make sense. And that would tell you that maybe you've done something wrong, but in many cases, it may not be perceptible, right? In many cases, the result that you may get may be wrong, but may still seem reasonable. And such bugs are very common. That's why Python provides the ability to pass named arguments. So invoking a function with many arguments is confusing and prone to human errors. So Python provides the option of invoking named arguments just to make it a little clearer. And you can even split a function invocation into multiple lines if you want. 
So here what we have done is we are calling the same loan EMI function, but this time instead of just passing in the arguments, we are also naming the arguments that we are passing and then we are putting an equal to after the name. We are putting an equal to after the name and then we are putting the value that we want to pass in into the function, right? So we have amount equals 1.26 million, duration equals 8 into 12 months, rate equals 0.10% by 12 per month and then the down payment is 300,000 and it gives the exact same result, no change there. And then finally, we have this uh, loan EMI function. So once again, we are calling it for the second option of EMI. We set the amount, duration and rate. Down payment is automatically set to zero and we get the same result. As we've seen, EMI one is lower than EMI two, but it would be nice to round up the amount to full dollars rather than showing digits after the decimal. And to achieve this, what we can do is we can try and write a function you can try and write a function which takes a number, a floating point number and rounds it up to the next integer. For example, 1.2 is rounded up to 2. Why are we rounding up? Because we are dealing with money and if you just pay 1287 then you will still be owing the bank 0 0.27. So you much rather bet, uh, you might much rather just pay 15288 to the bank and be clear, not get penalized for the unpaid portion of the EMI. So you can try and write a function which can round up a number and that would be a great exercise for you to try out. But because rounding numbers is such a common uh, operation, Python provides a function to do it. So Python provides a function along with thousands of other functions as part of the standard Python library for rounding numbers. And because there are thousands of functions in Python, uh, in the Python standard library, they are all organized into modules and these modules need to be imported if you want to use a particular function that they contain, right? Otherwise you would end up with thousands of functions all sitting in your, all sitting as global variables and every time you try to define a variable or a function you would realize that it's already something defined in the Python library and it would be very difficult for you to come up with unique names. So that is why Python has this concept of modules and modules are simply Python files they are files containing Python code. So they can contain variables, functions, classes, and they provide a way of organizing a code for large Python projects into files and folders. This is something that we will look at a couple of weeks from now when we talk about Linux and Terminal and uh, other things. We look at files and folders and how to organize Python code. But the key benefit of using modules is namespace. To use something within a module, you must import a module to use its functions, either within a script or a notebook. And namespaces provide encapsulation and avoid naming conflicts between your code and a module or across modules. So you can have many different modules. All of them ins inside the module may have the same set of variables and those variables will never clash in, in the values that they have, right? So each module can independently set variables just as each function can set variables. So that is the hierarchical set, uh, that is how the hierarchy of scope is organized. So you have inside functions, you have scope, then you have a global scope for the module or for the notebook that we are using. And then you have, and then you have to import modules and you can use things from inside modules inside other modules, okay? So here's an example. We can use the seal function. So seal is short for ceiling. So you know floor and ceiling of a number from the math module to round up numbers. Okay. So seal does the rounding up for us. Now to use a function, if you try and access seal directly, C-E-I-L, even though it's there in the math module, we are not able to access it. The name error, the name seal is not defined. And that's nice because then you can define your own function seal, which can do this rounding. But to access it from the math module, first we import math. So when we import math, we now can access things inside math. And the way to access this, it is to say math.seal. So you can say math.seal. And if you want to check what's uh, the documentation of a function from inside a module, just call help. And help is going to then tell you that 
this is a built-in function in the C in the math module. It contains the ceiling of X as an integral or basically an integer. So this is the smallest integer greater than or equal to X. So when we call math.seal on 1.2, that returns two. Okay. Now there's another way to do this. So I'll just show you very quickly the other way to do it as well. You can also say from math import seal. Now what this does is this is going to put seal in your current global scope. Okay. So you can see seal is this function and then you can call seal 1.2 and that's going to work. So it's up to you. What do you want to do? And you can use whichever you want initially. Don't worry too much about should I be writing import math or math.seal or should I be doing from math import seal. Just pick whatever works for you. And later on you will automatically start forming these rules. Okay, if I'm going to use a function only once then maybe I should just import the module and then use the dot notation. But if I'm going to use the function maybe 20 times I don't want to type math.seal each single time. So in that sense it makes sense to import seal as a separate thing from math. Okay. It also is a question of, are you going to use other functions from math? If you're going to use other functions from math too, then you may just want to import math. But if you're just going to use the one or two functions, and let's say you want to use the floor function as well, then you can just import them with comma separated values. So that's some guidance on how to import things from modules. So now we can use the math.seal function within the home loan EMI function to round up the MI amount. And that's another interesting, you can use functions within functions. And in fact, this is a great way to reuse code and implement complex logic while still keeping your code small, understandable and manageable. Ideally, a function should have one thing, a function should do one thing and one thing only. Okay, so if you find yourself writing a function that does too many things, something that you cannot describe in a single sentence, or, or maybe a couple of sentences, then consider splitting it into multiple smaller independent functions. Okay. And as a rule of thumb, and this is something that I follow very religiously, and this might seem like a joke, but uh, I do follow it. And a lot of people I know follow it as well. As a rule of thumb, try to limit any functions that you write to 10 lines of code or less. Now, it might seem like 10 lines is too less. How are you going to build all these huge complex applications and analysis within with functions of just 10 lines. But that's really the key here. Good programmers always write short, simple and readable functions. And they allow you to build all these complex applications and keep it understandable and manageable. Okay, so keep that in mind as you start writing functions. So now we, we can modify the loan EMI function to have once again calculate the down payment, uh, calculate the loan amount from the amount minus down payment apply the EMI formula and then use math.seal inside the function to change the EMI into a number. So we are rounding it up. So now EMI one will be one, four, five, six, eight, and EMI two will be one, five, two, eight, eight. Okay. And now let's compare EMI one and EMI two and display a message for the option, which whichever has the lower EMI. So if EMI one is less than EMI two, then we print that EMI one has the lower EMI. Option one has a lower EMI, 14568. If that was the other case, we would have printed option two has the lower EMI, okay? So this is our answer for Radha. She should go ahead with option one. Great, we've solved the problem and learned a little bit about functions. But what's great is that now we have this handy function low in EMI that we can use to solve many other similar problems with just a few lines of code. So let's try it with a couple more questions. So here's another question. Sean is paying back a home loan for a house he bought a few years ago and the cost of the house was $800,000. Now Sean made a down payment of 25% of that price. So that would be $200,000. And he financed the remaining amount using a six year loan with an interest rate of 7% per annum. Okay. So the whole bunch of information here, all that's just a fancy way of providing information into the loan EMI function, right? So you see the down, you see the cost, you, you, you can now picture the amount, you can picture the down payment, you can picture the amount duration, you can picture the rate. So you know what his EMI looks like. Okay. 
Now Sean is buying a car worth $60,000 which he is planning to finance using a one year loan with an interest rate of 12% per annum. Okay, so here's information about another loan. So both loans are paid back in EMIs. So what is the total monthly payment that Sean makes towards the loan prepayment? So although there are a whole bunch of number here, numbers here, looks pretty complicated, but ultimately there are just two loans. This is one loan and this is one loan. And all you need to do is just put those values into the loan EMI function to get the EMIs. So the cost of the house is 800,000. The home loan duration is 12 months, six times 12, uh, sorry, six times 12 months, 72 months. The rate of the home loan, the monthly rate is 0.07, a 7% by 12. The down payment is 0.25 multiplied by 800,000, about 200,000. And that, once you put that into the loan EMI function, so we are calling loan EMI and then we are using named arguments, amount equals. And now instead of directly putting the amount here, we've put the amount in a variable just to make it super clear for ourselves what, what that variable represents. And we put in the cost of the house, the variable name as the argument into the function. And then we have all these other things, home loan duration, home loan rate, home loan down payment, right? So this is the variable whose value will be substituted and this is the name of the argument inside the function. So don't get confused. If you write it the other way, cost of house equals amount, it's not going to work. We want to say that inside loan EMI, amount should take the value from cost of house, which is 800,000. That gives us the EMI for the house, 10230, great. And then here, once again, we have the cost of a car, which is $60,000. It is a one year loan and the rate of interest is 12% per annum. So that's 1% per month and we just put that into the loan EMI as well. No down payment here. Great. We get back the cost uh, EMI for the car and then we just add them together and we end up with the total cost monthly payment of $15,561 towards loan repayments. So we were able to solve this entire problem in maybe a, just a couple of minutes because we have this function and that's the power of functions. You do it once and then you don't do it again. In fact, there is a principle in programming called the dry principle, also known as don't repeat yourself. Every time you see yourself typing some code, which you have already typed in some different format, maybe with a small variation, you want to convert it into a function immediately. You do not want to do something a third time. And if you can get that habit, you will automatically start writing programs that do more and more and more and become more productive as a programmer. Okay, now let's try one more question here. If you borrow $100,000 using a 10 year loan with an interest rate of 9% per annum, what is the total amount that you end up paying as interest? Okay, very interesting. So this time we are just asking, you, you have a same loan, you have a loan just like you did in the previous term which is $100,000 and you know the term which is 10 years, you know the rate of interest which is 9% per annum. This time we're not comparing it with another loan, we are simply asking what is the amount that you pay as interest. And we can apply a small trick here. So one way to solve this problem is to simply compare the EMIs for the two loans. One with the given rate of interest and then another assuming that there is no interest. So another with a 0% rate of interest. Then we know that the total interest paid is simply the sum of the monthly differences over the entire duration of the loan, loan, right? So if one EMI is 100 and another EMI is 80, so that means 20 is what is going towards interest every month. So you can total that over the 10 years and that will give you the total amount of interest you're paying. Okay. So let's create one loan, loan EMI with interest. So this has $100,000, a duration of 120 months and 9% divided by 12, that is the monthly rate of interest. So you end up with 1267. You end up with $1,267 as the EMI with interest. Then let's compute the EMI without interest. So without interest, the amount is the same, the duration is the same. The rate this time is zero. And let's run it. Oops. So something went wrong here. So it seems like, and Python tells us what, what, what went wrong seems like there was a zero division error. And if you look carefully, Python is going to tell you exactly where it occurred. So when, and you can track this line and this line will tell you. 
so when you call loan emi on amount duration and rate there was an error and then python digs in and it tells you that okay inside loan emi when we were calculating when we were computing this formula loan amount times rate times 1 plus rate to the power of duration etc etc this is where there was an error and the error exactly was that we are trying to divide something by 0 oh i see what could it be that we are dividing by 0 if you look at this value the rate of interest in this case is specified as 0 percent so 1 plus 0 is 0 so 1 plus 0 to the power of duration whatever be the duration is simply 1 to the power of something that's just 1 and then 1 minus 1 is 0 so what that means is this entire piece of code has the value 0 and it is appearing in the denominator of this calculation so we are trying to divide something by 0 and that's the issue here now what you're looking at here is what is called an exception the zero division error is an exception that python has thrown now we've not written zero division error anywhere inside our code but whenever python detects that something has gone wrong it throws an exception and the exception stops any further execution of the code so as soon as python encountered the exception it said okay i cannot proceed further i'm simply going to print out this error and let the programmer figure it out just as we did okay now there are many built-in exceptions in python there are uh, you can check out this link there are a whole bunch of exceptions if you try to divide by zero you get an error if you try to um, let's say access something a variable that's not defined that's going to give you an error if you try to access a key inside a dictionary where the key is not yet defined or the dictionary does not have the key that's going to give an error. so there are a whole bunch of situations where python throws errors and they are to help you it's not that it's, it's not the end of the world all you need to do is either fix the error or handle the error so you can use a special kind of statement called the try accept statements to handle an exception and here's how it works so we have a block try just as we have blocks for creating functions or loops or if statements we have a block try and then inside the block you can see some indented code here so we are going to try and run this code python will execute this code normally now computing the result okay it's going to print that and it's going to try and divide 5 by 0 and that is going to blow up that's going to now throw a zero exception the zero division error so at this point python is going to quit python is trying to quit so it will not execute print computation was success, completed success, uh, successfully it's just trying to throw a zero division error but you're already ready for that possibility you've said that except zero division error so that means in the case i encounter as you encounter a zero division error do this okay so this is how you handle an exception so now it's no no longer going to print out and stop execution it's going to come here and it's going to execute this code so you're simply printing fail to compute the result because you were trying to divide by zero and we are setting result to none okay and finally we print the result out so there now we do have this try except block and you can see that now computing the result was printed then 5 divided by 0 completely blew up it threw a zero division error and we were expecting exactly a zero division error so when you get a zero division error we say except zero division error we print fail to compute the result you can see here and result has the value none on the other hand if this code was executing properly let's say you had 5 divided by 2 then you say now computing the result 5 divided by 2 computation was completed successfully and all of this never gets it. so that's how you work with an except that's how you handle an exception in python now you don't want to aggressively handle every single ex exception that can show up in fact exceptions are good because they tell you something is wrong with your program if you handle every exception and just silently return none results and stuff then your code may end up with a lot of issues which you never discover right so only handle exceptions that you need to or ha exceptions that you expect to occur don't handle every possible exception using so if you just write accept exception that's going to handle every exception for you but you don't want to do that you want to know how your code went wrong so that you can fix it 
Now you can also handle multiple types of exceptions and I'll let you read about it. There's a link here that tells you more about it. But let's enhance the loan EMI function using try except to handle the scenario where the rate of interest is 0%. Okay. And this is completely common practice where you have a function and then a new scenario comes up and you realize that, okay, I need to improve my function. So it's always good to go back and then change the function. And that makes your functions most more robust and more versatile. So here we have the loan EMI function and we are once again doing the same things, calculating the loan amount, which is amount minus down payment. But this time we know that there could be a possible zero division error here. So we say try to compute the EMI using this formula. But if you get a zero division error, that means the rate of interest is probably 0%. We set the EMI to the loan amount divided by the duration. And that's it. Once we get that, we can take the ceiling and return the EMI. So let's look at this problem once again. So we have one loan with interest of 10, 9%, one loan without, and we get back the EMI for each. Then we simply take the difference in the EMI and we multiply it with the total duration of the loan, which is 120 months. So it turns out that the total interest you're going to pay on a $100,000 loan is going to be $51,960. And now based on this, you can decide, do I want to pay all that interest or do I want to find some other way of financing whatever I want to do? Okay, next up, we are going to talk about documentation. So what we can do within our functions is add some documentation using what's called a doc string. And a doc string is simply a string that appears as the first statement within the function body. And it is used by the help function. So as we've seen, if when we did help seal or if we just do help print. So there is all this information that is there here. Where does that information come from? Well, you can put that information in your own functions too. And you should because a lot of other people or perhaps even you yourself might be using this function in the future. So you have the loan EMI function and it takes an amount, duration, rate and down payment. What you can do here is you can uh, open a multi-line string. So here I've created a multi-line string and then I have a one line description about the function calculates the equal monthly installment for a loan. Okay. Great. So a good one line description is helpful. And then you can also talk about each argument. Because there are some details here, we are assuming that the duration has to be in months. We are assuming that the rate has to be monthly. So that's where you may want to just clarify all that in the documentation. So you're saying arguments and there's no fixed format here. You can, you can write it in whichever way you want. But this is just one nice way to say arguments and then indent the arguments. Again, Python is not going to execute all any of this, so it shouldn't matter. So you have amount and you're describing that amount is the total amount to be spent, which is the loan plus down payment. Duration is the duration of the loan in months. Rate is the rate of interest monthly. And then down payment is, and you may, you can mention that it's optional, it is the optional initial payment deducted from amount. Okay. And then you have the code as usual. So now when you check help loan EMI, that's going to print out all of this information for the person using the function. Okay. Now one thing that I would like to suggest here is ideally your argument names should make things like these clear. So you shouldn't have to specify this somewhere within the function because people don't generally read the documentation very carefully. So you may just want to call instead of duration, you may just want to call it duration months. And instead of rate, you may just want to call it rate monthly. Okay. So that's one way to just improve the function. And Keep doing this, keep looking at the functions that you create and see, think about how you can improve them. Can you make them a little more flexible? Can you use better variable names? Can you use, uh, can you improve the documentation? Can you include certain named, can you include certain optional arguments to make the function even, even more flexible? So whenever you have an opportunity, try to improve your function. Okay. So with that, let us, uh, just save our notebook once again. So I'm just going to run jovian.commit and that's going to capture a snapshot of my notebook for me. Okay. So now we have an exercise for you. And this exercise is on data analysis for vacation planning. 
So you're planning a vacation and you need to decide which city you want to visit. And you've shortlisted four cities and identified the return flight cost. So the cost, for example, to go to Paris and come back is about $200. The cost for London is $250 and so on. And you've also identified a total a daily hotel cost. So if you're staying for five days, you pay $20 per day in Paris, $30 per day in London, 15 in Dubai and 10 in Mumbai. And you also figured out a weekly car rental cost. So cars are rented, whatever service you're using is renting cars by the week. So these are the costs. And while renting a car, you need to pay for the entire week, even if you return the car sooner. So you either rent a car for one week or two weeks or three weeks, even if you only use it for a few days or like 10 days or something. Okay. So using all this information, here is here are some questions that you can try and answer. So if you're planning a one week long trip, which city should you visit to spend the least amount of money? You want to you want to travel on a budget, save money and you're open to visiting any of these places. Here's another. How does the answer to the previous question change if you change the trips duration to four days? 10 days or two weeks. So is it going to be different if you plan a four day trip or a 10 day trip or a two week trip? Then if your total budget for the trip is a thousand dollars. So let's say you have a budget, you don't want to minimize things, but you want to stay within the budget. Then which city should you visit to maximize the duration of your trip? That's interesting. You want to spend a thousand dollars, but stay for as long as possible. Or another way to ask it is which city should you visit? If you want to minimize the duration for the of the trip, you want to have a luxurious visit. So you want to splurge the thousand dollars and just spend it in a day or two, wherever you can best spend it. Okay. And then the fourth question goes on and says, okay, what if, how does, how does the answer to the previous question change? If your budget is just $600 or if it's $2,000 or $1,500, right? So there are a lot of different, and these are the kind of questions we normally do ask, right? We normally do ask, okay, what's my budget? Can I spend this much? Okay, what can I do with this budget? Or how long can I stay for? If I just have a one week, what can I do? And this is where it will help to ref define a function cost of trip with all the relevant inputs like the flight cost, the hotel rate, the car rental rate, and the duration of the trip. Okay, so do try this out. Try defining this function and then try answering all of these questions. You have a bunch of empty cells here and you may want, you may find the math.seal function useful, especially for calculating the total cost of the car rental. So if you're trying to find the number of weeks that you need to rent for, you can round up to get the full number of weeks here. Okay. So do try it out. And then here, this is a quick summary of what we've covered today. So we've covered how to create and use functions. We've covered how to, well, how to create functions with one or more arguments. We've covered local variables and scope, how to return values using the return keyword, how to use default arguments to make a function flexible, how to use named arguments while invoking a function, and then importing modules using library functions, reusing and improving functions to handle new cases, handling exceptions with try except, and documenting functions using doc string. So we've covered a lot of material about functions. Hopefully all of that made sense. If not, you can review the video, you can review the notebook, you can try writing code yourself and experimenting with it. Now, this tutorial on functions is by no means exhaustive. You can do a lot more with functions in Python. And at certain points within the bootcamp, we will touch upon some of these more advanced topics as well. So here are a few topics that you can learn about. One is you can pass an arbitrary number of arguments to a function. So there's something called args and quags. You can define functions inside functions. That's very interesting too. You can define a function that invokes itself. This is something that we will cover in the assignment. You can define functions that accept other functions as arguments or return functions as the result. So some kind of function inception you can write functions that enhance other functions. So functions that add functionality into other functions. So there's a lot more, you know, as you get deeper into Python, I wouldn't recommend it doing it right now if you're just getting started because the purpose of learning a programming language is to solve problems. It's not an end in itself. So 
I wouldn't recommend getting into it immediately. First, become familiar with Python using some of the more frequently used features. And then with time, you can start exploring some of these as well. And we'll touch on them at different points whenever it is relevant. Okay. And then here are some more resources if you want to learn more. The W3 schools tutorial is kind of a bucket, uh, kind of like a kitchen sink, contains everything about functions. Then you have this practical Python programming course. It's pretty good too. And of course, there's the Python official documentation. If you, well, if you have the patience to read through it because it's pretty exhaustive. There was a question you have assigned named arguments like loan EMI rate equal to interest rate. Yeah. So we have named arguments here. So the question was, why do we, why have we named these arguments like 800,000 and six, six times 12 and so on. So whenever you are working with a certain value multiple times, as we have done here, we were evaluating EMI options. It's always a good idea to take any values like 800,000 and put them into a variable. Why? There are a couple of reasons. One, now you do not have to remember this number. As human beings, we find it easier to remember memorable names like cost of house. I can tell you cost of house today that this is my name of my variable. You will probably be able to recall tomorrow. But if I ask you to recall the exact number or the cost of the house in uh, the, as the exact number, you may not be able to recall it, right? So it is more susceptible to errors as you use, uh, let's say you're calling the loan EMI function three or four times, and you're going to use the cost of house um, as 800,000 each time. You may make a mistake. Sometimes you may just put in 80,000. Sometimes you may put in maybe 900,000 and that may give you a incorrect result that may go undetected and end up in production, break something. That's one reason. The second reason is what's called refactoring or just changing certain values. Now, if you want to change this value, 800,000 to 900,000, let's say you had a call with the dealer and they told you, uh, I'm sorry, the price has moved up to 900,000. Now that's, that's quite bad already, but now you will also have to go and change 800,000 to 900,000 15 times in your notebook. And again, you may forget to do it somewhere and you may end up with an EMI calculation, which is no longer accurate. So once you put this into a variable, you just go here and change 800,000 to 900,000. And then the loan EMI function will tell you or all the places where you've used that variable, you will get back the correct result. Now the general rule here is you want to assume that you are going to change your code and you want to assume that you are going to make mistakes and then be defensive. Okay. I'm going to make a mistake here. I'm going to, I'm bad with numbers. I'm going to type numbers incorrectly. So let me just put the number into a variable. And if I make a mistake in a variable name, Python is going to complain straight away, right? So take all the mistakes that you can make and let Python tell you about them before they end up in production or they cause some damage. The dry principle is simply don't repeat yourself D R Y. It means if you do, if you write some code, which looks very similar or exactly the same, the worst thing you can do is copy paste, never do that. But if you're writing some code, which looks very similar to some other code, and maybe the, there are a few things different, then it's possible that you can just write a function and just use a function to perform that computation. And that's the dry principle. Don't write the same code more than once. And you will thank yourself for the next 200 times where you have to do the same thing. The third lecture and today we are looking at numerical computing with NumPy. So let's get started. The data in data analysis typically refers to some numerical data. So things like stock prices, sales figures, sensor measurements, weather data, sports scores, database tables, and things like that. Now the NumPy library provides specialized data structures and functions and other tools for numerical computing in Python. That is working with numerical data. So why we might need NumPy uh, since Python itself also supports a lot of arithmetic operations and things like that. Let's look at that using an example. So let's say we want to use climate data. So things like temperature, rainfall, and humidity in a region to determine if the region is well suited for growing apples. Okay. So a really simple approach for doing this would be to formulate the relationship between the annual yield of apples. So let's say in tons per hectare. So whatever is the annual yield of apples in a region, 
we relate that to the climatic conditions like the average temperature which would be probably in degrees fahrenheit the average rainfall in millimeters and the average relative humidity and and formulate that as a linear equation so we could assume that the yield of apples is some weight w1 times the temperature plus some weight w2 times the rainfall plus some weight w3 times the humidity so we are expressing the yield of apples as a weighted sum of the climatic conditions now obviously this is an approximation because the actual relationship may not necessarily be a linear because this is a linear equation but a simple linear model like this often works really well in practice and then what we might do is we might do some statistical analysis of the historical data uh, and based on that we may be able to come up with a reasonable set of values for the weights w1 w2 and w3 right so just based on looking at some historical data so here is an example set of values so now you have these weights w1 2 3 now given some climate data for a region we can use these weights to predict what the yield of apples in the region might look like so here we have the data for five regions kanto choto hoen sino and unova and let's say we want to identify what might be the approximate yield of apples in kanto so for that what we can do is we can convert its this information into variables so the temperature rainfall and humidity all of these become variables and then we can substitute these variables into the linear equation the formula to predict the yield of apples in that region so here the yield of apples in kanto becomes the temperature times w1 plus the rainfall times w2 plus the humidity times w3 and once we do that we get back the result 56.8 and we can print it out that the expected yield of apples in the kanto region is 56.8 tons per hectare okay so far it's a pretty simple calculation that we've done with a bunch of variables but to make it slightly easier to perform the same computation for multiple regions what we can do is we can represent the climate data for each region as a list of numbers or what in mathematics is also called a vector because otherwise we might end up creating a lot of variables for five regions we end up creating 15 variables for 50 regions we end up creating 150 variables and that's just a lot of code to write so rather what we are going to do here is we are going to say that the kanto region is represented by this vector or this list of numbers the first number represents the temperature the second represents the rainfall and the third represents the humidity then similarly we represent all the other regions using these vectors and again temperature rainfall humidity are the three elements of the vector further the set of weights that we've used w1 to 3 those can also be represented as a vector together so now we have the region each region is a vector and each uh, and the set of weights is a vector so we can now write a function crop yield to calculate the yield of apples or any other crop for that matter because you just have to change the weights for a different crop so we can calculate the yield of apples given the climate data and the respective weights okay so here we have a function which takes the crop which takes the region it takes a set of weights and then it performs some calculation and returns the result so let's observe what it does so maybe let's just look at the kanto region and let us look at the weights so what we want to do is we want to multiply the first element 73 by the weight 0.3 then we want to multiply 67 by 0.2 and we want to multiply 43 by 0.5 so in some sense this is an element wise multiplication and then we want to add up each of these products so we get three products so we add them up so the way we do that is we set a result to 0 and then we use this zip function so this zip built in function returns pairs so you can actually check what zip does let's see so we say for item in zip kanto and weights we simply print the item so it turns out that it create pairs out of the two lists so it returns 73 and 0.3 67 and 0.2 43 and 0.5 so since these are pairs or what we call tuples in python so these tuples can be converted into variables so i can pull out the variables x and w so x would have the value 73 and then w would have the value 0.3 so here you go and then that's repeated for each element 
So now what we can do is we can simply multiply x times w and that is what we have done here. We have multiplied x times w, so 73 times 0 0.3, 67 point 0 0.2 and 43 times 0 0.5 and we have added them into the result. So in effect, it has the exact same effect as what we had done earlier. So temperature multiplied by W1, rainfall multiplied by W2, humidity multiplied by W3, and then we return the result. All right. So that's our crop yield function. And we can verify that we call crop yield with the Cantor region and the same weights, and we get back the same result, 56.8 tons per hectare. And we can do the same thing for the Joto region and for the UNOVA region. So already we've simplified things a bit by writing this function. Now the calculation that we've performed, the element wise multiplication of two vectors and then followed by a sum of the results. This is also called the dot product of two vectors. And this is just a linear algebra term and it the dot product means exactly what I just said an element wise multiplication of two vectors followed by a sum of the results. And uh, you can learn more about dot products here on Khan Academy. It's a great resource if you just want to brush up linear algebra in general. But now the NumPy library, which is specialized for doing numerical computing and perform performing operations on numerical data provides a built in function to perform the dot product of two vectors because this is such a common operation. But to do that, the lists that we have, the data that we have must first be converted into a, a special data structure called NumPy arrays. And to first to create NumPy arrays, we first need to import the NumPy module. So I already have the Python library NumPy installed. This was done when we clicked the run button. So there was a set of requirements with the Jupyter notebook. But if you do not have NumPy installed, you can do pip install NumPy minus upgrade and minus minus quiet. And this is just to suppress the output, but pip install NumPy should do it. So you can run this to install NumPy and don't forget the exclamation character. But now we import NumPy as NP. And now the NumPy arrays can be created using the np.array function. All right. So if you're seeing this part for the first time. So all we're doing here is we're saying that we want to import the NumPy module, but when we, but instead of calling it NumPy, we want to call it NP so that when we want to use the array function from uh, NumPy, instead of writing NumPy.array, we can just write NP.array. So this is also called aliasing. Okay. So now we uh, create the Cantor region, uh, the data, we simply call NP.array and then we just pass in the same list of numbers that we had earlier. So nothing is really changed yet. And you can see here we print it out and we can just see that this is a NumPy array with the same list of numbers. Uh, then we have the weights. So this is once again a NumPy array. It simply contains a list of numbers. But when you check the type, you will see that each of these has the type ND array, right? So this is no longer a Python list. This is now a special data type which is defined and offered by NumPy. Okay. And just lists the NumPy arrays behave like lists in many ways. And one of the ways is just the indexing notation. So if you just use the indexing notation, you can get back the zeroth element, which is 0.3 from weights or the second element, which is 43 from Canto. But they also differ from Python lists in many important ways. And that is what we are going to see next. Okay. So now remember, we wanted to compute the dot product, which is the element wise multiplication followed by some of the results. We can do that using the NP dot dot function. And a good way to see what the NP dot dot function does is just say help NP dot dot. And that's going to tell you what it does. So there's a lot of documentation here and uh, it gives you a lot of information about it. And then at the bottom, you will see a bunch of examples as well. So you can just see uh, how to use this function. So now we call NP dot dot with Canto and weights and we get back the same result 56.8, except that now we just need to write the single line of code. If we can actually achieve the same result with even lower level operations. So NumPy arrays support arithmetic operators. So here, if we simply do Canto, let's just print out these arrays so that we see it. So remember when we talked about element wise multiplication, 
So if we just do Canto star weights and run that, so that actually performs an element wise multiplication of the two vectors. And then what we can do is we can take that. So that is a NumPy array and then call dot sum on it. And now this dot sum operator, sorry, the dot sum method simply returns the sum of all the elements in a NumPy array. All right. So these are two convenient things that you could not do with Python lists. So these gi give us a very nice way to write the same expression without having to write a loop, without having to write a function and so on. Okay. So yeah. And that's what we just looked at the element wise multiplication and sum of two arrays. Okay. So before we move ahead, we we're already starting to see some benefits of NumPy arrays. So there's one that we've already seen, which is the ease of use. Now, instead of having to define loops and custom functions like crop yield, you can write very small, concise and intuitive mathematical expressions like Canto star weights dot sum and, and get the same results. But another important reason to use NumPy is performance because NumPy operations and functions are implemented internally using C plus and Python offers a way where you can write something in C plus and expose it, uh, connect it with a, a Python function. So there's an interface available. So NumPy operations are written in C plus, which is compiled down to assembly code. And what that basically means is it is machine code already. So the Python interpreter is not involved. Uh, in the actual calculation and that makes the calculation much faster. Sometimes we see, so that makes the calculation much faster. And whenever you want to have a claim like this, that something makes the calculation faster. The best way to do that is to, is the best way to verify it is to just check by creating an example. Okay. Here's an example. Here we are going to create a million elements, a list containing a million elements. So here we have a list. This is a Python list. And then here we have another Python list. So there are a million elements here, zero to one million minus one. And then there are a million elements here, one million to two million minus one. So two lists with the same size. And then we also con convert those lists into NumPy arrays. So now we have two lists and then we have two NumPy arrays with the same number of elements. Now we use this special time uh, command. So this is something special to Jupiter. So you put in two percentage symbols and then time. And what this does is this calculates the time it takes to run this cell. Okay. So here we are doing the dot product using a for loop similar to this, uh, what we did inside crop yield. So we just did a zip and then we got back the values and then we added them to a result. And to do that over two vectors of size 1 million that took about 200 milliseconds. Now let's do the same thing, but this time let us use a NumPy array. So we have the same NumPy arrays and then we run it, just use NP dot dot and that just takes 2.4 milliseconds. So that's where you can see we get the same result back, but the NP dot dot is a hundred times faster than using a for loop. And this is what makes NumPy especially useful when you're working with really large data sets with tens of thousands or even millions of data points. All right. That's the benefit of NumPy. Now, before we go ahead, let us just save our work. So I'm just going to import the Jovian library and uh, run jovian.commit. And this will ask us for an API key. So this was, this is to capture a snapshot of your notebook. So you can go to your Jovian account. So just visit jovian.ml and log in and copy your API key and then paste it back here. Now, when you do that, what happens is this notebooks, uh, this notebook gets captured, the entire snapshot, the inputs, the outputs, and that gets saved into your Jovian ML account. So you can view it here. And this binder instance, because it is running online, it's a temporary free service. So this might get shut down, but if you keep running jovian.commit from time to time, you will not lose your work. Okay. So moving right ahead. Now we can actually go one step further and represent the entire climate data for all the regions together using a single two dimensional NumPy array. So here we can say climate, the climate data is NP dot array. And here we pass in not a single list of numbers, but a list of lists. So each, so we have a bunch of lists inside the outer list 
and each list represents the data for a region. So this is the region uh, data for Kanto and this is the region data for Joto and then all the other regions. And then each column here, so each uh, element in the list represents a data point about the weather. So the first element always represents temperature, the second element represents rainfall and the third humidity. A and I've written it in this fashion, but you don't have to, you can write them all on the same line, but it helps to look at it like this because this is what if you've taken a linear algebra class in high school, you might recognize that this is what is called a matrix. Or if not, you can just look at it as a table of values. And it has five rows, one for each data point, and it has three columns, one for temperature, rainfall, and humidity each. Okay, so we create this array, and then we get back, once again, we get back this array object, but this time this is a two-dimensional array, right? It is no longer a one-dimensional array. And that is what makes NumPy arrays so flexible, that they can have any number of dimensions. So here is a one dimensional array. This is what we looked at a vector. And then here is a two dimensional array. So here there are two rows. So just we have five rows here and three columns here. There are two rows and three columns. And then this is a three dimensional array. So here you might have one, two, three in this direction. And then inside that you might have a list of, you might have three elements each and each of those elements itself could be uh, a list, right? So you can have 1D, 2D or 3D arrays in NumPy. And since these arrays, and, and you can actually have 4D and 5D and any number of dimensions, you just have to keep nesting lists inside lists inside lists. And since NumPy arrays can have any number of dimensions and different lengths along each dimension, what we can do is we can inspect the length along each dimension using the dot shape property of an array. So if, uh, if we check climate data dot shape, you get back the value 5 comma 3. So let's see how that arrive, uh, how we arrive at that value. So the way it works is you first look at the outermost bracket and then from the outermost bracket you see how many elements are there in the outermost list. So the outermost list has 1, 2, 3, 4 and 5 elements and that's why you get 5. Then you go one step in so you can just pick up the first value so let's say 73, 67, 43 and see how many elements that has. So that has three elements and hence you have three. Now suppose each of these elements was also a list, then you could count how many elements were there inside each inner list and that would give you the third dimension. So when, and we see an example of that. So here we have weights. This is a vector or a one dimensional array. So we can check the shape of weights and the shape of weights is just the tuple containing three. So the output of shape is a tuple. The number of elements is the number of dimensions or also called the number of axes uh, in NumPy and the length along each direction is uh, the number that is there at that position. So since this is a 1D array, you get back one number and that number is three because it is a vector of size three. Okay, so then moving forward, the next kind of array is a 3D array and then you can have 4D and 5D but for 3D, you can notice here, and this is a little difficult to show because we can only write in two dimensions. So you can see here that we have this 2D array or a matrix, and then we have another matrix. So this is, you can think of it as two matrices sitting side by side, forming a cuboid. So this kind of a structure. And to guess the shape, let's try and guess the shape here. So we look at the outermost bracket and then we say, okay, in the outermost list, there are two elements. So the first element is two. Then in the, in every inner list, there are two elements again. So the second element is also two. And then inside those elements, you have three uh, elements, right? So then the third element is three for the shape. So hence the shape is two by two by three. Okay. So now you might wonder what happens if I do not have the same number of elements, so you can do something like this and then try creating this array and try printing out the shape of this array, try looking at the array and see if NumPy is actually creating a, a, a n dimensional array or not. Okay, it's a good exercise to just try this out. So one other thing to keep in mind is that for the purpose of efficiency and performance, Elements in a NumPy array all should have the same data type. And you can check the data type of an array using the dtype property. So for instance, the weights, 
Uh, so this is an array containing some floating point numbers. So if you check D type of uh, weights, you will get back a D type float 64. So this is again important that the NumPy data type, NumPy has its own data types uh, different from the Python uh, primitive data types. The reason for that is Python's primitive data types support a wide range of values, but NumPy limits its data types to certain uh, set of values. So for instance, float 64 means that only 64 bits of space in the memory will be used for a floating point number. And similarly, if you check, let's say if you check climate data, this is of type int 64. So it can only take 64 bits of uh, uh, data to store an integer. And that's the reason NumPy has its own data types. But in general, there is a one to one correlation. If you're using floats, you might end up seeing float 64. And if you're using climate data, uh, if you're using integers, then you might end up seeing int 64. Okay. One interesting result from this is that if an array contains even a single floating point number, then all the other elements are also converted to floats. So for instance, the way we defined array three, let me just grab that once again. So here we just defined array three where all of these numbers are integers, but the last one is a floating point number. And if you check the D type, that turns out to be float. And even when you print it out, you will notice that all these numbers have been converted into floats. Okay. So that's just a little bit about when you're dealing with different dimensional arrays, how do you understand what their dimensions are? How many, uh, uh, how many axes there are? What is the length along each axis and what does the data type contained in it? So coming back to our example though, we have the climate data. The climate data is represented as, so there are five rows, one for each region. And then there is three columns for temperature, rainfall and humidity. So now we can compute the predicted yield of apples in all the regions using a single matrix multiplication, right? And this is where you will need to know a little bit about matrix multiplications. And I've pointed to a resource. Once again, some, there are three or four videos that you can watch to understand this, but roughly how it works is this. So this is our matrix containing all the data. So when we multiply that with the vector containing the weights, what happens is we get back a vector as a result and the vector will have the first element of the vector will be 73 times W11 plus 67 times W12 plus 43 times W13. So basically the dot product of this row and this uh, weights vector. And similarly, the second element will be the dot product of the second row and the weights vector and so on. So use it, the matrix when multiplied with the weights will give back a vector and each element of the vector will be the dot product of that specific row with that specific, uh, with the weights vector. Okay. And that is what we want. So now if, and the way to do that in NumPy is to use the mat mul function. Once again, NumPy gives an inbuilt function for matrix multiplication. So this here, what we're doing is we're taking the climate data and we're taking the weights and we're doing a matrix multiplication. So this first element comes by uh, multiplying, uh, doing a dot product of this with this. And then the second element comes by doing a dot product of this with, sorry, with the whole vector. And the third element comes by doing the dot product of this with the whole vector and so on. And another, another way to do the matrix multiplication overall is to simply use the add the rate character or the at character. So the at character represents matrix multiplication in NumPy. So we do the same thing, climate data at weights, and we get back the same results. So now that's pretty convenient. We've taken all our data, uh, all our operations, and then reduce them down to a single line of code for the entire data set. And that is what makes NumPy and libraries in general so powerful because they offer all of these behind this single at character. There is a lot of complexity that is being hidden from you. And you just have to think of it in terms of a matrix multiplication. All right. So let's take that one step further. Now, so far we've been working with five data points. Let's go a little bit further and try and work with a file. So what we'll do is we will download a file climate.txt, which will contain 10,000 climate data points. So it looks something like this. 
temperature rainfall and humidity so the first row simply describes what date what information this file contains and then each row or each line of the file will contain the information for one region so this is the temperature rainfall and humidity in region 1 and for region 2 and for region 3 so in a sense you can see here that this is like a table or a spreadsheet but represented using plain text files and it is separated the data is separated by commas and there is one data point or one what is called sample on each row or each line of the file so this kind of a format is called the comma separated values format obviously because these values are separated using commas okay so we are first going to download the file and the way to do that is to use the url lib library so uh, the url lib module in python offers a lot of utilities for working with urls like making requests getting downloading files and specifically we want to use uh, the url retrieve function which is present inside a sub module of url lib so we need to import url lib dot request because uh, that is what contains the url retrieve function and then we give it uh, so we call url lib dot request dot url retrieve and then we give it the url that needs to be downloaded and the file name or the path where we want it to be downloaded so we just want to download it in the same directory as the jupyter notebook so i'm just going to give the file name climate.txt so now the file should be downloaded and you can check this by going file open and you should be able to see here that you have climate.txt here if you click on climate.txt here you will find that uh, this is the as i mentioned this is the header it describes what each column contains and these are all the data points and there are about 10000 you can verify it but a better way is to just load it up as a numpy array so when a csv file contains all numbers uh, it's very easy to load it up as a numpy array so the way to do that is using the gen from txt function so np.gen from txt and once again you can use the help function on np.gen from txt to see what it does or just look it up online on the documentation uh, but we just need to need use three of these arguments it supports many more so the first argument that we give it is the file name or the full path of the file in our case it's just climate.txt in the current folder then we need to provide what the delimiter is so what is the separator between the data so in our case the data points are separated by commas but sometimes these are separated by colons sometimes these are separated by the tab character so we just want them to be separated by commas and finally we want to skip the header row right so because the header row this is not numbers this is just some metadata or some information about the data so we can skip that by providing the number of header rows to skip so we just do that and uh, then let's print it out and there you go you have the climate data and uh, because there are so many elements here numpy just truncates it by printing dot but if you check the shape you will find that there are 10000 rows and each row contains three elements right so temperature rainfall and humidity so we can now use a matrix multiplication operator to predict the yield of apples for the entire data set using a given set of weights so let's take these weights 0 0.3 0 0.2 0 0.5 the same weights that we had earlier and let us just so let us just multiply it so we do climate data at weights that performs a matrix multiplication and that will in just one line of code give us back the entire results so these are all the yields so you can see that these are so this is the yield for the first region this is the yield for the second region and so on and that gives us back all uh, and you can see that there are 10000 results here okay and and then what we might want to do is we might want to take the yields that we have and add that as a new column inside the climate data uh, inside the climate data array so just as we have temperature rainfall humidity we might want to just add another element here that will represent the yield and then we can write it back to a file right so this is the common flow that you get some data file you pull it in you perform some uh, analysis you perform some operations you get some results and then you add, uh, take those results create some output and write it back to a file so to do that now uh, to add the yields back to the climate data as a fourth column so we are going to use the numpy.concatenate function okay so 
I'm going to call numpy dot concatenate. This is used for joining two arrays, and then you need to give it a tuple containing the arrays that you want to join. So we give it the climate data and the yields. Ignore this reshape for a moment, and then you need to give it the axis or the direction along which you want to join them. So for example, what we want to do is we do not want to add more rows to the data, right? We want to add more columns. So if we wanted to add more rows, that means we were adding things into the outermost list. Uh, so that would be the zeroth dimension or the zeroth axis, right? So by default, the axis will be zero, but we want to add it inside. So to add it inside, we are going to mention that we want to concatenate along the first dimension. And that is why we have set axis equal to one. So we pass in the climate data and we pass in the yield and then I will let you figure out why this dot reshape is required. You can try running this line of code without it. And then you can try looking up the documentation for reshape. And I'll let you figure out. And if you're not able to figure it out, you can ask on the forum and then we'll answer it there. Okay. But all said and done, what this does is this concatenates the result. So you can now see that we have a new array called climate results which contains three, three columns from the original data. And then the fourth column is from the yields that we have just calculated. Okay. So here is the visual explanation of concatenate. So what we had here, let's say this was the yield. This was the data for the regions. So temperature, rainfall, humidity. And in our example, we only had one row of output. So uh, sorry, we only had one column of output. So you can ignore these two. So we simply had the yield of apples and the yield of apples here. So when we call concatenate with axis one, so these get attached along the columns. If you call them with axis zero, they would get attached below. All right. So you can experiment here. So the best way to actually understand what a numpy function does is to just experiment with it and then read the documentation using the help function. And for most numpy functions, you will actually find some examples at the bottom of the documentation itself. Okay. So use these cells, the, these empty cells to experiment with np.concatenate and np.reshape. All right. So now let us take the results that we have and let us write them back to a file using np.save.txt. So I think you're getting the idea here that for pretty much everything that you want to do, there is a function in numpy. And I'll tell you uh, in some time how to find the right function. But here we are just going to take the numpy function, the save txt function, give it the crime climate results, the climate results and say we want to write it to climate results txt. So just these two are enough. But then I have included some other things here just to make it a little bit nicer. So by default, numpy will write almost 10 decimal points for each number. We don't want that. We can just put in two decimal points. So I've just put in this formatting string to just put in two decimal points. And then we have this header. So if you want to include a header at the top saying that these, this represents a temperature, rainfall, humidity, and yield of apples. So that's why we can use the header uh, argument. And finally, there's a comments argument uh, and this one, I will let you figure out what this comments argument does. So you can simply remove uh, this argument and then try and running it and see what, what the difference is. Okay. So we run save txt and that writes the data results back to climate results txt in this format. Okay. And once again, you can open the file and check that it has the expected, uh, it has the expected output. All right. So as I just mentioned, NumPy provides hundreds of functions for performing these operations on arrays. And here are some common functions. So for mathematics, you will find numpy.sum. So you can not only sum the entire array, but you can also sum just along a particular dimension or, or a, along one or more dimensions. Then you have numpy.exponent, numpy.round. So for rounding numbers, uh, for array manipulation, you have concatenate, you have split, you have stack. Then you have matrix multiplications, dot products, transpose, eigenvalues. And you also have some statistical functions like mean, median, standard deviation, and things like that. So how to find the function that you need? You do not need to remember all of these functions. And it can sometimes be hard to find exactly what you need. So the easiest way to find the right function 
is to do a web search. Uh, so just do a search on any search engine, Google, DuckDuckGo, wherever, and try to formulate what you want to do into a single line uh, as clearly as possible. So for, for example, what I searched was how to join NumPy arrays. And that led me to a tutorial on array concatenation. And that is where I got the code for this for this operation. So I, I was not sure what to use. So I just searched how to join two NumPy arrays, or you can search something more specific, how to add a column to a NumPy array. And then you will find some result. And that is a good place to start. The next place is probably just to go through the documentation. So there is a full list of array functions. You can, and we'll go through that list a little bit later. So you can just go through the list and just try, and it is categorized based on different criteria, things like this. So you can find the right function there. And the, finally, you also have the Jovin.ml forum, the course forum. So you can always ask on the course forum and the course forum is really active. So you will probably get the fastest answer by asking on the forum. Okay. All right. So once again, before we continue, let us just save a snapshot of our work. And in general, when you're working with Jupyter Notebooks, especially on Binder, but also on your local computer, just keep running jovian.commit from time to time. It's like saving, but it's saving your work to your Jovian account. Okay. Okay, so we've seen arrays and we've seen these, we've seen functions operating on these arrays. But I also want to spend some time talking about arithmetic operations. So NumPy arrays support arithmetic operators like plus minus star. And the, the interesting thing is that you can obviously perform these arithmetic operations. So what we call element wise operations between two arrays. So here we have array two and array three. And I, if I do array two plus array three, so that's going to add up each element and it's going to return an array of the same shape. And now you might wonder, okay, what if these two arrays do not have the same shape? then you can try it. That's something that you can experiment with and find out, right? So when they have the same shape, most of these arithmetic operators perform an element wise operation. But what you can also do is instead of adding an array of the same shape, you can just add or do any arithmetic operation with just a single number. So here we have array two, you can see array two has a value one, two, three, four. And then if we just do plus three, so three gets added to every element of the array. Okay, so you can see one, two, three, four becomes four, five, six, seven, as we might expect by adding three. And then we've seen element wise subtraction. This uh, works as expected. So you can see that if I subtract from array three, array two, each of these uh, differs from the corresponding element by 10. And hence we get back this result. You can divide by a single number. So here's division by a scalar. We've already seen element wise multiplication. And then you can also do things like remainder, right? So you can take array two and you can find the remainder of array two with a number like four. And these are all the remainders. Now that's great, but NumPy arrays also support something called broadcasting. And what that does is that it allows arithmetic operations between two arrays having a different number of dimensions, right? So they can have a different number of dimensions, but their shapes must be compatible. So let's take an example and let's work through it. Let's understand it using an example. So here we have array two. This is, it has three rows and two columns. So it has the shape three comma two. And then here we have array four and this simply has the shape four. Now what we can do is we can write array two plus array four. And that is a perfectly legal thing to do in NumPy. And what NumPy will do is NumPy will check. Uh, actually it is, you can see it visually here. So here we have an array, right? And then here we have a smaller array. So what NumPy will try to do is it will try to take the array with lower number of dimensions and replicate it a few times. So here the array gets replicated three times because it has to match three. But here this array, uh, here this array four, five, six, seven can, will get replicated three times. So in a sense, what you will end up with is that NumPy will automatically replicate array four in this fashion. So the four, five, six, seven will now become four, five, six, seven, three times, okay? 
and then the addition can be performed right because now the shapes match so now we can just do array plus array 4 and you can see that has the result as you might expect 4 5 6 7 gets added to these 4 5 6 7 gets added to these and 4 5 6 7 gets added to these and you can just verify this completely array 2 plus array 4 replicated oops yeah and you can see that we get the exact same result all right so this is the idea here this is this is the idea of broadcasting and here is a visual explanation of the same thing and then the thing to remember is that broadcasting only works if one of the arrays can be replicated to exactly match the shape of the other array so for instance here we have array 5 and we have array 5 dot shape uh, is just 2 and then we have array 2 so now if we try to do array 2 plus array 5 even if you replicate the 7 8 uh, 3 times let's say let's try that let's uh, write it in a replicated fashion so array 5 replicated okay so this would be 7 8 and 7 8 and 7 8 so even when it's replicated what happens is that these dimensions these sh shapes don't match up right so you have the same number of rows because of the replication but the columns don't match up and because the columns don't match up you get a value error that the operands could not be broadcast together with the shapes 3 4 and 2 okay so broadcasting is a very powerful technique and it's useful because now you do not have to create this replication for one and in fact when numpy does the replication it is only a conceptual replication that means it does not actually create copies of the array so it saves on memory it saves on uh, improves the performance so it's just a way of conceptually replicating or increasing the dimensions of an uh, of a smaller array for the purpose of an arithmetic operation while still having good performance gains right so just try it with a few examples try it with two dimensional arrays try it with three dimensional arrays so maybe take a three dimensional array and to it try to add a one dimensional array and see what happens okay the m and in general this is true with most things but specifically with numpy the more you experiment with these things the better you understand it so you can hear somebody you can listen to somebody explain these things for uh, hours together but you will not get how it works unless you experiment with it and see how it breaks and that's very important okay and then apart from arithmetic numpy arrays also support comparison operations so things like double equal to not equal to greater than less than and so on so here we have two arrays and we can check if corresponding elements are equal so you can see here that some of these values are equal so 2 matched with 2 and 3 matched with 3 and that's why we have true here and then we have false here so now this is an array of booleans right so you can actually check this so if I do dot um, d type that has the type bool and the same holds true with any comparison operator okay now why might you want to do that uh, one important thing to remember is that even though these are comparison operators the result itself is not a boolean it's actually an array of booleans so that's very important it, it's an important thing to keep in mind and one common use case of something like this could be to count the number of equal elements in two arrays so what you might do is you have array 1 and array 2 and we want to know for instance that if we compare the corresponding elements the elements at the same positions how many of these are equal so 1 and 2 are not equal 2 and 3 is equal 3 and 3 are equal uh, these two are not equal 5 and 5 are equal so the way to do that is you could first do array 1 compared with array 2 so that would give you a list of the, an array of booleans and then you could call dot sum on it so now what dot sum will do is it will try to add up the booleans and remember that true evaluates to 1 and false evaluates to 0 when they are being used as booleans uh, when they are being used in an arithmetic operation so that will just give you the number three which is the number of matching elements between the two arrays all right and then you can imagine now you can uh, use your imagination to think of other use cases where this might be useful okay so that's about array operations and broadcasting one thing that we did not go into too much and we'll get into now is 
how to get data out of an umpire array, right? If you have a multi-dimensional array, and we looked at this briefly where we said that like lists, you can index into numpy arrays and that is possible, but then numpy actually supports a much more powerful indexing notation. So it extends Python's indexing notation to multiple dimensions and it does so in a fairly intuitive fashion. So what you can do is you can take, you can provide a set of, you can provide a comma separated list of indices or even ranges. And you can do use that to select a specific element from the entire array. So let's take this array and you can select a specific element. Let's say this one, or you can select specific portions, right? You can even select just what are called slices or sub arrays from the NumPy array. And we'll see a few examples of that. Okay. So here we have array three. This is a NumPy array and it has a shape and you can guess the shape here. It has the shape. So if you see the outermost list that has one, two and three elements, three comma. And then if you take, go one step inside here, you see two elements. So three comma two, and then the innermost one has four elements, right? So the shape should be three comma two comma four. And this is a good exercise just to visually uh, look at an array and try to tell the shape and guess what NP dot shape will return or uh, the array dot shape will return. So now let's say we want to grab a single element out of it. Let's say we want to, and the way to do it is you, so along each dimension of the shape, you provide which element you want to access. So here we are passing in one comma one comma two. So let's see, uh, at the, and the way I find it easiest to do is just to work from the outside. So now we have one. So that gives us, well, from the outermost list, we, this is zero. So this is one. So we take this. And in fact, we can just check this as well. So if you just do array three, one, you get back uh, just this element, right? And then we have uh, one again. So inside this array, we ignore this and then we choose this. So we get back one again. So one comma one returns this, or you can see it as this. And then finally we have two. So here zero, one, two. So this should give the result 36, right? So that's how indexing works. And I find it easiest to just work all the way from the outside. Uh, and let's take an example of an example of indexing using ranges. So now we are no longer getting a single element, but we are actually getting a range of elements from each along each dimension. So here, what we're saying, let me just print out array three again. So here, what we're saying, is along the first dimension. That means along the outermost list in the outermost list, we want to start from the first element. So we want to skip the zeroth element, start from the first element. So we skip this entire element altogether. And then we take this and then we want to go till the end. So we take the first element and then second element and however many elements. So you're remember list indexing, when you're using ranges, if you leave one side of the range empty, that means you want to go till the end. So this is the same as doing one colon three, but one colon just says one and then everything ahead of it. So yeah, so you have this 15, 16. So now you are, now you are left with these two. And again, I just find it very easy just to break it down a lot step by step so that I, there is no confusion. So as I expect doing one colon here, is going to return this. Okay. Then we are saying that in the second dimension, we only want to keep from zero to one. So in the second dimension, we want to start at zero. So that means in every inner list and by inner list, this, right? Not the innermost. We are just going, uh, we're just going from, let's say this is actually dimension number one. So out the outermost was dimension zero. And then this is dimension one. So let's just use zero indexing. So outermost was dimension zero and now we are at dimension one. So this is dimension zero and then here we have dimension one. Now within dimension one, we want to take the zeroth element, which is this. And then we want to skip the first element, right? So the range from zero to one means only zero because the end point of a range is not part of the range. Okay, so we, we want to take, keep the zeroth element, but we want to skip the first element. So if I put in zero colon one here and run it, so what I expect to see is that this element should go away. 
and you can see that element went away and the same thing happens everywhere along that dimension and now finally we have the final dimension the third dimension uh, the dimension number two so zero first and uh, second dimension so in dimension number two we are saying we want to start from the beginning and that's why it's blank and then we want to go up to the second up to the second index but not including so that means we want to take the zeroth index and we want to take the first index so for each of these elements we just take the zeroth element and the first element so we should end up with 15 16 98 and 32 okay and one thing to note here is that whenever you are using wherever you are using ranges the shape the number of dimensions does not reduce so when we use exact numbers uh, for indexing into an array each time we use an exact number the number of dimensions reduces and then when we use a range that preserves dimensions because the range is saying that the result of a range selection is also an array so along each dimension we are still keeping an an array of some kind okay and then you can mix indices and ranges so once again let's take one more example maybe and then the rest i will leave for you as an exercise so here we have array 3 and then we are saying that we are we want to take one colon so that means we probably want to exclude this one this element and then we want to take these and then we want to take this and then within these we want to select one comma three so one would be this and then inside that three would be zero one two three so we would be left with 18 but we would also be left with 43 so you can do this step by step again by just putting one index and two indices and three indices here you go we end up with 18 comma 43 okay and then here is another example where we have two ranges and then you have one index in between and here you have fewer indices one thing that you can also do is you can actually leave out if you uh, want to go all the way from start to end uh, then you can just put a colon and that will preserve that entire dimension completely no selection will happen there you can also use less than uh, so if you have three dimensions you can use one index you can use two indices you can use three indices but if you try to use too many indices you will get an index error okay so this notation and the results that we just got these can seem confusing at first especially if you're it's coming to you in such a short time but what you should do is you should take your time and experiment uh, so that you become comfortable with it okay and use the cells uh, use create some cells below so just by the way i'm pressing the b character so escape plus b creates cells so just create some cells and then try out some experiments and here is a visual representation so here you have a numpy array uh, and you can create this array over here and then you can try out these examples and see how that works okay it's all about experimenting the more you experiment the more you understand it okay and so now we've looked at pretty much everything numpy has to offer and one last thing that I want to share is how to create numpy arrays and we've seen np.array that is the easiest way to do it uh, and we've also seen gen from txt which can take it take the data from a csv file but you can also create arrays some special arrays using some direct functions so you can create an array of all zeros so np.zeros and then you give it a tuple containing the shape that you want to create and that will give you let's say this is a 3 by 2 array so that's a it contains all zeros this is also called the null matrix or the null array sometimes in when you talk about it in mathematics terms then you have these np dot ones so all of these are one and it has the shape that you pass to it so the shape can be a tuple or the shape can be a list uh, it it doesn't really matter at, as long as it is something that can be iterated over you can create the identity matrix so this is useful if you're performing some matrix operations uh, where you just want to pass in the identity matrix uh, you can create a random so you can create a random vector or a random matrix so for np has a uh, numpy has a dot random module so np dot random and inside it you have the rand function and then you also have the rand n function so what's the difference the rand function picks from picks uniformly a value between 0 to 1 but the rand n function picks it from a Gaussian distribution and this is where you need to know a little bit about a probability and uh, random distributions but if you don't 
you can just use rand n and b well most of the time and rand n generally gives values in the range of minus 2 to 2 it can even be higher it can generally be lower than minus 1 to 1 but it because it's picked from a probability distribution it can have a wide range of values but a lot of the values will be concentrated around 0 or specifically technical terms will say that it has a mean of 0 and a standard deviation of 1 anyway but if you don't understand those terms don't worry about it but one key thing to notice here is that while these normal array creation methods take tuples as the shapes for rand and rand n you need to pass in the shape as the arguments right so there is no tuple here so this will actually lead to an error yeah so that's just a random a small quirk in the np.random module that sometimes might cause values but you can experiment with this and you can check the documentation just call the help function and you will understand how to use it then you can create arrays with a, uh, you can create arrays with a fixed value so here we are creating a 2 by 3 matrix containing the number 42 and you can create arrays uh, you can create a range so you can say np dot a range so this is the analog for range in python so we are saying that we want to start at 10 we want to end at 90 and we want to take we want to take steps of 3 right so np dot a range so you can see 10 13 16 19 it goes up all the way up to 88 and i can check the size of i can check the shape of this and the shape it seems like there are 27 elements here now when you have this range what you can do is you can take this uh, you, or when you have any array in any array in numpy and what you can do is you can actually change the shape of the array so what you can say here is i can take np i can take this result of np dot a range which has 27 elements and i know that if i reshape it if i call reshape and i pass in 3 comma 3 comma 3 what does is this creates a 3d array where there are it has the length 3 along each dimension so essentially what it's doing is still the same numbers 10 13 16 19 20 25 it's just inter inserting brackets at the right places to make it look like a 3d array and that is why the reshape function can be quite uh, useful sometimes and remember you cannot just reshape this array containing 27 elements to any size if i tried 3 by 4 that will fail because you can because the number of elements does not match up right here you have 27 and here you have 12 that cannot match up so it has to be something like 3 by 3 it can be 3 by 9 it can be 1 comma 27 so you can actually increase the number of dimensions while still keeping the still keeping the same structure not changing too much and things like that one interesting thing is that because the number total number of elements is fixed while reshaping you can leave out one of the indices right so you can just leave out you can just say 3 3 minus 1 and numpy will automatically calculate that in total you need 27 elements uh, so then this number should be 27 divided by 3 multiplied by 3 so this number will be 27 divided by 9 so this number will be 3 uh, so if you leave it as minus 1 you can see that we get the same result okay so that's just how that's just a very nice way of creating numpy arrays of different shapes that you need another last function that i'll talk about is the lin space function so here what we do is we take some uh, we take a range so we have we go from 3 to 27 but now instead of taking a step what we provide is the number of elements that we want in the array and you automatically get equally spaced out numbers so if you wanted nine numbers so it, it we could go from 3 6 9 12 all the way up to 27 but if we wanted let's say 18 numbers then we would get back 18 numbers here all right so that's that i'll just make a one final commit here and let's just do a quick recap of all the topics that we just covered so for the first thing that we saw was how to go from python lists to numpy arrays uh, and why we should do that why we should consider it we also looked at how to operate on numpy arrays so we looked at the np dot dot function or the matrix multiplication uh, then we looked at the benefits of using numpy arrays over lists and then we saw the uh, we saw how we can go beyond just one dimension using multi-dimensional numpy arrays and then we also looked at examples of working with 
CSV data files, how to load them, how to perform computations and then write results back to a file. And then we looked at some arithmetic operations and broadcasting. And then we looked at array indexing and slicing. And finally, we looked at some other ways of creating NumPy arrays, right? So NumPy is in some sense, it's a very uh, small library because the core concepts that it offers are fairly small in number. But on the other hand, it is a very vast library as well. And it offers hundreds of functions. So if I go back to the NumPy documentation, so on the documentation, you will find a list of all the different functions. Let me see here. Yeah. So there is this, so there is this uh, uh, section called routines within the, uh, within the NumPy documentation. Let me just zoom it in for you. Yeah, so there is this uh, section called routines uh, and it is linked to in the notebook as well. So you can see here, these are all the different array creation routines and then you have array manipulation routines, then you have binary operators, string operators. So NumPy arrays can have strings as well, not just numbers, although we use it mainly for numbers. Then you have some date time related things. You have some, you have a bunch of mathematical functions. You have a bunch of things like calculus related functions, Fourier transforms, you have different ways of doing input and output. So it's not just text files. You have a linear algebra, you have logic, you have uh, array operations uh, here, more mathematical functions, trigonometry and so on matrices, polynomials, uh, randomization. So there's a whole random section for random sampling, sorting, searching statistics. So there are a lot of things here, right? And this brings us to the assignment. So because it's not really possible for one person to go through the entire documentation and I don't highly don't, I, I highly recommend not going through the entire documentation and trying to memorize it. That's just not a useful thing to do. But what you could do is just read a few of these and just try to experiment with them and come up with some interesting examples that you found unique, right? That's something that you did not come across in the documentation, something that you came across while you were experimenting. And that is what we are going to do in the assignment. So if I come back to the course page, so that is zero to pandas.com. Now here on the course page, you can see that assignment two is now live. And the objective of this assignment is to have a build a solid understanding of some NumPy array operations. So what you need to do is you need to pick five interesting NumPy array functions. So you will do that by going through the documentation. So specifically by going through this page on routines, and then you will run and modify a starter notebook. So let me just open up the starter notebook here and let me just quickly click run here. So the starter notebook contains some instructions. So you can see assignment two, it contains a bunch of instructions here, but the idea here is that you will go through the documentation and you will pick five interesting functions. For example, just as an example, let me pick uh, something related to Fourier transforms. If calculus, this might be of interest to you. So you pick five functions and then what you need to do is for each function you need to add, you need to come up with three examples. So three examples, two examples that work and one example that breaks. And then you also need to explain the function in your own words, right? And the way to do the way you, you need to do that is by modifying this Jupyter notebook, right? So you have a Jupyter notebook here when you run it and open it up. What you should do is give it a nice title. So let's say I'm going to call it something like find NumPy functions. You didn't know you needed. Okay. So basically I'm going to pick some rare functions, let's say, and then you can have a subtitle or not. It's up to you, but you should write a short introduction about NumPy. So think of it like a report or a blog post that you're writing, writing good documentation is an essential part of data science. It's a lot more important than you might think. So just write a short introduction to NumPy. What is NumPy used for? Use your own words. What do you take away from it? And then list the functions that you will be talking about. You can mention what functions you will talk about the five functions that you have picked and uh, then uh, then save the notebook. So I'm not going to commit here, but keep committing your notebook from time to time. Then here, once again, you need to list the functions this time inside a code cell. Okay. So I have 
I'm just going to show you one example. So I've put in NP dot concatenate here, but you should change this. So use something else here, whatever you come up with. So list the five functions. So like NP dot concatenate, NP dot max, NP dot min, let's say NP dot mean, NP dot median. All right. So these are the functions, statistics related functions I'm going to do. So you just list them here. Then for each function, you need to edit the in information. So function one NP dot concatenate. So change this to your first function, then add some explanation about the function in your own words, right? So you may want to experiment with it a little bit. So you can add a few cells here, do some experiments. And then uh, once you're done with experimentation, you can delete those cells. But finally, you need to have some basic ex uh, explanation about the function. And then you need to give three examples. So here is example number one where I'm concatenating two arrays uh, along the axis one, then you can give some explanation about the example if required, like how the example works. Then we have example two. So you can write, you can take, try to pick a example that illustrates something different. Like maybe instead of axis zero, axis one, I will, so instead of axis one, I will use axis zero and I will use different shapes of the inputs. So between two examples, you should generally be able to demonstrate the pretty good range of what a function can do. And then finally, the third example should be something that breaks. So this should lead to an error. So for example, here I'm trying to concatenate two arrays that cannot be concatenated. And this leads to an error. And then you can provide some explanation about why it breaks. Okay. Uh, so the idea here is that you read the documentation, you try to break the function and when it breaks, you understand why it is breaking and explain that. And when you do that, your own understanding of that function improves uh, dramatically. And finally, you can add some co closing comments about when you might want to use this function, where it can be useful. And all of this is just uh, for you to, you to really think about an answer. And then at the end of it, you just commit. So you run jovin.commit. And when you run jovian.commit, what this will do is this will save the notebook to your Jovian profile. Let me just uh, do, oops, let me do import Jovian and jovian.commit and I will set project equals assignment to live. And let me grab my API key. Okay, so now keep committing after every function, otherwise you may lose your work. And we've noticed that a lot of you have complained about this, about assignment one. So now it is committed to your Jovian profile. So now you need to take this link and remember, take this link and not the binder link because the binder instance will get shut down. So you take this link and then you come back to the assignment page and you can make a submission here. Okay. So now you can uh, put in the notebook link and this has to be a Jovian notebook link and click submit. And that is going to then put it into evaluation and then we will do the evaluation. Basically what we're looking for is you should have five functions and you should have some explanation and three examples for each function, two that work and one that breaks. And that is the whole idea here. But after doing that, after you're done with the submission, you can even uh, share your notebooks online on Twitter or LinkedIn or wherever. And that would require you to make your explanations nicer. Uh, one thing that you can do is before your final commit, you can actually remove this explanation block. So you can take this explanation block and then just get rid of it so that it looks a little bit nicer and that will uh, make it easier for you to share it online. So that is the assignment. That's what you need to do. That is the compulsory exercise for the week for the certification. Apart from the assignment, there is also a, there is also an optional exercise. Okay. Going back to the lecture. So on the lecture page, you will find, so coming back to lesson three, you will find an optional exercise here as well. hundred NumPy exercises. So this is a bunch of, uh, this is from a GitHub repository. It's a popular repository, which contains, uh, this is basically just hundred questions related to NumPy. So you can import the NumPy package, print some version, create a null vector, get some documentation create a null vector, fill in a certain value. So there are a lot of different exercises and this will help you get your hands dirty and this will require some exploration. So sometimes you may have to even search what some of these terms mean. And sometimes you may have to look up the documentation and try a few ideas. And these are hundred problems. So this is an optional exercise, but once again, if you want to really master, uh, 
Python and Master NumPy, we highly recommend doing these uh, 100 or at least try and do maybe 20 or 30 of these, pick a random set of 20 and uh, try and do these exercises. They're also marked by difficulty. So that's up to you. So those are the exercises, the required assignment and then the optional uh, and then the optional 100 NumPy exercises. All right. So with that, we complete our discussion of NumPy and I want to cover another topic here uh, since we have some time. So this is, we've looked at how to use NumPy and we've also seen briefly how NumPy works with files, but it is also a, a useful thing to know how to work with files and the operating system interact with the operating system in general using pure Python. Okay. And that is where we are going to use this other notebook called working with operating system and files. So I'm just going to click the run button here and click run on binder to run this notebook. And we'll see how, uh, how to work with files in Python. All right. So the notebook is loaded up now. So let me just hide the header and the toolbar and restart and clear the output here so that we can do things from scratch. Okay. So just as we've learned about the NumPy library, the NumPy module, we've seen a bunch of other modules like the math module. There is a module called OS short for operating system, which provides many functions for interacting with the operating system as well as the file system, which is basically your hard disk and all the files that exist on it. So let's try it out. So first we are going to import OS and then we can, so the simplest thing that you can do with OS is to just check what is the current working directory that we are in. So right now we are running on binder and bind this binder, this Jupyter notebook is actually running inside a particular directory. So to check the directory, we just say get CWD and you can see that it is running in a directory called slash home slash Jovian with a Y. Okay. Then the next thing that you might want to do is you might want to get the list of files in a directory. So to do that, you can use the list dir function and to it, you can pass either an absolute path. So all the way from the root, or you can also pass a relative path. So here we do like, and you can check the help. So it has a bunch of different things and it can, yeah. So it gives you a bunch of explanation about it. But if you just do os dot list dir dot, so this is a relative path dot refers to the current directory. So you can see that in the current directory, there is, this is our Jupyter notebook. And then there seem to be a bunch of other uh, files and folders. A lot of these have a dot in the beginning. So that means they are hidden files. That's why they don't show up when uh, you do something like file open because they are hidden files. Uh, and then there is, uh, and you can also check an absolute path. So if we check like the slash user directly slash USR, you can see here that it has all of these subdirectories and then you can navigate. So you can say us dot os dot list dir and pass in, let's say slash us user slash lib. And then you can probably go inside it and navigate around. And so this is the, the so just within Jupyter using Python itself, you can uh, browse around the file system. You can also create new files and new directories. So let's see how to create a directory. The way to create a directory is using the os dot make dirs function. And let's create a new directory called data where we will later download some files. So in the current directory, so dot refers to the current directory, we will create a new directory called data. And then we have this exists okay equal to true. Try using the help function or try reading the documentation to understand what it does. Okay, so now we've created a directory called data and we can verify this. There are a couple of ways to do this. If we just do file open and you can see here that a data directory got created, but I don't really even need to do that. I can just do os dot list dir dot. And since that returns a list and that's a nice thing, since that returns a Python list, you can simply check if data exists in that Python list and that returns true. And inside the data directory. So if you do os dot list dir dot slash data, you can see that directory is currently empty as we might expect. So now let us download some files into the data directory. And again, you, we are going to use the URL lib module to do this. So here are three URLs for files and we're going to import URL lib dot request. This is the module which contains the URL retrieve function. 
So we are taking the first URL and go, we are going to download it to dot slash data slash loans one dot txt. And similarly, we are going to retrieve and download the other two files as well. So now we have downloaded three files inside the data directory. So you can see now the data directory contains three files, loans one, loans two and loans three. Okay. Now to read the contents of a file, we first need to open it and to open it in Python, there is a built in function called open. Now the open function takes a path and then it takes a mode in which to open the file. Do you want to open the file for reading or do you want to open the file for writing? And if you want to open it for writing, do you want to replace the existing contents or do you want to append to the end? So there are a bunch of modes and you can see here. And then there's also something called a binary mode and the binary mode is for non text files. Let's say you're working with images or you're working with some kind of uh, file, which cannot be read as text. So that's when you can use the binary mode. So the open function, when we call it, that returns what is called a file object or sometimes also called a file pointer. And the file object contains several methods for interacting with the contents of the file. So, so you may not just want to, uh, it, you don't always need to just read the content. Sometimes you may want to do other things as well. So that's why you have the entire file object available to you. So now to get the contents of the file, we take the file object file one, and then we call dot read on it. So when we call file one contents, a dot read and then we can get the entire contents of the file into a single string. So this becomes a string and we can use a print function to print the file contents and just to just for you to see that it is a string. I'm just going to just output file contents here. And you can see that this is a string that this contains a, a bunch of data and then this contains some new line characters. So when we pass it into the print print functions, it pr just prints it nicely. It prints the new line characters or new lines and so on. Okay. So this is what the file contains. And uh, actually, if you remember the previous lecture in the previous lecture, we were talking about loans, about people taking a home loan with a certain amount for a certain duration of time. Let's say a duration, uh, uh, let's say somebody is borrowing a hundred thousand dollars somebody is buying a house worth a hundred thousand dollars and they are taking a loan which lasts 36 months and they're taking it at 8% per annum. And then they're also doing a down payment of 20,000, right? So the actual loan amount is only $80,000. So they're taking $80,000 in loan for 36 months at 8% per annum. And then we had a function to calculate the equal monthly installment. So for this, I will refer you back to the previous lecture two or lesson two where we had a discussion about functions. So this represents the information for one loan. And then you have information about uh, other loans. So each line represents information about one loan, right? And then the first row tells you what these numbers mean. So the first number means amount. The second number means duration. The third number means rate and the fourth number means down payment. And you will notice that in some cases there is no down payment here. So that's why it is empty. Okay. And once again, this is the CSV or the comma separated value format. So we've read the file, we've seen its contents. And when we are done with the file or when we've read something from a file already and we are done with it, it is important to close the file because especially with larger files, what happens is that when you open a file, that file is put into the system RAM or uh, memory. So if you keep opening files, but you don't close them, then that will eat up your RAM and that might slow things down for you. So you remember to close the file and once a file is closed, it can no longer be read, right? So I've closed the file. So now we get that the IO operation on the closed file is not valid. Okay. So let's now try and process the CSV file. Okay. But before we do that, because we always need to open a file. So whenever we open a file, uh, we always need to close it as well. So the Python has some special syntax for it. So there is something called a with statement. Now this with statement is used for a lot of things, but one most common use case is with open. So you say with open, and then you have the open statement and you can also have a mode here by default. The mode is a read mode. And then you say as file or uh, whatever variable name you want to give to the file object. So with open loans to as file to, we get file to contents and we read the contents and we simply print the contents. 
So we put a bunch of code inside a block. So we indent it a little bit. So that puts it in a block. And what that does is after running this code, it automatically closes the file. So we've done all this with file two and we've never called file two dot close. And if we try to invoke file two dot read outside the with statement, you will see that it uh, leads to an error. Yeah, so it leads to an error IO operation on a closed file. Okay, so that's that. But now the next thing that we want to look at is how to read a file line by line. So sometimes you may, you may not want to read the entire file at once, but you may want to read different lines. So here we have, we are opening the file loans three as file three. And then instead of calling read, we are calling read lines. And when we call read lines, then each line is a separate string and you get a list of strings. So each element of the list is a line. Now, one important thing to note here though, is that here there is this new line character at the end of every line, which you may not want. So the way to avoid the way to skip the new line character is that you might want to then go to file three underscore lines. Let's say I get this particular line. It has a new line character and I can just call strip. And when we call strip, what that does is that removes the new line character. So strip is used to remove spaces at the beginning, spaces at the end and new line characters. Okay. And it's pretty, it's specially useful when you're using read lines. So whenever you call read lines, remember to use strip to remove the new line character. Okay. So now we've seen how to get information out of files into a string, but we might want to go further. And in the previous, in the NumPy tutorial, we just directly used NumPy gen from txt. But for this particular file, we cannot use that because these numbers, sometimes not all the values may be numbers. You may have a combination of strings and numbers and that causes a problem. But sometimes as in this case, values may be missing, right? You may have to account for missing values. So for example, if we check this file too, you can see that down payment is present for the first loan, but there is no down payment for the second loan. Uh, and there is no down payment for the fourth loan. And now if you try to read it directly using NumPy, this might be difficult. So this is where now we have to do some custom processing. So here's what we can do. Okay. So we will read the file line by line, and then we will parse the first line to get the list of column names or headers. Then we will split each remaining line we will split each remaining line and convert each value into a float. So maybe let's also try and do that step by step. So here is, let's say, let's get the contents of file two. So we have the contents of file two. Let's print it. Okay. So we will first read the first line, the headers. And from here we will get the names of all the columns all the data names of all the different fields in our data, which is the amount duration rate of interest and down payment, then each line. So a line like this, we will take this line and we will split it into, we will split it into the different parts that it has. So this can be done just by calling split with a comma. So here we get back a list of all the values. Then we will convert each of these values into a float because these are actually numbers ultimately. And we will also have to handle a special case where there is no value for down payment. Then what we will do is we'll, is we'll actually convert this into a dictionary. We want to take this line and then we want to write it like this. So we want to say amount is eight to eight, four double zero. Then we want to say duration is one twenty. Then we want to say rate is point one one and then down payment is a hundred thousand. Okay. And that becomes basically our loan one. So now we've created a loan object and this is a much nicer thing to look at. Uh, we know exactly what's going on here. We've created a loan dictionary. So we will convert. So we'll create a dictionary for each loan and we'll use the headers as keys. So these same headers that we saw here are getting used as keys and the values are just the values that we passed from the line and converted it into numbers. Okay. Uh, then finally, 
what we will do is we will create a list of dictionaries to keep track of all the loans. So this is loan number one. Similarly, you will have loan number two. So all the loans together can be tracked in a dictionary. So let me just put this on one line. So this is loan one and then I might take uh, loan one and then I might create loan two and then I might create loan three and so on. So each, so this one, the data for this loan will come here and then the data for this loan will come here. So what we want to do is we want to parse the file into a list of dictionaries, which is a lot nicer to work with that. Now we have our own Python data structures and we can write functions and perform calculations on these Python data structures. Another thing as an exercise you can try is instead of converting it into a list of dictionaries, try converting it into a NumPy array. Okay. Anyway, so this is what we want to do. Now, whenever you have a target like this, you know what, uh, where you are, like you have a, the lines from a file and where you want to get to, you want to get to a list of dictionaries. So it helps to first list out the process. What is the step by step process? And then it helps to create a small helper function for each of these steps. So our entire, we'll have a read CSV function, which performs all of these things, but we will also define some helper functions to build up the functionality step by step. Okay. First of all, let us start by defining the parse header function. So it takes a header, it takes a header line, which is the first line of the file and it simply strips it. So stripping removes any new line characters, any spaces at the beginning or at the end, and then it splits it at the, uh, and when we call split on comma. Okay. This is a very simple function. So this is the header line amount, duration, rate, down payment, new line, comma separated. We call parse headers on this line from file three dot lines, file three underscore lines, which we just read previously. So remember file three underscore lines came in here. So let's just take that here as well. Yeah. So file three underscore lines came in here. So now we check the headers and it looks like we now have the headers amount, duration, rate and down payment and in a list. Okay, great. Next going forward, let us define a function parse values. So which takes a line, a data line as an argument. So something like this. So this is a data line file three lines two. So it has the well amount, duration, rate, down payment, new line, and it converts, it returns a list of floating point numbers. Okay. So how does it do that? It creates an array of values. Then it goes through the data line and then it uh, strips each line and then it, it splits the data line into an array. So if we take this data line, so let's say we take file three lines two as our data line and then we call strip and then we split it. Then we get back four, five, three, two, three, zero, 48, 0 0.07, 4,300 and the new line is gone. Okay. So now we have a list. So now we go over each item in the list and then we convert that item into a float and then we append it to values. All right. So we take each of these items, convert it into a float and then put it back into this values array and then we return the values. So let's try it out. Let's call parse values on this line. So this line takes four, five, two, three, zero, 48, 0 0.07, 4,300. Now you can see that all of these are converted into floats. Okay. So now we have parse headers and we have parse uh, values. Let's try it for another line from the file. This line does not have a down payment. So here it has a amount duration, a rate of interest, but there's no down payment. And if we call it here, you will see that here you will get a value error here. You'll get an error. So you might want to explore why an error showed up. So here it says it could not convert a string to a float. Okay. That's interesting. So let's check what string it could not convert into a float. So if you go back up, you will see that on values dot append, there was an issue when we are calling float on item that seems to be the issue. So let's go back. Let's go through the file here. Let's go through file. Let's go through the line that we are working with. So let's take this line and let us uh, strip it and let us split it on comma. And we can see here we have three numbers. But then because there is no down payment, we have the empty string and the empty string cannot be converted to a float. So you can just try it here. So I am in inserting a new cell and pasting the empty string and that leads to us through the same value error. Okay. 
So this is how you narrow down an error in Python. So you can simply find out which line the error is on, read through the error and then inspect. Okay, we were going through a list. So let me just print out the list. So I just printed out the list here and then I noticed that, okay, it seems like there is an empty element. Maybe I failed to convert that into a, into a float. So let me try converting that into a float and it seems like that gives me the same error. Okay. So all said and done. Now what we know is that we need to handle this empty string in a special fashion. So this is also called an edge case because this is uh, not something that comes up always. So a function can work properly without an edge case, but sometimes it might give an error. Okay. So this is what we do now that once again, we iterate through the data line, which is then stripped and which has been split. And if the item is the empty uh, string, then we append the value zero. So we say that if, okay, if the down payment or whatever is empty, then we simply use the value zero in its place. So this, you can also, this is called handling missing values. And we'll see it in the future as well using pandas, how to handle it. And if it does have a value, then we simply convert it to a float. Okay. So now we have parse values and here we have, so now we see file three lines one, this does not have a down payment. And now we call parse values on it. And we can see that all the values got passed properly and a zero got inserted for the down payment. Okay. So now we've done one more step. We've parsed the header. We've parsed the values. Uh, now we can create a dictionary of the data. So here, what we can do is to the dictionary, we can give a list of values. We can give a list of headers and I will let you figure out what is happening inside this function. But the idea is it takes and I'll, and we've also already seen the zip function, but you can see an example of the zip function here as well. But the idea is that it takes this. So this is the bunch of, uh, this is a line and I'm taking this line and converting it into a set of values. So let's see values one. So here are a set of values from a line uh, of the loan. And we also have the headers. So here are the headers. So create item dict take the, takes the values, takes the headers and returns this dictionary. Okay. So for each loan, we are going to get back a dictionary. And then finally, here's another example. So for a different loan or different line of data, we are getting back a different dictionary. All right. So now we have create item dict as well. So now we have been able to parse the header line. We've been able to parse values and we are able to convert the values and headers together into a dictionary. So now we can write a read CSV function. Uh, again, we'll just briefly go over it and then you can read it in more detail. So the read CSV function takes a path, the path to the CSV file that you want to read and it creates a result list. So first it opens the file in read mode as F. So F is your file object or file pointer. Then it gets the list of lines. So it, it we call F dot read lines and that gives us the list of lines. Then it parses the header. So it calls parse header, parse headers on line zero. So remember the first line, the zeroth line will contain the headers. So that will give us the list of headers. Then it loops over all the remaining lines. So if I, if you see an example here, it is then going to pick each line one by one. And then for each line, but we're only checking the remaining lines, right? So we, that's why we have this one colon here because we want to skip the header row. We've already parsed the header. Then it parses the values. So it takes this line and converts each of these into floating point numbers. Then it takes the values and it takes the headers and it creates an item dictionary. So that creates a dictionary and then it takes that dictionary and appends it to the result, which is an array, uh, which is a list where we are keeping track of all the dictionaries. Okay. So that's our read CSV function and let's try it out. So this is our loans to file. And if we call read CSV on loans to, so looks like we have gotten a list of dictionaries and you can verify that these values match these values. All right. So that's it. So that is how you read and process a file using just plain Python. So you use the open command and you use the open function and then you can read lines. And then for each line, you can do some processing and the processing does not have to be this complicated. Instead of take creating an entire dictionary, you could simply have just created, let's say an, a list of the values. And then you could have taken the list of uh, list of values and just converted them into a NumPy array. That is another way to do it. 
uh, but this is just I wanted to show you something different. Okay, now one interesting thing to notice here is that this read CSV function that we have uh, defined, this is actually generic enough that this can parse any CSV format, not not just this specific format of uh, home loans, right? So it can have a CSV file with any number of rows and any number of columns and it can also handle missing values. In just about 15-20 lines of code we've written a pretty powerful function that can that can be pretty helpful and what you should do is over time you should start building a repository of your own functions. Maybe you should just keep a python file somewhere on your github or just on your computer where you keep where you list out all the interesting functions that you have made. Okay so that's that. Now what we can do is we can now do some processing so we have this uh, list of loans and we can then we can do some processing on this list of loans and for to, for doing the processing once again I will refer you back to the previous lecture 2 on functions where we defined a function called loan EMI that takes the amount for a loan, the duration, the rate of interest and a down payment and it returns, it performs a calculation and returns the equal monthly installment for the repayment of the loan uh, and this we've covered in a lot of detail in the previous uh, uh, lecture so please refer to lesson 2 and refer to the part on functions okay so what we want to do now is we have this function that operates on a single loan and then we have a list of loans now we can now we can work on this and use this function to apply uh, to calculate the equal monthly installment for each of the loans in that list okay so here we read the csv file loans to and now we have loans to which is a list of loans now what we can do is we can say for loan in loans to so just iterate over each of the loans get, uh, once we get a loan so since each loan is a dictionary we can add a new key within the dictionary called EMI and here we can simply the EMI is calculated as using the loan EMI function and we just need to pass in the amount we pass in the duration we pass in the rate of interest and we divide the rate of interest by 12 because for the equal monthly installment we need the monthly rate of interest and what we have in the CSV file is the annual rate of interest and finally we have the down payment so we take all of these and uh, now you can see that loans 2 contains not just the amount duration rate but it also contains the EMI right so just in a single for loop we have now calculated EMIs for all the loans and we can actually take that and now put that into a function so that you can read from any file uh, a list of loans and then you can pass it into the compute EMI's function and that will add the EMI inside those loans okay so great so now we have uh, defined functions to compute the EMI so let us now take this function and use that to first read some loans from a file compute EMI's for those loans and then print out and then print out so uh, these EMIs along with the original data back to a file okay so first we read the CSV loans to we compute the EMIs and then now we have loans to with the EMIs now we want to write it back to a file to write to a file we open with the W mode so we are going to write to the file dot slash data slash EMIs 2txt so for loans 2 we have EMIs 2 and we are going to open it in W or write mode. So in write mode, we are if the file exists or if it does not exist, it gets created. If it exists, then the data gets wiped out and we write fresh. Then we iterate over the loans in loans2. And then we simply call f. So f.read is to read information from the file. f.write is to write information to the file. So to write to f. we need to provide a string. So here we are going to use the string formatting uh, notation. So in the string we have one, two, three, four, five gaps and then each of these so here we will insert the loan amount, we will insert the loan duration, we will insert the loan rate, we will insert the down payment and we will insert the EMI okay and then we will separate them with commas and we will include a new line character okay so this will make sure that one, one loan is written to one line along with the EMI. So there you go. Now we have just written to the EMI's file and if we check now the data directory you will find that apart from the three loans files now it has an EMI's file EMI's2.txt and uh, 
we can read the data back from that file. So you can see emis2.txt has um, the loan information and at the end it also has the EMI. Okay. So as with everything else, every time we implement some interesting logic like this, it's a good idea to write a function. So let's convert that into a write CSV function. So just as we had the read CSV, which takes in a file and returns a list of dictionaries, we have we are now writing the write CSV function, which takes in a list of dictionaries and a path, and then it writes it to that path. Okay. So I'll let you go over this function. It does the same thing that we have already looked at here, except that it will also add a header line. So I'll let you figure that out by just going through that function step by step. And uh, let's try it out. So we have loans three, we read loans three, and then we compute the EMIs for loans three, and then we write it back. And you can see here, we have created EMIs three dot txt, which contains the amount, duration, rate, down payment, and EMI. And uh, if you want to do it for all the different, uh, all the different files that we have, so we have loans one, loans two, loans three dot txt, we want to compute the EMI. So what we can do is we can iterate I in the range one to four. So that will take, I will take the values one, two and three, and we can call read CSV on each of these. So when we use the string formatting, we will read loans one dot txt, then loans two dot txt, then loans three dot txt. And that will, and each of these loans, we can compute the EMIs. So we can insert using the uh, data that is already present, we can insert the EMI key uh, using the loan EMI function. And then we can write that back into a EMIs file. So loans one goes to EMIs one.txt, loans two goes to EMIs two, and loans three goes to EMIs three. And yeah, and that's it. So now once we have all of these functions in place, we have, we can read each downloaded file, calculate the EMIs and write the results back to new files. And now we just check os.listir and you can see here that we have loans one, loans two, loans three, and then we have EMIs one, EMIs two and EMIs three. Okay. So that is how you read and write, read from and write to files using Python and always try to create functions for whatever you do. And that is that then you will start to see the real power of a programming language like Python for processing large amounts of data. Okay. So that completes our discussion of working with files. So I'm just going to save my notebook here, commit it to Jovian. So we copy the API key and paste it here. All right. So that's, and, and that's pretty much uh, what it is. And I've also linked to some other resources here. So you can just look through these other resources to learn more about working with files in Python. The topic for today is analyzing tabular data with pandas, which is one of the libraries that we are exploring in this journey towards data analysis. So let's get started. So the notebook that we are going to use today is called analyzing tabular data with pandas. So you can click through and open this notebook. So this is a notebook, a Jupyter notebook hosted on the Jovian.ml platform, just as we've been using this for other lectures. And the first thing you should do, and please don't do it right now. Uh, right now you can just watch the lecture, but later on you can click run and click run on binder. And when you do this, we will take this notebook and run it on an online platform called Binder Hub. And it might take a few minutes to start up for you, but please wait for a few minutes and it should start up just fine. I've clicked the run button and I have selected run on Binder. And now that has opened up this Jupyter notebook interface. This is where we will be doing all of our coding and we will be executing the code. So I'm just going to open up this specific notebook pandas python pandas data analysis and the first thing that i like to do just before starting any tutorial from an existing jupyter notebook is to go kernel restart and clear output so this clears so this clears all the outputs so that we can now execute the cells execute the code and view the outputs from scratch and i will also do a view toggle header and view toggle toolbar so that you can see things a little better but you can keep the toolbar around it has many useful functions okay 
So as we've been going along this journey, we've done a lot of things. We've learned some basics of Python and Jupyter. We've also done a quick tour of variables and data types in Python. And then we looked at branching using conditional statements and loops. And all of these, you got a chance to test, try them out in the first assignment. Then we looked at writing reusable code using functions, reading and writing from files and numerical computing with NumPy. Now all of these topics are available in the previous lectures, so you can go watch these videos and you can also test out your skills after watching these videos by doing the assignments. Today we are looking at analyzing tabular data with pandas. Now we are running this code on an online platform, Binder Hub, and that is why we use the run button on Jovian. But you can also run this on your computer locally and the instructions are given here. The instructions might vary slightly based on your operating system and the version of Python that you're using, but you should be able to follow along with this quite easily. Okay. So pandas is typically used for working with tabular data. And when I say tabular data, you can think of the data stored in a spreadsheet or in a database table. And the first thing that you might want to do is to actually read a data file into the Jupyter notebook using pandas and pandas provides many helper functions to read data from various file formats like CSVs, Excel, spreadsheets, HTML, JSON, and, and many more. But the most common format by far what I've seen is the CSV format. So let's download a file Italy COVID device.csv, which contains the device COVID data for Italy in this format. And we're using COVID data because this is something like we are right now in the middle of a pandemic and it is it is a real tragedy and there is a lot of information floating around. Some of it is right and some of it is just wrong. So what I wanted to help you with is to look at the raw data, analyze the raw data and make your own inferences and also know what are the shortcomings in the raw data. So any headline that you read or any metric that you see, you should be taking it with a grain of salt and trying to verify it on your own. If you're suffering from the coronavirus or know somebody who is, our best wishes are with you. So this is the format and we have the data for Italy here. So the let's maybe let's download the file and let's we will look at it. So to download a file, we will be using the URL retrieve function from the URL lib dot request module. So this is the URL lib dot request module and from it we import URL retrieve. And this is the URL from where you can download the file. So we pass the URL and then we also pass a file name where we want to download the file. So we want to download it into the current directory with the name Italy COVID device.csv. So let's run it now. And the file has been downloaded. Now, if you want to see the downloaded file, you can click file open and you will be able to see here that earlier we did not have Italy COVID device, but now we have it. Let's give it a second to show the file. Okay, so while it loads, the format of the file is something like this. So the first row contains, the first line contains headers or column names. So we have the date, we have new cases, new deaths and new tests. And then we have day wise data. So this is each line represents the data for one day. So on the, so this starts from, let's say the 21st of April, the number of new cases was 200, 2,256, the number of new deaths was 454 and the number of new tests was 28,095. And this is the format in which you have the data for a bunch of different days. Okay. This file is loaded. So you can see here date, new cases, new deaths and new tests. And then you have the data starting from the 31st of December and day wise data going all the way up to the third of all the way up to the third of September. So just a couple of days ago. And this is only the new cases and deaths and tests daily for Italy. Okay. And this is called the comma separated value format because the values are separated by commas. All right. So to read this file, we can use the read CSV method from pandas. And it's a really simple method. Of, so before that we need to import pandas and the pandas library by convention is typically imported using the alias PD so that you do not have to write pandas each time. So once you've imported pandas as PD, then you can create, we call PD.readCSV and then pass in the file name or the full file path. And that 
returns what we call a data frame. So that's why we're calling it COVID underscore DF. So DF is a suffix just indicating that this is a data frame and data frame is, so the data from the file is read and stored in a data frame object, which is the core data structure and pandas for storing and working with tabular data. Now we typically use the DF suffix to identify data frames, but you don't have to. And if you check the type of COVID DF, it has the type pandas.core.frame. So this is the module where this class lives and that it, it is a, an object of the type of the class data frame. And let's take a look at this data frame. What exactly does it look like? So once we run the cell, we see that this, it looks like a table. So very much like a database table or a spreadsheet and looks like there are some columns, the same columns that we just saw. And there are some rows and there seem to be 248 rows and four columns. And we, and as we've seen, this provides four daywise counts and the metrics reported are new cases, deaths and tests. And the data is provided for 248 days from December 12th to the September to September 3rd. Now, one thing to keep in mind is that these are officially reported numbers and it's possible that the actual number of cases and deaths may be far higher because not all cases are diagnosed and not all cases are reported. So you should not take this information to assume that we have a full list of all the cases. And now we can view some basic information about the data frame using the info method. So if you call COVID DF dot info, we will get some information like the list of columns. So the columns are, as we've seen already date, new cases, deaths, and tests on a daily basis. And it seems like if you just see the non null counts, then there are 248 values each for the first three columns, but new tests, there seem to be some null values. If you see here, you will see NAN and this NAN indicates that there was no value provided in the file for that specific of on that specific date for this specific column. And it's different from zero because zero indicates that the value zero was provided. So that's an important distinction. So that's some basic information and you can see that it has, uh, you see the number of entries, you can see the data types that are available. Now the date column seems to have the object data type. So object is the generic data type whenever pandas cannot really figure out what type of data is there in a particular column. And the rest of them, it has figured out that these are floating point numbers. Now, one other thing that you can do just to get a quick overview of the numeric data is to call the describe method. Now, if you call COVID DF dot describe for each of the numeric columns, cases, deaths, and tests, you will get back the total count of non null uh, of non null entries. You will get back the mean or the average. So the, it seems like the average number of cases per day was 1094. But if you check the standard deviation, it seems like the standard deviation is about 1500. So that means it's a very high deviation and that's expected because um, it, th this graph initially it was close to zero. So it, during January, there were basically no cases on a daily basis, but during March, the case load was really high and then the case load went down again. So that's why the standard deviation is very high. So the mean by itself is not very useful. And there are a few other metrics as well that you can look at. It seems like the maximum number of cases on a specific day was 6,557. That's pretty high. Now the column property of the data frame will contain the list of columns. So you can call COVID DF dot columns, and that will give you the list of columns in the data frame. And then you can also retrieve the number of rows and columns as a tuple using the shape method. So these are all different ways to get some meta information about the data frame. So we have looked at info, which is a basic information about rows, columns, and data types. Then we have describe, which has statistical information about the numeric columns. Then we have columns to get the list of column names and shape to get the number of rows and columns as a tuple. Apart from that, we've seen how to read data from a CSV, but apart from read CSV, you have read SQL files, read, you can read Excel files, you can read JSON files and a lot, dif a lot, many different formats. Okay. So before we move forward, let us save our notebook because we are running this on an online platform binder. And this, if you leave this tab idle for some time, th this Jupyter notebook may shut down and you may lose your work. So I'm just going to install the Jovian Python library and then I'm going to import it and run Jovian.commit. 
And what this does is this asks me for an API key, which I can get from my Jovian profile after logging in. And after logging in, I, I can copy my API key by clicking the API key button here. And then I can paste it here and hit enter. What this does is this captures this notebook running on binder and this takes a snapshot and it puts this snapshot on my Jovian profile so that I can access, I don't lose my work even if this, even if this server shuts down. And later what you can do is you can come back and you can run, run on binder again from this notebook on your profile. So every time you do some significant work, just keep saving, keep committing your notebook to Jovian. Okay. So moving right ahead. So now the first thing that we might want to do once we have loaded up this data, the COVID DF data frame is to retrieve some of the data from this data frame. So we, for instance, we might want to know what is the count of new cases on a specific day? Let's say the 4th of April, right? So a specific value within a specific column and a row. Now to do this, it might help to understand what the internal representation of data in a data frame looks like. So conceptually, you can think of a data frame as a dictionary of lists. So you can think of a data frame as having a structure like this that the COVID data, uh, COVID DF data frame is similar in structure to the, to this COVID data dict, which is a dictionary. And then this dictionary contains the keys. The keys are the names of the columns, a uh, column headers. And then the values of those keys are lists or arrays containing the values in those columns. So, so it's a little bit flipped from what you might be used to, but this analogy is helpful to think about uh, pandas data frames. Now, obviously it is not an actual dictionary and inside it, you do not have actual arrays because internally it, pandas is implemented in C plus using a bunch of other libraries. So it uses some other internal data structures, but this is the conceptual picture that you should have in mind. Now representing this data in this format has a few benefits and that is why pandas does it. Now, the one thing is that all the values in the column typically have the same type of uh, the same data type. So it's more efficient to store them in a single array. That's one thing. The second thing is that retrieving the values for a particular row. Let's say we want to know what were the values in the fourth row. So we simply can fetch the fourth element from each column. So that is simply one an array indexing, which is very efficient, especially when the data types are all the same. So that's a very efficient operation. So fetching the information for a row becomes very efficient. And then finally, the representation is a more compact compared to other formats. So another format that you can think of is that we actually use a list of dictionaries where we have a list and then inside each list, each row is represented as a dictionary, which contains the date, new cases, new deaths, and new tests. Now this is this will take up a lot more space because we are repeating the column names for every single row. And this will also not be as performant. On the other hand, this takes up far less space and is a lot more performant. All right. So keep this picture in mind as we try to retrieve data from this pandas data frame. I personally struggled a lot initially because I did not see this picture and I would often wonder how exactly do you get data out of a data frame? Okay. And so this is not the picture that you should have. This is not how pandas stores it. And this is the format how pandas actually stores data conceptually at least. Okay. So now with this analogy in mind, we can now guess how we might be able to retrieve data from the data frame. So the first thing that we might be able to do is let's see the data frame once again. So this is, this is the data frame here. So the first thing that we might be able to do for the data dictionary that we created for the analogy, we know that the keys are column names. So accessing a key using the indexing notation, gives us all the values, all the, the list of values in a column. So we can do the same here. We can call, we can index into COVID DF for new cases. And you see here, you can see that we have all the values. So starting with a bunch of zeros and going down to these numbers, and you can verify that these numbers match with the numbers shown here. So we have been able to retrieve a full list of values in, in, in a particular column. Okay. And now each column is actually, it's not really a list or an array, but each column is represented using a data structure called a series, which is essentially a, a NumPy array, but it has some extra methods and properties associated with it. So if you check the type of COVID DF new cases, you will find that it has the type series. And just like arrays, you can retrieve a specific value within the series 
using the indexing notation. So this gives us a series and then out of the series, we can get the 200 and uh, the value at the 246 index. So you can see that it has a specific index that is listed here. So 246 is the value is 975. So there you go, you get the value 975. And similarly, if you go in, let's say 243, you will get the value for, and for new tests, you will get the value uh, 53541. Again, we can verify this by going up. So 243, you can see that the data for new tests is 53541, all right? So that's how you can dig in. You can go find a column using the index and then you can index into the column. So the, which is a series, you can index into it by passing the index of the row now that you want to access. Okay. Now this is a little bit inconvenient. So Python also pandas also provides a helpful at method and the at method can be used to directly retrieve the value at a specific row and column. Okay. So you can simply say COVID dot at now here you need to specify the row first, which is, which can sometimes feel more natural. So at the row 246 and then the column uh, is new cases and you get back the same value 975 and we can check add the row 243 and new tests and we get back the same value 53,541. Okay. So instead of using the indexing notation, apart from what we've seen already, pandas also allows accessing columns as properties of the data frame using the dot notation. So here, what you can also do is you can say COVID DF instead of saying COVID DF. So this is the same as saying COVID DF and then using the indexing notation. Instead of doing that, you can simply say COVID DF dot new cases. So this is a slightly easier to write. It saves you a few keystrokes and it also, what you can also do is you can just type COVID DF dot and then start typing N and press the tab character and that will auto complete the column names for you. So this is a good way to just explore the columns and other properties of a data frame. So that's one other way to access a column. Apart from that, what you can also do if you want to access multiple columns together, so you can pass in instead of a single column, you can pass in a list of columns into the indexing notation to access like a, a, what is called a subset of the data frame with just the given columns. So here notice this double bracket here. So the first bracket is for the indexing notation. And now instead of saying just a single date, we can simply pass in a full list of columns and passing in that list of columns is going to give us a smaller data frame with just those columns. So now we have the date and we have the new cases right here. Okay. Now one thing to note here is that this cases data frame, the, the data frame that we just created right now, it is simply a view of the original data frame. So that means they both point to the same data. So if you were to somehow modify the information here at this location, or you were to modify it on in the original data frame. So more modifying in one would make the change in the other one as well, because they're pointing to the same data in memory. And this is a very important thing to understand because this is what makes pandas really fast, especially when you're working with tens of thousands or millions of rows of data. So pandas can, you can keep creating new data frames. You can keep generating new columns. You can keep processing this data without having to worry about repeatedly copying the data over and over. So that is slow and that takes up a lot of memory, but you do not need to worry about it at all. But the downside of that is if you change something inside one data frame, all the other data frames, which are derived from it will also change. However, so in the cases where you do need a full copy, and you normally don't, but in case you do need a full copy, all you can do, all you need to do is just call the copy method. So if I create COVID DF copy as COVID DF dot copy, then the data stored within this new data frame is completely separate from the COVID DF data frame. So modifying the values inside one will not affect another. All right. So to access now to access a specific row, we've looked at how to access columns. We've looked at how to access specific elements, but to access a specific row, you can use the dot LOC method. So the dot LOC method actually requires indexing. So here we have the data frame once again, and let us try to access this row of data. So you need to pass in this index 243 into dot LOC. So notice the, it's not a method. It is, it's more of, you need to use the indexing notation here. So we say COVID DF dot LOC pass in 243 and then we get back new cases, new deaths and new tests. And that's, and you can verify that this data matches what we see here. And each retrieved row is also a series object. So this is also a data 
This is also a series, just like each retrieved column. So that's about getting a single row, but then you can also get multiple rows out of the data. And it sometimes it might help to just look at just the first five or 10 rows, or maybe just the last five or 10 rows. Uh, then to get the first few rows, you simply use the head method. So here we are trying to get the first five rows. You can see these are the first five rows, the first few days of January. And then you can also see the last few rows. So you can use tail for that. And here you can see the a data for the last few days of August and then the first few days of September. All right. Now, one thing you might notice here is, and this is something that we mentioned earlier is that some values are zero and some values are NAN. And how do you check? You no, know, the, the reason this happens is because this column does not have any information in the data file. So if we open up the data file again, so this is the file Italy COVID device.txt. And if you check here that initially there are only two numbers available. So you have the date, new cases, new deaths, but there's no data available for new tests. All right. And then sir, after a few days, after about two or three months, you start seeing data for new tests. This is an important thing to understand. And this info, so what pandemic does whenever it does not find a value uh, within a CSV file or any other file, whenever it sees a blank value, it inserts the NAN value there. So you can just check it out. So if you, if we just try to access the zeroth row or we try to access this last element here, so row zero and column new tests, you can see that the value is NAN. And if you check its type, it's actually a floating point number. So it's a floating point number, but it is not really a number. It is in fact, NAN stands for not a number. So whenever uh, any and, and it is different from zero. And that's an important distinction to understand that in this data set, it represents that the daily test numbers were not reported on specific dates. And that is why you have the number NAN here. And if you find out, if you look it up online, you will find that Italy started sharing or reporting daily tests only after April 19th, 2020. And before that time, 935,310 tests had already been conducted. So this is some additional information that is not present in the CSV. And uh, this is something that we should know beforehand while we are performing any operations so that we account for this as well. Okay. So when you see a bunch of NANs in a column, for instance, the column like uh, new tests, the first thing that you might want to do is just identify where do the first valid indices begin. So you can check that by simply getting the series. So COVID DF dot new tests and calling a dot first valid index on the series. And here it tells you that the first valid index is one, one, one. And now once you've gotten the first valid index, it might help to look at a few rows before and after this index, just to verify that the values are indeed changing from NAND to the actual numbers. If I, if we call COVID DF dot LOC with one zero eight to one, one three. So now we see a range of rows instead of a single row. And you can see here that around 19th April was the last day when there were no daily tests reported. And then from the 20th of April, we started seeing a daily test number. Okay. So that's about accessing rows of a data uh, of a data frame. Now, one last method I want to talk about is the sample method, which can be used to retrieve a random sample of rows from the data frame. So it's good to look at the first few last few, maybe a slice in between, but what might really help to get a sense of the data to see what kind of values are in there uh, is just to go through sample rows, random, randomly picked rows. And I often tend to do this my five or 10 times with a sample size of 10 or 20, just to get a feel for the data and the feel for the range of numbers. If see which ones have NAN values, which ones do not. And of course it's not perfect, but it is something just to get a visual understanding of the data. Okay. Now, one thing to also notice here is that while we get the sample out, you can see that the original indices of those rows are still retained. And that's a very useful thing. In fact, that makes pandas a lot more useful than just a numpy array where if you took a random sample, you wouldn't know where those uh, elements came from. But here you also know that, okay, we've gotten the 151st element and then we have the 88th element and so on. So that we, when we want to refer back to the original data frame, we know what to do. All right. So that is how you can get data out of the data frame. You can get columns. So to retrieve columns, you use the indexing notation. You can get 
out of a series or out of a column, you can get values out by passing in the index. So the a series is just like a NumPy array. And then if you, or if you want to just get it directly out of the data frame, just get a single value. You simply use the at, um, you simply use the at method and give it an index of a row and a column. Or, and if you want to create a copy, if you want to get a single row, you use the dot LOC method, uh, the LOC method. Again, you have to index into it. And then if you want to create a copy of a data frame, you use the copy method. And then you have the head tail and sample methods to retrieve multiple rows of data from a data frame. So the thing here that you need to understand is that whichever way you want to access data out of a pandas data frame, there is a way to do it. Now you may not always remember uh, this it, and you don't have to, but you can always look it up. So what you, what, suppose you want to figure out how do you want, to, how do you access a particular row of a data frame? All you need to do is take this expression or just type out this expression into a search engine. How to access a specific row from a data frame. And that will lead you either to the documentation or an answer somewhere on a site like stack overflow, where you can find the syntax. And that is a perfectly valid way of going about this, right? And as you keep doing this over time, you tend to start remembering some of these methods, but honestly, I still tend to look up a lot of these methods, even though I've been using pandas for many years now. So moving ahead, let us now start analyzing the data from the data frames. We've created the data frame. We've accessed some values and let us try to answer some questions about our data. So the simplest questions you might want to ask once you have this data is what is the total number of reported cases and reported deaths related to COVID-19 in Italy? And I say related because not all of these, not all of these deaths may have been due to COVID-19 alone. In fact, in a lot of cases, there are comorbidities. So that's again, another detail to keep in mind that to say that the disease has killed that many people is not completely accurate, although it is definitely a contributing factor. And these are all these things when you're doing your data analysis with the raw data, these are all these things that you really understand, which are sometimes not conveyed subtle details that are not conveyed in the headlines or the reports that you see. So now we have the COVID data frame and out of which we get back the new cases. And then on the new cases, we call dot sum. So this is the dot sum method is similar to the dot sum method in NumPy. And you can call it on a series to get the sum of all the elements in that series or that column. So we will have the total cases and we get back the total deaths and then we can simply print it out. So it seems like the total cases, number of reported cases is 271,515 and the total number of reported deaths is 35,497. So that's the data we have on Italy so far till about the first week of September. We might want to know, okay, what is the overall reported death rate, which is the ratio of reported deaths to reported cases. So that is simply the sum, the total number of deaths reported by the total number of cases. And you can see that is about 13%. Now that does not mean that 13% of people who contract the virus are going to suffer or die from it. In fact, the number is actually far lower, but we have to keep in mind the subtle detail here that not a lot of cases are actually asymptomatic. And then a lot of cases may never even get diagnosed because the person may not feel sick enough to actually come to the hospital or they may come to the hospital and not find a test on a particular day. Then let's look at what is the overall number of tests conducted. And here we have to remember that daily test data was not being reported till a particular date. And a total of 935,310 tests were conducted before the daily test numbers were reported. So let us use that and let us incorporate that. So here we are saying that the initial tests, that the initial tests were 900 uh, was this number. And then, so the total test becomes the initial tests plus COVID DF dot new tests and dot sum, right? So this is the sum of all the data in the new tests column. And when we're taking a sum on a series, the NAN values get ignored. Uh, this is just how, this is just something to remember with pandas that NAN values will always get ignored and while aggregating and then the initial tests, we are adding that. So that gives us the total number of tests, which is about 5.2 million. All right. Then we have, uh, we, we might want to find out what fraction of tests returned a positive result. So it turns out that the positive rate of uh, total cases by total test, that was about 5.21%. Uh, 
right? So about 5.21% of the tests in Italy led to a positive diagnosis. Now, this value may actually have varied month from month and we are only looking at the overall value here. So this is how we can answer some basic questions about our data. Now at this point, you might want to try asking some more questions about the data and you can use these empty cells to first, and this is how you actually go about analyzing a data set. The first thing you have to do before you even do any analysis or write some code is just to ask what are the questions you want to answer from the data and i'm sure as you've seen this data as you've looked at the things we are doing you may have many other questions so try them out here and that's the best way to learn the pandas library as a whole and data analysis in general and from time to time i'm just committing and saving my work so that if this binder instance shut down uh, shuts down i can resume my work by just clicking the run button from jovian okay so now let's look at let's look at querying and sorting rows of data. So let's say we want to only look at the days which had more than a thousand reported cases, or we want to look at the yeah, or we want to look at the days which had less than a hundred cases. And we we can have many other criteria like this. So to do that, what we can do is we can use a boolean expression to check which rows satisfy this criterion, which is more than a thousand reported cases. So for instance, we can say COVID DF dot new cases. So this is a series or a, the column, which is a series. And we can simply check, use the expression greater than thousand. And what this does is this creates a new series. Now this series has the same length as the original series or column, except that it now contains Boolean values, false and true. So the false here indicates that or at that particular in index, the value within COVID DF dot new cases was not greater than thousand was less than thousand. So false is where the criteria was satisfied and true is where the uh, false is where the criteria failed and true is where the criteria was satisfied. So now what we can do is we can take the series of booleans, the high new cases series, and we can pass that as an index into COVID DF. So that, so this is another way of just indexing COVID DF. And then you use the index and then you pass in this Boolean series. Now, when you pass in this Boolean series, what happens is wherever there was a true, those rows are retained and uh, wherever it was false, those uh, rows are skipped, right? So you get back a subset of rows. Now these, you can see that there are only about 72 rows here. And in this is basically another data frame, which is a, again, a view of the original data frame. So here you can see that there are 72 rows and in all of these rows, you can see that the number of new cases is higher than 1000. All right. So this is if, if the question was on how many days was the number of new cases higher than a thousand, you now know that it is 72 and you can actually pull out a full list of dates as well by just accessing the dot, the date uh, column of the data frame. Now we can also write this very succinctly on a single line by simply passing the Boolean expression. So COVID DF dot new cases greater than thousand as an index into the data frame. So this might seem confusing if you see it directly COVID DF and then it looks like inside the index, you are once again using COVID DF and it might feel a bit odd, but if you look at it this way, that this creates a series of Boolean expressions and then that series is passed in as an index to filter out the rows, which satisfy that, that expression. So that makes it a little more intuitive and you can see here that you get back the same result, which is 72 rows and four columns. Now, although there are 72 rows here, we do not actually see 72 rows. What we see is five rows and then we see these dots and then we see a lot, uh, then we see the five rows at the end. And pandas does this because your data frames can have tens of thousands or even millions of rows. So it may not, it will really slow things down, especially on the browser where if you print out the millions of rows. But in this case, sometimes we might want to look at all the rows of data. And when you do want to do that, there is some special syntax that you can use. So there is an option context method that you can use where you need to set the display of max rows to hundred and, or, or whatever you want. So you can set the maximum number of rows to be displayed to, in this case, I'm setting it to hundred. And then you have to use the display function from ipython.display. So these are just some details that the specifics are not important, but the idea here is that you can use this kind of a syntax to simply display all the rows of data. And once again, this is not something that you need to remember specifically. You can simply search it online, how to show all the rows or sometimes even columns are truncated. So how to show all the columns of a data frame and you will find some syntax like this. 
Okay. So here are all the 72 days where the number of cases was higher than a thousand. Now we can also formulate more complex queries. So complex queries that involve multiple columns. So often you may want to combine data from multiple columns to actually identi to identify or create a criteria. So we already have a positive rate, which is the number of cases that out of the tests conducted, what percentage of or what fraction of cases turned out to be positive. So it was about 5.2% or 0 0.052. And now we might want to determine the days where the ratio of cases reported to tests conducted was higher than the overall positive rate. So you could interpret these as days where a lot of people got infected or a high percentage of people got infected among the tests that were conducted. So the way we can do that is once again, we have COVID DF and then we pass in an index. So remember whenever you're filtering out or so, uh, querying something from a data frame, you have to use the indexing notation and inside it, we have this expression. So we say COVID DF dot new cases. So that's a column or a series divided by COVID DF dot new tests. That is another series. So here we are dividing a series by a series. And as you might expect that performs an element wise division. So we get back a new series, which which contains the element wise corresponding divisions. And so that is a, that's the kind of the daily positivity rate. And then when you check whether it is greater than the positive rate overall, that will give us the list of rows, the list of rows, which is about 12 rows of, or about 12 days when the positive ratio. So that is a ratio of new cases by new tests was higher than the overall average. All right. And as we saw here, the, you can even check this specific operation. So dividing two series or two, two columns by one another. So that simply gives you another series, which contains the element wise divisions. Okay. And further, what we can do is whenever we do an operation like this, which returns a series, which has the same length as the number of rows in the data frame, we can actually set that back as a new column into the data frame. And this is once again, where the dictionary of lists analogy will make sense because if you think of COVID DF as a dictionary, then into that dictionary, you are adding a new key called positive rate. And into that new key, you will add the values of that specific column. So the column being the column being new cases divided by new tests, which we are calling the positive rate. All right. So now if we check the COVID DF data frame, you can see here that we have a new column called positive rate. And whenever there are NANs in any of these calculations, you will also see a NAND reflected here, right? In column wise calculations. Okay. But here's a detail to keep in mind. And this is once again, going back to the context about the data that sometimes it takes a few days to get the results for a test. So as such, we can't really compare the number of new cases with the number of new tests conducted on the same day. You may conduct a thousand tests today, but maybe 500 of these results might come out tomorrow and then another 200 might come out a few days later. On the other hand, the number of cases that were reported today could have contributions from tests conducted over many of the past few days. So comparing cases and tests on a day by on a day to day basis is probably incorrect and any inference based on that is likely to be incorrect, right? So this is a place where you should dig in more and see what is at least what is the average duration it takes to get the result for a test and how did that change over time and so on. So it's important to watch out for subtle relationships like this in the data, which are not conveyed clearly by just the CSV file. So these require some external context. So you should always read through the documentation provided with the data set about how the data was collected, what are the processes involved in collecting the data? And if you have any questions uh, on your own, then you, you might want to ask these questions from the source uh, of the data set, whether it is your company or some online source, you might want to ask for more information. Okay. So for now, what we can do is we can simply remove the positive rate column. So to remove the positive rate column, we call the drop method. So we say COVID DF dot drop. And when we call COVID DF drop, we can remove one or more columns and we can either get a new data frame out, which will be a view of the previous data frame, or we can simply drop it from the existing uh, variable. So COVID DF, right? So I'm just going to drop it from the existing variable so that we do not have to worry about a new variable now. So if we check COVID DF now, you can see that the positive rate is now gone. 
So now we've looked at querying data. We've looked at even, we've even looked at adding new columns, but another thing that we might want to do is just sort these rows by a specific column. So for instance, you might want to identify what were the 10 days with the highest number of cases, right? And the way to do that is to first use the sort values method. So you can simply use say COVID DF dot sort values and into sort values, you can pass in the column by which to sort. So you can either pass a single column or a list of columns and to figure out how to use these functions, a simple way to do you is to use the help function. So you can you call help on COVID DF dot sort values, or you can simply press shift plus tab while you are on, while the cursor is inside that method or, or that function. So if you do shift tab once or twice, you will see the full signature. So you can see here that the first argument is by and by can be a string or a list of strings. So either a single column or a list of columns. And similarly, you can also specify whether you want to sort by ascending or descending order. And again, ascending can either be a single uh, Boolean or if your list of columns is a list, you can also pass a list of trues and falses, a list of Booleans, so that you can sort by descending and ascending with multiple columns as you require it. All right. So that's a very powerful way to sort similar to what you might do in Excel or SQL. And then another thing that we have done is we have actually chained this. So the result of sort values is another data frame. And then we have changed that we have chained, we have chained that with the head method and we are looking at just the top 10 elements from that sorted data frame. So that now that gives us the 10 days. So it seems like the 22nd of March was the peak with 6,557 reported cases that day. And then, and it was mostly the last couple of weeks of March. It seems like where most of the highest number of cases were reported. Okay. Now let's compare this with the days where the highest number of deaths were recorded. So here now we have COVID DF dot sort values and here we are sorting by new deaths. And once again, we're looking at the top 10 and it seems like the 28th of March was when there was the peak and then the 29th. So if you compare these two, it seems like overall that the daily deaths hit a peak just about a week after the peak in the daily new cases. So that might lead you to, and, and then you can dig in a little more and read some literature and that might lead you to understand that, okay, maybe for somebody who's contracted a virus and is going to become seriously ill from it. So they are going to probably suffer the most within the next week or so, and they will either recover or not. Okay, so let's also look at the days with the least number of cases. And here, you know, this might be obvious to you that, okay, the least number of cases might be in, in the first few weeks of January, but even then it's a good thing to look at. So I'm just going to sort these values. So COVID DF dot sort values and by new cases, this time in ascending order and pick the 10 lowest numbers. So as we might expect, we see a lot of days from the last day of December and then we see a bunch of days in January, but here's one. So on the 20th of June, there seems to be the value minus 148. And now this is unexpected. You might not expect to see a negative number of cases in a day, but that is the nature of real data. This is what happens and it invariably happens with any real world data and it really cannot get more real world than this, which this is data being updated based on real facts and real numbers being reported by hundreds of countries and hundreds of agencies and hospitals on a daily basis. So there are likely to be errors. There are likely to be discrepancies and this could simply be a data entry error, or it's possible that the government may have issued a correction to account for miscounting in the past. So you may have to see the documentation around the data. And this particular data set that we have is pulled from our world in data. So you can go to our world in data, the website and try to find out more why this might be the case. And I encourage you to dig through news articles online and figure out why this number was negative. Okay. But Another thing that you might do if you do not have any external information is to just look at some of the days before and after that date where we have this negative value. So if you look at the days, so this negative value was at index 172. So we can look at the few days before it and a few days after it. So it seems like the values that for new cases were in the range of 210, 328, 331 and similar range after that, but only this value seems to have some discrepancy. Now, based on this, 
I am guessing, although I cannot know for sure, but I'm guessing that this might be a data entry error. And if it was, and if we are able to verify that, we can use one of these approaches to, de to deal with this missing or faulty value. So one way is to just replace it with zero. Just say that we are assuming there were no tests, there were no new cases reported that day, but that is a little unlikely for this specific data set. It may be likely for a different data set, but not for this. Another thing is to replace it with the average of the entire column. So we can say that, okay, we just take the entire average number of new cases and then simply put that in here. Again, you can do that in certain cases, but in this case, once again, it may not make a lot of sense because the variation is so high, the standard deviation is so high that the average here does not really, is probably not going to be anywhere close to the actual number. The average we know is about a thousand, but the actual numbers on the days before and after are actually more in the range of 300 or so. Another thing that we can do is to discard this row entirely. This is something that is, so in a lot of cases you can do this, you see some faulty data and it is okay to discard. It is not going to affect the overall results significantly. So you can just discard that data as well, that row of data. And one more thing, which is probably makes the most sense in this case is to simply replace this value with the average of the numbers around it. So we can simply take the average of these two numbers or these two and these two, these four numbers. So which approach you pick really requires some context about the data and the problem. In this case, we are dealing with data ordered by date or what is called time series data. And that is why taking an average of the values around it actually makes a lot more sense. So now to do that, we need to modify that value within the data frame and we can modify it using the same at method that we use for access. So we say COVID DF dot at, and so 172 is the row number or the row index and then new cases is the column. And here we simply say that we want to take the average of the two values uh, of the value above and below it in the data frame. All right. And with that we have fixed or at least temporarily fixed the discrepancy in the data frame. All right. So these are just some ways in which we can filter out data and sort data sort rows out of the data frame. So we looked at finding the sum of values in a column or a series. We looked at querying a subset of rows satisfying a given criteria. We looked at adding new columns by combining data from existing columns. And then we also looked at removing one or more columns from the data frame using drop. And then we looked at sorting the rows of a data using the column values. And finally we looked at replacing a value within a data frame, right? And once again, this is not something that you need to remember by heart. On the other hand, you need not, and you can simply search for this online and you will be able to find the right resource. Okay. So now I've committed my notebook once again. So moving forward, as I just mentioned, this data is ordered by date. So we have, this is what is called time series data. So while we have looked at the overall number for cases and tests and positive rates, it might also be useful to study these numbers on a month by month basis because the, because there is so much variation on the daily cases. So you might want to just drill down and look at a specific month or a specific uh, week. Now to do that, the date column might come in handy here. And in fact, because so much data tends to have a date or a time associated with it, Pandas provides many utilities for working with dates. All right. So if you just check the date column here, so it seems like this is a series as we might expect, but this has the D type or data type of object. And that means that Pandas currently does not know that this column is a date. So what we might want to first do is convert this date time, convert this date column into a new column, which has the data type of date time. And this can be done using PD dot two date time. Okay. So we just say PD dot two date time, and then we give it a series and it takes the series and then it converts those data types uh, into the date time format. So it's an internal format within pandas. And then what we can do is we can take that and we can assign it to a new column. But instead of assigning it to a new column, we can simply assign it back to the same column because once you have the date in the date time format, then we don't really need the string date. We can always get it out from the date time format if we need it. So now if we check COVID DF dot date or COVID DF indexed the date column. So you can see here that the data looks similar, but this time the date, the data type is date time 64. So this tracks date, uh, this tracks time up to a particular nanosecond. But since there was uh, no time portion in the date, so you don't really see a time portion, but it tracks time up to nanoseconds. Okay. 
So we can now, what we can do is we can extract different parts of the data into separate columns using the date time index class. So, so this is a really helpful class in pandas. So all you need to do is take the series or the column and pass it into PD dot date time index. So that creates an object of type date time index. Now, if you want to extract a specific information, a piece of information out of it, you can do that. So if you want to get back the year, so we just do dot year and then we can set and that will return a series and we can set that into the year column. Similarly, we can set it, we can set a month column and we can set a day and a weekday column as well. All right. So now we've just added four columns simply by converting the date time, date column into a date time data type and then passing it into the date time index. Okay. And uh, let's look at the data frame now. So we have the date as before we have uh, the metrics that we had earlier, but now you can see year, month, day, and even the weekday. So the months go from one to 12 January to December, the day goes from one to 31 or whatever is the number of days in the month. And the weekday represents Monday to Sunday. So Monday is zero and Sunday is six. And then you can guess the values in between. All right. So now that we have the month related information, so let us track the overall metrics for the month of May. And for this, we are actually going to do it in a few steps. So let us just see all the intermediate steps here. First of all, we may want to query the rows for May. So here, what we're saying is COVID DF May is uh, COVID DF. And then we are indexing into it and passing a Boolean expression where the month uh, column is equal to five. And let's check the value of it. So there you go about looks like there are, yeah. So there are 31 values or yeah, there are 31 values here and you can count it as well. So there are 31 values for and this contains the data only for me now the next step now is to get this uh, get the sum for each column right so we want to sum for new cases we want the sum for new deaths and the, we want the sum for new tests but instead of doing it column by column we can also do it all at once on the entire data frame but to do it all at once we may want to first exclude the columns which we do not want to sum over because some of, for some of these columns, the sum may not make sense. So we can simply extract just these three columns. So let's do that. So we say we create another data frame called COVID DF may metrics where we pass COVID DF may and it, from it, we simply extract the columns, new cases, new deaths and new tests. So here we are using the indexing notation and instead of giving it a single column, we are giving it a list of columns. And now you can check the value of COVID DF May matrix. And you can see here that it has 31 values, but only for the new cases, deaths and tests column. Okay. And now finally, now we can get these totals. So instead of calling sum on each series individually, we can simply call it on the entire data frame. And when we do that, now we get back the totals. So now the entire data frame collapses into a single series. So you can see that this is a series. And now we have the total number of new cases, which is 29,000 during the month of May. The total number of deaths was such, and the total number of tests was about a million and 78,000. Okay. And this is how you should initially do it when you're learning pandas. This is how you should initially just go step by step, keep creating intermediate data frames. As I said, all the data is shared between the data frames. So you need not worry about it being very slow or taking up a lot of memory. So just keep creating as many intermediate data frames as you need. The most important thing is for you to have clarity about what's going on in your calculations and performance should performance and optimization can be an afterthought, but what you can do is once you become comfortable with this is you can actually start doing it in, in a single statement. So now here we are saying that, okay, we are getting out the, we are getting the data out for me out of it. We are selecting a few columns and then we are calling dot sum on those columns together. And that gives us the exact same result. Okay. That's some data about May. Now you can try finding the data about January, February, March and see how they compare. Now here's another example. Let us check if the number of cases reported on Sundays is higher than the, the average number of cases reported every day. Okay. So this time what we might want to do is instead of aggregating, so we do not want the total number of cases on Sundays. We simply want the average number of cases. And we also want the average number of cases. We also want the average number of cases in general per day. 
So the overall average, what we can do is we can say COVID DF dot new cases and call dot mean on it. So it seems like the overall average is 1095.78 cases per day. And the overall, the average for Sundays. So the average for Sundays, it looks like is COVID DF. So for first we extract out the data for Sundays. So we say COVID DF dot weekday equals six and we pass that as an index. So the Boolean expression returns a series of Booleans, which we pass as an index to COVID DF. And from that index, we get back the new. So now we have only the data for Sundays and from it, we get back the new cases column by using the dot notation. And then we can, now that we have the list of new cases on Sundays, we can call mean and that gives us the mean one, two, four, seven. All right. So now it does seem like the cases were the cases more cases were reported on Sundays compared to other days. And you can compare, you can get this information for each day of the week. And now at this point is where you might want to go do some investigation, do some research and figure out why it was the case. Okay. So data analysis cannot be done within a silo, any data that you analyze and any inferences that you come up with, you have to then go and investigate why it is. All right. So those are just some basic questions that we've asked about our data. But try asking some more related questions about the data and share your results on the forum. If you found some interesting insights, share the results, discuss what might be the reasons behind those insights. Uh, who knows, you might discover something new. Okay. But what we really wanted to do as we started talking about dates was that we wanted to summarize the day wise data and we wanted to summarize it and we want to summarize it on a month wise level. So instead of having the new cases, new tests and new deaths, on a daily basis, we might want to see them on a weekly basis or on a monthly basis. And this is again, a very common use case. Often the data, and this is called the granularity of data. So often you may have data that is collected per millisecond, or you may have data that is collected per second or per minute or per hour per day. And you might want to change the granularity. Now, obviously you cannot go back from hours to minutes, but you can combine the data from minutes to hours, right? So in this case, what we want to do is we want to combine the data for multiple days within a month into a single row of data. All right. And the way to do that is using the group by function. So in the group by function, what we need to do, it's a function of the data frame. So we say COVID DF dot group by, and let's just do it step by step here. So we say COVID DF dot group by, and then we want to group by month. So what this does is it does not show you any output because this is an intermediate data structure. It does not really do anything. It simply collects some information about how you want to do some grouping. But conceptually what you can think it, it does is that if you look at COVID DF, so here you can see that there are a lot of values for month. And in fact, month has about 10 values. So there is 12 for December, 2019. And then there is one to nine for uh, 2020. Now, fortunately, all the data is from a single year. And so we do not need to consider just month and year, but in some cases we might want to group by month and year. But in this case, if we just group by month, what happens is pandas creates one group for each unique value of month. So for the month of January, all the rows are collected together into one group. Similarly for the month of February, all the rows are collected together into one group and for the month of March, April, May, June, and so on. So each month, the rows for that month are collected into a single group. Now, what do you do with that group? Now on that group, you can do some, you, you can then say how to aggregate the information in that group. So what we might want to do then is that for all the data, all the rows in January, we may want to add up new cases, new deaths and new tests to get back the total number of cases, the total deaths and total uh, tests in that particular month. But before we do that, now to do that aggregation, we may have to first ignore all the other columns, right? So just like a data frame, a group by also allows you to specify which columns to keep. So once you've done a group by here, we are, once we've done a group by let's put this into a variable called group. So let's say monthly groups. Okay. So now from the monthly groups, before we summarize the data, we may want to simply say monthly groups and out of these simply select the columns that we want to look at. 
so monthly groups now you can see here that we still get back a group by object so we are still in an intermediate state no aggregation has been performed yet but what we can do is we can select these columns and then we can call dot sum and now what is a new data frame a completely new data frame so the original data frame still exists but this new data frame the index it does not have the same number of rays, rows as the original data frame in fact the number of rows here is equal to the number of groups in the grouping column right so month had 10 values in total so you have 10 rows in this data frame and then we had selected three columns new cases new deaths and new tests so these are the three columns that show up in the result and for each of these groups we have then performed an aggregation using sum so that's where you can see that the total number of cases reported in january was three and then it grew to 885 and then it grew to a hundred thousand and it remained at a hundred thousand in april and then it started going down in the month of may uh, and then you can see here that it started going down but it seems like the number of cases seems to have grown again in the month of august so it seems like there might be a second wave going on here and already you can see here that simply by grouping and aggregating a data onto a monthly basis we can already make some more inferences than we were able to do previously using just the date level data and that is really the whole purpose of data analysis what we are doing is we are transforming data from one form into another whether it is aggregating it whether it is creating new columns whether it is creating new groups or whether it is sorting in a certain way so we are simply moving the data around to gather more inferences about the data all right and the underlying data remains the same now we will take this idea further next week where we also use this to plot graphs because you can while you can see the trend here you cannot really see how drastic the change is and that is where we are, humans are able to perceive things much better visually especially when they are comparative so we will also look at a few ways to draw some graphs all right so that's our so that's grouping and there's a lot of depth in grouping so you should probably just check out the documentation or read a tutorial on grouping in python in pandas but we will just leave it at this one simple example or maybe let's do one more so let's do this let us instead of aggregating by sum let us aggregate by the mean and let me pose the question this way so let's try and find out what was the average number of cases reported on every weekday all right or average number of cases or tests or deaths so we group by weekday now and then we select the columns new cases deaths and tests and then we call dot mean so instead of aggregating by sum we can aggregate by mean so there are a lot of ways to aggregate you can aggregate simply by the count so if you just want to see the counts in this case the counts will be equal for every weekday because we have over time the number of weeks each week has seven days so the count is not very interesting but sometimes that might be interesting in but then you can also check aggregate by just keeping track of the maximum and you can aggregate by keeping track of the minimum so there are a lot of ways to aggregate but we are aggregating by mean and when we do that we can see here that for each weekday we can see how many new cases on average were found so on average 1100 cases on mondays and 1200 cases on sundays and it seems like on tuesday and wednesdays when on average you had the lowest number of cases all right and then you might want to now dig in and investigate that why is this the case maybe it has something to do with the testing methodology maybe it has something to do with the reporting and maybe you can see that okay how does it compare with the average number of tests so it seems like the average number of tests was highest on probably around the fourth day so which is monday tuesday wednesday thursday friday it seems like the average number of tests was the highest on fridays but the average number of reported cases were highest on sundays so it might suggest that it seems like that maybe it took about two days for the test results to come out but this is where you have to then go back and investigate a little more okay so now apart from grouping another form of aggregation is to calculate the running or the cumulative sum right so we have in our data frame we have data for on a daily basis 
the in the original data frame so once we look back here so we have new cases new tests new deaths but what we might also want to know is that up to a particular date what was the total number of cases and we might want that information on a daily basis because that is again another interesting trend to study right so the way to do that is using the cumulative method so there is a cum sum cum sum cum sum method but there is also a cumulative maximum there is a cumulative mean and there are a lot of other ways to accumulate the data on a row by row level so let's just call cum sum on new cases and set that to set that into a new column total cases and similarly we do that for the deaths and the tests as well and now what we've done is by the way for tests we have also included the initial test count so this is again to account for there were a lot of date where daily tests were not reported so we have accounted for that as well and now when we check the data frame you can see here apart from new cases new deaths and new tests we have total cases total deaths and total tests as well all right so that's pretty good that now we have this information to look at too notice that the nan values still remain here so you can still see that the total tests was nan so the cumulative values tend to remain nan till you have a single nan value or uh, and actually whenever you see a nan value the the cumulative result seem, turns out to be nan okay next up now we have the cumulative information and we have we've gathered a lot of information about our uh, data set from the data that was given but more often than not you might need to merge data from multiple sources so you might want to calculate let's say we want to calculate a metric like tests per million or cases per million and so for this we require some more information about the country specifically its population in this case okay so let's download another file locations.csv which contains the health related information for different countries around the world including italy okay so we have url retrieve here we and this is we are we are passing in the full url and we are passing in a csv file name where we want to download this data once again we read this into a data frame and we can check it out here so this contains the location it contains uh, which is basically country but there are also one entry each for world and then international that was to track for any country any anything that was happening not in any specific country's borders but yeah we have location continent population life expectancy hospital beds per thousand and gdp per capita so we will only be using the population data right now but in the assignment that you will do after this lecture that you will end up using all of these different information about each of the countries so let's just check let's verify that italy is here so the way to verify is once again we just have a boolean here that we want to check that the location is italy and pass that as an index into the locations df so it looks like italy was there it was at the 97th index and it is in europe and it has a certain population so it seems like it has a population of 60 million people and then there's a certain life expectancy and uh, beds per thousand and gdp per capita all right so now one thing you might just do is take this population and then just use it directly for our calculations but a more interesting thing that we can do is to insert all of these columns all of these values into every row of our data frame so why might we want to do that so we have covid df let's take a look at it so this is our covid df data frame and right now we only have the information for italy but it's possible that we may have information for multiple countries in a single data frame all right so we may have let's say if i set if i introduce a new column called location and right now because we only have data for italy i'm just going to set it to italy so now we know that for italy so in the location italy on this particular date these were the metrics and similarly in the location italy on this particular date these were the metrics and then we can do the same analysis for let's say spain and portugal and germany and then we can put all those data frames together so you can imagine having a data frame where you not only have uh, data for italy but also have data for spain and portugal and all of these other countries so location may take different values now when we want to calculate when we want to calculate the per million metrics then a good idea would be to introduce a few new columns into the data right so for so for each row if we could introduce columns like continent 
population life expectancy then we can calculate a few more metrics all right and the way to do that so the way to join these two data frames is to use the merge operation within python but to merge these merge the data frame you need to have at least one common column and in which in this case the common column is italy right so the location italy is the the, the co common column is location so the location column can actually be matched up so what we can do is for each row here we can look up the location uh, for that location we can look up the data from the locations data frame and insert that as new columns within that row and the way to do exactly that is to use the merge method so here we take the source data frame which is the covid data frame and in the covid data frame we are saying that we want to get information out from the locations data frame and how do we want to get the information out we want to get the information out using the location column so for each row of the covid data frame we check the location and then for that location we get the data from the locations data frame and then we insert that data into that row as new columns okay so let's see what that looks like so here we have the same data as before and we are calling this merge df because it returns a new data frame so covid df still contains the original data locations df remains undisturbed and merge df will now contain the merged information so now in this merged df you can see here that we have the same information that we had earlier but after location you can see a bunch of new columns were inserted and these columns are fetched from the locations data frame okay these are the data for the corresponding locations now since we only have italy in our covid df data frame you can see that all of these rows pretty much have the same data but if we had multiple locations you would see different data for each corresponding location okay so now we can calculate metrics like cases per million deaths per million and tests per million so we simply take the total number of cases and then we divide it by the population but because the population is the overall population we need to divide the population by a million or that or we can simply bring it up here so this is just to account for the per million calculation and now if we check the our merge data frame now we also have this information of cases deaths and tests per million people and that's an important metric probably to look at when we are comparing countries because between countries we might really what we really might want to know is not the overall number of cases not maybe even the number of tests conducted but more the per million or per capita number of cases and that's where this is useful okay so that's merging so now we have merged our data and with this we have pretty much done a everything that we can do with a pandas data frame there's still a lot more uh, for sure there are many different kinds of functions to explore there are many different things that you can do but this is some of the common things that you do and we are using a real world data set so this is a like a real world data analysis that we are doing and what we might want to do after doing some analysis after creating some new columns it would be a good idea to write the results back to a file because right now we are running a jupyter notebook which is running on binder and whenever this jupyter notebook shuts down the data will be lost right all the analysis that we have done so far so before writing this data to a file the first thing we might want to do is just create a smaller data frame because now we've while you're working through your data you may create a tons of columns you may create dozens of columns and you may uh, sometimes you may create columns that you don't even really need for instance we've not really used the weekday data or the day data and while we are exporting this back to a file since we already have a date in now including year month day and weekday is somewhat redundant so what we can do is we can once again create a result data frame where we can get rid of all the intermediate columns that we had created which we don't really need we also pulled in a lot of columns from the locations data frame once again we not, we may not really need them so we are simply going to keep the date the new cases the total cases the uh, similar metrics for deaths and tests and then the per million metrics okay so we take this and check it out so result df here and now this is the information that we want to save to a file now to save this data to a file we can use the two csv function or the two csv method of a data frame so we simply say result df dot two csv and then we pass in results dot csv here uh, which is the file where we want to write to now if this file already exists it will get overwritten 
and then we also said index equal to none. So this is an, a small detail that you need to know about pandas. This is a common error that I tend to make all the time. So what pandas does is it also treats the index as a column while writing to file because sometimes that in, an index need not just be just numeric indices index. For instance, we saw that month was an index earlier or weekday was an index earlier. So sometimes you may want to retain that information, but in many cases you don't. So since we do not want to retain the index information, we do not want an additional columns going from zero to 247. We can just say index equal to none or index equal to false. And that will tell pandas not to include the index in the output. Okay. So now once we do that, we've created, we have now created the file so we can open up that file. So we can go file open and open up the results.csv file. And now with this results.csv file, you can see here that these are all the columns that were exported. And this was the data for all these columns and wherever the data was NAN. So now just as empty values got read as NANs, so same way NAN values get written as empty values within the CSV file. But you can see here, probably sometime in March, you can see that all the numbers have, most of the numbers at least have non-zero values over time. So that's how you save data back. And then you can, just as you can read many different file formats, you can also write back to different file formats. Like you can create a SQL file, you can create an Excel file, you can create a JSON file and so on. Okay. Now, one other thing that you might want to do is now one thing you can do is you can simply download this file. So you can click select results.csv and click download to download this to your computer. And by the way, you can also use the upload button to upload files from your computer. So if you have a CSV file sitting on your computer and you want to upload it to binder, then you can just click the upload button and select the file instead of using the URL retrieve method to download it from an online URL in any case. So that is one way you can keep the file around, but it would be nice to, since we are already putting our Jupyter notebook on jovian.ml, it would be nice to also attach the file as an output of the Jupyter notebook. And in fact, as we do multiple analysis, each time we may get back different results. If we come back tomorrow, get the new data out, then we may get new results. And for that, what you can do is when you do jovian.commit, you can actually specify an outputs argument. And in the outputs argument, you can specify a list of files or folders. And what Jovian will do is it will, along with the Jupyter notebook, it will also capture and upload the results.csv file. So let's take a look at that. So here we have created version 14. So every time we run jovian.commit, a new version got created. And you can see the same Jupyter notebook here in a read only mode. And then you can click run and run it on binder and the whole, you know, just exactly as you might expect. But if you check the files tab, you will find on the files tab that there is a section called artifacts where you can see the results.csv file. So this is the results.csv file. And you can view it here. You can view the raw file. You can even delete it if you want to get rid of it or download it if you want to simply pass it on to somebody. And now each version will get a different results.txt file. So this is a good way to keep your outputs organized. All right. And that's pretty much it about writing data out from pandas into a CSV file. Now I want to take a few questions at this point. So let's see what questions we have. Okay. So the first question that we have is why do we use pandas when data analysis uh, and presentation can be done in SQL or Excel? Okay. So that's a good question. And there are two parts here. The first question is about SQL, uh, about let's say about SQL and Excel. Let's answer that first. Yes, you can do a lot of this analysis in SQL and Excel, but SQL for instance is one, one thing you might, one limitation that you might face is that SQL only works with database tables. So if you want to combine data from multiple sources, one of which is a SQL table and one of which is an Excel file and one of which is a CSV file and one is a JSON. And that is just how real world data is that you may have some COVID data in your SQL database, but then you may have to download a locations.csv file from somewhere. And then to combine them, either you have to create a new table. Now pandas lets you avoid all that you can pull data from any format into a pandas data frame, which is held in memory and then do all and combine them and then perform all these operations. So that's one benefit. Then the other thing is 
that SQL is a very limited language. So Python being a general purpose language, you can write functions, you can write, you can reuse the code, you can use the pandas library. And then there is a whole ecosystem of thousands of libraries that you can use, which are built on top of NumPy and pandas, like things like SciPy and uh, uh, so on. So that's something that you can draw into and that makes whatever you want to do, you can possibly do that in just a few lines of code. Whereas with SQL, SQL interviews are the hardest because you have to write everything from scratch and you have to write these huge expressions, which all have to be within a single line. So it's not very convenient and it's not very reusable. And you, you can use variables within pandas, within Python. So that's a benefit. Then comparing it to Excel, if you are able to do the, all the analysis that you need to do within Excel, that's great. And that's a good place to start. You need not really use pandas if you can do all your analysis in Excel. But when you want to scale things like we've done analysis for Italy, but now we want to do this similar analysis for a hundred or 200 other countries. Now at that point, it might get a little difficult to do that in Excel because you cannot really, you cannot really capture all of the analysis that we did into some basic Excel formula or even like an Excel macro. So that is where again, pandas, this might be useful. You can take all the analysis we have done, put that into a function and use that function to analyze hundreds of files. So that's about SQL and Excel. And then the second question was about presentation. Now in terms of presentation, what I would say is that the Jupyter notebook is probably a better way to present because you can add all of this uh, explanation. You can draw graphs within a Jupyter notebook and it all, it has this sequential order, which is, so we, it's also very well suited for a narrative or a storytelling flow where you can present all of your findings in a structured format. And you know, there are ways where you can hide the code and so on. So I, I would say that Jupyter is actually a good way to present. And what you can do is you can simply take the Jovian URL and you can share that. And that, that is a good way to just present, uh, create a report and share it. If you're doing a project and you want to create a report, you can simply upload the notebook to Jovian and that's the report right there. What you can also do is now you can also see previous versions. So if you, that's one, one other benefit that you, if you're, let's say doing this analysis on a daily basis, you can always go back and check previous versions. Versioning is not something that you can do easily with Excel or SQL. So these are just some of the benefits of, I would say benefits of programming in general, but using pandas and Python and Jupyter in particular. All right. Let's take another question here. Okay. So there was another question. Is it better to write individual statements or is it better to combine multiple statements into a single statement to improve performance? In general, what I would suggest it is better to do the thing that you find the most clear because the performance hit that you're really taking, unless you're working with millions of uh, rows of data is maybe you go from one second to five seconds. If you split something into multiple lines or do something a little bit inefficient, but I would suggest that that's probably totally worth it rather than trying to create one long expression or one long statement that you don't really understand. So initially try to break things down, try to write small statements and over time, as you get the hang of it, try to write single statements because ultimately it is true that any a single expression is going to be faster or going to be more efficient. Okay. So now let's talk about plotting. And this is something that is leading into the next lecture. So typically we use a library like matplotlib or seaborn to plot graphs within a Jupyter notebook. But pandas data frames and series also provide a handy plot method for a very quick and easy plotting, right? So we're not going to learn a lot about the syntax for plotting, but we will see how to draw a few graphs. So the simplest way is to just call the plot function on a series and you can say, and that plots a line graph. So here we take the result data frame and then we check the new cases and then we just call plot and you can see that that plots a line graph. So here you go. So now so we've been looking at this data for about an hour and a half, but only by looking at this and, and so far, I don't think we've had that insight of how exactly the trend was on a day to day basis. But just by looking at this single picture, we know now probably now know more in a different sense that we did all this while. So you can see that the trend is the, the number of cases increases to a certain point, hits a peak, and then it goes down. 
and then it seems like it seems to be going up once again so there seems to be a second wave happening right now so that's just so this is just like a line graph visualizing the number of daily cases now it would be nice to see it's hard to tell where the peak occurred exactly because it is simply using the indices that are already there in the series and those indices go from 0 to T8 so we might have to do some mental math to figure out where the peak occurred but we can actually put the dates on the x-axis and the way to do that is take the date column and convert it to the index for the entire data frame so what we can do is we can take the result df and then just set the index to the date column and we just do it in place so that we don't want to create a new data frame so now we check result df you can see that the index is now gone and now the date is the index and this is no longer a numeric index now this is a date time or a, a string index essentially and now we can in fact even access the data for a specific date so now into loc loc we pass not the index like a number 1 to 248 but we actually pass the date and then we can get the data out for that specific date okay and every series that we extract out will also have the date so if we check results uh, result tf dot new cases now each of these series or each of these columns will have the date as the index and that is just one of the benefits of using series that it, it can let you index using a specific index and not just numbers so now that we have this the next time we run plot so now if we plot new cases and what you can do is you can also combine plots so you can also say dot new deaths and we are going to plot that as well just to compare okay what was the ratio of cases to deaths and what was the trend looking like so we can plot them and now you can see that we have a graph it has uh, the data for new cases which is the blue line and the data for new deaths reported which is the orange line and then we have the x-axis also shows the months so as we saw earlier it seems like towards the mid or towards the last couple of weeks of march was when the maximum number of cases was reached and just about a week from there about seven days out was when the peak number of deaths was reached we can also compare the total cases with the total number of deaths and you can see here that here this number grows up to a certain point and it seems like it is increasing again but the number of deaths seems to have mostly flattened out so this is what when we talk about flattening the curve that was a popular term initially this is the curve that we talk about that we are flattening actually this is the curve that we're talking about flattening because we want to reduce the number of cases on a daily basis so what happens when you do social distancing when you wash your hands regularly when you wear a mask in public is that the daily cases probably will not hit such a high peak it will actually go slightly lower and it will take a longer time but overall it is not going to reach that peak and you can see here while the second wave is coming it doesn't seem like it is growing at the same pace or at the same speed that it was growing earlier so it seems like we've flattened the curve to a reasonable extent at least Italy has so let's see how the death rate and the positive testing rates vary over time so we can also plot them so here is how the death rate changes over time so the death rate is simply the total number of deaths divided by the total number of reported cases so you can see that initially it is low because the number of cases is very low and it's mostly people coming from different parts of the world so initially we were not really tracking they were not really able to account for all the cases because testing was limited and probably even deaths were not being diagnosed as covid deaths but over time that number has increased as the tr contact tracing improved uh, so the people who were being tested were specifically being tested people with symptoms people who had come into contact with other covid patients and that's why this number may have went down or gone up and now it seems like uh, maybe the pressure on the hospitals is now not as high so it seems like the death rate seems to be going down once again so different parts of this curve may have happened for different reasons and you need to be watching the you need to be following the recent developments you need to be reading the literature reading the research to come to an informed understanding of why this seems to be happening right and this is the common pattern you see a certain you see a certain trend or you see a certain pattern and then you wonder why it is maybe you take a few guesses but your guesses are just guesses so what you then need to do is go back and back up those guesses with evidence and see which of your guesses are correct okay then we have the positive rates so the positive rates also 
the total number of tests was only tracked from April. So the positive rate uh, data is available only from April. So it seems like that over time testing was increased to cover a, a wider number of people. So initially while only people who were very sick or had very strong symptoms or it was well known that they had either come from a foreign country or they had come into contact with another COVID patient. So only those people were being tested and that is why the positive rate was quite high, about 18%. But over time as more tests are being conducted, even for healthy people, just to identify contact, test and trace people, you can see that the positive rate seems to have gone down. And its overall positive rate is currently at around 5%, which is which means that there is a fairly good level of testing. Finally, let's also plot some month wise graphs. So remember we had this month wise data. Okay. Let me just grab the monthly information here. Yeah. So here we have the month wise data. So this is the month wise data that we have. So for each month we have the total number of cases, deaths and tests. And then we can come back here and we take the COVID month TF cases, tests and de deaths. And then we can simply plot that. So here is the number of cases per month. So you can see here that in January, there were no cases pretty much in actually it was about three cases. And this time we have chosen a bar plot. So when we have a smaller number of elements on the smaller number of values on the X axis, then it helps to have a bar plot. It can give you a slightly better idea of our comparison. So it seems like the months of March and April were the worst where there were the most cases. And then the number of cases went down quite significantly starting in May and then May, then June. And it seems like it is on the rise again in August. And then in, uh, in September, we've just had a few days. So we need to see how the trend turns out in September, but definitely now we are a lot better prepared. Every country is now a lot better prepared. So this number should probably not go as high as a hundred thousand. Then here we are looking at the number of tests being conducted. So again, we do not have daily test data for Jan, Feb and March and even half of April. So you can see that testing really picked up in, in May and we've con Italy has continued to con conduct a large number of tests, but even though the large number of tests are being conducted, the number of positive cases is low, which means that the, probably the country is doing a good job of containing the positive cases. The country is doing a good job of isolating people. Maybe people are also following things like wearing masks in public and avoiding and doing social distancing. And as you compare this information ratio of tests conducted and positive cases, and maybe even positive cases and death rates, you get to know about the country per country situation and every country is unique. So you really need to dig into the data to really understand how, how things are unfolding in each country. Okay. And with that, we complete our discussion of data analysis with pandas, uh, especially for tabular data. So we can do one final commit and now we are ready to move on to the assignment. But apart from that, I've also listed a few other resources you can check out. So here are some exercises on pandas. You can check out the official user guide, or if you want to, you can check out the book by Wes McKinney, the creator of pandas. It's called Python for data analysis. It is a huge book, pretty comprehensive. And a lot of the material in this course is also inspired. In fact, a lot of material in general related to data analysis is inspired from that book. So do check it out as well. So now let's come to the assignment and the objective of this assignment is essentially to gain some hands-on experience with the pandas library. So the things that we learned today, you will get to apply them. So things like creating data frames, querying and indexing operations, grouping, merging and aggregation and dealing with uh, missing values. And to get started, you can simply open up the starter notebook. So here is the starter notebook and it contains the information that you need to uh, work on the assignment. And the first thing that you might want to do is just click run and run it on binder. And you can do this assignment completely using binder. The basic idea here is that you will see in a lot of places, you will see uh, question marks. So you will see three question marks in certain places. And your job is to complete the assignment. To complete the assignment, you have to replace these three question marks with appropriate values, expressions or statements to ensure that the notebook runs end to end properly. Okay. 
And some things to keep in mind is that to make sure that you run all the code cells, because if you do not run, if you miss a certain code cell, then you may get errors like name error or undefined variables. You do not want to change the variable names that are already there. You can create new variables and you can add new cells, add new code, but do not delete existing cells. Do not change variable names and do not disturb any other existing code because that may cause problems during the evaluation. And in some cases you may need to add more code cells or new statements. So feel free to do that. It's not that you just have to replace the question marks. You can write additional code as and when you need it. And you can do this assignment on binder, but since it is a temporary online service, then you need, you do need to save your work by running jovian.commit at regular intervals. And ideally we recommend doing it at after solving every single question. Then finally, there are some optional questions here. So these will not be considered for evaluation, but we highly recommend doing them. They are for your learning, but if you are running close to the deadline, then you can skip the optional questions and work on them later. Okay. So let's look at the notebook. So I have just clicked the run button and selected run on binder. And now on run on binder here, I can open up the notebook pandas practice assignment. And the same thing that I like to do always is to just clear the outputs and toggle the header and toggle the toolbar. Okay. So now in this assignment, the first thing that we do, the first and very first thing that we do is we simply import Jovian and commit. And the reason for doing that is so that you can save a snapshot of this assignment to your profile. So let's just copy our API key from our profile and paste it here. And so now you've taken the starter notebook and created a snapshot that is saved on your profile. So the next time you want to continue your work, you need to open up this URL, which is on your profile and then click run from there. Okay. Now here you have to run this line to install pandas. So we are not automatically installing pandas so that the assignment runs a little bit faster for you. But each time you uh, run the assignment just uh, on binder, just make sure to install pandas. And then we install uh, import pandas as PD. So this is all done for you. So in this assignment, we are going to analyze and operate on a, a, a data file, analyze and operate on data from a CSV file. So this is the same locations.csv file that you saw, but we've cut it down to just a 210 countries. So this is the information health related information for 210 countries. And we will do some analysis on that. So here you can see questions like how many countries does the data frame contain? So you can try and answer this question. Here's a hint. You can also see the number here and put in the number directly, but here's another hint. So you have the countries DF. We have seen the shape method and the shape contains the number of rows and columns. So it seems like each, there is one row per country and you can verify that by looking at uh, some sample data and see, just make sure that there is one row per country. Uh, so you can then in that way, you can check how many countries there are and then you can take this information and then simply put it here either directly like by typing the number or by simply getting the first element out of this tuple. Okay. Whichever way you do it is completely fine. And then you answer the question and then you print it out. And at the end of the question, just run jovian.commit again. And we do that for every question just to keep, just so that you don't lose any work. Then you can retrieve a list of continents from the data frame. So there is a method here. Here's a hint, use the unique method of the series. So you can see that for each country you have a continent. Can you get the full list of continents out from the data frame using pandas methods? Try to do that. Then try, there's a question to find out the total population across all the countries listed in the data set. So each country has a population. So if you add up all the populations, you get the total population of the world approximately because there might be some small minor countries which are not included here and the population also keeps changing daily, but this would give you an idea of the approximate population of the world. Now here's an optional question that you need not do, but it's an interesting one to try out. What is the overall life expectancy across the world? And your first thought may be to just take an average of life expectancies across countries. We have a column for life expectancy, but you might not want to do that because each country has a different population. So it's not right to say that you give an equal weight to the life expectancy of let's say Andorra, which only has 77,000 people and a country like Afghanistan, which has 38 million people. So you may want to take a weighted average using the population as weights. So try that out.
this is an interesting question to try out. Then we have basic sorting and filtering. So here we are asking for creating a data frame containing 10 countries with the highest population. So here you can use sort values and then you can use head. Then we are also trying to add a column here. So add a column into the country's data frame to record the overall GDP per country. So the overall GDP is simply the product of the GDP per capita, which is given in the data frame and the population of the country. Then here is a slightly more complex question. Create a data frame containing 10 countries with the lowest GDP per capita among the countries which have a population greater than 100 million. All right. So that's just a two or three step problem and you can try to solve this as well and create a data frame that counts the number of countries in each continent. So this is again now here you might want to do some kind of grouping and aggregation. So here we are counting. So here we might want to aggregate using count. There's another question to find to show the total population for each con continent. So you might want to group by continent and simply select the population column and aggregate it using the sum. So that was the first part. And then the second part is to merge this data with some COVID-19 stats. So once again, there is this file called COVID-19 countries data. So here for each country, we have the total cases, total deaths and total tests. And a lot of countries, the total tests are actually not reported. So that's where you see NANS. And that's what the first question is. Count the number of countries where the total tests data is missing. So just use the is any method to do this. That is a hint here for you. And all of these, even if this hint wasn't available, you can simply say count the number of missing values in a column pandas and that will give you the same result. So this hint is essentially just giving you saving you a search, but do try that out as well. Then you will merge the two data frames, the country's data frame and the COVID data frame using the location column and that you might want to use the merge method for it. Now to, once you've merged it, you can calculate the tests per million, cases per million and deaths per million. And then now you can look at what were the countries with the highest number of tests per million people. What are the countries with the highest number of positive cases per million people? And what is the high number of uh, the what are the countries with the highest number of deaths per million people? All right. So that's something to try out. And then here's an optional question. Here is where you can try and check, okay, which just to get an idea of maybe which country has managed things. You might want to count how many countries feature in both the lists of the highest number of tests per million and the highest number of cases per million. So is it true that more testing necessarily leads to more cases or are there cases where even with a small number of tests, you have a large number of cases, right? So do this kind of an analysis and really ask these questions and ask these questions of your data. Here are, we've only mentioned a few optional questions here, but you can go on and asking more questions and that will get, let you draw your own inferences on how different countries are dealing with the outbreak. And then you might also have to go back and you have to figure out how these test numbers are reported because each country tests differently. There are different types of tests. There is a test, which is a test for the virus and then there is a test which is a test for the antibodies and it seems like both of these numbers the total gets reported some countries are reporting only the number of samples and not really the number of diagnosis or some countries are reporting just the number of diagnoses some countries are reporting just the unique number of people tested and so on right so just keep that in mind that there is a lot of there's a lot of nuance a lot of subtlety in this aggregate information so it's not always fair to just comp just calculate these metrics and make assumptions or make inferences on top of it. Although that's a good starting point, but from that point, you need to dig in and learn more. And the more original research that you do, the better your understanding of the situation improves. So please try and do as much as possible. In fact, and there's one more final question before that. And then I'll talk about the data set itself. So this question is to count the number of countries that feature in both 20 countries with lowest GDP per capita and 20 countries with the lowest number of hospital beds per million. But for this question, you should only consider countries with a population higher than 10 million. Okay. So this is a complex three, four part question. And then you can just, all you need to do is do it step by step. 
get the list of countries with a population higher than 10 million and then get the 20 countries with lowest GDP per capita, 20 countries with lowest number of hospital beds and then count the number of countries which feature in both lists. And then you can see if GDP has, what kind of a relation GDP has with healthcare facilities in a country. Okay. And once you do that, once you make this, once you solve each question, just keep committing. And then when you are ready to submit, just take the link. So the link that you get once you commit, this is from your Jovian profile. Just take that link. You can also get this link by clicking the share button and clicking the copy link button here. So take that link and come back to the assignment page and make a submission here. So you can just paste the link here. It needs to be a Jovian ML link on your profile. And when you do that, you can see here that it gets added and you will see that the evaluation is currently pending. But a few things to keep in mind is to always use a Jovian ML link because we need to, we are going to do automated evaluation. So do not submit binder links because binder shuts down after some time. Do not submit Kaggle or Colab links because we cannot extract that Jupyter notebook out for automated evaluation. Okay. So with that said, I wanted to just share a little bit about where this data came from. So this data came from our world in data. So I just searched for our world in data, COVID raw data. And you can see here, this is the source data for this analysis. And in fact, what we've done is we've taken this original data set, which is in CSV format and we've extracted out just the information for Italy. So one good exercise for you is to download this CSV file. And from the CSV file, we've done analysis for Italy, but what you might want to do is pick your country and for your country, just extract out the same information, which is the a data frame or a CSV file containing the dates, the daily new, the daily new cases, new deaths, new tests, just keep these four columns and then repeat the analysis for your country. And how do you repeat the analysis? You, uh, so the way to repeat the analysis is you take this lecture notebook that we have. So just go, let's go all the way to the top here. And alongside you open up a new notebook as well. So here I'm just going to go file new notebook. Okay. And keep these side by side and download the data for your country or first create the data for your country and then download the data for your country. And then for your country, just start typing out each of these lines one by one. Download the data using URL retrieve, or you can simply upload it into the Jupyter notebook. And then you can start typing out each of these one by one. So import pandas as PD. And then if I have the data for India, I might do COVID DF equal to PD dot read CSV and India device dot CSV. Now, once that is read, then I might want to look at the data, look at the data frame and uh, get some information about the data. So type out each line of code and typing it out is a great way to just get some practice because then you feel more confident typing it out. Then you feel more confident with each of these functions. You feel more confident like you've learned pandas and initially you're just looking at it and typing, but then with time, the notebook on the right goes away and then you can simply type by looking things up online or by looking at the documentation or just from memory once you've done it enough times. Okay. So do this analysis for your country. Try to first create that data set for your country from the raw data. And that should be a good place for you to just get started doing some more analysis. So today the lecture notebook that we will use is called matplotlib and Seaborn tutorial. So let me open up the notebook. Now on the notebook page, you will be able to see a run button. I will be running the notebook right now. So we've clicked the run button and selected run on binder and that has brought us to this page. So now we have a Jupyter notebook running in front of us. So let me just open up the notebook here and I'm going to click kernel restart and clear output. So that is going to clear all the outputs and we can just see the code cells and execute them for ourselves. I'm also going to toggle the header and the toolbar but you need not hide it because the toolbar has many interesting and useful operations that you might need. So today's topic is data visualization using matplotlib and Seaborn and we've been building towards this slowly. So we've been 
We've talked about the basics of Python. We've learned numerical computing with NumPy, analyzing tabular data with pandas. And now we're looking at data visualization. And you can run this code. We are currently running it on Binder, but you can also run this code on your computer. So the instructions for running it on your computer are given here. Okay, so let's get into it. Now, data visualization is the graphic representation of data. So what it involves is producing images that communicate relationships between the represented data to viewers. So the idea here is that a lot of the data that we deal with is in the form of numbers. It's in the form of tables or data frames or CSV files. And it's not really easy to look at a lot of numbers at once and understand something. But if you take the same numbers and then draw and then represent them using some kind of a picture or what is called a graph or a chart, then that leads to a better understanding of what the data represents and what the relationships between the different data points are. And in this lecture, what we are going to look at is some popular data visualization techniques and we'll understand how to implement them using Python libraries, matplotlib and seaborn. So to begin with, let's import the libraries. So we'll import matplotlib.pyplot. That is the module that is used for doing most of the basic plotting. So we'll import matplotlib.pyplot with an alias of plt because that is the most common alias that is used in the data science domain. And then there is also a Seaborn library, which provides a Seaborn module, which we'll import, import as SNS. And this library is built on top of matplotlib and it provides many convenient methods that avoid, that help you avoid writing a lot of code in basic matplotlib. Okay. And apart from these two import statements, we also have this magic command matplotlib inline. What this does is this informs Jupyter that you want your graphs to show up as outputs below the cells where you've plotted them and not as pop-ups. So without this line, sometimes you may see that your graphs show up as pop-ups. Okay. So that's the setup. Now we've imported matplotlib.pyplot as plt and seaborn as sns. And to get started, we will study one of the simplest types of charts or graphs, graph data visualization techniques. And that is called line charts and a line chart simply displays some information, especially a sequence of numbers as a series of data points or markers. And these data points are connected by straight lines. So let's see what that means. So here we have some data here. We have a Python list called yield apples and it contains six numbers. What this represents, it's an imaginary data set, but it could be a real one as well. So what this represents is the annual yield of apples in tons per hectare over six years in an imaginary country called Canto. So there's a country Canto where they grow apples and we've simply measured the annual yield of apples in tons per hectare over the past six years. Okay. So ultimately those measurements are turn out to be numbers like this. So now we have the yield of apples and by looking at this, we might wonder what the trend is looking like. So we have a certain idea by looking at this, that it seems like the yield is growing over time, but it's not very clear how fast or slow the growth is and whether this growth is likely to sustain. So immediately the simplest thing that we can do is we can plot it on a two dimensional, on a two dimensional X, Y axis coordinate plane. And we can plot these points on the coordinate plane. So the simplest way to do that is to use a line chart, which you can plot using plt dot plot. So we say plt dot plot and give it a sequence of numbers. And that sequence of numbers now gets plotted. So you can see that this was the number at the zeroth index 0 0.895. This was the number at the first index 0 0.910 and 0 0.920 and so on. So already we can see that it looks like the yield of apples is growing with time, but it appears that the growth is slowing down. So it seems likely that over time this will flatten out around 0.95 unless we make some technological improvements or there is a significant change in climate or things like that. So that is the power of visualization. Just a simple graph. This is already giving you a lot of information. Now, one thing you may have noticed here is when we call plt dot plot with yield apples, it draws the graph here, but it also gives an output. So this output is basically the result of the plot function. So the plot function returns whatever was called. And in this case, it returns a matplotlib.lines2d object. 
and we may not want to always look at this in the output because we are mainly concerned with the graph. So one thing that you can do is you can include a semicolon after your code. So if we call plt.plot with the semicolon, you can see here that now we do not have that output, the line 2D output, we simply see the graph being plotted. And in general, while using matplotlib, you might want to just include a semicolon with the last statement so that you do not see an unintended output. Okay. So now we have a line plot and it's already telling us a lot, but let us enhance this plot step by step to make it more informative and beautiful. Okay. So the first thing that we are going to do is we are going to customize the X axis of the plot. Now you may have noticed that here we know what the values or the yields of apples are and this is plotted along the Y axis, but we do not know which years these, this data is for. And without that, this plot is not very informative. So the first thing that we can do is we can change the X axis to show the actual years. So here now we have two sequences. We have years, which is 2010 to 2015. And then we have the yield of apples. And now we are passing to the PLT dot plot years. The, so this will form the labels on the X axis, the ticks on the X axis, and then the yield of apples. These will form the points on the Y axis. So in a sense, we are actually giving it now a list of points. So for 2010 on the X axis, we want to point to 0.895 for 2011. We want to show 0.91 and so on. So we plot it now. And now you can see that you have the years 2010, 11, 12, 13, and 14 and the corresponding values. So that's great, but it would be nice uh, as if we share this chart with someone, it would be nice to include information about what these axes represent. And these are called labels for the axes. So we can add labels for the axes to show what each axis represents using the plt.x label and plt.y label functions. And now one interesting thing to note here is that we've already called plt.plot and any other plt functions that we call within the same Jupyter notebook cell are going to get applied to the same plot. All right. So we can actually write these in any order and all of these will get applied to the same plot that comes out as the output of this cell. So we call plt.plot and that plots the two lines. And then we say plt.x label and set that to year. And then we say plt.y label and set that to yield in tons per hectare. And that gives us this result. So we have the year here and then we have the yield in tons per hectare. So now this plot is starting to get a little better. Now what would be interesting is that, okay, we can see that the yield for apples is growing, but we may want to know if this is happening for other crops as well, or is it just that the whole agriculture sector is growing? So this does not really say a lot about apples in particular. All right. And so what we might do is we might want to plot multiple lines within the same graph. And to do that is really easy. So all you need to do is invoke the plt.plot function multiple times with different data within the same cell. So here let us construct some more synthetic data. So here we have data from 2010, 2000 to 2011, because in a range, the last value does not get included. So we have 2000 to 2011. So there are 12 years. And then we have the data for apples and the data for oranges for 12 years. Now already you can see here, there are about 25 numbers you, you are looking at here and it's very hard for you to make an inference even if you spend a few minutes looking at all the numbers. And this is where a visualization is going to help. So now we're going to plot plt.plot years and then plt.plot years with apples and years with oranges. So the x axis remains the same. This is not necessary, but in this case, we just want to keep the x axis the same. And then we set an X label and the Y label, and then we plot it. So there you go. So now you can see that we have two lines for apples and oranges. And it seems like, since we already know that this was the graph for apples, it seems like the graph for oranges is going down. So based on this, you may form a hypothesis that it's probable that maybe the demand for oranges is falling or the demand for apples is growing. So maybe some of the land that was being used for apples is now being used to grow oranges or something like that. And once you have a hypothesis like that, then you can go back and investigate and find out if this is indeed the case. So this is great, but just by looking at this graph, it's not quite clear which line represents what. So we already knew this was apples and that's how we could tell, but you can actually include what is called a legend. So you can simply say PLT dot legend and into the legend, you can give a list of labels for each of the lines. So the labels will get applied to each line and then you have, and then you have the title. You, this title is applied to the entire chart as a whole. 
So now you see here, you can see a title crop yields in Canto at the top of the chart. And then you have the apples and oranges. And then you have the yield per yield in tons per hectare and the year. Now, as we add more lines, sometimes it can get difficult to understand where the points exactly are. So for instance, if, you, if we want to do the data for 2005, we have to estimate it a little bit. So we can tell that 2005 is around here. And so the value is probably this one. And that is about 0 0.908 or something like that. It's not very clear sometimes, especially in, in a graph like this, which is seems to be growing linearly where the points exactly lie. And this is where you can actually add markers to the points. So to show markers for the data points, we can simply use the marker argument of plt.plot and matplotlet supports many different kinds of markers like circles, cross, square, diamonds, and so on. And you can actually see a full list of markers here. So if you visit this page, you can, or you can just search for matplotlib markers. You can see what the value that you need to provide to the marker argument and the symbol it displays on the screen. Okay. So let's try out a couple of examples. Now we are going to plot the yield of apples and we are going to use the circular marker for it. So apart from the line, there will be a circular marker. And then for the yield of oranges, we are going to use an X marker or a cross marker. So let's run this. So you can see now you have circular markers here and then you have a uh, cross markers here and they're also represented in the legend. So this is a little better, but you might want to style these lines and markers. Suppose you want to use these in a presentation, then you might want to include some of your brand colors and backgrounds and things like that. So to do the styling, to style the lines and the markers, plt.plot, the plot function supports many arguments for styling them. So you can use this color or C argument to set the color of the line. And once again, there are many inbuilt colors that are supported within matplotlib. So here you can just search for list of colors in matplotlib. And you can see here that there are a lot of colors already supported. And if you want to use a color other than this, then you can use the RGB hex code of that specific color to set a, a custom color as well. So you can set the color and you can set the line style. So you can have a solid line or you can have a dashed line. Maybe you have one primary metric that you want to show using a solid line and the rest you want to make them dashed. You can do that. And then you can set the width of the line and each line's width can be set separately. You can set the size of the markers and you can modify some other, uh, some colors of the markers as well, like the edge color, for, which is the outline of the marker, the edge width, the width of the outline and the face color, which is the color of the filling in the marker if it has a filling and you can also change the opacity of that specific line plus markers. So check out the documentation of plt.plot to learn more about what you can do. And here we've just included a few examples. So for apples, we are going to use this a square marker with, and the color is going to be blue and it is going to be a solid line with a width of two and the marker size of eight. And then the marker edge and the mark color is going to be different as well. And then for oranges, we are going to use the red color and we are going to use a dashed line. So we use two hyphens to indicate a dashed line. And then the line width and the marker size, etc., will also be different. And we are also setting an opacity of 50%. So for the oranges. So once we run this, now we see that now we have the crop yields in Canto, but now you can see that the lines are a little bit wider and the lines have bigger markers and then the orange one is a little less opaque. It has a opacity of 50% whereas the blue line, which is apples is solid. So this is how you can modify the lines and the markers. Now there's one shorthand here because often the most common thing that you want to do is to specify the type of line, the type of marker and the color of the two things. So there is a FMT argument that you can pass into plt.plot and that can specify the line style so the way you specify it, you specify the marker first, then you specify the line style, and then you specify the color all within a single string. So for example, here, what we're doing is we're saying ears, apples, and then FMT is the third argument that goes into plt.plot. So you do not need to call it as a named argument. So you can just pass in the third argument. So here we're saying that it, it will have a square marker. It will have a solid line and it will have a blue color. Whereas oranges, we're saying that they will have a dashed line 
and it will have a circular marker and it will have a red color. So you can use this shorthand from time to time when you are quickly drawing some graphs just to differentiate between different lines. And once again, you can see that we've still copied over the X label, Y label, title and legend. What you can do is you can take all of this. If you have plots that you want to draw in a certain way, you can take all of these and put them into a function so that each time you pass in two lists of values, apples and oranges, all these styles are applied to them, right? So you can use all the nice things that Python offers, things like functions, modules and so on to organize your code and organize your graphs as well. Okay, now one exception here is that if in the format argument, if you do not specify a line type, so in this case, we are plotting ears and oranges. And here, instead of specifying a solid or a dashed line, we have skipped it entirely. So then the line will not be drawn and only markers will be drawn. So you can see here that you can just see the markers and not the lines. And this is a useful thing to have as well. Sometimes you might want to have a line for a particular set of data and you want to show points for another. So you can do that too. Okay. Now, if you want to change the size of the figure, if you sometimes you might the figure might be too small and you might want to increase the height of it or you might want to increase the width of it for that you can use the plt dot figure function to change its size so you simply say plt dot figure and then you set fig size and then you give a tuple so you can experiment with this what the tuple does so let me just try out two two and then you put in a sample value and see what two two gives you and then use that to maybe make some changes. Let's try eight and four. So yeah, that way you can change the size and the aspect ratio of the image. Now already we have, we are starting to draw pretty good line graphs, but one interesting thing that we can do just to make our charts a little more beautiful is to use the Seaborn library. So now we are going to use the Seaborn library for plotting, but one of its use cases is also to just improve the look and the feel of the graphs that we draw using matplotlib without doing anything additional. All you need to do is import Seaborn. So we have imported Seaborn as SNS and then use the set style function. So the Seaborn contains a, a bunch of predefined styles within the library and you can get the full list of predefined styles here at this link. So for instance, one of the predefined styles is wide grid. So when we say sns.setStyle wide grid, what happens is a certain set of styles get applied to all matplotlib charts. And this includes some background, some font colors, some other configurations, and we'll see an example of that. And this gets applied globally. So now this style is going to be used for any plot that we make using matplotlib or Seaborn. So now we do plt.plot, we plot apples and oranges in the exact same way that we did before and we set the x label, y label and legend. So we're not doing too much styling here. And you can see that you can already see there are some changes. So the font is a slightly different and there is now a grid. So the grid makes it slightly easier to see, okay, where the values lie. For instance, you can see that this point is 0.93 and then this is 0.94. So this point is probably around 0.934. You do not have to draw an imaginary line in your head from here to here. You can just follow the grid. So that's pretty useful. And one style I like, so this is the white grid style. One style I particularly like is the dark grid style. So you can just call sns.setStyle dark grid. And now we have the exact same code that we had in this cell that we're going to run, but it's going to have a slightly different style. So here now you see that now we have a graph where the, it has a background. So the part of the graph has a background and then it has a grid as well. And then the colors are slightly different too. If you had used, if you had used the default colors, then those would be slightly different too. You can see here that these colors are slightly nicer than the default colors that you will get with matplotlib. So this is one of the benefits of using Seaborn that it automatically makes your charts a little more beautiful. Now the next thing that, uh, and here's one more example of that. So you can see that this we've only called set style once and then every subsequent plot that we, every subsequent plot that we do will already, will automatically have that style. Okay. But if you want to, you can also edit the default styles within matplotlib directly. So matplotlib has, so you can import matplotlib and then there is something called rc params inside matplotlib. In fact, you can just check it out. 
let's say we just print it out here matplotlib.rc params you can see a whole set of values here you can see uh, there, there are probably hundreds of values and you can change the font size you can change the font family you can change the uh, background colors you can change the default ways the default grid whether you should show a grid or not and a lot of other things like that you can change the default marker style you can change the default line style and so on and the way to do it is to simply set matplotlib.rc params so here for instance i'm changing the font size the default font size to 14 and i'm changing the default figure size to 9 comma 5 so just making it slightly bigger and then setting the figure dot face color to this is basically transparent so here let me just take this same graph so just keep this graph in this picture in mind and let me just take the same graph and plot it here and you can see now that this graph is bigger so this is nicer when you want to present or let's say do a video so i'm doing a video with you i can show you this and it's a slightly bigger graph easier to see and sometimes you might want a small graph as well now one quick note here is any graph if you want to just download it you can simply right click and click save image as in whatever browser that you're doing that you're using and you can just save the image to a file with that we complete our discussion of line charts and let us just save and upload our notebook to our jovian.ml account so we just call pip install jovian and then we import the jovian library and then we commit and then we commit the notebook using jovian.commit so you can change the project name here to whatever you like and this will ask us for an api key which we can get from our jovian.ml account so here i'm going to my account and clicking copy api key and then I'm posting, pasting the API key here. And what this does is this captures the entire notebook and puts it online for me to share and continue working on. So even if the binder instance shuts down now, we have the notebook on our profile. And you can see here that it contains the charts that we have drawn. And if we want to continue our work, we can simply click run and click run on binder once again to continue. So moving forward, next we are going to look at a scatter plot so a line so a line plot is primarily used to represent a bunch of values in a sequence whereas a scatter plot is used to visualize the relationship between two variables as points on a two dimensional grid okay so what does that mean a good way to look at it is by looking at an example and for the example we are going to use a data set that is already included within the seaborn library but you can also use any csv file and import it using pandas so here seaborn contains a utility function called load dataset and into load dataset we can give one of the predefined datasets that are included with seaborn so we have flower and that returns a, a data frame in pandas so this is our pandas data frame for flowers df but you could just as easily have done pd.read csv here and passed in a path to a csv file and that would have worked well too so let's study this data set. So it looks like this data set contains four or five columns. So it contains, it, it is information about flowers. So these are some measurements made on a total of 150 flowers. So here we have 150 rows. So for 150 flowers in a garden, let's say, we've measured the sepal length, the sepal width. So sepal is a part of the flower and then petal is another part of the flower. So then we've also measured the petal length and the petal width. And we've noted the species of the flower. So this is a typical data set that you might work with. All right. And this is a, you can learn more about it. Here's a link to the Wikipedia page. It is called the Iris flower data set. And the first thing that I wonder here is, okay, it seems like there are a lot of values of sepal length, width, petal and width, but the species seem to be limited. So the first thing that we can check is what were the species here? So if we just check the flowers df dot species dot unique. So it turns out that there are three species, Setosa, Versicolor, and Virginica. Now, let's try to visualize, you can see a lot of numbers here. So there's a sepal length and a sepal width. Now, you might wonder, is there a relationship between the sepal width and the sepal length? Like when the length increases, does the, does the width increase? or vice versa right or is it or does the, is there an opposite relationship where the length if the length is low then the width is high currently by looking at just these numbers it's hard to tell it's 
you may have some idea that okay for 4.9 you have the width is 3.0 but for 5.1 the width is 3.5 so there seems to be an increase but the relationship seems to be different here like the width is higher for flower 2 but the length is higher for flower 1 right so it's not very easy to tell the relationship and we can't even look at and grasp all the numbers at once that's where we might to to visualize the relationship our first instinct might be to create a line chart using plt.plot so we may call plt.plot and remember that we need to pass in an x-axis a bunch of values for the x-axis and a bunch of values for the y-axis and then all those points will be plotted and connected with lines so here we say flowers df dot sepal length and flowers df dot sepal width so this is a series or the column this is a column from the data frame which is a series object a pandas series and that is similar to a list in the sense that it can be iterated over so pipe matplotlib can automatically work with anything that looks like a list so a numpy array will do a panda series will do and so on so we plot it and that leads to this plot right so this plot is not very pretty or very useful because and why do we end up with a plot like this because there are 150 values and all of those values are in this range of like in a small range of 4.5 to 8 you have 150 values for the sepal length and then similarly in the small range of 2 to 4.5 you have 150 values of sepal width and there is no natural order to either of these values right these are all completely random measurements earlier what we had was we had years so the, we know that the years would increase so at least one of them was ordered but here we, there's no order so in cases like this especially you might first time you might try something just start with a plot like this and see and if you get a, a, a bad output like this then maybe a line chart is not the best thing to draw here and the next thing that you you should try is to draw a scatter plot now let's see a scatter plot it's going to be somewhat similar to this but instead of the lines you will just have points so for scatter plot we use the scatter plot function from seaborn now matplotlib also allows you to draw scatter plots but it is a little bit limited in its power so the scatter plot function in seaborn is much nicer to use so we just say sns.scatterplot and then we say flowers df so dot sepal length so this is the x-axis and flowers df dot sepal width these are the points on the, uh, the coordinates on the y-axis the corresponding coordinates all right and then once we call it this is what we get so now all the 150 flowers the points have been plotted like for instance this is this represents a flower with the sepal width of 5 point length of 5.5 and a sepal width of something around 2.3 and you can see that the scatter plot has automatically picked up the names from the series and shown them here as labels for the axes and this is one of the nice things with seaborn it saves you a few lines of code every time by automatically doing some the right thing but we were concerned about the relationship between length and width but there doesn't seem to be a clear relationship here in fact like the points seem to be all over the place but if you notice carefully you will notice about two or three clusters so you can see this one cluster of points here these are all together and then there are some outliers and then you can see another cluster of points around here these are all together and then you can see three another cluster of points here so there seem to be three clusters of points and you might have a hypothesis here okay there are three species of flowers and now we can see about three clusters of points and it makes sense that you know different across different species of flowers we may not really see a relationship but maybe if we just study a single species separately maybe we might be able to find a relationship all right so this is where we you can use the hue argument to scatter plot so here now we are specifying flowers df dot sepal length sepal width and then we are also specifying a hue so what the hue says is that you pass it uh, another column or another series which has the same length as these two so e for each flower we also know a species and now for each distinct value of species the points the corresponding points uh, will get a different color okay and then one other thing that we are doing is we are increasing the size of the points so you can just make the size of the points larger and you can try experimenting with a few values here uh, i looked at i tried it and i found 100 to be a good value okay so now we have this graph so now here we have the sepal length once again and the sepal width but now the dots are slightly bigger because we have a bigger size and they are of three different colors so now we have 
setosa which is blue so all the setosa flowers are here and as we had guessed so they do form a cluster and then versicolor are orange and then virginica are green and now you can also visually see there does seem to be a relationship here that in setosa flowers the sepal length tends to be a little bit low whereas the sepal width tends to be high compared to other flowers and there is a general relationship probably as the flower grows uh, both the sepal length and width grow proportionately so there seems to be like a line that you can cut through obviously there are more factors involved so this is not a perfect relationship but you can see that there's some kind of a rough linear correlation then similarly you can observe a similar trend for versicolor maybe not so much but versicolor values are somewhere in between both the width and length and then you have virginica so virginica has tends to have pretty long sepals but the width seems to be pretty small and virginica, virginica also seems to be more spread out so it's not as concentrated or as close to a linear relationship as we have seen in the others so then we might want to go back and learn more about virginica maybe there are two multiple classes of virginica flowers or maybe they behave differently for a certain region so this can inspire research when you plot a graph in fashion like this okay and now we have a great plot but it is missing a few things one it would be nicer to make this figure a little bit bigger so we can do that and the way to do that is because seaborn builds on top of matplotlib so apart whenever you call a seaborn sns dot oops whenever you call an sns dot scatter plot or a function like that along with it you can also include some plt functions on the same within the same cell so you can say plt dot figure and that will apply to the same chart that is being drawn by scatter plot and then you can say plt dot title and that will apply to the same chart as well so in this way you can mix and match things from matplotlib and seaborn and this interoperability is sometimes really useful so now we have a title and now you see that because we had a more wide graph the legend was moved to this corner and that allows us to see some points here then we have the sepal width and the sepal length as well so this is how you modify a plot drawn using seaborn now one other thing i want to mention here is that seaborn has a great inbuilt support for pandas data frames so instead of passing each column as a series you can also simply pass column names and then use the data argument to pass the data frame as a as the source for the data so for instance you can say here we have sns.scatterplot and here we can say that we simply want to use the sepal length column as the x and the sepal width column as the y and the hue should be the species column and then pass in a single argument called data where we pass in a data frame. and then seaborn will automatically pick these columns from the data frame for the respective axes so you can see here we get back the same result so that's it for scatter plots now i hope you're getting a sense of when you might want to use a line plot and when you might want to use a scatter plot and even if it's not very clear yet the best thing to do is just to try it out that's the best thing about jupyter notebooks and about python that you can just first draw scatter plot and then draw line plot and see if it looks good if it serves if it serves your purpose if not draw scatter plot maybe that will help you that will help you visualize the data better and so on the next plot that we're going to look at is called a histogram and a histogram represents the distribution of data for a single column or a for a single type of variable essentially so what do i mean by that the, i think the best way to look at it once again is using an example so once again we load up the flowers data set the flowers data frame and let us just look at the sepal width this time so let's not concern ourselves with other columns so histograms are typically just the data for a, a specific column now you're looking at a bunch of values here and it seems like there is a so you might wonder okay what is the smallest what is the range of sepal width in terms of the smallest and the largest value and one way to do that is just to do flowers df dot sepal or you can just do flowers df dot describe remember the describe function on data frames so if you call the describe function then for each numeric column it tells you a bunch of statistics so if we look at sepal width it seems like the minimum value is 2 and the maximum value is 
4.4 so we already know a little bit and then this mean is 3.0 so that means 3.0 is the average and then there is standard deviation of 0.43 and Oh, okay, that's good that now we know more than we did earlier, but it is still not very clear where the values lie. If we had to count, okay, how many values lie between 2.5 to 3 and how many lie between 3 to 3.5, we might not, you know, that way. And then we, if we were to plot that somehow, then it would be easier to visualize the relationship, sorry, visualize the distribution of the values along this range. And that is where the histogram comes into picture that within the range of values that a variable takes. So sepal width in this data set takes the values from 2.0 to 4.4. So within the range of the values it takes, how are the measurements, how are the data points distributed? So let's just see it now and then we'll talk a little more about it. So here we are saying plt.hist, H-I-S-T for histogram and we simply pass in the sepal width column to it. And we've also set a title, distribution of sepal width, okay. So now we have this graph. So let's just spend a couple of minutes understanding what this graph represents. So here we, as we saw earlier, the, the range of values is from two to 4.4. Now this entire range of values taken by sepal width is split into 10 parts here automatically. So that's the default setting and we can change that. So it is split into 10 intervals and you can probably guess that this would be around two to 2.2 and this would be 2.2 to 2.2. 4 and this would be 2.4 to 2.6 and so on and then what we do is we look through the column we look through this data of sepal width and then we count how many values lie in this range so if so in this case about five values lie in the range of 2 to 2.2 and so around four values so we draw a bar which goes up to the height of four and then similarly we count the number of measurements that lie within the range 2.2 to 2.4 and then we draw a bar which shows the number so this number seems to be around 7 and so on so now when you study this it seems like somewhere around 3.0 so it seems like from 2.9 to 3.1 somewhere around that range there are 36 measurements that is where a large number of measurements lie and then it seems like there are more measurements on the larger side than on the smaller side so from 3.2 3.1 2 to 3.3 let's say 3.4 or something like that you have another 30 or so measurements okay so already now we know how the values are distributed the values of sepal width the measurements how they are distributed in the range that they take now these bin intervals are currently a little bit arbitrary we may not want to check between 2 and 2.2 that's a little bit arbitrary we may want to have a fixed number of bins or me or we may want to decide what the intervals, the bins. So each of these intervals is called a bin. So interval is a mathematical term and bin is the statistical term used with histograms. They mean the same thing. What we can do is we can specify the number of bins. So if we, let's say instead of the 10 bins, we wanted to see just five bins. So here now we can split the entire range into just five bins. And now we can see that, okay, obviously now if the bins are larger, the interval is larger than between three to 3.4, it seems like you have a total of close to 70 values or we can, what we can also do is we can specify what should be the points at which bins should be created. And the way to do that is to give a list or an array as an input to the bins argument. So there's a bins argument. So here we are giving an input. Let's just see what this does. So we are to the bins argument. We are passing NP dot a range. So let's see what that does. So NP dot a range, 2.5 and 0.25. What this says is create an array that starts at 2, goes up to 5, not including 5. So goes up to 5 and it takes steps of 0.25. So we have 2, 2.25, 2.5, 2.75 and so on. Okay, so now we can take this array and we can give that as a list of bins and then the matplotlib will automatically create an interval between each two consecutive numbers. So 2.5 to 2.25. 2.25 to 2.5, 2.5 to 2.75, 2.75 to 3 and so on. So these are much nicer boundaries to have, I think in this case, compared to what we had earlier. So you can see now we are going between 2.0 to 4.5 and then we have these nice intervals that line up with our measurements. You can also have bins of unequal sizes if you want to. So here we have simply set the bin measurements to starting from one going up to three 
so that's a bin of length two and then starting from three going up to four so that's a bin of length one and then a bin of length half so there you go now we have three unequal bins and obviously when the bins are unequal the data points that line each bin the number of data points will change but you can still see that even though the three point three to four bin is a little bit smaller half the size of the first bin it still has twice as many values so this is how you can play around with histograms just change the number of bins and the size of each bin but I hope you get the idea that the basic idea here is it tells you how a single variable like the sepal width how its measurements are distributed along the full range of values that it takes okay now similar to LAN charts we can also draw multiple histograms on a single chart and we can reduce the opacity of each histogram so that because there are bars here and these are opaque bars if one of the histograms is going to be drawn on top of the other and typically this is the order in which they are listed so the first one that you list is drawn at the bottom then the second one second command that you include is drawn at drawn on top of it and so on so some of the bars of the first histogram may get hidden by the second and to avoid that what you can do is you can simply set a lower opacity for each of the histograms so what we are doing now is we are taking the same flowers data frame but this time we are going to filter out just a specific data frame for each species of the flower. So here we are saying flowers data frame where the species is equal to setosa and similarly we have versicolor and similarly we have virginica. So you can check here that for setosa df you only have setosa flowers and you can verify the same for versicolor and virginica. So you have 50 flowers in each and you can check that. Now let us plot setosa and a versicolor using two different histograms and once again you can set the color using the C argument but by default if you simply plot two of them matplotlib will automatically cycle through different colors. So let's plot them and we are plotting them with an alpha or an opacity of 0.4. It might be helpful to add a legend here as well because we don't know which one is which here so if I just do plt.legend and here we can say setosa that is that should be the first one drawn and versicolor all right so here we go so now we have setosa and we have versicolor so setosa is blue so it seems like the setosa flowers the triple width seems to be on the higher side mostly higher than 3.0 whereas for versicolor the the sepal widths tend to be on the lower side so mostly between 2.2 to 3 and that's already a lot more information than we had earlier. So this is one way to show multiple histograms. But what we can also do is we can stack histograms on top of one another. So we can rather than showing this on top of rather than when I top like above. So here actually it is both are overlapping. But what we can do is we can put this bar above the previous bar. And the way to do that it is actually a little bit easier is into plt.hist instead of passing a single instead of passing a single set of values a single you can pass multiple arrays so we can pass the setosa df sepal widths and we can pass the versicolor df sepal widths and the virginica sepal widths as a list and then we simply specify the same set of bins that we want and then we say that we want to stack them so we set stacked equals true and once we do that you can see here that the bars get stacked right so there are these many so for setosa we can see that in the range of 3 to 3.25 there are these many setosa flowers and these many versicolor and these many virginica excuse me and these many virginica flowers and now this histogram obviously is a lot more informative than before so you can see the overall trend but you can also see the trend for each species of flower so you can see that setosa lie in this range and then virginica in this range and versicolor in this range so let us save and commit our work before continuing okay so now we've looked at line charts scatter plots and histograms the next type of chart that we're going to look at is called the bar chart and a bar chart is conceptually very similar to a line chart in that they show a sequence of values except that what we do is we use a bar for each value we show a bar for each value rather than we showing points connected by line and uh, let's just see that as an example so let's maybe first draw a bar chart for this data so here once again we have the data for apples and oranges 
and now at the years so first we might want to draw plt dot let's say plt dot uh, plot and we say years and apples oops yeah so here we have a line chart showing the yield of apples so that goes from around it seems like it goes from in the range it goes from around 0.35 to 0.9 and then goes up and down now a, a better way now this is great to study the trend a line charts are great for that but they're not very useful for comparing individual values right so you can tell probably that this value and this value is this value is a little bit higher from higher than this value but it's it's not visually it's not very obvious and that is where when you want to compare data across multiple uh, across multiple years then it might be better to plot a bar chart so we can just say plt dot bar and the only difference here is instead of there being points and these points being connected by lines you have a bar for each year and then the height of the bar goes up to the data point the data points value which is the yield of apples right so we just say plt dot bar and here we have the yield of or sorry this is the yield of oranges so let me just plot oranges here yeah so this is the yield of oranges and you can see that the same thing is represented here now and you can see that now it's not that easy it's maybe not as easy as a line chart to or to visualize the relationship on how the trend looks but it's definitely easier to compare across so if you want to say between 2003 and 2005 or between 2004 and 2001 it's very easy to look through and identify and one trick here is that you can actually draw bar charts and line charts together so let's take this plt dot plot put it here let's also add a marker here so let's make it a red line or oh sorry red let's make it a circular marker with a dashed line and a red color and let's also take the bar chart here and let's put the bar chart behind so first we will plot the bar chart then we will plot the lines and let's set a title okay so there you go so now we have a graph which shows both the same data yield of oranges both as a bar chart and as a line chart so now it's easier to study the trend and now it's easy to compare multiple values as well and you can choose based on what is what looks better for you or for that particular data set you can choose which one to use or you can use both and then like histograms you can also stack bars on top of one another so for instance here we can plot the yield of apples and then we are plotting the yield of oranges but we do need to specify that the bottom we need to use a bottom argument for the second bar so here we are specifying that the bottom for oranges is apples so this tells that the bars for oranges should be drawn at particular heights so here you go so now you can see the trend for apples so you can see how the yield of apples changes you can see how the yield of oranges changes and then you can see how the overall yield let's say this is the yield of fruits so what is the overall yield of fruits how is that changing over time okay so that's the bar plot and uh, this is what this was a convenient case because here we already had a single value for each item on the x axis so for each year we already had the average yield but that may not always be the case sometimes what we sometimes we may want to show not a single metric but we want to show an average of, of many columns on a bar chart and let me show you what i mean by that and for that we are going to use another data set that is included within seaborn called the tips data set so this data set contains some information about customers visiting a restaurant over a weekend so from thursday to sunday a bunch of customers visit a restaurant and for each customer we note down a bunch of information so for each customer the information that has been noted down is the total bill the tip given by the customer on the bill the sex of the customer and whether the customer was a smoker and what time or what day it was so whether it was thursday friday saturday or sunday what time of the day it was whether it was lunch or dinner and what was the size of the party so how many people were there in that group along with the customer in total okay so this is the tips data frame and you can see here that one of the questions that you might want to ask is what does the average bill look like on a particular or on every weekday or on every day so what does how does the average bills between thursday friday saturday and sunday compare 
and to do that you might want to you might have to do like a group by operation so actually let's try to do that maybe so let's say we have tips df and you might do group by yeah so you might do group by and on group by you may group by day and then from that group by you may select simply the total bill and from that you might then do mean so now you have this is the average total bill for uh, on the days of Thursday, Friday, Saturday and Sunday. Okay. And then you can draw bar plot here. So you can just say uh, t dot bar and here you can just pass in tips df dot. Let's just put this, let's just call this bill average df. So now we want to provide an x axis and a y axis. Now, unfortunately in the bill average df, the day has become the index. So there's no longer a day column. But what we can do is we can simply use the index column. The index column is called day. And then we have, we can pass in the bill average df dot total bill. Okay. And now we have the total bill, average total bill compared across Thursday, Friday, Saturday and Sunday. But we had to go through two steps here. We had to first do this group by operation and then we got the average and then we plotted it. But since this is such a common thing to want to know that you may want to see that for let's say for days, but then you might, you may want to see how does the average bill compare across men and women? How does the average bill compare across different, uh, let's say smokers and non-smokers and so on. And that will involve all of these calculations. And that is where we can use the Seaborn library, which can, which provides helper functions so that we don't have to do this calculation. So instead of doing that entire calculation yourself, what you can say is you can call SNS. So Seaborn dot bar plot and the bar plot is the plot for drawing bar charts in Seaborn and you can specify. So here we have specified the data as the tips DF data frame. And here we have now specified the day as the X axis. So we now say that we want to group on the day and we want to average the total bill, right? So on the X axis, we have the day and on the Y axis, we have the total bill and Seaborn will automatically calculate the average and now plot a graph. So now you can see Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, we see a very similar graph, similar to what we saw here, but this is done automatically for us. And another thing this includes here is this line. So this line tells you that what was the variation in the values. So I think it is, it's called confidence interval if I'm not wrong. Basically what it tells you is that 50% of the values lie in this range from here to here. So you can see that there's a lot more variation on Friday in the bill, even though the bill is lower compared to Thursday. On the other hand, on Sunday, the bill seems to be the highest and there seems to be a much lower variation. And, and then Seaborn has also automatically added these labels here, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, the day and the total bill. So in a lot of cases, I find myself using SNS dot bar plot rather than doing PLT dot bar, especially when there is some average to be computed. Okay. One thing that we can also do is just like a scatter plot, we can specify a hue argument and that can be a third argument. So let's specify hue as sex. So we know that here in this data set, we have male and female. So let's specify hue argument apart from the day and total bill. And now you can see that for each day you have two bars. So you have one bar for male and one bar for female. So it seems like on average, you can see that the bill for the female is lower than the bill for the male. And there also seems to be, if you look at Friday, there also seems to be more variation in the bill from males rather than the bills from females. And then you can look closer into the data set. Maybe you can go and investigate and figure out why this is the case. Why are, why is the total bill lower for females? Is it, and, and, and similarly, you can specify, you can just say filter on smokers. Let's see if the average bill for smokers is lower or higher. Yeah. So if a person is a smoker, it seems like on average, their bill is higher, but then there seems to be a lot of variation. So I'm not sure if we can make that assessment if we can make that inference very confidently, but that seems to be true on average, except again on Friday seems to be an exception, right? So the correlation between total bill and smoker is not as high as the correlation between total bill and, or the average total bill and sex. Now, one thing that you can also do is you can make the bars horizontal simply by switching the axis. So you can go from day total bill to total bill day, and that will switch the axis and draw the bars horizontally. And sometimes these are slightly nicer to look at. 
and it's really up to you and like on a case by case basis you decide what looks better for your use case and do that a good point where you might want to make it you might want to make these you might want to make these uh, horizontal bars is if let's say you had a lot of values here right so if you had a lot of values here on the x axis you may in, instead want to make them let's say the x axis was countries and not days of the week so then you would need to show 200 countries and that's very difficult to show so rather what you might want to do then is use a horizontal plot so you can show a list of 200 countries here and then the y axis could represent let's say something like population all right so that's it about bar plots and once again let's commit a uh, save and commit our work before continuing and the next kind of chart so we are only looking at a few common charts here the the ones that are used most frequently and in fact if i have to tell you from my experience around half of the plots that i tend to end up drawing turn out to be line plots sometimes bar plots and then those where the line plots do not make sense tend to be scatter plots and histograms are useful when you are visualizing a specific variable just a distribution of values so histograms are pretty useful as well and then there is this last one called heat map which you will use from time to time not very often but this is also one of the most common plots so to understand what a heat map is it's used to visualize a two dimensional data like a matrix or a table using colors now that's probably not telling you a lot but the best way to understand it is to look at an example so the way so what we are going to look at is we're going to use a data set called flights once again this is included within seaborn so we say sns dot load data set flights so here what we have is we have data for years of, for a bunch of years so starting from 1949 to 1960 and then for each month starting from january to december for each year we have the total count of passengers in thousands so in these are the count of passengers who visited a certain airport visited a certain airport so this is the footfall at the airport okay and we don't know I, I can't recall which airport this is but let's assume it's an airport so in january for 1949 112000 passengers visited the airport in february of 1949 118 passengers visited the airport 18000 passengers and so on we have this data for 1949 to 1960. Now what we may want to know is what does the trend look like? What does the trend of passengers coming to this airport look like? Is it increasing or is it decreasing? And we could do a line plot. So we could simply do plt dot plot. So this we have, let's say, let's call this df. Let's simply do df dot passengers and it seems like there's an increasing trend, but you can see that things go up and down and a, a nicer way to visualize this in my opinion would be to use a heat map and for using a heat map, we could, first of all, we have to represent this data as a matrix. So here, what we're going to do is we're going to use the pivot argument. We're going to use a pivot function on pivot method of a data frame. And we're say, saying that we want to pivot on month and year. And what, the, what that does is that creates that sort of puts this data frame into more of like a matrix kind of a format. So now instead of the rows, uh, instead of the columns being year, month and passengers, the months become the rows. So for each month, we have one row, January, February, March, and uh, all the way up to December. And for each year, we have a column. So here we have 1949, 50, 51, all the way up to 1960. So this is still a pandas data frame, still the same data represented in a different way. And then the val the element at a particular, the value at a particular position. So let's say 51 February, this is the number of passengers in thousands, of course, that was there in the original data frame. Okay. And you can live a, look up the documentation of pivot to learn more. But now we have this matrix of values, all of which is representing a count of passengers across. So one axis is the months and one axis is the years. Okay. And looking at this matrix of values, it's not easy to tell what the trend looks like. It seems like the values increase over the years and it seems like the values increase up all the way up to June, July and then decrease, but it's still not very obvious. And this is where we can use a heat map. So all we need to do is first get the data into this format, right? And you've seen how to do that. You can 
using the pivot method or sometimes you can simply use a numpy array, numpy two dimensional array with all of these values and then we pass in this into sns.heatmap so once again this is a seaborn something that seaborn gives you and we're also setting a title here so once we create a heat map we get this nice visualization so this is a visual representation of the same information so instead of the numbers now we see colors and then you can see that the the darker the color represents a lower number so you you, you can see this legend here on the side the strip it tells you that the darkest color black is closer to let's say 100 passengers whereas the lightest color which is close to a very uh, very pale color that is about 600000 passengers in thousands and then now you can see the trend a little bit better so it seems like over the years we go from dark to bright so that means over the years the traffic seems to increase and then within a year we go from dark to bright and back to dark so that's the same trend that you can see everywhere so it seems like once again that the traffic increases up to june july and then decreases once again okay and this heat map is is pretty useful here to to visualize this relationship in a single glance then once again what we can also do is we can take we can change we can also show the values here in, uh, apart from the colors so we simply set a not equal to true so just use the argument a not equal to true and that will also show the numbers and uh, then we have the c map so here it uses this color map of going from very dark to very bright i actually would prefer the opposite here i would want a lighter color to uh, show them to show a smaller number of passengers and a darker color to show a higher number of passengers so you can search for color maps in matplotlib and there are a lot of pre pre included inbuilt color maps i'm going to use a color map called blues so that's going to be slightly different from what you saw before and this is what that looks like so now we have now we are showing the number of passengers the actual value and we are showing a background color behind it and the background color goes from very light showing a small number of passengers to very dark showing a high number of passengers so here now you can see that the once again the same trend that the number of passengers increases over the years and the highest footfall seems to be around july okay so that's the heat map and you will the main reason you may not draw a lot of heat maps yourself but you may come across a lot of heat maps as you're looking at tutorials or notebooks drawn by other people and then over time you'll start to see when they make sense and then you can start including them in your own visualizations so next up we've looked at five types of graphs and that's pretty much it in terms of the types of plots that we are looking at but matplotlib can also be used to display images so to display an image let's first download an image from the internet so this is the this is the image you can follow this link to see where it what it looks like and we are using the url retrieve function from the url lib dot request module for this okay let's just try that again yeah so the image is now downloaded now before the image can uh, can be displayed it has to be read into memory and to do this we use the python imaging library or the pil module and from the pil module we import the image class and then to the image class there is a method called open so this creates an image i am so this is an image and then you can check the type of this so this has a type of pil dot jpg image plugin dot jpg image file so image dot open automatically converts this into a certain class within the a certain object of a certain class within the pil library but internally pil is simply using a numpy array a three dimensional numpy to represent this image and we will look at that array but first let us display the image so to display the image we can use plt.imshow so we just say plt.imshow and then we put in the image the plt the pil image object and this is what the image looks like so it seems like the image itself is the image of a graph it is actually a, a meme about a bar plot where one of the bar plots has a very high variance the confidence inter interval is very large and so the other bar plot says sorry we just can't trust you and that's the image and it seems like this image is displayed but along with this image an axis is also displayed now you see this is drawn by matplotlib so you see 0 to it seems like it goes from about 0 to 480 
and again 0 to 600 and something. So this image is of height 640 and this image is of high uh, is of width 640 and it is of height around 480 and you might know that images are represented using pixels so each point so when we say 480 is the height so there are there's a pixel or a point there are 480 points vertically and then there are 640 points horizontally so in some sense it is a matrix of points right so it is a matrix of points with 480 rows and 680 columns 640 columns now what does this what does each point contain so each point is actually a point on the screen which is called an rgb pixel or a red green blue pixel so how images are represent are, are displayed on the screen is that you have a red pixel which shines with a certain intensity and then you have a blue pixel which shines with a certain intensity and then you have a green pixel which shines with a in certain intensity and all of them together form one pixel of a color image and as we vary the intensities of the red green and blue lights that leads to all the different colors that we see on our screens millions of colors so that's what an image is and if you want to see the internal representation of an image so you can simply do np.array and pass in the image object and that will create an image array and then you can check the shape of the image array so as you might expect the image array has 481 rows for e and then 640 columns so that means there are 481 cross 640 pixels points on the image and then each point is again has three values so these three values are the color intensities of red green and blue and typically these values go from 0 to 255 so we're getting a little bit into like how images are represented and so on it's a little bit outside the scope of this tutorial but let's look at it anyway so you can see here that this is a 3d array and then each pixel is represented using three values r g and b and then these values can go from 0 which means that the red light is completely turned off to 255 which means that the red light is completely turned to a full value of like bright red and then similarly green and blue okay so that's a little bit about images but the key idea here is that you can actually display images using plt.im show and now if you do want to just see the image and not see the axis and the grid lines so then we can simply a turn off the grid so we say plt.grid falls and then we turn off the axis and then we say plt.axis off so this is a little bit odd where for grid you say false and for axis you say off but you know these are just same things that you can look up you can always just search online how to disable the grid in matplotlib so the by grid these lines that these white lines that seem to be cutting the image and then the axis by axis these uh, x-axis and y-axis which has a bunch of values here and we also can set a title for this plot so here once again we have the actual image now so it seems like the image had a border internally that's why you see a border and we have a title for it and then you can look at the image okay now we can since i mentioned that this image is a numpy array we can actually also display just a part of the image so all we need to do is we need to select which columns and which rows we want to show let's say we simply want to show this portion Right? And if I go back to this image where we had all the axes, so if we just want to show this portion, then I might start from picking from the 120th row to let's say the 320th row. And I might pick somewhere from the 100th row to the 300th, uh, 100th column to the 300th column. So that might give me just this section. So that's what we do here. We say IMG array. And here we say 125 to 325 and 105 to 305. So we've picked certain rows and certain columns. And now when we pass that into plt.im show, it will only display that particular section of the image, right? So you can see here now it only displays this particular section from a certain set of columns and a certain set of rows. So that's how you effectively what this means is we have zoomed into the image. So that's it about images in matplotlib. Then we have plotting multiple charts in a grid because we've seen different types of charts we've seen how to plot images but there are certain cases where you might want to show certain charts side by side certain different charts right not just let's say two lines within the same plot but you may want to show a line plot and a scatter plot and an image side by side and this is possible this is actually really easy to do in matplotlib so let's look at it 
the so the way we do it is to first call plt dot subplots and then in plt dot subplots we pass in the number of rows that we want to see and the number of columns you can see here we get back this we get back some one two three four five six plots the, there are two rows and three columns and then you can change this and see how that varies so now here we have three and three so that's a good starting point now the next thing that you might want to do is because you can see that these values uh, are overlapping a little bit so you can actually specify spacing between these so you can just say plt dot tight underscore layout and then in this tight layout you can specify a pad argument so i'm just going to set pad equals two so now that is going to give some space so now you have space between each of these graphs so it's starting to look a little bit better and now we need to start filling these graphs so to start filling these we need to use the result of plt dot subplots so plt dot subplots returns two results so it returns a figure so something called a fig and then it returns axes and we'll see what each of these mean but yeah let's just get the return values out and let's plot let's just look at what the axes contain so the axis it turns out is a numpy array and it, this numpy array just contains some what is called an axis subplot object so each of these is an object so if we check axis dot shape it has the same shape that we had set it has the same shape that we had set for within plt dot subplot so two rows and three columns so if we just check axis 0 comma 0 so that seems to be an axis dot subplot function right axis dot subplot object now this subplot object is something that you can use for drawing plots so just as we do plt dot plot we can do axis we can pick a particular subplot axis like that object and then we can say plot right so axis 0 dot plot and then here let's say we want to plot a line chart so let's say we want to plot the yield of oranges so we say years oranges and once again we want to make this a circular markers and have a dashed line and make it red so we can do that and now you can see that we've plotted oranges inside this small subplot let's go one step further we can once again take this axis 0 0 and let us set a title for it so let's set the title yield of oranges let's also plot apples maybe so for apples we are going to use a square and then we are going to use a blue color and solid line and let's set a legend so you can do all of that just within that specific plot so we can set legend and the legend is apples and oranges or yeah let's move apples up so apples and oranges so we use it exactly like plt dot plot but there are a few differences and to understand these differences you can refer to the documentation i'll provide a link below so to set the title you need to actually call set underscore title and then if you want to set labels so let's say we want to set x label and y label so in plt we were doing dot x label but here you need to do set underscore x label and this is just some it's just a specific thing and implementation detail within matplotlib which unfortunately we have to deal with so you just say set underscore x label so x label is the year and then similarly we set the y label and the y label is the yield in tons per hectare okay so that's it now within that particular axis we have drawn a pretty complicated chart here you can see here okay maybe i don't want a legend maybe the legend is too much in a small graph like this so yeah let me just hide that you can see now you can see the this is crop yields so now if this is getting a little bit too cramped you can increase the size of the figure so you can specify a fig size and let me set the fig size to 12 comma 9 and let's see if that makes it better okay so now the figure is a little bit better so now we have crop yields maybe we can even add back the legend all right so there we have it now we have the crop yields for apples and oranges in yield tons per hectare and then we have the year here and then we have a title for the graph so that we've done for the first one and similarly we can do it for the next one as well so now we pick axis 0 0 uh, we pick axis 0 1 so that would be this one now here let's do a scatter plot but to do a scatter plot we need to use sns dot scatter plot right so we say sns dot scatter plot and here maybe we want to visualize 
let's say flowers df dot sepal length and flowers df dot sepal width so let's just take that and put in sepal width and then we want to give it a hue so we set the hue to flowers df dot uh, species okay and then we want to set the size to 100 the size of the dots and we want to give it a title so we want to give this a title of sepal length versus width let's say now one issue here is that we have not passed in the we have not specified which axis the scatter plot should be drawn on and that's where Seaborn provides an ax argument and to this ax argument you can specify axis 0 1 and here this one should also be 0 1 okay so we have now specified the axis so for in mat when you're using matplotlib you can directly call functions on the axis but when you want to use seaborn you simply pass in the axis into the seaborn scatter plot or whatever function you're using okay so let's run that too oops it seems okay so we need to set dot set title all right so this is where i get confused sometimes but we need to call set title for the axis okay so now you see here now we have the sepal length versus width species are centosa versicolor and virginica and these are the plots and similarly you just extend this forward so here once again we are creating a plt dot subplots we have used a figure size of 16 comma 8 and then we are plotting here we're plotting a line graph then here we're plotting scatter plot so these two we just did ourselves then we can also similarly here now we are plotting a histogram so in the third position we are plotting a histogram so for histogram we directly use dot hist on the axis 0 2 then we are plotting a bar plot so here is a bar plot from the restaurant bills data set then here we are plotting a heat map so on like axis 1 1 and then we are passing the same heat map we are passing the axis into the sns dot heat map function and finally we are plotting an image and for that particular axis we are hiding the grid and we are hiding all the we are hiding all the axis like the x axis and y axis and then finally we are calling plt dot tight layout to give some space between these so once we do that once we use subplots and then in each subplot we draw something here we end up with a single image so you can see this if i drag this around this is a single image in the single image we have six plots and in the six plots we have all the different kinds of graphs that we have drawn so let's do a quick review as well so first we looked at a line graph we we saw how to use the plt dot plot function to draw a line graph and then we saw that you can include you can add a x axis by including a bunch of values for the x axis and a bunch of values for the y axis then you can also add labels for the x and y axis using plt dot x label and y label you can also add a title to the chart using plt dot title and then you can add markers you can add a legend and then you can modify the style of the markers and the lines using various arguments to plt dot plot so all those also apply to the axis dot plot function then we looked at the scatter plot so we learned that a scatter plot is used to visualize the relationship between two variables especially when there are a lot of values within a small range so here we compared sepal length and we first we just plotted the values and we did not see too much of a relationship but then we introduced a color or a hue to change the to decide the color of the dots and that turned out to give us more information that now we could see that each species has a sort of an independent relationship <clears throat> so that was a scatter plot then and we also saw that a scatter plot or any so scatter plot was created using sns dot scatter plot so the seaborn function and any seaborn function has great support for pandas data frames so instead of passing full lists of values you can simply pass in column names and then you can pass in the data frame using the data argument then we looked at the histogram is used to visualize the distribution of values of a single variable so for instance sepal width we saw how the values of sepal width how they are distributed in the range of 2 to 4.4 it seems like a large number of sepal width values lie in the range of 3 to 3.25 about 50 values to be exact and then there are a smaller number of values in each range so that gives you like a probability distribution and we saw that we can stack histograms for multiple species so we did a filtering we created a list of values for each species and then we used different colors to plot them so that we can see the overall relationship as well as the relationship for individual species of flowers so that was the histogram 
Uh, then we looked at a bar plot. So our bar plot, uh, in this case, we use the restaurant bills data set and the bar plot was used to represent the average bill on a weekday, the average total bill uh, on each weekday and to be able to compare them side by side. So for instance, we could see that the bills on sat Sunday were the highest and the bills on Thursday were the lowest. Uh, then we also introduced a hue. So either a sex or a smoker or things like that, which would then show two plots side by side for each value on the X axis, right? So that we could compare male and female as well. So that was the bar plot using SNS.bar plot. For histogram, we had used PNT.hist. Then we looked at heat maps. So we looked at heat maps to visualize flight traffic into a particular airport over time. So oh, from 1949 to 1960. And then we saw how the footfall increased over the years, but within a year, the footfall increased up to July and then it tended to decrease, right? And a heat map was a good way to visualize that in a compact fashion. And finally, we also looked at how to display images. So we first load up an image using plt. Oh, sorry, using pil.image.open and then we can display it using plt.imshow. We also learned that images are actually num in Python are represented using NumPy arrays with a certain number of rows, columns and uh, pixel values. So there are 3D arrays and you can actually select a specific slice of the image and just display a small part of the image. So that's what we looked at as well. Now this is just a small selection of what's possible and there is a lot more that you can do. So what I would recommend is I have pointed to a few resources here. So I've pointed to a data visualization cheat sheet. So let's go through these one by one. So I pointed to a data visualization cheat sheet, which takes everything that you've learned here and then a few more plots and gives you, gives it to you in a very simple format that you can use as a place to copy paste from because with data visualization, what I often struggle with is that I know what I want, but it's very hard to figure out what the right syntax should be. So here we have included some examples for line plots, scatter plots, frequency distributions, heat maps, uh, there's something called a contour plot, something called a box plot, which we've not covered and a bar chart. So you can see simple examples, one line, two line examples, and you can simply copy over this code and use this as a reference whenever you are working on a visualization project. Similarly, we've pointed to a gallery of Seaborn plots and matplotlib plots. So you can see what's possible with Seaborn and matplotlib. So there are a whole different variety of plots that you can draw. And you can combine different kinds of plots in very interesting ways to create some really good visualizations. And the good thing is that these only take a few lines of code, especially with Seaborn. So for instance, if we open up this, so here you can see that this is just a few lines of code, less than 20 lines of code, and you get this beautiful visualization. And all of these contain, Seaborn contains example data sets. So you can just try out, try it out using these example data sets. So do try it out. If you just do it once, you're going to get a good idea, a good handle over Seaborn. Then similarly, we have this gallery for matplotlib. Now, since Seaborn builds on top of matplotlib about that. So for matplotlib, you will have to write a little more code, but matplotlib is equally powerful ultimately, and it gives you a lot more control over your plots. So you can open up any of these examples and see. And then we've also pointed you to a documentation and a tutorial for matplotlib. So here's a great tutorial that goes into a lot more depth. So it may take a few hours to work through, may take a couple of days, but you can work through this great tutorial that goes a lot deeper into matplotlib. And this is by the same person who, from whom we borrowed the hundred numpy exercises. So if you like this tutorial, just definitely give them a star. So with that, we complete our discussion of data visualization. I guess one of the questions that commonly gets asked is, should I use matplotlib or Seaborn? And do I even need to use matplotlib? What does Seaborn not contain? Well, so uh, I tend to use matplotlib, especially for line plots and uh, for simple histograms, because it's so easy to use. You just call plt.plot and also for displaying images. So you just call plt.plot and put in some data and then you can progressively enhance it. So whenever there's a simple plot to be drawn, just use matplotlib. But whenever you're doing something a little more complex, like you want to have a scatter plot across two dimensions and then you want to use a color as a third dimension and you can also use a fourth dimension to decide the size of the dots. So that's something that we did not look at, but that's possible too. So Seaborn, 
is when you want to do more with your graphs uh, and that's when you would use seaborn so i would use matplotlib for more simpler stuff like lines and histograms and seaborn for the rest now in terms of how to choose the right plot well the a good rule of thumb is to just try out a line plot and in a lot of cases it can give you a good enough it can give you a good enough result but then once you want to go beyond then you start looking through this list okay a scatter plot makes sense here will it be interesting to use a heat map here and a lot of these things just come from experimentation you now take the same data and try to draw different kinds of plots with it and see which plot gives you the most information and gives you presents the information visually in the best fashion all right and uh, as you experiment with it you will start to cultivate an intuition for which plot to use where now one last thing we should do is to just commit our notebook from time to time remember that we are using binder which is a temporary online service so it can get shut down if you leave the computer idle for some time so whenever you are working on binder just do commit from time to time okay so with that we complete our discussion of data visualization so let us open up the course project this is one of the most interesting things interesting parts of this course so the objective of the course project is to apply all the skills and techniques that you have learned during the course onto a real world data set and the the thing about the course project is well to get it accepted there is a certain evaluation criteria that you have to complete and we'll talk about that but then it's really open ended in the sense that you can do as much with it as you want you can end up drawing dozens of different types of graphs and answer many answer like many different questions you can combine data from many sources so use this to really practice all the skills that you've learned don't take it as something that you just have to submit take it as something that you will showcase on your portfolio so let's open up the starter notebook the starter notebook contains all the information all the guidelines for the course project so the first cell of the starter notebook contains guidelines and then there is a template that you can use but you do not have to use this template you can just use you can start from scratch to the way to start from scratch is to go on your joven.ml profile and then click new notebook and select blank notebook and that will create a blank notebook that you can start working with but in this case i'm going to start use this starter template and then i'm going to click run on binder is so while the jupyter notebook starts up let's start going through the guidelines so as i mentioned that this is the starter notebook and you will pick a real world data set of your choice and then you will apply all the concepts that you've learned in this course to perform exploratory data analysis okay and this seems to have opened up so let me just open up the jupyter notebook here all right so the first thing the step 1 is to select a real world data set so you can find and download an interesting real world data set and we have pointed to a lot of interesting data sets in the recommended data set section so you just you can just scroll down below and you will find recommended data sets and we'll spend a little bit of time there too and the criteria is that this data should data set should contain tabular data which is rows and columns and preferably in a csv json or excel formats or other formats that can be read using pandas because we have used pandas primarily for this course and if you are unable to read the data using pandas you will not be able to analyze it if it is not in a compatible format then you may have to write some code to convert it to the desired format so remember we also had a discussion about reading and writing to files so you may have to read it using pure python and then write it back into a csv or a json format which can be read using pandas okay i would suggest that if you're not too comfortable with python yet don't do that just pick a data set that is already in the csv format and just run with it but if you are feeling comfortable if you really like a particular data set it's not in a csv format then you can just convert it into csv as well then the data set should contain at least 3 columns and at least 150 rows of data now this is important because so that there sh there should be enough in the project if it is just one column of data and 100 rows of data then you are not going to have enough to showcase when you present this project let's say uh, while you are applying for an internship or a job so just pick a data set that is large enough now when i say at least this is just a lower bound you can pick data sets with tens of thousands of rows of data probably bigger than that will slow you down so restrict yourself to maybe a few thousand rows or 10000 rows or so and you can pick data sets with hundreds of columns once again that's not that will probably once again cause a lot of confusion so stick to maybe something around 10 columns a maximum would be good but as such the data set data set should be rich enough that you can 
ask enough questions and draw enough graphs and so on okay one thing that you can also do and this will be great because it will really enhance your skills and your experience is if you can combine data from multiple sources that will let you create something really unique and you've learned how to combine data using the merge function in pandas yeah so just keep that in mind those are some guidelines for picking the right data set and we'll show you some examples but once you have picked the right data set then next step is to perform some data preparation and cleaning so you simply load the data set using pandas and then you know, the same way we've done with the covid data set and a few other examples and then you explore the number of rows and columns the range of values so you use things like info describe shape and such so just to get some basic understanding about the data this is like some meta information about the data you also decide how you're going to handle missing values maybe fix any incorrect values maybe drop any rows that you you don't want to consider so there's some basic cleaning up that you might have to do and you can also perform additional steps like you might want to parse dates into the date time format you might want to create additional columns or merge multiple data sets so you do all of that that's the data preparation step and so take these steps as a guideline on what to do and not as something that you have to really stick to is you you can work on the data as you see fit but these are just some guidelines to help you along the process okay so once you've done once you're done with the data preparation and cleaning then you will perform some exploratory analysis and visualization so what this means is you will compute the mean the average the sum range and other interesting statistics for numeric columns so here we are still discovering you are going one step deeper where you are looking into specific columns maybe you can use this you can look at the distributions of numeric columns using histograms maybe you can explore relationships between columns using scatter plots bar charts and things like that and also make a note of interesting insights from this exploratory analysis so here we are not really trying to ask any questions yet we are still just exploring what we just feeling it out and through that you know as we plotted some graphs we got some we could infer some things from it or we could form some hypothesis so make a note of all of these interesting insights from this exploratory analysis and then the, the next step is to ask and answer questions about the data so now once you have become familiar with the data you have looked at it in different ways through graphs and through summaries and things like that now you have to like you have to figure out what are five things at least five things that you want to know about the data set so ask five interesting questions so questions 1 through 5 and then answer these questions either by computing the results so you can use numpy pandas the different functions that we have for computing the results or by plotting graphs so the questions do not have to be numeric questions the questions in fact sometimes even if they are numeric questions let's say which country has the highest population if you're trying to answer that you can actually draw a bar graph and use the bar graph to answer that question right so it's not there's no automated evaluation here it's more for you to explain what's going on in the data and you get to decide your own questions and you can create new columns you can merge multiple data sets and you can perform grouping and aggregation wherever necessary and one good thing to do is in all of this process apart from writing the code you should also write try to write good explanations so make it like a tutorial so that it is a useful to read for somebody who is one step behind you for somebody who has not taken this course so in that sense it becomes like a full report and a, and a tutorial as well so whenever you're using some library function from pandas numpy or matplotlib just explain briefly what it does or link to the documentation that we can use the pandas dot read csv function to read a file from from in a, in the csv format right just one sentence like this even though it's obvious to you it's really helpful for a reader so that's where you will ask and answer some questions and then finally at the end you have to just conclude so this is treat this jupyter notebook as a project report along for, with the code itself so just learn a, write a summary of what you've learned from the analysis include some interesting insights or graphs from the previous sessions so you can once again copy over the code and then just include those graphs if you need to again all of these are guidelines so you do not have to stick to them perfectly and then share ideas for future work on the same topic or using other relevant data sets you know you have gathered some insights but maybe you've not really figured out everything and you maybe did not have the time so you can just mention these are a few other things that you can try out with the same data set
and maybe even point to some other relevant data sets which can probably be combined using with this data set or maybe the insights can be combined to to get more to get something more interesting out of it and this could be an idea that might help you in the future that this is a starter project that you do and then two months later you're looking for another project to work on you can just look through the future work ideas from your current project your previous project and see if any of those make sense to pick up right so this is a very important thing to do so do some reflection and then share more ideas while you are still in the thick of things and finally while working on this project you will probably refer to at least a few dozen blog posts articles documentation pages stack overflow answers and some of these you might want to just note down and keep a track of so just keep a note somewhere of the import of the most interesting links that you found and just link to those resources at the end of your analysis all right and in this entire process from step let's say step 2 to step 5 five all of this will happen in the jupyter notebook so document your jupyter notebook write detailed explanations use the markdown cells use the markdown syntax use headings use bullet lists use tables so there are a lot of things you can do with markdown so just make it a point to make it as nice as possible because when you send this notebook to somebody you want them to look at it and tell that uh, you want them to look at it and be able to understand what's going on and also really appreciate the effort that you have put in and that will really help you make progress because presentation is a very important part of data science right so that will really help you make progress towards getting a role or like getting an internship a fellowship or a job in the data science domain okay so now once you're done with all of this and then you can use this you then need to make a submission so you can use this starter notebook or you can just start a new notebook from scratch but make sure to run, keep running jovin.commit from time to time so here we have a project name just give this a nicer project name whatever makes sense for you let's say if i'm working on some covid-19 data analysis that's a data set a real world data set something that is evolving on a daily basis okay so i am just setting a project name and then just use the jovian library and keep committing the project so here i have created sections for you in the starter notebook so let me just make a commit first and then i'll go through that so here we just put in the api key and then make a commit but here you can see some sections like data preparation and cleaning exploratory data analysis asking and answering questions inferences and conclusion and then references and future work right so you can just use that as a guideline and write some explanations write some code plot some graphs get some results and keep committing from time to time and then when you're done with the entire project when you feel that you have something significant enough then you take the notebook here the notebook link covid-19 data analysis demo that i just committed i come back to the course project page and here i make a submission and click submit and a submission will be made and then we will evaluate it okay so now what are the evaluation criteria the evaluation criteria is this that your submission will be evaluated on these criteria that the data set must contain at least 3 columns and 150 rows of data so this is just so that it has enough of a breadth enough information within the data you must ask and answer at least 5 questions about the data set so asking the right questions is also a skill so that's why you have to ask come up with five interesting original questions about the data set your submission should include at least five visualizations or graphs and once again try to make these different but we are not going to test if these are all different graphs but don't make just five line plots try to use different kinds of charts scatter plots histograms heat maps whatever you can try out your submission should include explanations using markdown cells so it should not be just code it should not be just a series of code cells because then it's you've not it shows that you've not really put an effort into presentation presentation is an important part of the of data science and especially of doing projects and then your work must not be plagiarized that you should not have copy pasted the entire thing from somewhere else now you can see a lot of these data sets are already analyzed there's a lot of information available online so you can repeat what somebody else has done but just uh, there's a difference between simply copy pasting where you do not really understand what has happened versus borrowing the right things from specific notebooks or tutorials and it's a fine line 
and it's something that you should hold yourself accountable to but just try to as long as you have put in some original work into the project and you have satisfied all of these criteria we will evaluate and accept your project and this course project along with the three assignments if you've completed all of them then you will be able to earn the verified certificate of accomplishment that you can add on your linkedin profile or wherever else you want to so these are the evaluation criteria this is how we will evaluate your work now i just want to spend a little more time talking about some of the data sets that you can use for working so we have created a list of a few data sources from where you can get data sets so the first one is kaggle data sets this is the easiest one to get started with so you just click on kaggle data sets and you will find a whole bunch of there are over 50000 data sets you can pick from so for instance what you do is just open up a data set and then just click download and that is going to download the data set for you and i'm just going to save it on my desktop and i'm just going to open it up so unbundle it so you can see here that there is a file here so from 1976 to 2018 you have the data for us senate let us open it up in let's say let's use visual studio code to open it up so you can see that this data is in csv format this data is in csv format and in the csv format you can now read it using pandas and you can start doing your analysis so that's one example the us elections data set and there are lots more that you can look through here you can also filter there are a lot of filters that you, that you can use for this data set for these data sets so that's kaggle data sets then similarly you have the uci machine learning repository this has a whole bunch of data sets too so here you can for example just click on view all data sets here and you can see you can even filter it out with different areas different attributes you can see different data types and different instances and use that so here for instance breast cancer data set so this has around 2000 data and you can see a basic information that it contains a bunch of information about breast cancer patients and you can found the data folder here so here it has it is in a certain format called dot data you might want to then convert that format to csv but a lot of these lot of these data sets are also in a specific csv format that you can directly use to okay then you have awesome public data sets this is also another great source so this is a github repository from where you can find links to a lot of data sets in many different areas so if you are from a different domain like whatever domain you're from or you're currently working in find an interesting data set there use that and then you have we also link to a place you have google data set search so on google data set search you can find data for anything and everything pretty much so for instance if we try global temperatures you can see that there is some data here about global surface temperatures and you can then get this data so in some cases you might have to go through a few links to get the data and you might have to look through on how to actually download the data so i'm not sure here what it seems like there's a lot of different data files here but as you just go through and support and uh, look through all of this information you will be able to find a csv file if not probably just try another data set so these are some sources where you can find these data sets right and whenever you get a data set downloaded to your computer now you will need to upload it back to binder so here whenever you're working on it you will need to just upload this data so here for example you have the usa presidential election by county i'm just going to upload that actually let me upload a smaller file so here let me upload this 2012 data so this is how you upload a data to binder and if you want to download a a file let's say you've created a csv file by processing some other data file you can download it by selecting it and clicking the download button so that's something you can do as well one other thing that you can do is when you're running jovian.commit you can also include a bunch of files so for instance here in in the list of files i can include this csv file name so in this way what happens is that your csv files can get included your csv files can get included along with your commit so that the next time when you run then the csv file will automatically become available to you so the first time you run commit you might want to just include the csv file using the files argument so then 
when you commit and you check your check the files tab of your project you will be able to see the file here and when you run it the file will already be present so that you don't have to upload it again and again okay so that's how you work so these are some data set sources and then we've also picked out some specific data sets like the stack overflow annual developer survey some covid 19 data some google play store data and a bunch of these so these are data sets that we would highly recommend that you can analyze and so there are some game data sets like dota cricket basketball pubg and so on and then there is also data that you can download from your personal apps that you use so things like whatsapp chrome google calendar apple's apps instagram facebook linkedin and that is also another really interesting thing to do now apart from that there is one optional step here and the option step is to write a blog post so you can have a jupyter notebook and you can have great explanations but sometimes it is also helpful to write a separate blog post so you can use the medium.com platform again this is completely optional not part of the required submission you can sign up on medium.com and you can copy over the explanations from your jupyter notebook into your blog post and the code cells and the outputs you can actually embed them within your blog post so i'll just show you an example so here you can see that you have uh, this is a blog post where we have embedded this code cell from a jupyter notebook you can see here that you have the inputs and the outputs. so you have some code and then you have a graph this is embedded from a jupyter notebook the called kaggle python recipes so you can embed a code and output from your jupyter notebook inside a blog post so try that out as well and if you want some inspiration you can check out our medium publication right and we will love to feature your work on our medium publication and we will share it uh, with our uh, user base we will share it on our social media so we are looking forward to interesting submissions interesting blog posts and interesting notebooks okay now i want to show you a few examples of some good projects that you can take inspiration from so here's one this is uh, analyzing your personal browser history using pandas and seaborn by uh, karthik godavad a good friend of ours so here what Karthik did was he used Google Takeout. So Google has something called Google Takeout. So takeout.google.com from where he exported his entire browser history across all devices including mobile and desktop in the JSON format. Then he took that browser history JSON and then he converted that into a pandas data frame. So this is what the data frame looked like where there you had the url and then you had the title and then you had some other information like at what time you he visited the page based on that data frame he extracted a bunch of features so created new columns so he created like days of the week year month and things like that he also created categories so based on the url like if the if coursera fast fast ai kaggle or free code camp were part of the url then he ca categorized that as learning on the other hand if it was y combinator medium or hacker noon he categorized that as tech reads and then probably categorized youtube etc as entertainment so he did some categorization and created a data frame out of that as well and so that is some pre-processing on the data then he started exploring the data and creating visualizations so here he uh, he has used seaborn to create a count plot this is something that we have not explored but you can look up the documentation so to check how many sites were https and how many were http he has used he has done some more analysis to figure out how the browsing activity varies on weekends versus weekdays so it seems like there's more activity happening on weekdays compared to weekends so that's great he also looked at his browsing activity over the different months and the different hours of the day so sorry different days and different hours of the day so here it looks like that most of the browsing uh, so between let's say 12 a.m to 9 a.m not a lot of activity happens and then there's a lot of activity happening on certain nights probably when you're binge watching something or maybe busy with work so here a heat map is a good example and you can see that all these graphs are things that we have covered then you also looked at browser visits by the day of week and the hour again a heat map and then there are more uh, some more analysis here here this is a list of the most common stack overflow questions so sometimes you don't need to create a graph you can just create a, a filtered out data frame so it seems like these are some of the most common 
stack overflow questions that he that karthik looked at and so on so this is one great example then another one is just analyzing the covid-19 data using pandas this is what we did for the pandas tutorial so you can see that we followed all these steps here and you will be able to just take a data set and follow the same steps reading a file using pandas retrieving some data from a data then exploring the data querying and sorting the data we did not do a lot of visualization but you can see very easily how you can insert a lot of interesting visualization here we also asked and answered many questions here so we've answered asked four questions and answered them so this is again something that you can review here's one where prajwal used what his own whatsapp data to perform certain analysis so here prajwal has downloaded his whatsapp data and he has given you the instructions on how you can do that too and based on that he has then converted that into a data frame so you can probably even just borrow this function if you want to analyze your whatsapp data and then he's done some data cleaning and then based on that he's asked questions like who is the most active member of the group so it seems like this person is the most active and what were the most popular emojis that have been used it seems like the laughing emoji was the most popular emoji what can you say about the sleep cycle so it seems like there's a lot of activity on whatsapp happening around around after 9 pm so these are interesting insights that you can discover about yourself right and then there are a few more so here's one called uh, understanding the gender divide in data science this is more around uh, data visualization so you can see this is from a kaggle data set and here akansha has walked through oh, many different interesting kinds of plots that you don't normally see in matplotlib or cborn so if you want to explore more interesting plots you can check out this tutorial and then there is also a couple more that you can follow okay so we are hoping to have a lot more examples as the course participant work on projects do subscribe to the jovian ml youtube channels to get more updates about interesting courses and other tutorials with that i wish you all the best for all the assignments and the project thank you topic for today our final lecture is exploratory data analysis a case study where we will be taking everything that we have learned in the entire course and bringing it together into a single project where we will be analyzing a real world data set and we will be asking and answering some interesting questions about the data and we will figure out how to use the right tools and techniques and libraries and functions at the right places and we will be drawing some inferences and conclusions so this is in some sense a walk through of a real world project that you might do in data analysis so with that let's get started so the first thing you should do is go to the course page 02pandas.com and on the course page you will be able to find all the course materials so today since we are looking at lesson 5 so you can uh, sorry lesson 6 so you can scroll down to lesson 6 exploratory data analysis a case study and click open this will take you to the the lecture page where you will be able to see the video so the video that you're watching right now will be available as a recording for you to review now for each le lecture we have been using jupyter notebooks so today we will be using the jupyter notebook eda on stack overflow developer survey so you can just click on this link and that will bring you to this jupyter notebook now you can view this jupyter notebook you can read through it but what we would want to do is we would want to run this notebook now you need not run it right now you just watch the lecture and after the lecture you can run this notebook and experiment with it but i am going to run it right now and we are going to work through it and we click the run button and click run on binder to start the notebook up on the binder platform now this might take a couple of minutes so returning to the notebook this notebook is called exploratory data analysis using python a case study and we have clicked the run button and selected run on binder so finally here we have our jupyter interface running so let's just open up the notebook here python eda stack overflow survey dot ipy nb and the first thing that i'm going to do is i'm going to click kernel restart and clear output this is to clear all the outputs so that only the code remains and we can run the code and see the outputs for ourselves then i'm also going to hide the header and the toolbar <coughs> you need not do this but i'm just giving doing this so that we have a little more space to work with so in this 
Notebook exploratory data analysis using Python, a case study. We will be analyzing responses from the Stack Overflow annual developer survey, and we will apply all the things that we have learned so far about Python, Jupyter, NumPy, Pandas, Matplotlib, Seaborn together, and we'll bring everything together. Now you can run this code online just in the way that we have by using the run button that we just used to run this code on binder. But you can also run this code on your computer locally. So you can follow the instructions given here under option two. Now, as I mentioned, we'll be analyzing the Stack Overflow developer survey dataset for our analysis. And this is an annual survey conducted by Stack Overflow. And you can find the raw data and results on this page, insights.stackoverflow.com. In fact, we will be analyzing the results from 2020, but you can also see the survey from the past years. So the first thing that we would want to do is to download this data set into Jupyter. And there are many ways to do this. We've seen many ways over, over time across different lectures. So the first thing that you could do is just download the CSV manually and upload it using Jupyter's graphical interface. So let's do that. Let's see how to do that. So you click download full data set and that points us to a Google drive link. And then you can download the Google Drive link. And so here I'm downloading it to my desktop. And then you can unzip the Google Drive link. So once you unzip this link, you will see this folder developer survey 2020. And if you open up this folder, you will see here that you have a PDF and then a bunch of CSV files and then a readme file. So you can go through the readme to learn more about the data set. But probably the interesting files for us are going to be the CSV files. So we might need to upload these CSV files onto Jupyter. So the way to do that is to come back to the notebook, go file, open, and then you will find an, an upload button here. So click upload and just select the file that you want to upload. So in this case, let's say as an example, let's try and upload survey results schema.csv. So one by one, you can upload each CSV file that you need. Okay. So that's one way to do it. Uh, you can click the upload button to complete the upload, but I won't do that right now. Then there's another way to do it. If you have a direct link to the raw CSV file. Okay. So this is very important. If you have a link which points directly to the CSV file. So a Google drive link or some other link will not do. It has to point to the raw file. Then you can use the URL retrieve function from the URL lib dot request module. So this is what we've used in our previous lectures. We've used this in the lecture on NumPy and pandas. So you can review those lectures, lectures three and four to see how to use this or just check the documentation. But today we are going to use a third method. We are going to use a helper library called open datasets. So this is a library that we have created for you to make it easier for you to do data analysis, where we are creating a curated collection of datasets for data analysis and machine learning. And these datasets can be downloaded into Jupyter with a single Python command. So this is how it works. We have to install this library, pip install open datasets. So let just come back to the Jupyter notebook and let us run pip install open datasets. So this is installed the open datasets library. Then we import open datasets as OD. So we just import open datasets as OD. And then all we need to do is run od.download and then pass in a dataset ID. So we have currently added about six datasets here, but we will be adding many more. We're trying to make sure that we have at least a hundred datasets here by the uh, end of this week. So you will see more here and we simply need to pick up the ID of the dataset that we want to use. So here we have the stack overflow developer survey and we need to paste that ID here. So we just do od.download and under the hood, this is going to fetch the list of files in the dataset and it is going to download all the files. So you can see that these URLs have been fetched and they have been downloaded into this folder stack overflow developer survey 2020. Okay. So with that we have, we seem to have the data set downloaded. Once again, you can go file open and you can check that there is a folder here, stack overflow developer survey 2020. And this contains the uh, readme and then the public file and the schema file. Okay. So those are different ways to download the data set. The important point is to have the files next to your Jupyter notebook, irrespective of how you get them. All right, so let's just check import the OS module and verify once again that the data set is actually downloaded. So when we run os.listdir on the stack overflow developer survey folder, we see a readme, we see some survey results and we see the survey results public and we see a survey results schema. So there are three files 
and you can go through these three files. So the readme contains some information about the data set and then the survey result schema contains a list of questions. And uh, so let's maybe just view load up that file and view that file as well. And then there are the survey results public. So this contains the full list of responses to those questions. Okay. So we will load the CSV files using pandas and uh, let's import pandas as PD and let's use the PD dot read CSV function where we will pass in the path to the survey results public dot CSV file, which contains the survey responses. And we are going to call it survey raw DF. So the reason for calling it that is because this is going to be the raw data set, the unprocessed data set that we are loading up. And then we are going to do some modifications to create a prepared data set for analysis. So here we create a survey raw DF by calling PD dot read CSV. And let's take a look at this. So this is what the data frame looks like. It looks like it has a whole bunch of columns. In fact, in total, there are about 61 columns. So 60 of them are the each column corresponds to one question from the survey. And here what is not the full question, but just a short form. And then there is also one column which contains a respondent ID. So these survey results are anonymized. So there is no personally identifiable information like first name, last name, phone number, email, etc. So results have been anonymized and every respondent has been given an ID, which is not really useful for us. There's one column if you want to use the respondent ID. And then there are 60 columns, one for each question. Now, if you want to know what the actual question was, this is where you can use the other file, which is uh, survey. So which is the other file, which is survey results schema.csv. And we'll see that in just a moment. But you can see at the bottom here that there are over 64,000 responses. And as we said, 61 columns, and let's just see a list of columns in the data frame. So we can use survey .df .columns to see a full list of columns from the data frame. A lot of these may not make sense. So this is where we need to use the schema file to understand what these columns represent. So we, here we have this file. Let me just put it on a single, on a separate line. So here we have this file schema survey results schema .csv. And maybe let's read, load up the entire file first. So we can just do PD dot read CSV and schema file name. So this file is a CSV file that contains two columns. One of the columns, the first column is titled column. So this corresponds to the names of all these columns except respondent. So main branch hobbies, etc., etc. Actually it contains the respondent ID as well. So for each of these columns, you can see the actual question here. So for instance, main branch means this question was which of the following options best describes you, etc, etc. Hobbyist means do you code as a hobby? So that's what the correspondence is. Now it's okay to have it in this format that but the schema data frame is primarily going to be used to access the question for each column. So what we might first want to do is we might just want to set the index by loading the file and set the index call argument to this column. So that when we read it, now we just have one proper column and then the column itself is just the index. So now we have the respondent and then we have this one column question text. Uh, so now we can access the question text using the respondent as a key, right? So you can, for example, imagine doing dot loc and then passing in the respondent key here to access the question text for the respondent. Okay. So now let's simplify it a little bit further. Since we only have one column, we don't really need a data frame. Data frames are required when we want to go over multiple columns of data. So we can simply get the question text out of this and that will give us a series. Okay. Looks like this is stuck. Yeah. So we can some just read the CSV file, the data frame and from it, just get the question text column out of it. So that will give us a series and that is all we need. Really the series has an index, which is the column name in the main data frame. And then the series has a value. Each value corresponds to the full text of the question. Okay. So that is what we have done here. We've created a schema raw, which is where we read in the schema file with the index column as column. And we just create a series question text. So here is a schema raw and we can now use schema raw to retrieve the full question text for any column in survey raw df. So now we can check for example, the years code pro column. So you can see here that years code pro column 
in the survey data frame corresponds to the question not including education how many years have you coded professionally as a part of your work all right so with that we have loaded up our data set and we have converted them into data frames we have it in a way that we can now work with it using the tools that we know and understand so we are now ready to move on to the next step of pre-processing and cleaning the data for our analysis and before we do that it's always a good idea to keep saving your work from time to time because we're running this on an online service binder so we simply select a project name so here i'm selecting a project name python eda stack overflow survey we install the jovian library and then we import jovian and run jovian.commit and this is going to ask us the first time this is going to ask us for an api key which we can get from our profile and just paste it in here and that is going to then commit this notebook to our profile yeah so now this notebook has been committed so you can view this notebook on your Jovian profile whenever you want to. Whenever, wherever you commit from, whether you commit from Binder or you commit from your local computer, everything gets saved on your Jovian profile. And then you can take this and run it on Binder whenever you need it to continue your work. All right, so moving ahead, now we have our data as data frames. And while this survey contains a wealth of information, it contains about 65,000 responses to 60 questions we will limit our analysis to us a few areas and this is what you might want to do for your projects as well just pick a theme for your project and do not try to do a lot of different things with the data set so we will limit our analysis to three areas the first would be understanding the demographics of the survey respondents who it is that has taken the survey and the global programming community in general and understand if the survey responses are representative of the global community we will also try and understand the distribution of different programming skills, experiences and preferences. So specifically like things like programming languages, which programming languages do people like, which one do they not. And we will also understand some employment related information, professional and information preferences and opinions. So something related to the kind of roles people are holding in data science and programming fields. Okay. So to do that, let us select a subset of the columns. So here are some columns for demographics and then here are some columns for the programming experience and then here are some columns for the employment. So you know that you can use this, the schema that we had created to check the questions. So do check out the full questions for each of these before moving forward. And let us just check how many columns you have selected. So we have selected about 20 columns. Okay. Now, what we will do is we'll take our survey raw data frame and then if we simply pass in a list of columns to it as an index that is simply going to select a subset of columns and then we are going to take that data and just create a copy of it and call that survey data frame. So we are creating a copy so that we can modify this without affecting the original data frame so that if we make a mistake we can always recreate this from the original data frame. So we create the survey data frame and we've just taken the selected columns and created a copy. And then we have created here. We are now going to just pick out the same selected columns out of the schema as well. So that our schema also contains just the columns that we need. So we can look at it right now. So here we have the survey data frame. This now has only 20 columns, the columns that we have selected. It still has all the rows and then we can check the schema as well. So here we see the schema. So you can see here that the schema has each uh, questions for each of the 20 columns. So you can see in total it has a, if you check the shape, you will see that it has 20 entries. And the survey data frame has about 64,000 rows and 20 columns. Now we can use the info method of survey data frame to see the list of columns and different data types. So these are all the different columns that we had just selected. And you can see that out of the 64,000 plus entries not all of the entries are non-empty so for each of the columns you see some null values some uh, values that are empty in the csv file so they pandas replaces empty values in the csv file with np.nan which is a token it is use it uses for empty values and because there are so many empty values and because a lot of rows contain many different types of data the data type that you see here is detected as object for most of the rules. 
Now the object data type is okay while we are working with strings. It's not really a problem, but when we are working with numbers and we want to perform some numeric computations and draw some graphs which involve number, uh, some kind of number processing, then we might need to convert some of these rows, some of these columns into numeric data types. Okay. So far we have just the age and the work week hours as the numeric data types. If you see age here, it has a data type float 64 and then the work week hours has a data type float 64. But there are a few more columns which can also have a numeric data type. So we have the age first code, we have the years code pro and we have the years code column. All three of these are also numeric, uh, but for some reason they have gotten classified as object. So let's investigate that a little bit. Now if we just look at survey df dot age first code and let us look at the unique values for this. So it turns out that most of the values are numbers and the question, if you're wondering what the question is, let's just check schema dot age first code. So the question is at what age did you write your first line of code or program? And the answers to that are mostly numbers, but there is also an option younger than five years and older than 85, which are strings. And we might want to just somehow convert these into numbers or ignore them because that will pre keeping them as string strings will prevent our analysis. So what you can do, uh, what we will choose to do here is we will choose to replace these with empty values. Okay. And we will choose to convert the rest of these into strings. And the way to do that is to use the PD dot two numeric function. So the PD dot two numeric function, and you can check the documentation. It takes a series or a column and it converts that series into a numeric data, right? So it's going to take all of these and convert these into floats and wherever it encounters a string, it will show throw an error. But what we want to do is we want to ignore the errors and simply replace any non numeric values with the NAN value or the empty placeholder value. So that's why we are passing in errors equals scores. Okay. So this is one thing that we're doing for the age first code. Similarly, we have years code and years code pro. So let's just take a quick look at years code and years code pro is going to be similar. So years code is including any education. How many years have you been coding in total? And if we take that and we check the unique values of that. So once again, here we have these options like less than one year and more than 50 years. Uh, once again, what we are going to do is we are going to ignore those values. We are going to convert these into empty values and the rest we are going to convert into numbers. So once again, we use PD.2 numeric and we assign the result back to survey DF years code. So this way we are replacing the columns with a new version of the same column where all the, all the elements are numbers or empty. And then similarly, we have this for the years code pro column. Okay. So go through the other columns and see if there are any other columns that are numeric, but for the time being, we will convert these three into numeric columns. Now we had two columns earlier, age and work week hours, and then we have three more columns. So in total, we have five numeric columns and we can start seeing some basic statistics about the numeric columns using the describe function. So here we have called survey df dot describe, and you can see that for age, um, there are the mean, the average age is about 30 of the survey respondents, but the average age of first coding. So the age at which they wrote their first line of code is around 15. Uh, the years of coding is about 12 in uh, on average and so on. Work weeks are around 40. Um, but you will start to notice some problems here. It seems like that the minimum age mentioned is one, which seems quite unlikely that a one year old infant has filled out this survey and the maximum age appears to be 279, which once again is quite unlikely. And this is a common issue with real world data in general and with surveys in particular, you have to understand that surveys are filled by people and people are not, there is no obligation to enter the right information. So sometimes people may intentionally putting the wrong information while other times there might be accidental errors while filling in. Like maybe somebody was looking to type 17, but they did not press the seven. And so it ended up being one, or maybe somebody was trying to type 27 and they accidentally pressed nine as well. And that ended up with 279. So we should try and solve for these for each column. You should go through it and try to figure out if the values in the column make sense. And a simple fix in this case would be to simply delete the rows 
where the value in the age column is higher than 100 years or lower than 10 years. So we are basically saying that those entire responses are invalid. Maybe they were, maybe they're invalid unintentionally or maybe that was intentional. And to delete the rows, we can use the drop uh, method of the data frame. So we just call survey df dot drop. And then you can just go try and understand the syntax here. What's happening is that we are first checking the list of values survey df dot age where the age is where the age is less than 10. So that's going to give us a Boolean series of true and false for each row uh, on whether the age is less than 10 or not. We then use that to select the rows. We then use that to select only those rows where the age is less than 10. And then to drop to a survey df dot drop, we need to pass an index. So if you just call dot index on this, so we are basically passing all the IDs of all the IDs of all the rows that need to be dropped. And then we are saying that we are dropping, we are doing this in place. So that is going to remove the rows from this same survey df data frame and not create a new data frame with the removed rows, right? There's a lot to unpack here and the way to solve it would be to just take each expression and run it on a different line on a different code cell and see the results and build it step by step. Or you can also follow this link here, which explains this entire line of code, or you can just check the documentation of survey df dot drop. Okay. So with that, we've done this for age less than 10. We've removed those rows age greater than hundred. We've removed those rows as well. And the same holds true for work week hours. So here, if you check the work week hours, it seems like the minimum is one, which seems reasonable. Some people might be just working for one hour a week, but the maximum seems to be 475. And that's probably wrong because the number of hours in a week is about 168. All right. So we can take another approximation here that let us remove all the rows where the value for the column of work week hours is higher than 140 hours, which is about 20 hours per day. So now you have survey df dot drop and here we are dropping the where the rows where the work week hours are more than 140. The gender column also allows picking. So there's the gender column. So if you see, there's a column called gender. If we just check schema dot gender. So here the question was, which of the following genders describe you and please check all that apply. So this gender uh, question about gender allows picking multiple options. So here we have man, woman, non-binary, gender queer or gender non-conforming. So these are the three options, but there are cases where people have picked multiple options too. So for instance, there are around 121 people have picked man and non-binary, gender queer or gender non-conforming. Now, while this is acceptable in general, it is going to make our analysis a little bit difficult. So we are just going to do a small simplification here. We are just going to take all of these values where none of the values have been selected or, or where multiple values have been selected or all the values have been selected and simply replace these with empty values. So the reason we're doing this is that it's going to simplify our analysis just a little bit. So let us simply, so what we're going to do is we're going to replace all of these with the empty value. So that's going to simplify our analysis. to so just looking at one category at a time. Okay. So I'm just going to do this. There is a, there is, you can follow this line of code. So we're calling survey df dot where and survey df dot where takes a condition. And then based on the condition, wherever the condition is satisfied, it replaces the value with a specific value that we are providing here and you can do it in place. Okay. So I will leave this as an exercise for you to figure out on what exactly this does, but the end result of this is to take survey df gender. And now when we check the value counts, we only have a single option being selected, man, woman, or non-binary. Okay. And that's just for simplification, not to say that any of these options are invalid. So with that, we have now cleaned up the data set and prepared it for our analysis. We've made a few assumptions. We've made a few simplifications. Uh, we've removed certain rows. We've replaced certain values with empty values. And this is a typical process that you will follow for any data set, any real world data set that you do. Um, the, the lesson here is not to jump immediately into analysis. Just first go through these values, see where the missing values are, 
see if you need to do something about the missing values. So for strings, not really, but sometimes for numbers, you may want to do uh, some kind of a replacement for the missing values. Sometimes you may want to simply remove those rows altogether. Uh, we've not done that in this case. Uh, deal with any invalid values, any values that you feel are outside any normal range. You should uh, get rid of, maybe get rid of those rows entirely, or maybe simply clear out those values with just the empty value and a lot of things like that. And then finally, we've now cleaned up our data frame. So we can just check a sample. So I'm just calling survey df dot sample with 10. So just to see a random sample of 10 rows. And this is again, a very good exercise to do. Just go through some sample data from your data set, just to get a sense of what the values in each column and different rows look like. Okay. So here we can see that the countries it looks like there are strings and then the age seems to be okay. It seems to be a number. There are also places where people have not filled the age. Then we have the gender. Remember we've done a simplification here where we've reduced it to just one, one answer. And then we have the education level. Um, then there is the undergraduate major and so on. So just going through each columns is going to help you make better inferences on the data. And with that, our data, Pre-processing and cleaning is complete. So let's just commit our work once again. So moving forward now, before we can ask any interesting questions about the survey responses, it would be helpful for us to understand what the demographics, which is things like the country, age, gender, anything that you can use to pick out groups from the responses, any such information, what the demographics of the respondents look like. And it's important to explore these variables mainly in order to understand how representative the survey is of the worldwide programming community and of the worldwide population in general. And this is again, the reason this is important is because a survey of this scale generally tends to have some bias. So in the world, there are a certain number of people who are programmers out of those programmers, a certain fraction use stack overflow. And that's not a randomly uniformly selected fraction. So there's already definitely some selection happening there out of those who use stack overflow, a certain number of people have taken the survey. So once again, that is not a, a uniform selection from the entire user base of stack overflow. There's probably some selection bias here. People who are more likely to take a survey are probably also people who are, let's say have three or four other qualities. So it's not a random sample, completely random sample. And then there's also how stack overflow publicizes survey, what was the outreach process and all that decides who saw the survey and who filled the survey. And also like the language of the survey, the kind of questions that were asked, the length of the survey, all of these things make a big difference in terms of who has actually filled the survey. And all this is called selection bias where the respondents of a survey do not come from a randomly picked sample of the overall population that you want to study. So do keep that in mind. And that's why we, it's important to first look at the demographics. Okay. So we are going to do what is called exploratory analysis and visualization where we don't really have a question in mind. We are simply looking at different uh, rows, columns, comparing things, plotting graphs. And since we will be plotting graphs, we will be using matplotlib and Seaborn. So here, what I'm doing is I am importing matplotlib and Seaborn and uh, I've set some basic styles. Like I've used the dark grid style from Seaborn. I have increased the font size and the figure size for matplotlib so that we can see the figures a little more easily. Now, if you want to understand what all of these mean, I will refer you back to the previous lecture on data visualization with matplotlib and Seaborn. Okay. So with the imports out of the way, so let's first look at the number of countries from which there are responses in the survey and maybe plot the 10 countries with the highest number of responses. So there was a question, where do you live? And that, so the column name for that was country. So we just see that from the schema country corresponds to where do you live? And from the survey data frame, if we just get the country column and then call dot n unique on it. So that's going to give us the number of countries that are there in this data set. So respondents from 183 countries have answered questions and that's pretty good. You know, that's quite, it's quite wide. But it might be better to look at what the distribution of responses across countries looks like. Now we cannot plot the entire distribution for 183 countries. So maybe what we'll do is we will simply look at 
15, the top 15 countries from where we had the maximum responses. And the way to do that is to take the survey df dot country, the column, and then use dot value counts on it. So dot value counts is going to, well, let's see what that does. So you can see here a dot value counts that's going to take each distinct value on country. So each unique value inside country and then take that and count the number of values for each one. So here you can see that these are the different value counts. So for each country, we now get back a, a count and this is a series essentially. And then from that, and this is going to be sorted. So you can also decide whether you want to, this to be sorted. So you can set sort equals true and you can set ascending equals false. By the way, if you want to show this documentation in line for any function that you're using, all you need to do is press shift plus tab. So here I'm pressing uh, shift plus tab and that shows me the documentation. Okay. So we have the value counts and then we pick the top 15 countries out of it. So those are the top countries. You can see here United States at the top, then India, then UK. And it's good to look at it this way as a table, but you cannot really grasp what is the difference visually what is the distribution looking like and that is where a bar chart will probably help so we can use the index of the series as the x-axis and then we can use the values in this series as the y-axis so we are going to create a figure here so i'm just going to set a plt.figure fig size just to make this a big figure we're going to set a title for it so we're going to set the title as the question that was asked and then we are going to use seaborn dot bar plot. So seaborn has been imported as SNS and we use the bar plot and for the bar plot, we give an X axis and a Y axis. So the X axis, we are going to use the index, the names of the countries. And for the Y axis, we are going to use the values, which is the number of respondents from each of these countries. So there you go. Now you have the graph. Now, before we analyze this, I just want to say by default, these labels are printed horizontally and if we do print them horizontally there will be a lot of overlap what we've done here is we've caused we've called the plt.x sticks function and we've set rotation to 75 so that has taken these labels and then rotated at 75 degrees and because of this now you can see that they're slightly slanted and we can all read them okay so now we have the graph so looking at the graph, it seems like a disproportionately high number of responses came from United States and India, right? So the United States has 12,000 responses and then India has 8,000, which is about uh, only about 75% of the number of responses from the US. And then next is United Kingdom, which is less than half of India. All right. And that already tells you that probably this survey is not really representative of programmers around the world. Uh, maybe you know, a large 12,000 plus 8,000 plus 4,000. So that's about 24,000 out of 65. So that's about more than one third, more than 40% of the responses have come from these three or four countries. And you might, if you think about this a little bit, it makes sense because one, this survey is in English, so it was only conducted in English. So therefore the programmers from non-English speaking countries probably did not get to hear of it. Second stack overflows user base is stack overflow is also a platform that is completely in English. So it's user base is primarily from countries where English is spoken in, in, in different professions. And those happen to be the top three countries, United States, India, and United Kingdom, where we speak English on uh, a day-to-day -day basis for in our professional lives okay so that's something to consider that the survey may not be representative of the entire programming community especially the non-english speaking countries and it's something for stack overflow to consider maybe they should uh, try translating their questions and answers into different languages and maybe they should also translate their survey into different languages so that they can get a more representative uh, result okay now there's an exercise for you here. What you can do is you can try finding the percentage of responses from English speaking versus non English speaking countries. So here I've linked to a list, uh, a CSV file, which contains the list of languages spoken in different countries. See if you can combine that data with this data to identify, to create a new column that says English speaking, and it maybe it contains yes or no, or true or false for the English speaking column. And then see if, uh, you can see how many responses are from English speaking and how many are not. Okay. So that was about the different countries the data came from. 
Probably the next thing that we can study is the distribution of the age of the respondents. So the age is another important factor to look at and this time because age is numeric, we can probably use a histogram to visualize it. So we are going to use plt.hist and let's just check what the age, what the question about age was. So the question was what is your age in years and a lot of people may have preferred not to answer this question. Fortunately what happens is when we use these matplotlib and seaborn functions any empty values are automatically ignored. So now we have, so we are calling plt.hist and then to it we are passing the survey df.age. So this is the column containing the age values and these are all numeric remember. So then we are also going to set a number of bins. So what we want is we want to take the ages starting from 10 because we've removed and everything below age 10. So we want to start from 10 and we want to go up to 80. You could also go up to 100 if you wish. Let's maybe change that to 100. And we are going to split this entire range of 10 to 100 years into ranges of 5 years. You could split this into ranges of 10 years as well. Uh, but we'll split it into 10 years and then we will count the number of responses in each age group. Okay, so this is what the chart looks like. So it seems like that there are very few responses below 15 years of age and a little more a little over 2000 above 15 years of age but the maximum bulk of the responses seem to be in the range of 20 to 45 years maybe you could say 15 to 50 years so that seems to be the sort of the professional um, lifespan of a programmer to a large extent but on the other hand you can still see thousands of responses above beyond the age of 45 and 50 it's common that a lot of people tend to fall into this age range of 20 to 50 but on the other hand you have people from all over all the way going up to close to even 80 years of age. Okay, So that's good now we understand the distribution of age and roughly this is representative of the programming community in general uh, especially since a lot of young people have taken up computer science uh, as a field of study or a profession in the last 20 years, right? Colleges now have computer science degrees, the number of uh, jobs in computer science have increased and most new jobs tend to be taken by uh, younger people and most new degrees as well. So that's why it is slightly representative and you can do some research on how exactly representative it is and which age groups are left out. And if you, and here's an exercise for you, you may also want to just create specific age groups like 10 to 18 years, 18 to 30 years, 30 to 45, 45 to 60 and so on. And may, you may want to create a column called age group which, con which will contain based on the age it will contain one of these values. And then what you can do is you can repeat the analysis in the rest of this notebook for each age group. If you want, if you just want to pick out your age group, let's say you're in the 30 to 45 age group and you just want to know what programmers in your age group think then you can just do this analysis for your age group and that will be an interesting thing to try out. That's a project idea right there. Then let's look at the distribution of gender. Uh, we've already done a small simplification here where we've excluded multiple responses and now we, it's a well-known fact that women and non-binary genders are underrepresented in the programming community so we might expect to see a skewed distribution here. So if we do schema.gender here it looks like the question that was asked was which of the following describe you if any. So people were open to leaving it blank. And then we have the gender counts. Uh, so now we are taking survey df dot gender and then using value counts here. And already you can see that there is a huge drop. There are 45,000 responses from uh, where people have selected man as the gender and there are about 38 uh, 3800 only 3800 values where people have selected woman and let's also include in value counts you can also include drop na equal to false. What that does is that also tells you how many people have picked nothing no value. So now what we can do is we can use a pie chart to visualize this distribution. So once again we take these gender counts and we use plt.py and we can gen um, give it an index, we can give it, give them some labels as well and we can give the chart a title. So here you go. Now it seems like around 71% people have picked man, only about 6% have picked woman and only about 0.6% have picked non-binary uh, gender queer or gender non-conforming. 
and if we exclude the nan values so if we exclude the no answers so among the people who have answered it seems like 92% close over 91% are men and this number is actually so the so that means only about 8% are women or non binary and this number is actually a far more skewed than the overall percentage so the overall percentage of women and non binary genders in the programming community is estimated to be about 12% so this number is, is still has some skew and what this number tells us in general and even the overall figure is that there is a diversity problem in the programming community that we definitely if 50% of all people are uh, women and then there is a larger number is uh, i think i'm not sure about the number but a larger percentage of people also identify as one of the non binary genders so we definitely need to have more representation in the programming community and we should support people from under represented communities and encourage them to be part of the programming community okay and an interesting exercise for you now to do would be to compare the survey responses and preferences across genders and repeat this analysis with those breakdowns so for each graph maybe instead of for each bar chart try to show side by side men versus women and see how things differ so for instance you could try and figure out how do the relative education levels differ across genders are um, do women hold uh, similar degrees in terms of percentage or do they hold higher degrees and you may be surprised um how do the salaries differ that is another thing to figure out we definitely know that there is a gender pay divide there is a gender pay gap so maybe you can discover that and there is a column which talks about salaries and then you may find uh, there is this analysis on gender divide in data science and you may find that useful that is also an exploratory data analysis project if you want to uh, explore that a little bit so that was about gender now let's talk about the education level now formal education in computer science is often considered an important requirement of becoming a programmer computer science is one of the most sought after degrees and both in bachelor's and in masters let's see if this is indeed the case because on the other hand a lot of you may have learned programming on your own and there are many free resources and tutorials available online to learn programming so what we'll do is we will use a horizontal bar chart to compare the education levels of different respondents so you can just check here schema dot education level so there's a ed level column the question was which of the following describes the highest level of formal education that you've completed so keep that in mind this is the highest level so what we are going to use now is a, a count plot so what's a count plot we can check the doc documentation So the count plot shows the counts of observation in each categorical bin using bars. So what that means is if you check the different values that education level contains. So if we just check schema df, or sorry, if we just check survey df dot ed level dot let's say what are the unique values. So these are all the unique values, and the count plot is going to tell us for each of these values how many observations are there. Like how many times was this particular option picked? how many or how many times is this particular value show up in that column okay so we pass to count plot survey df dot education level and you can just do this but that is going to make vertical bars and if you just want horizontal bars you can just pass y uh, equals survey df dot education level so this is what the graph looks like maybe we should increase the size of the figure a little bit so let's just set plt dot figure fig size Okay this is a lot better so the question is which of the following describes the highest level of formal education you've completed and now you can see here that it seems like out of the 65000 respondents about 25000 more over 25000 hold a bachelor's degree and then um, another close to 12000 hold a master's degree and then there are a few more which hold a doctoral degree probably about a 1500 or so so all of these three combined it seems that over half of the respondents hold uh, half of the respondents hold a bachelor's or master's degree so most programmers definitely seem to have some college education definitely maybe some stem education what is called uh, yeah so, some kind of a stem education but it's not clear from just this graph alone whether they hold a degree in computer science okay so we, let's dig a little bit deeper into that 
And one problem with this graph is that here we are showing the absolute numbers and probably what we really want to understand is percentages. So one exercise for you is to convert this graph to just show percentages instead of the full numbers. Okay. And that will probably give a clearer idea because we probably want to know out of the number of people who have responded to this question, what percentage have mentioned that the bachelor's degree is the highest degree that they hold. And that is probably the more relevant question to ask. So you can try and modify this code to just show percentages. Okay. But keeping that aside, we could tell that over half of the respondents hold a ma master's or a bachelor's degree. All right. So now let us then take and plot the undergraduate majors. So this time we will look at schema dot undergrad major, which was what was your primary field of study. And we will then convert these numbers into percentages. So to convert these into percentages, we take the value counts for each of the values. So here we say survey df dot undergrad major dot value counts. So for each major like computer science major use, you, you have 31,000 responses and so on. So what we can do is we can divide that by the total number of um, responses given for undergraduate majors. So let's just take the survey df dot undergraduate major and call dot count on it. So dot count is going to count the total number of no null values. So if we do that, then you can see that now we get back a fraction. So for each major that was provided here, we get back a fraction 0.61 and so on. And if we multiply that by hundred, we are going to get back a number or we're going to get back a percentage. All right. So now we have a 65, 61% have computer science and another 9.3% uh, have picked another engineering discipline and so on. All right. But it's probably better to look at that using a graph. So we just put this result into a variable called undergraduate percent and then use SNS dot bar plot to plot it. Okay. So now here we have it. So in terms of the primary field of study, it seems like out of the people who have responded over 60% say that computer science or software engineering or computer engineering was their major. Now the one way to you know this is like a glass half full, half empty kind of a situation. The way I would interpret this <coughs> is that close to 40% of programmers holding a college degree, have a field of study other than computer science, which is very encouraging. A lot of people after college feel that you cannot switch your field. That is definitely not true for computer science. If you want to get into computer science and you have some sort of formal education, some sort of STEM education, you can absolutely pursue it. There are so many online resources like close to 40% of people who are in the domain are from, are from streams other than computer science. So I think this is a very encouraging sign and I think this number is only going to go higher because there are better and better resources available and programming is, uh, uh, is proliferating into pretty much every domain now. So you do a little bit of programming no matter what you study and that equips you to become a programmer as well. Even data science for example is primarily a lot of programming. So what we understand in general is that while college education is helpful in general, you do not need to pursue a major in computer science to become a successful programmer. And one trend that you might have noticed here while we are doing exploratory analysis is that first, every time we plot some graph, there is some background to it. There is a reason why we are exploring a particular column. And this is something that we've explained here that we want to understand like the reason we are looking at education level is to understand whether formal education is important or not. So have some background, have some, have something in mind when you are exploring a particular column. And then once you have explored that column, once you have plotted a graph, try to make, gain some insight from it, try to make some kind of an inference or an observation or a hypothesis based on it. Sometimes you may need to then go do more research to identify if your hypothesis is correct. And in other cases, it, the inferences can become pretty clear. For instance, in this case, it is pretty clear that a lot of people do not have a computer science degree. All right. And that is what, that is the best part of exploratory analysis is that you get to form all of these interesting inferences. Each time you draw a graph, you learn something new. Each time you look at a column, you learn something new. And then there's an exercise here for you. There's a column called new ed IMPT. Let's see what that column is. So that's, let's see schema dot new ed. Okay. So that column is that call the question in the column is how important is a formal education such as a university degree in computer science uh, to your career. 
So now what you can do is you can take this column and analyze the responses, the distribution of responses for people who hold some college degree or versus sorry for people who hold some uh, hold a computer science degree versus those who do not. Okay, try and analyze these results. So how many people, what percentage of people who hold a computer science degree have selected that a formal education in computer science is important to the career and what percentage of people who do not hold a computer science degree have selected that formal education is important for their career and see if you notice any difference in opinion. My guess is somebody who holds a college degree may value it highly but somebody who does not hold a college degree but still become a programmer will probably say that it's probably not that important. So do check it out, do discover there are more insights to be gained here. And then one last area that we will look at is employment. Now especially in among programmers freelancing, contract work and part time work is slowly becoming uh, a more popular choice. So it would be interesting to see the breakdown between full time, part time and freelance work. So maybe let's visualize the data from the employment column. So the employment column was which of the following best describes your current employment status. And what we've taken here is once again, we are going to plot a simple horizontal bar chart. And one of the things that I want you to take away from this is also that simple charts are often good enough for a, a, a good analysis. You do not have to come up with a lot of fancy charts, although it's good if you can find the best chart for the best kind of graph for every statement or for, or for every situation. But even simple bar charts, line graphs, scatter plots can give you a lot of information, right? And so you're very well equipped at this point if you've worked through this course. So now we look at the surveydf.employment.value counts and uh, we are just setting normalize equals true. So when we set normalize equals true, that also gives percentages. And then we're also going to convert, uh, sort it in ascending order and con convert that multiply by 100 to get percentages. So normalize gives fractions and then we convert that into percentages. And then we use the pandas plotting function. So dot plot and this so it's just to show you a variation of different ways of plotting and we are going to plot a horizontal bar chart with the green color. So now you see that among the people who have re replied to this question employed full time seems to be about 70%. So 70% people are employed full time among the respondents, but there are a fair number of students as well. So there are about 12% of students. What you might want to do is you might want to break down and then there are people who are not employed, but are looking for work. And then there are people who are freelancers, part timers, and then there are people who are just maybe their hobbies. They're not really looking for work. They're not employed or they're retired. So you might want to create a new column employment type that contains values like enthusiast, which could mean students or people who are not employed, but are looking for work. And then professional, which is people who are employed full time, part time or are freelancing and then other, which is people who are not employed or retired. And then what you can do is you can see for each of these graphs, how do the preferences differ between students and professionals, between enthusiasts and professionals, right? Especially some of the things that we'll do um, after this, which is analyzing programming language preferences and things like that. So that's a good exercise to do. In any survey, in any analysis, all of these breakdowns offer a lot of insights and the best way to do it is identify which group you lie in. Let's say you are parsing by gender or by age or by your employment status and then do the analysis just for yourself and people like yourself. And that is going to give you a lot more insight. Okay. Now one interesting observation here is that if you take away students, then among people who are employed, it seems like at least 10% of the people are working independently as contractors or freelancers or self-employed. For instance, startup uh, people who are doing startups or running their own companies. And that is pretty encouraging. That's a pretty high number uh, for a technical field like this to be able to work on your own without being formally associated with any com company. So that's an, that's a great thing that it's also a way for you to try and break into the field. If you are looking to become a programmer or looking to break into data science, maybe initially you, you can try some freelance work. You can try maybe an internship, some part-time work and help, and that can help you transition into a full-time role. So that's something to consider as well. 
Now in terms of what are the actual roles held by the respondents, we can look at the dev type field. So you can see here there's a type dev type which of the following describes you and there are a bunch of different values for the roles that are provided. Now the problem here is that this allows selection of multiple values. So if we just check the dev type dot value counts or let's just do dev type dot unique. You will see here that there are a lot of different possibilities. So you can see here that there is a developer desktop or entry. Okay, let's just try value counts. That's probably a little bit easier. Yeah. So you can see here that there are some simple options that were picked like developer full stack, just that and then developer backend. But then there is also you can select multiple options. So you can select developer backend and the semicolon indicates that multiple options were picked. So about 3000 people have picked three options, developer backend, developer frontend and developer full stack. And about 2000 have picked developer backend and developer full stack. And then there are a lot of people who have picked many different co combinations. So it's not really clear even from the data, how many options were available, but it seems like this person has picked a whole bunch of different uh, options. And so is this person and so on. So this is where we might need to do some more processing. You know, we might need to take this column which contains a list of values uh, se separated by semicolons and maybe split it out into multiple columns. Okay. And for that, what we are going to do is we're going to define a helper function called split multi column that is going to take a series or a column of data, which contains list like values, lists of values. So a data like a column like survey dot dev type and split that the values of that column into multiple columns. Okay. Now I will not go over the code here and you can try this. You can try to run each line one by one and you can try to understand the code. So by this point, I hope that you are well equipped to understand this code. Just run each line on a different cell. If you're not, you can also ask on the forum and you can have a discussion where you can ask, you can uh, share where you're stuck or which part you don't understand and you can have a discussion to figure it out. But let us look at the output. So we know what the input into this looks like. So the input into this split multi column function is going to be a series where people have picked either one, either none or one or more than one options for uh, their employment type for their role job role. So we can take split, we can call split multi columns on survey dot dev type and passing this column returns a data frame. So we get back a data frame dev type df. And if we just check this data frame, it seems like this data frame now has one column for each of the options that were provided for the question. So now we have one column for developer, desktop or enterprise applications. Then we have developer full stack, developer mobile designer and so on. So there are in total 23 columns. So there are about uh, 23, there are about 23 options that were given for your job role. And what we have is for each respondent, we have either true or false. So for instance, for uh, this respondent has not selected developer desktop or enterprise, but this respondent has selected developer full stack and this respondent has selected developer mobile and they have not selected developer front end or back end. All right. So this is how sometimes we might need to do a little more processing of our data. We might need to break one column into an entire data frame so that we can do our analysis. And now that we have this data frame, the dev type DF, we can now use this to identify what were the most common roles? Okay. And a simple way to do that would be to simply count the number of trues in each column. And you know that true when it is converted to an integer becomes one and false when it is converted to a number becomes zero. So what we can do is we can simply take the column wise sums. So we can just take dev type dot sum. So we now we get a column wise sum and then we can sort those values in a descending order. So that's going to give us these dev type totals. So now you see that we have developer backend, developer full stack, developer front end and so on. So those seem to be the most common roles. And it's not surprising that the stack overflow is primarily a tool used by developers and professional developers for finding answers to small questions on writing code. So it's not uncommon that the developer role that you see is the most common one. But one interesting thing for you to figure out would be what percentage of respondents work in roles related to data science. And then you can probably also try and figure out which 
role has the highest percentage of women. So what you can do is you can just filter. Now that you have this data frame, you can then merge it back into the original data frame. So you, you can create a new merge data frame, which contains the columns from survey DF, but also contains these columns for each role. And then you can try and find out which role has the maximum percentage of women. Okay. That's an interesting thing to figure out. So with that, we end our exploratory analysis and we've only explored a handful of columns from the 20 columns that we selected. We've only explored about five or six. So you can explore and visualize the remaining columns. Here is, you have some empty cells and you can always add new cells using insert cell below. So please do that. The more you explore, the more you learn. It, it's possible that while you work through this notebook, you find five or 10 interesting columns and you just want to do a project using those columns. And that's perfectly acceptable. You can use this data set for your project. Just do not um, repeat the same analysis that is done here. Do something a little more interesting. And before we continue, let us upload our work. So from time to time, keep running jovian.commit so that you do not lose your work. All right. So now we come to a slightly more interesting part, although I think the exploratory analysis was pretty interesting as well, but now we can ask some questions and then answer them. So we've already gained several insights about the respondents and about the programming community in general, simply by exploring individual columns, but let's ask some specific questions and try to answer them using the data frame operations and using interesting uh, visualizations. Okay. So the first question that we'll ask is what were the most popular programming languages in 2020? So this survey was conducted in February of 2020. So this is technically 2019's data, but see, so we see schema dot languages work with. So the question asked was which programming scripting and markup language have you done extensive development work over in over the past year, right? So which languages have you used in the past year? But this is a two part question. And the second part is, and which do you want to work in over the next year? So here the respondents were presented with a list of options. And then for each option, they had two checkboxes. So the first checkbox they would tick for this part, whether they've worked with it in the past year and the next checkbox they would tick for this part, whether they want to work on it over the next year. And the responses were then taken and they were broken into two they were broken into two columns. So we are, we have the language worked with, which contains the answer to the first part, which language have you worked with in the past year? But then we also have the language desired next year, which has the exact same question, but this contains responses to the second part. So I'm showing you this because this is something interesting that you know, with, with real world data and especially with how surveys are conducted, you might often have this and without the context, you might not understand what's the difference here because it seems like uh, languages worked with and languages desired next year have the exact same question. So you may want to just go through the readme or you may want to take the survey yourself to understand that, okay, there are two parts and the first part is con covered in the first column and the second part is covered in the second. Okay. So putting that aside, let's just look at what the, what some values in the languages worked with column look like. So it looks like once again, people could select multiple options, multiple languages. So you can see that the first person has selected C sharp and then HTML, CSS, and then JavaScript. So they are separated by a semicolon. So this is similar to the dev type field. So the first thing that we might want to do is just split this into a multi-column. So we just call split multi-column on survey DF dot languages worked with, and then we can see the languages work DF. So this is now the data frame where we have 25 columns. So it seems like 25 languages were presented to the respondents. And now for each of those, uh, for each respondent, we have, we can see true false. So true indicating whether the, uh, whether that respondent has used the language and false indicating whether they have not. Okay. So now going back to the question, what were the most pro popular programming languages in 2020? So all we, what we can do is we can try and identify percentages, how, what percentage of people have selected JavaScript and then what percentage of people have selected Swift and Python and so on, and then plot, plot that as a bar chart. Okay. So once again, to get these percentages, we simply say languages worked DF dot mean. So this is another way to do it because true becomes one and false becomes zero. 
So if we take the mean of this entire column, if we take a column wise mean, we essentially we get back the percent or the fraction of true values in the column, right? So the mean is simply sum of all the values divided by the total number of values. So since the zeros or the falses go away, that is basically the number of true values divided by the total number of values. And that is essentially the percentage of true, right? So we take or, or the fraction of true. So we to convert the fraction into a percentage, we multiply by 100. And then we sort values by in descending order. So that gives us the percentages of each language. So it seems like JavaScript is the most popular language followed by HTML, CSS and SQL and so on. Uh, and let's visualize this once again using a horizontal bar chart. So now it seems like the languages used in the past year, once again, uh, JavaScript was the most popular language followed by HTML, CSS. And this is no surprise because today a lot of software has moved onto the web. Uh, like you probably spend most of your time in the browser. Even the Jupyter Notebook platform that we're using is actually running in the browser. And the only way to write code in the browser is one, you have to write HTML, CSS. And second, you have to write uh, JavaScript for interactivity. Now JavaScript might be higher than HTML CSS because uh, you can also use JavaScript on the server side using a framework called Node.js. And because of all these reasons, JavaScript is the most popular language because it is the sort of the de facto language of the web. And then we have, so again, the, now we have plotted this chart and based on this chart, we can make some inferences, right? Uh, then we have SQL. Now, once again, today, all applications need some kind of a database and the most popular form of database is what's called a relational database or what is called a tabular database. So a lot of the data, let's say your, the data of your Facebook accounts, the data of your Twitter, the data of your Instagram or any platform that you use the data that you put into Jovian, a lot of the data is saved in SQL databases and the way to interact with these databases using the SQL language. And that is why SQL is probably pretty popular as well. But beyond that, if you take away web development and take away database access, the actual application development or like any backend application development or data science, a lot of these other areas, any non web related uh, development seems like Python is the most popular language. And this is again, no surprise because uh, Python is a, uh, well, Python is a general purpose language and it has beaten out Java. So Java was the de facto language for all development pretty much for about 20 years, but seems, it seems like Python has now beaten out Java. So it's a good thing that you're learning Python. It is definitely uh, an in demand language. Okay. And there is a whole wealth of information that you can gather just from exploring a little bit deeper into this question. For example, what are the most common languages used by students and how does the list compare with the most common languages used by professional developers? So is there a gap between what students learn and what professional developers use? You might want to answer what are the most common languages among respondents who do not describe themselves as front end developers because you no know, front end development, you don't really have a choice. You have to use JavaScript TypeScript is a choice, but it's a small choice. So if you just exclude front end developers, can you then answer what are the most common languages people use? Can you f try and find out what are the most common languages used by respondents who are working in a field related to data science and maybe also see in terms of age developers who are older than 35 years of age, or maybe developers who have more than 10 years of programming experience, uh, what are the most common languages used by them? And what are the most common languages used by uh, people who are younger? Is there, do you see a shifting trend? And what are the most common languages used in your home country? That is something that you can try and find out because there are responses from over 180 countries here. Is there a difference between let's say US and India and China and different countries? Then moving ahead, an another similar question is you, we could ask is which languages are people most interested to learn over the next year? So for this, we can use the language desire next year column, uh, which is, and which will have pretty much identical processing. So we take the language desire next year and we split it into multi columns. Then we get percentages for each language by again, once again, by taking the mean and sorting the values and multiplying by hundred. So you can see here the language interested percentages. These are the values and let us just go jump into visualization directly. The visualization is once again, pretty much identical. And it seems like that Python is the language that most people are interested in learning. So we have Python, JavaScript, HTML, CSS. Again, they seem to be close by and followed by SQL and TypeScript. 
and it's no surprise that python is the most sought after language because it's an easy to learn general purpose programming language and it is very well suited for a variety of domains like application development numerical computing data analysis and so on and in fact we are using this using python for this very analysis so you are in good company uh, if you're learning python you can apply it to a whole host of different domains uh, what you can do is now you can repeat the same exercises that we discussed for the most common languages just replace all of these questions with the languages people are most interested in so that those are some exercises and you can also the the next question what we'll do is we'll combine these two things so the question here is which are the most loved languages uh, that is where do you see a higher percentage of people who have used the language and want to continue learning it over the next year okay so this may seem like a somewhat a complicated question to ask okay people who have used the language in the past year and they also want to continue learning it how am i going to figure that out it may seem a little bit tricky but it's actually really easy to solve using pandas array operation using pandas data frame operations so here's what we'll do we will create a new data frame languages love df which has the same structure as languages work df and languages interested df so again it for every col language it has a column and then for every respondent there is a row and there is a true in there is a true value only if the corresponding value in both languages work df and languages interested df are both true right if so if somebody has worked in that language in the past year and wants to continue using that language then we are going to put in a true there and the way to do that it's really simple all you do is you take the languages work df and then you put in an ampersand and then you pass languages interested df what this will do is this will do a element wise and right a, a boolean and so if two values are true two uh, respective values then you will get two and if true if you have a true and a false or a false and a true or a false and a false you will get back false all right except that this is going to happen on a per element or a per value level so now we take languages love df then we um look at it so for example this respondent has true set to set for c sharp because this person has this person has worked in c sharp and they were interested in continuing to work in c sharp so that's the they we are saying that this is a proxy for saying that they love this language okay so let's convert that into percentages now we want to take these numbers and for each language we want to identify how many people love it out of the number of people who have used it in the past year so we take language love dot sum and then so that's a column wise sum and we divide each of the column wise sums by languages worked dot sum so for the column c sharp we will count how many people love the language so how many trues there are in this column divided by how many people have used the language and then we are also going to multiply it by 100 to convert it into a percentage and we are going to sort it in a descending order and let's take a look at that so you can so you can see here that we have languages loved percentages you can see that for each language we now have percentages and you can see who the winner is here so the winner seems to be a language called rust and let us look at it in a plot so the winner seems to be this language called rust uh, you may not have heard of it but it is so it is a low level language for doing systems programming and it provides the performance of languages like c++ but it provides many conveniences and a type system of some of the best languages like things like scala and java and so on so it's a pretty useful language a lot of people enjoy using it and it's interesting to see that a small language with a growing community is the one of the most loved languages uh, and in fact you can see the hints here now if you see this graph rust seems to be used in a very small fraction so you see rust here it's a small fraction of people who use it it's a uh, you know far smaller than let's say javascript but if you look at this graph in terms of people interested in using or learning rust it is way up ahead somewhere at the top right almost close to about a third or maybe a higher than a third of uh, javascript so it definitely seems to be an a language that's gaining a lot of popularity and a lot of interest so maybe if you're looking for a new language to learn rust may be a good choice and this metric that we just calculated is something stack overflow calculates every year based on their survey results 
and Rust has been Stack Overflow's most loved languages for four years in a row, followed by TypeScript. And TypeScript again is a language that offers an alternative for web development. Um, so these are things that you should do. That and once you get an answer, once you get a graph, maybe just search online on why that might be, why the result might be such. So you can learn a little more about Rust and TypeScript. Now. What I find probably even more interesting is that Python features at number three, despite already being such a widely used language. And that's generally not true for widely used languages. If you see JavaScript in terms of the love score, it's fairly low in term and Java is far lower. Whereas Python has remained at number three, right? So it seems like people who use Python enjoy Python. Then that is because the language has a solid foundation and it is really easy to learn and use. I hope you've been able to learn Python. You've been able to, you can now say that you're comfortable with Python in just these six weeks. And then it has a strong ecosystem of libraries for various domains. And it has a massive worldwide community of developers. And that now includes you and me. So who enjoy using it. So I've been using Python for the last 12 years. I definitely want to continue using it for the next 12 as well. And I hope you feel the same way. Um, so that's about the most loved languages. We now have some insights about that. The next, uh, a few exercise, a, few, a simple exercise that you can try here is to identify the most dreaded languages, which is languages, which people have used in the past year, but do not want to learn or use over the next year. Right? There's a small hint here. All what you can do is you can simply invert the languages interested call uh, data frame. So if you, and the way to invert it is using this tilde operator. So just invert that data frame and then do the same thing that we did here. So you should be able to answer the most dreaded language and then see if your results, you get the same result as what the stack overflow results present. So you can always refer to them. So moving further along, next question here is in which countries do developers work the highest number of hours per week? Okay. Now to do this question, we will you need to use the group by a function of or the group by function of a data frame the group by method. And there's a small uh, caveat here. We only want to consider countries with more than 250 responses because otherwise it's not really representing an average because there are definitely lots of countries with thousands of responses. And we, we are setting a threshold of 250 so that if there's a country where only 10 people have responded, we're not going to consider it in terms of to get the average number of hours per week. So we take DF and we group it by country. So what this does is this, it takes uh, for each value of country and there are 184 values. Uh, we take all the rows which have that country related to that country and then can separate them out into groups. And so far we've not performed any operation. So you don't see any result here. Now for each of these rows, the column that we are interested in is work week hours. So we select the column work week hours, just as we select the columns of our data frame. And just as an example, let's select the age column as well. So now once again, from these, for each of the groups, we have all the rows and from these rows, we've only selected the work week and age uh, columns. And now we need to aggregate them. So one way to aggregate them could be using a mean. So if we use a mean, then we can see here that work week hours and age. So we will get back a new data frame where now the index is the name of the countries, all the different unique values in countries. And then the values for work week hour and age are the averages from those groups. So all the rows from Afghanistan, we've taken a, an average of the work week hours and put that value here. Similarly, all the groups uh, from Afghanistan, we've taken the age and we've taken, uh, we've uh, all the rows from Afghanistan, we've taken the age and we've put in the average value here. Okay. So this is how you group by, and you can learn more about this in the pandas lecture, which is lesson four. Now what we want to do though, is we want to only look at countries which have more than 250 responses. So the way we're going to do that is first, we're going to create a country's data frame. And this is exactly what we just did group by country, but just keep the work week hours and take the mean and then sort uh, to aggregate and then sort by work week hours in a descending order. So that's a country DF. Okay. So you can see that these are the countries with the highest. These are countries with the lowest, but it's possible that a lot of these countries, probably the number of responses is really low. So what we will do is we will create a new data frame called high countries DF, where we will take these 
oh no where we will only select the rows where the value counts are greater than 250 so we are getting survey df dot country and we are trying to find the value counts of um each country the number of responses from each country and then we are filtering out those only where the responses are greater than 250 and then we use the dot loc dot loc function to pick values from the country's df with only value counts greater than 250 and then we pick the top 15 out of those so let's see now so now we have the top 15 countries okay and once again if you do not understand this there are a couple of things you can do revise the pandas lecture that's one thing you could do look at the documentation of countries da of uh, dot loc dot loc and take split this into small parts so first take this survey d of dot country dot value counts run it in a cell take that and compare that with 250 and see what the result of that is and then put that into countries df dot loc and see what the result of that is and then add in the head so with all of these things it's a question of breaking them down step by step and then the more you break them down the more you understand and the more you will be able to use them so now we have the high response countries and these are the 15 countries with the highest number of working hours it seems some south asian countries some asian countries like iran israel and china have the highest working hours which is followed by united states so that's interesting and then we have greece so people are probably working a lot programmers are working a lot in greece and once again we we see a bunch of asian countries all the way till actually a major majority of these seem to be asian countries and then there are a few european countries and then there is united states but overall there isn't too much variation if you see 44 is the highest value if you just take the first three as outliers then here you have 41 to 40 so on average there are only about uh, no people are working at about 40 hours per week there's no variation where on there's a country with an average of 60 hours or a country with an average of 20 hours at least it seems like so from the top 15 so now one a few exercises that you can try is try to compare how the average working hours compare across different continents so you may find this uh, list of uh, countries in each continent useful try and find out which role has the average number of uh, has the highest average number of hours worked per week out of all the developer or out of all the roles that we looked at so you may need to merge with the dev type data frame that we created with, with which had one column for each role and try to find out try to find out maybe how the hours work compare between freelancers and developers working full time well full time developers it's possible that you might find that the average is around 40 but freelancers the one of the reasons people take up freelance or even part time work is because they want free time to work on other things so let's try and verify if this is true do freelancers work less or more and that could help you maybe even decide if you want to choose between a freelance or a full time role okay and then let's ask one more question how important is it to start young to build a career in programming okay and this is again something that is a question that a lot of people wonder not just about programming probably about data science and in general about any field can you enter this field let's say beyond if you've not done it in college and i think we've established that even if you've not taken it in college you can still enter the field but can you enter the field if you've worked in a different uh, domain for a few years can you enter this field in in your 30s in your 40s and so on okay so what we'll do to answer this question is we will create a scatter plot of age versus the years of coding experience so there is years code pro is asking not including education how many years have you coded professionally as a part of your work okay so what we'll do is we'll plot age on one axis on the x axis and then we'll plot the years of professional coding experience on the y axis and that should maybe give us a hint so here is a chart and this is what it looks like now if you look at this it seems let's look at some values and let's try to understand this chart and we've also put in a uh, colors here and we'll touch that in just a moment but if you see here in the let's say you're looking at age 40 so at age 40 there are several people who have less than 10 years of programming experience and there are even so at, at every age all the way from around 15 to even close to 50 there are people who have just started working as programmers 
So what that means is that you can start programming professionally at any age. There's no restriction that you have to start early. Uh, people are starting at in their 20s, in their 30s, in their 40s, and everybody is welcome. And these are pro this is professional experience. This is not just programming experience in general. So you can, if you put in the work, if you learn, if you're open to learning, if you're excited about it, then you can definitely get in into the domain. And then we have also added a color for each of these dots. So each dot represents one response. So we've added colors. So the color we've added is if a person is a hobbyist, then we uh, represent them with blue. And if not, we represent them with orange. And once again, it turns out that a lot of the people who are programmers also say that programming is a hobby for them. And especially so in the initial years. So in the initial years, to get through the initial years, it will really help for you to just have programming as a hobby, something that you do just to you know, build things, just to solve problems, just something that you do on the weekend. And if you do that, then you will probably also have a long and fulfilling career in programming. So these are some inferences that we can draw from the scatter plot. We can also look at the distribution of the age first code column. So just to see when people have tried programming for the first time. And as you might suspect, a lot of people have pro have some exposure to programming. Maybe they've written a first line of code, maybe a simple HTML page, or maybe just a hello world program just and Python's hello world is just this, right? So you can just type Python into a terminal and you just say print hello world. And that's your first program. But that by itself, no, tells you what programming is. So it seems like a lot of people have been exposed to programming in their teens and it depends on pretty much every field you end up writing some code. So in Excel, you write formulas in, in, in different streams of engineering, you probably use MATLAB or maybe some kind of a numerical computing package. Um, of course, in computer science, you write, pro you write programs. Uh, if you're doing Right, right now, pretty much every field, there is some code that you're writing. So it's not surprising that people get some exposure to programming at an early age. But then there are also people who have experienced this after a certain age, like you can see a lot of people doing so after the age of 30 and after the age of 40. And there is like a small number of people who have even expo become exposed to it all the way up to the age of 80. So there are people from all ages and walks of life who are learning to code. Okay. Now, here are a few questions that you can try and answer. How does the experience change opinions and preferences? So maybe what you can do is you can repeat the entire analysis while comparing the responses of people who have more than 10 years of professional programming experience, like which languages do they use? Which languages do they want to learn? With those who have do not have that, and, and this is going back to like students versus professionals. Now you can have three categories, students, professionals and experienced professionals. And do you see any interesting trends? Do you see what you, what one might call a generation gap in terms of the coders from the old days versus coders, people who are learning it right now? What kind of roles do they occupy? What kind of languages do they prefer? And maybe you can also try and compare the years of professional coding experience across different genders just to see if, and my guess is you might see that you know, although uh, minorities are underrepresented right now, there are very few women, but my guess is you will see that there are more women now uh, than there used to be earlier. So it's definitely things are improving and you can try and validate that. So that's one way if you can try and compare the years of professional coding experience across different genders. So with that, we have barely scratched the surface here. We have al almost been talking for about 90 minutes and we've already gotten a huge load of insights and hopefully you're thinking of many more questions that you would like to ask and answer using the data. Now I, we've not even used all the 20 columns, only about 12 or 13 columns have been used. And then there are another 45 columns to pick from. So you can use these empty cells below to ask and answer more questions. So I'll let you try out and you can try out all of these exercises. So there's really no end to this. The more you do, the more you experiment, the more you exercise these skills, the better you get at it. Now I've used fairly simple charts. I've not done many breakdowns. I wanted to leave that as an exercise for you, but try and replace each chart. So each chart or each graph that we have, try to use a different kind of graph 
and maybe go through the matplotlib gallery go through the seaborn gallery and try and pick which might be an interesting graph to draw there so these are all different exercises for you to try data analysis by itself is uh, there's a lot of depth in the field and you can probably spend at least a few months just exploring different ways to slice and dice and analyze and visualize the data so please do that okay the best way to learn is by doing now what we'll do is we'll just summarize some of our inferences and conclusions and this is always a good thing to do at the end of your analysis so here's some of the summaries like based on the demographic data we can infer that the survey is somewhat representative of the overall programming community although it definitely has fewer responses from programmers in non english speaking countries and from women and non binary genders we have also learned that the programming community is probably not as diverse as it can be in terms of gender in terms of age maybe in terms of the different uh, languages or the, the different countries that are there so we should probably take more efforts and support and encourage members of underrepresented communities and race is another thing that we have not looked at but that's another factor where there's a lot of uh, disparity and we've learned that most programmers hold a college degree and although a fairly large percentage of them did not have computer science as their major in college so a computer science degree isn't compulsory to learn to code or to build a career in programming but a but some stem education definitely helps and a significant percentage of programmers either work part time or as freelancers 10% is actually a pretty good number and this can be a great way for you to break into the field not just in programming but also in data science which are very closely related fields we learned that javascript and html are the most popular programming languages used in 2020 and then we learned that python is the language in most people are interested in learning and we've learned that rust and typescript are the most loved languages both of which have small but fast growing communities and finally it seems like programmers around the world seem to be working on 40 hours on average but there are slight variations by country and uh, finally we learned that you can learn and start programming professionally at any age and you're likely to have a long and fulfilling career if you also enjoy programming as a hobby and especially it's going to help you during the first few years all right so that's our analysis and as i said there's a wealth of information to be discovered and we've like barely scratched the surface so there are a few more ideas that i wanted to share with you you can repeat the analysis for different age groups and genders and compare the results specifically try and represent try and pick a slice of responses that represents you uh, right so maybe the country you're from the gender uh, the, the age group that you're in and try and see what the preferences of people are and see if that reflects your opinions too try and choose a different set of columns we've chosen 20 out of 65 and we've used about 12 of them so you can look at a lot of the other columns read through go through the readme go through the survey prepare an analysis focusing on diversity so identify the areas where underrepresented communities are at par with the majority so you might see that in education actually there's probably not a big difference in terms of the percentages of degrees uh, that or uh, different degrees pe held by people but then there are places where there are differences like salaries you will see that there is definitely a pay gap and you can try and validate that and try to compare the results of this year's survey with the previous year and identify some interesting trends because this is data that you get every year and once again you can go back to this link stackoverflow.com insights.stackoverflow.com and you can download the raw data for every year now one interesting exercise for you to do is to see the survey results so you can see that this is a pretty long analysis that they've done a whole bunch of analysis on on pretty much the similar questions that we have answered so see the survey results and try to replicate the survey results graph for graph right this could be a great way for you to just see if you are doing the same kind of data cleaning and analysis and simplifications and see how that affects your results now if you can re replicate all of these results now that's a great sign that this is real world data and this is a large data set and this is a real analysis so that's a real sign that you've done something significant in data analysis and you can proudly then showcase that on your professional profile then we have this i just want to share a few references now we've used pandas matplotlib and seaborn so you can refer to the previous lectures we've linked 
you just go to zero to pandas dot com and you can find the lectures there. You can watch those lectures, or you can also just re go through the documentation and the user guide. So you have the pandas, matplotlib, and seaborn user guides. Also go through galleries on matplotlib websites. So these galleries will show you all the different types of charts that you can create using these libraries. And finally, as I told you, we are creating this open data sets. the library python package which is a curated collection of data sets for data analysis and machine learning okay and that is the next step that i want to talk to you about now we have we have looked at this uh, what we saw today the exploratory data analysis is basically what you need to do on your course project so you simply need to repeat this you can repeat it with the same data set and ask different questions do different analysis pick different columns or you can uh, pick a different data set So let's open up the course project page, and then the objective of the course project is exactly similar to what we did today. You find a real-world data set of your choice. You use NumPy and Pandas to parse and clean and analyze the data, and you use Matplotlib and Seaborn to create visualizations. And then you ask and answer interesting questions about the data. And an optional but highly recommended step because you've put in so much work and. if you can just consolidate all of your learning into a blog post to showcase your work that is something that you can do as well so i just want to give you a quick overview of the course project and then we have a, a few exciting things to close out so now the course project this is a starter notebook and by the way we've done a walk through of the course project in last week's video as well so you can just check that out too so on the course project you can uh, take the starter notebook and just run the starter notebook on binder and you can also run this starter notebook on your local computer so you do not have to run it on binder so i just want to show you how to run it on your computer so here i have a terminal let me just zoom in a bit yeah so here i have a terminal and this would be a terminal or a command prompt or a anaconda prompt that you would need and if you want to download this um, to your local computer and run it locally then what you need to do is click on the clone button So click on the clone button and just paste that command. Now you will need to run this command, but then to run this command you need the Jovian command line tool installed. So actually I'm just going to skip that command and I'm just first going to run pip install jovian upgrade. So that's going to upgrade the Jovian Python library for me. And once the Jovian library is installed, you can see that we now have this command line tool called Jovian that you can use. So now once again I can copy this clone command come back here run jovian clone and just simply the title of the project so username slash the name of the project and press enter now that is going to download the files so you can see that this these files got downloaded to my desktop the zero to pandas core starter if you wish you can change the name of this folder so let me just if i am let's say i am going to analyze the state of javascript survey so i'm just going to call this state of javascript 2019 this is the data that i am going to analyze for my project so then i go into this folder state of javascript 2020 2019 now here you need to install all the different libraries and we suggest installing these libraries inside an anaconda environment what you can do is you can manually create an environment so conda create minus n and then simply give it a name so let's say course project and you can set a python version for it so these are the same instructions that are provided in each lecture notebook so let's just create a yeah so let's create a conda environment here so we've called conda create minus n course project so that's going to create a python environment where we can install all our libraries okay so now the environment has been installed then we are going to activate the environment So here we now run conda activate course project. So now the environment has been activated. Inside this environment, we might want to install all the libraries that we want to use. So we're going to use Jovian. We're going to use Jupyter. Let's say we'll use open data sets, or you don't have to, but you might. We are going to use pandas. We are going to use numpy, and we are going to use seaborn, and we are going to use matplotlib. So we just install all the libraries after activating the environment. And once these libraries are installed. let's just give that a second yeah sometimes this might take a while for you to install and this is one of the reasons we recommend using binder because all of these steps are taken care of for you so once these libraries are installed we can now start a jupyter notebook 
by typing uh, Jupyter Notebook. Okay. So once again, a quick recap of what we did. The first thing that we did was we installed the Jovian Python library. Let me just come back here. I'll open this once again. So once you run Jupyter Notebook, you this will print out a URL for you, which you can open up on your browser. But a quick recap, the step one was to install the Jovian Python library. And of course, you also need to have Anaconda installed. So make sure that you have the Anaconda distribution of Python installed too. Step two is to then clone the notebook using the Jovian clone command. Step three is to enter the directory and create a conda environment. So that is done using conda create. Step four is to activate the environment and install all the libraries. So you say conda activate the environment name and then you install libraries using pip install. And then step five is to just open up the Jupyter notebook. So by typing Jupyter space notebook. So that's going to print this URL. So you just take this URL here and open it in your browser. And now you can see here we have the zero to pandas course project.ipynb file. So now at this point it is pretty similar to the place that we get to when we click the run button and click run on binder. So run on binder is a one click experience that's why we recommend it but with a few more steps and I think now you are familiar with these steps. Now you are comfortable. Now I think you're comfortable enough that you can figure these things out. So with a few more steps you can run it on your local computer. Okay. So now we have this zero to course uh, pandas course project file and the first cell is a text cell, a markdown cell and you can remove this cell before submission. Now this is this cell describes what you need to do. It gives you the guidelines. So the first step is to select a real world data set. So you have to find and download an interesting real world data set. You take these data sets and then you have to make sure that this data set contains tabular data, preferably CSV, JSON or Excel files that it can be read using pandas. Then you perform some data preparation and cleaning just as we did. So you load up the data frame, you look at the number of rows and columns, you decide which columns you want to use, you decide how you are going to handle any missing or invalid data. Maybe you might want to parse some dates, like we parse some numbers, you might want to create additional columns, you might want to merge multiple data sets. Then you need to perform exploratory analysis and visualization. So this is exploring the distributions of numerical columns using histograms, using bar charts to visualize categorical columns, using his scatter plots to see distributions across multiple columns and take note of interesting insights from this analysis and then also ask and answer questions about the data. So you have to ask at least five interesting questions and answer those questions by either computing the results using NumPy, Pandas or by plotting graphs using matplotlib or Seaborn. And wherever you're using any library function, just explain briefly what it does. It's always helpful for the reader. And then finally, take your inferences and summarize them and write a conclusion. So this is a really important part of consolidating everything you've learned into a single paragraph or a single section. And also share ideas for future work on the same topic using uh, other the same data set or maybe other relevant data sets. And make sure to share links to any resources that you that might be helpful for people reading the reading your analysis. So definitely share links to documentation, maybe share the link to the course page so that people who are not familiar with pandas or numpy can use that. And then the last step is to make a submission and share your work. So whether you're using binder or you're running on your local computer from time to time, you need to run jovian.commit. So you just set a project name. So for instance, my project name would be, let's say state of JS survey 2019 analysis, set a project name and then use the Jovian library to run jovian.commit and commit the project. And that's going to take this either from binder or from your local computer and put this onto your Jovian profile. So you simply take this link then and then you need to take this link and go back to the course project page. And on this page, you need to click, put in the link and click submit. So once you do that, you will see it showing up in your submission history. So make sure that this is a jovian.ml link. So this should not be a local link. Don't put a local host link. Don't put a binder link. Don't put a Kaggle or Colab link. Please commit to Jovian and uh, put up a jovian.ml link and make sure that Jovian, that link is to a notebook hosted on your own profile. Otherwise the submission will be rejected. Okay. And what we will do is then we will evaluate your project. So what does the evaluation look like? So here we have shared the evaluation criteria as well. 
So we will evaluate that your data set contains at least three columns and 150 rows of data. We will, you must ask and answer at least five questions about the data set. Your submission should also include at least five visualizations and your submission should include explanations using markdown cells apart from just code, right? So just code is not good enough. Please write explanations and that helps you understand your data that helps you gather insights from your data. And it is also going to help others like tomorrow. If you want to showcase this project on your public profile or you want to share it on LinkedIn or wherever, or you want to link to it from your resume, you want to make it nice. You want to show that you've put in work, you are presenting it well because presentation, believe it or not, is a very important part of data science. So uh, do not, so do not skip that. Uh, it's not just about writing code. It's about gathering inferences and presenting them and making, coming to, you know, making interesting observations and maybe making hypotheses and digging deeper. So the data tells you just some facts, but you have to analyze it and really come up with what that those facts mean and infer them, right? in the context of either the data set itself or for your company or whatever you're working on. And finally, your work should not be plagiarized. So do not copy paste from somewhere else. Of course, you can take, you can borrow functions and every data set has been analyzed by many different people. So you can do this analysis, which people have already done. You can even look at those notebooks. You can look at notebooks by other people, but do not plagiarize. And I think you will be able to tell best if you are plagiarizing. So as such, the entire project should not be a copy paste. And, and the biggest loser in that case will be you yourself if you're basically copy pasting stuff. So please don't do that. Now, apart from doing that, do share your work online. So this is a lot of effort that you've put in into this project. So please share it on your social media. And one highly recommended step is to write a blog post and a blog post is a great way to present and showcase your work. So you can sign up on medium.com to write a blog post for your project. It's really simple. You just sign up and then you click new story and you can just start typing and you can simply as a starting point, you can simply copy over the explanations from your Jupyter notebook into your blog post. And in terms of the code and the graphs, you can actually embed them. So you can take your code and graphs from your Jovian, uh, the notebook submitted to Jovian and you can embed them within, within your blog post. So you just watch this video for a quick tutorial or just follow this uh, guide. So you can see here that this is a blog post on medium and inside it is embedded a code cell, or you can even embed an entire, um, you can em embed even like some code and the outputs like things like graphs, or you can only embed just the graphs if you want to see it. So the benefit of writing a blog post is that it, you know, with Jupyter, it contains a lot of code and contains a lot of pre-processing steps, but on your blog post, you can decide the narrative and you can simply use the right code blocks and you can write, use the right graph, you write graphs from your Jupyter notebook and you can embed them within your uh, blog post to tell the story that you want, right? It doesn't have to follow the same structure as the Jupyter notebook. And it will be a great thing to showcase on your profile. It will be a great thing to share on your, on your social media, on your, with put up on your resume or just mention while you're applying for an internship or things like that. And you can check out our medium publication. We've linked to it for how to write a good blog post. There are many good examples. All of these have been written by people from the community. And this was during a previous course. And in fact, all of these are in a lot of these cases, these were the first or the second blog post written by people. So please do check it out and don't be afraid. You can write it too. It just takes a little more effort, maybe a few more hours after you do your project. Okay. But do write it as far as possible. And we've, as I mentioned, we've shared some recommended data sets and we've shared some example projects. So you can go through these projects and you can keep revising this video as well to just get a sense of what, how you should analyze your data. And you can either use this notebook as a starting point. We've uh, created this template for you where you can put in the project title, write some introduction, and then there are sections for each step. And remember to commit your work at each step so that you do not lose your work. Uh, or you can also start from a blank notebook. That is perfectly all right. Uh, it's all a question of what you feel most comfortable with. And do remember to just remove this cell uh, before your submission so that the instructions are not included in your final submission. Okay. So with that, we have done 
we've just revised the course project as well and you have time till the 3rd of october that should be sufficient time so please do put in the work you if you've come this far you should definitely do a course project while you have this all of these things in your head and it will really reinforce all the ideas that we have learned now i just want to do a quick recap of the course for a couple of minutes and a lot of you started out without even a python programming experience so we started out with an introduction to programming with python we just looked at the first steps with python and with jupyter notebooks using it like a calculator we did we explored data types and variables we saw branching with conditional statements and loops and then in the second lecture we looked at re writing reusable code with functions working with the os and the file system and uh, then you solved the first assignment where we solved some word problems using variables and arithmetic operations we manipulated data types using methods and operators and we used branching and iterations to translate ideas into code and uh, we also learned how to explore the documentation how to get help from the community so after learning python we looked at numpy so we saw how to go from python lists to numpy arrays uh, we saw how to work with multi dimensional arrays and we saw what were the different array operations matrix operations that you can do we learned about slicing we learned about broadcasting and numpy by itself is a very powerful library and we also saw how to work with csv data files then we did an assignment on numpy array operations where you explored the numpy documentation and demonstrated the usage of five array functions and you created a jupyter notebook with explanations about five functions uh, on how to use them and how not to use them and we shared hundreds of notebooks with the community and probably learned a lot from each other then we learned how to analyze tabular data with pandas which was reading and writing csv data with pandas we learned how to query and filter and sort data frames and you know pandas data frames are really powerful and even today we've seen a lot of different functions which we probably did not explore earlier then we also looked at grouping and aggregation for summarizing the data we looked at merging and joining data from multiple sources and then we did an assignment on pandas where we applied all of these things that we learned Finally we had one lecture on visualization with matplotlib and cborn where we learned how to do basic visualizations with matplotlib and advanced visualization with cborn so things like uh, line charts scatter plots bar charts heat maps and histograms and then we also saw how to customize and style charts how to make them beautiful and we also saw how to plot images and how to plot multiple charts in a grid so all of these things are you know all of these things then we tied together into our today's lecture on exploratory data analysis where we found a real world data set the stack overflow developer survey with a 65000 responses we loaded the data cleaned it pre processed it did exploratory analysis and visualization then we asked and answered questions and we made a bunch of inferences and now you are working on the course project where you will repeat this process on a real world data set of your choice So that was a quick recap of the course. Now, if you complete all the assignments and the course project, then and if we once we evaluate all of that and you get a pass grade in all of them, then you will be issued a certificate of accomplishment. This will be a verified link hosted on jovin.ml so it will be a page on jovin.ml a part of your profile where it can be displayed and this will be available for download as a PDF as well. So if you want to download it, print it out, you can do that too. and you will be able to add it on linkedin onto your linkedin profile so that anybody who visits your profile will see that you have completed a certification on data analysis with python and you will also be able to share it online on twitter facebook or wherever so we've all put in a lot of effort so we can definitely celebrate it once we on the certificate of accomplishment do share it and even encourage your friends to take the course in future sessions This is what the certificate looks like but this will be embedded into a web page from where you will be able to download it and share this page as well. The thing you should not do is immediately do not jump to another course. Work on a project. Make your project as large and as interesting as possible because it's not enough to say that you've done a course and it's not enough to say that you have a certification. It's not enough to just say that you've done a small project. You should have a significant data analysis project under your belt. and it should be something that you should you have documented and presented well and it should be something that you have put on your public profiles right so do something that you feel proud of and then put it up on your public profile build improve your professional profile 
and write blog posts, write tutorials and write guides. You can do this on Medium, you can do this on GitHub pages. There are a lot of platforms where you can write blogs. You can use Jovian to share your Jupyter notebooks. Do write, write any guides that can help people who came before you. So look back at yourself and try to write maybe a small tutorial for that person to encourage them to, to demystify data science for them or maybe just to tell them that pandas is not as scary as it might seem or maybe just point them to this course and say that you can learn about it here. Uh, so there are a lot of resources available online for you that you now know and so you can now curate them and share them with your community, right? So if you're a student, share them with your classmates. If you're a professional, share them with your colleagues, share them within your company. The more you share your knowledge, the better you get at it as well. Okay. And then improve your professional profile. So showcase your certificate, showcase your project on your LinkedIn profile, on your GitHub profile, on your uh, resume. So do that. And then once you feel like you've really done a lot of work in on this topic, that is the point at which you should then take more data science and machine learning courses, right? So do not fall into the trap of just doing a bunch of courses without any real output out of them. The best way to learn is by doing and doing good projects. Okay. So we hope you find Jovin useful. And just on behalf of the entire course team, I just want to say a big thank you for you uh, to you for doing all the assignments and the, uh, working on the project, going through all the lectures and just being awesome overall. We were really excited to run this course and, and this is really not the end. We are hoping that we will continue to have a long association with you. We, we have a lot of interesting things planned for you. So with that, we come to the end of data analysis with Python. Thanks a lot for joining and all the best for those of you who are still working on the assignments on the course project. And I hope to see you soon in a future course. Thank you and goodbye. And this is a walkthrough of the course project. So first let's go to the course page on zero to pandas.com. On the course page, you will be able to find the links to all the previous lessons and the assignments. And if you have submitted the assignments, then you can open up an assignment page and find the results of those assignments as well. So today we're looking at the course project. So first I'm going to open up the course project by opening up this section. And the objective of the course project is to apply all the skills and techniques that you've learned during the course onto a real world data set. So we have a starter notebook here. So let us open up the starter notebook. So this is a starter notebook. It's called zero to pandas course project starter. Now on this starter notebook, you will find the instructions and the guidelines on the first cell. So you have a link to make the submission, which is back on the course project page. You have a link to the forum where you can ask questions. So let's quickly open up the forum as well. So here is a forum thread where you can ask questions about the course project. The, this forum thread also contains the same explanation that is there in the starter notebook and it also contains a list of data sets, interesting data sets that you can uh, use for your course project. And you can find a lot of questions and discussions already from the course participants. So if you need any help, please feel free to ask questions on this forum. So in this course project, you will pick a real world data set of your choice and apply all the concepts that we have learned in this course to perform exploratory data analysis. And this starter notebook can be used as an outline for your project. So focus on the documentation and presentation is specifically apart from the code because this Jupyter notebook will also serve as a project report. So do include a detailed explanations wherever possible using markdown cells. And uh, before we start working on the project and do a walkthrough, I just want to tell you what the evaluation criteria are. So your submission will be evaluated on these criteria that your data set must contain at least three columns and at least 150 rows of data. This is to ensure that the project has a large enough scope and scale. And this will be a useful project for you to showcase on your professional profile. And you must ask and answer at least four questions about the data set. And your submission must include at least four visualizations or graphs. 
and your submission must include explanations using markdown cells apart from code and your work must not be plagiarized that is directly copy pasted from somebody else you can always uh, use functions that have been implemented by other people you can use same data sets that have already been analyzed but do write the code at least most of the code should be written by you and then we have a step by step guide to working on the project so the first thing we will do before we follow that guide is just click the run button here and run this notebook on binder so you can either use an online platform like binder to work on your course project or you can run your course project notebook locally and we will see both the approaches so right now i'm going to show you this approach on binder so once again we click the run button and then click run on binder so now we have the course project notebook here so once you have this running on binder you can open it up here so zero to pandas course project dot ipynb and i'm just going to zoom in here a little bit okay so let's now follow the step by step guide so the first step is to select a real world data set for your project so now to select a real world data set we have uh, provided a link from where you can find data sets so we recommend that you find data sets from kaggle so here we've uh, provided a link to kaggle.com/datasets where you have over uh, 30000 public datasets and we've already applied a filter of csv files this is so that we can load these files using pandas and over here you can look at any of these datasets for instance here let's say we have this health insurance cross sell prediction dataset so all you need to do is just click on this and then you will be able to browse the files here so it seems like you have this a uh, train file where you have a bunch of information like id gender age and a bunch of other things related to insurance and once you've picked the dataset the next step is to download the dataset so we will show you a demo of how to download the dataset but once you have a dataset that has been downloaded into your jupyter notebook the next step is to perform some data preparation and cleaning where we will load the dataset into a data frame using pandas and explore the rows columns and range of values then you can perform exploratory analysis and visualization where we will uh, visualize many different columns of the dataset and relationships between columns and take note of interesting insights and then you will ask and answer questions about the data so the requirement is that you ask at least four interesting questions about your dataset and answer these questions by computing the results using numpy pandas or by plotting graphs using matplotlib and seaborn and then finally you need to summarize your inferences and write a conclusion so you write a summary of everything you've learned and include any interesting insights and share ideas for future work and links to any resources that you found useful during your analysis and then finally you will make a submission on the same page from where we got the starter notebook and optionally we also recommend that you write a blog post so that's the outline of the project and let's go over an example so what you can do is you can actually remove this top cell so i'm simply going to click on this top cell and then go to edit or sorry yeah edit and delete cells so that is going to remove that top cell containing the explanations and then we need to pick a project title so now you can pick a project title so uh, for project title let's say i am going to analyze this health insurance cross sell prediction data set so i can simply call this health insurance data analysis and then you would have to write some explanation so here you have uh, below the title you should write an introduction about yourself maybe about the data set where you got the data set from what you're trying to do with it which tools and techniques you are using to analyze the data set and you can also mention about the course data analysis with python and what you've learned from it so use this as intro as an introduction to somebody who is new to data analysis or new to this data set and give them some information Uh, then we have the section on how to run the code so we have used the first option which is to run the code using free online resources and you can leave this cell inside so that anybody viewing your project can also run their code by following these instructions and there is another option to run on your computer locally and we will go through this towards the end of this video once we go through the entire process of the project first the next step is to download the dataset and to download the dataset as we've already seen we can find the dataset on kaggle.com/datasets and here we have picked the health insurance cross sell prediction data uh yeah health insurance cross sell prediction data 
Now to download this data set, all you need to do is to simply download this, uh, take this link of the data set, like the health insurance cross cell prediction data and come back here and paste that link into this command here, uh, into this uh, variable here, data set URL, right? So what you need to do is you need to set the data set URL to that data set which you want to download. And then we are going to use this library called open data sets. What this library does is it takes any data set URL and downloads it directly into your Jupyter notebook. So this is useful because now you do not have to go click download and then upload it manually. It is all done for you in a single step. So let us install the open data sets library first. So we do pip install open data sets and we also install the Jovian library and then we download the data. So first we create this data set URL uh, variable which contains the link to the data set. Remember the link is from the Kaggle page of the data set. And then we import the open data sets library and then we simply run od.download data set URL. And once we run this, you can see that this data is now getting downloaded to this folder dot slash health insurance cross cell prediction dot zip. And then that, uh, that zip file is then getting extracted to the folder. Okay. And this data set has now been downloaded. So you can check it by clicking file open and then looking here at, you can see this folder health, health insurance cross cell prediction. Um, and you can also check this. You simply set the name of the directory. So the name of the directory is health insurance cross cell prediction. So we simply set the name of the directory here, health insurance cross cell prediction. And then we can check the list of files in that directory. So it seems like there is a train.csv, test.csv and sample submission.csv file. And this is the first step. So this was downloading the data set. It's really simple. You simply find a link from Kaggle and then you take that link and then you paste it here in place of data set URL and then you run od.download. Now at the end of each step, what you can do is you can delete the instruction cell. So once again, I'm selecting the instructions and then going edit and delete cells to remove it. And then you should also add some explanation here. You can mention that you're going to download this data set from Kaggle and then you're using the open data sets library and so on. So just have some explanation in each step. So now that the data set is downloaded um, at, so we have completed step one. And now that we have completed step one, we can save and upload our work to our Jovian profile. So then you can once again come here to the project name and change the project name. So for instance, the project name here should be health insurance data analysis. And you can pick a project name that is appropriate for your data set and then install the Jovian Python library, import Jovian and just run jovian.commit with the project name. So then you will get asked for your API key. So you can get the API key from your Jovian.ml profile. So if you just visit Jovian.ml and log in, you will be able to copy your API key. So let's just copy the API key and paste it here. So with that, we have downloaded the data set, completed step one, and then we have committed our notebook to Jovian. So you can see that this notebook that we just committed will now show up on your profile. So your profile slash whatever name you have given and you can then take this link and make a submission and we will go through that soon. So that was step one, downloading the data set. Step two is doing some data preparation and cleaning. So the first thing that you might want to do is import this data set using pandas. So you load the data set into a data frame using pandas. So if we just do import pandas as pd and then we can do pd.readcsv and in the read CSV, we can simply pass in the path to the data set. So we all already have the data directory. And inside the data directory, we can, uh, the file that we are interested is in is called train.csv. And we can put this result into a data raw DF or let's call it insurance raw DF. Okay. So now you have this data frame here, insurance raw DF. So we have downloaded the data and loaded it into a CSV file. And now next thing you should do is explore the number of rows and columns and then the ranges of values. So you can use things like uh, insurance raw DF dot info and insurance raw DF dot describe.
So you can see here that these are the columns and then these are the values within the columns, the ranges of the values. Then you need to handle any missing, incorrect or invalid data. So to learn how to do this, you can review the last lecture where we have done all of these steps in a lot of detail. And then you can perform any additional steps like parsing dates, creating additional columns, merging multiple data sets and so on. Okay, so that is the step data preparation and cleaning. Once again, once you're done with that step, you can simply remove the instructions. And then once again, run import Jovian and Jovian.commit. So at the end of each stage, at the end of each step, you can save a snapshot of your notebook. The next step is to do exploratory analysis and visualization. So here what you need to do is you can compute the mean, the sum, the range and other interesting statistics for the numerical columns. You can explore distributions of the numerical columns using histograms or bar charts or line charts. You can explore relationships between columns using scatter plots. And for each of these, you need to make a note of any interesting insights that you get from this exploratory analysis, right? So here, for example, we have added some import statements for you. So you can import matplotlib and pyplot, and then you can take, so now if you have the raw insurance DF, you can take this, you can take this data set and maybe let's say you want to see a distribution of the genders. So you can just do a SNS dot bar plot and on the bar plot, let's just look at the genders. So let's do gender. So let's just check that again. Yeah, so it's gender with a low uppercase G. So let's do insurance raw df dot gender. And that is going to draw a bar plot for you. So this is what you need to do for each of the columns. You need to run, you need to draw some kind of a plot. This seems to be stuck here for a second, but it will draw the bar, bar plot in just a second. So then, uh, and, and we have created small sections for you where you can explore one or more columns by plotting a graph. And for each section, you can just pick one or more column and draw a bar graph, a, a line plot, a, a histogram, a scatter plot, and so on. And at the end of your exploratory analysis, you can once again run jovian.commit. So that was step three, which was to perform exploratory analysis and visualization. Then step four is to ask and answer questions about the data. So once again, what you need to do is you need to ask at least four or five interesting questions about the data set and then answer the questions either by computing the results using NumPy and Pandas or by plotting graphs using the matplotlib and Seaborn libraries. If you need to, you can create new columns or you can merge multiple data sets and you can perform grouping and aggregation wherever necessary. And then whenever you're using any library function, it's always a good idea to add an explanation about it, about why you're using the function and what you expect the result to be. So we've already created these templates for you for question one, two, three, four, and five. So for each of these questions, you simply need to first put in a question here and then describe an approach on how you will answer that question and then write the code to answer the question and then mention any insights that you have from answering the question. Okay. And once again, I'm going to delete this cell containing the instructions. So once you've asked and answered all the questions, you need to run import Jovian and Jovian.commit. So that is step four, answering, asking and answering questions about your data. Then we come to inferences and conclusions. So at this part, we have completed the coding, but our project is not complete. So you have done some exploratory analysis. You have gained some insights. You have asked some questions and then you have asked those, answered those questions by either calculating the answer or by plotting something. So at this point, you should write a summary of all the inferences that you have drawn from the analysis and any conclusions that you have at the end. Okay. So just mention these in, in a bunch of points, in a bunch of bullet points. And once you do that, once again, we can commit our notebook at the end of each section. And one last thing to do is this is always something that you should do is to 
add any references so if you've used found any resources online helpful for your work so just add links to those resources and then also add ideas for future projects so because of the time or the scope that you have chosen you may not have been explore uh, may not have been able to explore everything about this data set so that is where you can mention that these were other ideas that other people can try out on this data set and you can add links to resources that you found useful so with that, we are now ready to make a submission. So to make a submission, one let's do one last commit and let's uh, go through these instructions. So first we need to upload this notebook to the jovian.ml profile. So we have already done that. Every time we do a commit, a new version gets captured. So if we can simply take this link from our jovian.ml profile and then we need to go back to the course page, which was the course, the course project page. So on the course project page, you have a make a submission input box. So you can simply put in the link to the notebook here. Now you need to make sure that this is hosted on your profile. So this is, this must be on Jovian. So when you run jovian.commit, then you get back a jovian.ml link and then you take that link and make sure it is part of your profile and uh, the same profile that you logged in with here and then click submit. So we will not be accepting links on Kaggle or Colab or Binder or any other place or GitHub, you have to submit a Jovian link so that we can run our evaluations, internal evaluations automatically. And you will be able to see your submission history here. So you can see here that uh, your submission is now visible here. And we will be considering only your last submission. So if you need to, you can make multiple submissions, you have time. Just make sure that your last submission is the one you want us to consider. So that is how you make a submission for the project. And I just want to show you a list of the interesting data sets that we have mentioned. So now once again on the, in the starter notebook, you will find a link to a forum thread where we have recommended interesting data sets. So as we mentioned, you can find some data sets on Kaggle and then you can download them using the open data sets library. So you simply install the open data sets library and then you import it and set a dataset URL and call od.download with that dataset URL. Here are some interesting datasets. So you have video game sales, world university rankings, Netflix TV shows, Stack Overflow developer survey, Google Play Store, Android apps data, and several more. So already hundreds of people have done projects with these, uh, but there is a lot to explore in each data set. There are many different angles to explore, many different ideas to explore. So go through these data sets and see what uh, catches your interest. See what questions you would want to ask about the data set. See what others have asked and others have not asked. And based on that, come up with ideas for what you can do with the data set. Explore it a little bit and then use the starter notebook to download the data and start working on it. If you want to use an external source other than Kaggle, then you will need to create a new data set on Kaggle by uploading a CSV file yourself. So you can follow the instructions here. There is a link here which you can click on. And then here you can upload this data set. Okay, there seems to be something wrong right now, but this link should work for you. Um, if, if this doesn't work, you can always click the new data sets button here. Uh, and if you're, and you need to be logged in for the new data set, maybe that's why you did not see the, uh, oops, something wrong here, but you click a new data set and you log in on Kaggle and then you can upload your CSV file there and make sure that it is a public data set. And then you can use it with your, uh, with the open data sets library, just as we have used any other data set, right? So instead of having the data set URL to some public data set, you can set it to your own data set that you have created on Kaggle. Now, one other thing that I want to show you is how to run this locally because sometimes running on binder can be a little bit slow because it is a free service, uh, which we are lucky to have. But if you do want to run this on your computer locally, there are instructions here. So let's follow these instructions. So the first thing you need to do is you need to install Conda. So Conda is a distribution of Python. It is a it is a software which installs Python along with a bunch of other libraries onto your computer. So here we have the installation guide for Python and you can follow the, you can follow the regular installation guide for whichever operating system you are on. For instance, if you are on windows, 
then you need to follow the installation guide for Windows and you can use Miniconda. You do not need to use the Anaconda full installation. Miniconda is good. So just download the installer. So there is a link here for the installer. So all you need to do is download the installer and then execute the installer on Windows and on Mac OS and um, Linux you have a few other steps but ultimately what you need to do is you need to make sure that Conda is installed on your system and there is another step here which is to add Conda to your path. So there are there are certain steps here where you can ensure that the Conda distribution of Python is installed and then the Conda command is available on your terminal. So what you should have is you should be able to run the Conda command on your terminal. So here I've run the Conda command and you can see the output. So it prints out a bunch of outputs. If you do not have the Conda command, just look it up how to install the Conda command. The instructions are available in the installation instructions. Then we need to create a Python environment and install all the required libraries by running these commands. So first we are going to create a Python environment. Now a Python environment is like a, a specific installation of Python which is sandbox so that all the libraries that you install do not affect your global Python installation. So that every project that you work on can have a separate environment, can use separate libraries and different versions of the same libraries or even different versions of Python. So here we are creating a conda we are creating a Python conda environment using the conda create command. So we say conda create and then we are giving the environment a name zero to pandas and uh, we are also installing, we are setting the, we are setting the version of Python to 3.8. So we run this, now this is going to install Python 3.8 and this is going to set up the environment for us. And this might take a few let's say maybe about 10 minutes to uh, install all the packages depending on your internet connection or if you have already installed these packages it will not take so long but once the python environment has been created you do not need to create it again but whenever you want to use it you need to activate it so here to activate the environment you do conda activate zero to pandas and that activates the environment and you can see this python environment included here now it will be a part of the prompt now on Windows this might be slightly different. You might have to run this on the Anaconda prompt rather, rather than the um, command prompt or terminal. So just follow the instructions given on the Conda documentation. But the idea here is that you need to have the environment activated and the prompt ready for analysis. Next once we have activated the Python environment, we can install all the required libraries. So we are going to install Jovian, Jupyter, NumPy, Pandas and a bunch of other libraries inside the environment. So that again might take a few minutes. First we have set up Python and now we are setting up all of these specific libraries. Then the next thing is to download this notebook. So now we have the libraries and we, we now want to download the notebook. So to download the notebook, first you need to go into a directory where you want to do this download. So let's just give this a minute to complete. Yeah, so now the library installation is complete. So now I'm going to go to my desktop folder and you can navigate to whichever folder where you want to download this uh, notebook. And then you need to go to the top of this page, at the very top of this page and you will see a clone notebook button. Now click the clone notebook button and that is going to copy a command to your to your clipboard. And then you can come back to your terminal or command prompt and paste that command. So now you will see this command Jovian clone and uh, it will have the name of the user. So in, in this case my name and then zero to pandas course project starter. So once I run this you will see that a folder gets downloaded on my desktop. So you can see here the zero to pandas course project starter this folder gets downloaded. So now we can go inside this folder and inside this folder we can just check the files. So there seems to be this file 0 to pandas course project dot ipynb. Now to open up this file we can just run Jupyter notebook. So now you have it. Uh, this will automatically open up the browser for you. 
but if it doesn't there is a simple way because it also prints out this URL so you simply need to copy this URL and then come back on the browser and run it here and now you have the same notebook running on your own computer right so now you have this running on your computer now you do not have to depend on binder now uh, you can make your changes here you can download the data set here you can run jovian.commit from here so even when you are running this notebook on your own computer if you run jovian.commit so let's say i run jovian.commit and we give this a project name so let's say the project is called uh, insurance demo oops we import jovian and we run jovian.commit so now that is going to create this and upload this notebook on your jovian profile so you can use this jupyter notebook interface on your own computer in the exact same way that you use binder so you simply uh, run jovian.commit and at any point and this will push that notebook to your profile and then you can take this from your profile and come back to the course page and make a submission on the course page okay so that is how you run this notebook on your own computer now one last thing that i want to suggest is that if you're having difficulty in working through the project maybe once again consider going through the notebook or the video for the exploratory data analysis lecture which was lesson 6 so you can watch lesson 6 exploratory data analysis we have a whole 2 hour case study on the stack overflow developer survey or you can also follow this notebook here so here you have this notebook you can also follow this uh, notebook here exactly and in this notebook you will find that we have done all of these steps we have downloaded the data set we have downloaded it using the open data sets library this time it was not a kaggle data set so that's why we are not using a full kaggle url but you simply need to replace this with a kaggle url to download a data set from kaggle then we looked at the data set we loaded it it up using pandas so so we created a raw data set and after that we looked at all the columns then we decided to pick a small number of columns out of the data so when we came to data preparation and cleaning we decided that out of 60 columns we only want to use about 20 columns then after loading up those columns we also did some cleaning we converted some non numeric columns into numeric columns by performing some operations we looked at the values and some of the values that did not make sense we either excluded those values or replaced them with empty values um we also made some other cleaning steps so every time you work with real life data you have to do some cleaning then we uploaded our notebook to jovian and then we moved on to exploratory analysis and visualization where we used a uh, seaborn and matplotlib to create many different uh, visualizations so here was a visualization about country so these were the top 10 countries here was a visualization about age so this was a histogram then we used a pie chart to create another visualization then we used a bunch of bar charts to visualize the education level and the undergraduate major and the kind of employment that people had and then we moved on to asking and answering questions so we asked questions like which were the most popular programming languages in 2020 we asked more questions like which languages are most people interested to learn over the next year and we asked which are the most loved languages we looked at uh, the working hours per week we tried to figure out the countries which have more uh, which have the highest number of working hours uh, and we only considered countries with more than 250 responses so this notebook gives you a very good template for how to how to work through the project you simply need to replace this with a different data set and then work through the exact same steps and you can even use the same data set the stack overflow developer survey data set and that is perfectly okay you simply need to do a slightly different analysis so you can maybe take a different set of columns you can ask different questions you can analyze different columns you can draw different graphs so the you can use this as a template for what a project should look like and you can notice that at every stage we have added explanations whenever we ask a question we just describe the approach before implementing it in code and whenever we have drawn a graph we write some inference after that graph and then at the end we have summarized all the inferences and conclusions and then we have added references to all the all the things that we found useful all the places where you can learn more about the libraries and the functions that we have used and we've also added ideas for future work 
that can be done using this uh, same data set. And finally, we do one final commit. And then you can take this and use that to make a submission. So that's it for the course project. What I will recommend for working through this is to work on one step every day. So every day go to the course page and open up the course project and uh, just check out the starter notebook. Now the first time you need to clone, the, uh, you need to run the starter notebook. But once you have made a single commit, then you can find the notebook on your Jovian profile. For instance, we just did this health insurance data analysis. You can see that it shows up on your Jovian.ml profile. So you just open Jovian.ml and log in and you will see that uh, notebook, your course project notebook right here. So just come back to your course project notebook. Maybe you completed step one, which was simply downloading the data set. And then uh, tomorrow what you can do is you can come back, click run, run on binder once again, and then run it on binder and then complete step two. So complete the data preparation and cleaning step and then run jovian.commit and that is going to bring it back to your Jovian profile. Uh, then the next day you can do step three, exploratory analysis and visualization. And then the next day you can do step four, which is asking and answering questions, or maybe you can do this over two days. And then the next day you can just write the inferences, clean up the explanations, make your notebook a little bit nicer. And then the next day you can add some references and future work, and then you can make a final submission, right? So over a course of five days, if you spend one to one and a half hour, that should be sufficient time for you to work through the notebook. Now, one last thing that I wanted to cover was writing a blog post. So if you see here, we have included an optional step seven. Uh, step seven is to write a blog post for your notebook and a blog post is a great way to present and showcase your work. So I'll just show you how to write a blog post. So to write a blog post, we recommend using medium.com. So you go to medium.com and then you sign in onto medium.com. So I am already signed in here. So I'm just going to show you what it looks like after you've signed in. So once you have signed in, you will see an option here on your profile menu to write a new story. So just click on your profile and click new story and then give the story a title. So you can give it the same title. Let's say I was working on health insurance analysis. And then you can add the same explanations that you have written within your Jupyter notebook. So this is my health insurance data analysis. So here, whatever explanation you have added, you can use the same explanation and copy it over. And you can mention about the course as well. And then wherever you need to include, let's say a graph or um, some code, you can actually embed this code. So what you can do is let's say you want to show this code within your, you want to show this piece of code, this cell of code, which is this input and then this output within your blog. So just click on the embed cell button and then click embed using a link. So that is going to copy the link to the cell to your clipboard and then come back to medium and paste it there. And that is going to embed this cell here for you. So now you will have the code as well as the outputs and you can embed a lot of things. You can embed graphs. So let me see if I can embed a graph for you. So let's find a notebook with a graph. Yeah. So here we have a notebook with graphs, the Python EDA stack overflow survey. So for example, here we have this uh, cell which, which also has a graph. So you can go to a cell within your course project which has a graph and then click on the embed cell and click copy. And let's come back here and then just add some explanation. Here's a graph. And now the graph will get embedded too. So you may not be able to see it here uh, while you are editing, but once you hit publish, and then click publish now. So you can untick this checkbox that says allow curators to recommend because uh, you want your 
your blog to be freely available. So just untick this checkbox and click publish now. And once you publish the story, you can see here that you have the explanation that you have put in and then you also have the code that you have embedded. So here we are, we have some code and some outputs here. We have some code and we have some graphs and you can even choose whether to simply embed the input or the output or both. So by default we embed both. So this is a really powerful way to include graphs and include any code and include any analysis from your Jovian notebook onto your medium blog post. Okay. And we have a medium publication. So which is like a collection where you can submit your blog post. So you can go to medium.com slash Jovian ML. And here you can see a bunch of analysis uh, that has been done by participants of the course. So for instance, Sathi has worked on analyzing crimes committed against women in India in the span of 2001 to 2014. And you can see her analysis here. So this is a great way to showcase your project to a larger audience by writing a blog. So with that, we come to an end to the uh, walkthrough of the course project. Now a quick recap, just go to the course project page, open the starter notebook, work on one step every day. You can either use binder or you can run it on your own local computer completely up to you. Both of these are acceptable for each step about one, one and a half hour should be sufficient. And we recommend that you commit your notebook to Jovian after every step over the over the four or five days, you should be able to complete all five steps. And when you've completed all five steps, just take that link from your Jovian profile, the notebook link and submit it back on the course page. And then if you have more time, we recommend writing a blog post. And when you do write a blog post or when you complete your course project, one thing that you can do is you can come back to the discussion page. So we have the forum thread and you can share your ex, uh, course project here. So there are already hundreds of projects that have been shared here. So you can share your course project here. You can uh, get feedback from the community. You can get very good uh, suggestions for how you can improve things. You can share your blog post here too. And you can also check out projects done by other people. So right now I've shown you one project, but there are actually hundreds of projects for you to check out. So do check out these projects for getting inspiration. And that's it. So all the best for the course project and thank you.